Best Radio Mystery Theater presents... of the giant primate, there is a mirror with bars over it, as though it were a cage. It is the last cage that you see before you leave. There is a sign over this mirrored cage that reads, the most dangerous animal in the world. You are looking into the mirror, and you see yourself. Two such creatures are facing each other in the center of a prize room. And in 10 seconds left in round eight, nobody expected the fight to last this long. Tiger Vincent has pounded the ex-champ mercilessly from the first bell. Why doesn't the referee stop the fight? He's down. The ex-champ is down. The referee waves Tiger to a neutral corner. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Something is wrong. The doctor is coming into the ring. What, what is it? What did he say? He's dead. Max Thompson, the ex-champ, is dead. Our mystery drama, The Most Dangerous Animal, was written especially for Mystery Theatre by Sidney Sloan. And stars Fred Gwynn. I'll be back shortly with Act One. After the big fight. The newspapers, radio, television, all the media are telling the story, repeating in detail the fatal beating the old ex-champ took from Tiger Vincent. Pictures taken during the fight are on the front pages. Pictures of the widow and her three children are to be found in the center fold. The old ex-champ, Max Thompson, only 37, was cut down by a man ten years his junior. A man who had the killer instinct. Oh, Dusty. Uh, what do you want? I'm uh, busy. I tried to get you on the phone, Tiger. Uh, look, I ain't answering the phone. You know that. Day after the fight, I like to stay in bed. So, what do you want? I got a call from the commissioner this morning. He's all worked up. <laughs> so let him. Uh, that all you got to tell me? No. Look, can I come in? I can't tell you standing out here in the hall. <sighs> come on in. Okay. Let's have it. Commissioner says that Max's death last night is going to be bad for boxing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he says. The commissioner, huh? What does he know? A guy gets knocked off in the ring, the fans love it. That's what they come for. And that's what I gave him. Action. He wants you to come to his office and talk to him. Look, Dusty, you're my trainer and my manager. You go see him and make excuses. Yeah, I told him I'd come, but he wants to talk to you. I don't think he likes you, Tiger, <laughs> from what he said. I know he doesn't. He'd like to suspend me. I know that. He's important to your career. It wouldn't hurt you to be nice once in a while. He's the commissioner. You didn't even say you were sorry. Okay, okay, okay. What are you building up to? I know you didn't come here to pay me a social visit. Uh, the commissioner, off the record, suggested it would be a decent thing if you donated half your next purse in a the fund. Half for... my next purse? Dusty, you out of your skull. I'll be fighting a champ. It'll be the biggest money I ever got. And you want me to hand it over to... Now, Max Thompson's widow. She needs it, Tiger. What is this? Widows and uh, orphans' welfare I'm, I'm fighting for? She's got no money. Three kids in school. Tiger, you were responsible. The answer is no. I was in the ring. He could have killed me. So he got it. 
Tough luck. I'm willing to give up half my cut. Go ahead. You got my permission. Now, get out. I need my beauty sleep. Uh, Commissioner, I, I haven't really had a chance to talk to him about it. He, yeah, I'm working on him about your suggestion of giving half the money to a fund for the widow. Yeah. Well, thanks for calling, Commissioner. Goodbye. Come in. Hi, Dad. Oh, Lori, baby. Come in, come in. I thought you and the kids were down in Texas. You never said nothing about coming east. Yeah, well, I had to come. Aren't you glad to see me? Oh, sure, baby. I uh, left the kids with Mame. They're in good hands. Uh, Tiger around? He's over at the gym, working out. Oh, good. I didn't want to see him just yet. Not until I had a chance to talk it over with you. You know what a violent temper he has. Yeah. Well, what's on your mind, Lori? Tiger and I have been separated for nearly two years. Yeah, I know. I thought it would be better for me and the kids if we got away from him. You know, far away. Well, is it money? Because... I don't need much to live on, and you with the two kids... Dad, you're giving me enough. He should be doing something for the kids, not you. And I don't care about myself. I'm all right. Got a job as a waitress in a cocktail bar. Oh, honey, I don't want you doing that kind of work. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. I make good tips. We're making out. But there's something else. That's why I came to see Tiger. You want to see him? Remember the last time I was afraid for your life? The way he acted, I thought he was going to kill you. I'm not afraid of him, Dad. He's getting worse. He killed Max, a nice guy. He didn't have to. He knew Max was way past his prime. Tiger could have won easy. But no, he had to go for the kill. I honestly don't think he's right in the head anymore. Why do you stay with him? The next fight is my last one with him. I'm taking my cut and I'm quitting. I've had enough. Yeah, that's the way I felt when I walked out. I knew he'd kill me or I'd... Don't. Please, don't say that, Lori. Don't ever say things like that. Yeah, okay, all right. You're right. Tiger sure brings out the worst in people. But I gotta see him, Dad. That's why I made the trip. Well, what do you want to see him about? I want a divorce. He said he'd never give you one. I know. But I've met someone else, and he's kind and good, and he loves me. And you? I love him, too. I want to marry him. He'd be good for the kids. I mean, to have him for a father. Say, Dusty, I just got a call from him. Well, well, well. Look who's here. The runaway. Hello, Tiger. So, what do you want, Lori? Hmm? Money? Don't ask for money. You walked out on me. I don't want your money. I came here to ask you for a divorce. Forget it, baby. I ain't going along. I thought we could do it in a friendly way. <laughs> you mean just agreeing to disagree? That's the way civilized people would do it. Baby, haven't you heard? I ain't civilized. That's what the newspapers are saying. They're calling me Killer Vincent now. Killer Vincent. So that's what he said, Jack. I told you when I spoke to you over the phone yesterday, there was no reason for you to come up here. Well, look, maybe if I talk to him... No! He won't listen to me, he wouldn't listen to you. Especially not to you. So, the money you spent for the plane ticket was wasted. I'm going to talk to him. Laurie, I love you. I want you to marry me. Jack, he will beat you up. He's got a terrible temper. And he'd like to hurt you. Cripple you. You make him sound like he's some kind of a monster. Now, take my word for it. He is. Well, you know, it is possible to get a divorce without any agreement from him. Oh, yeah, sure. But he'd fight it. And he wouldn't care how much it cost him. He could do it. Hire lawyers. I haven't got that kind of money. Well, neither have I. I'm going to see him, Laurie. I've got to. He's got to listen. Miss 
Mr. Vincent? Yeah? I'm, uh, I'm Jack Huggins. Okay. Where are you from? Where? Uh, I'm from Texas. Houston. Uh, and you want an interview, huh? Uh, got your photographers? What? Uh, to get my pictures, mister. Come on, don't waste my time. I'm working out. Let's go. No, no, no. You got it wrong, Mr. Vincent. Hey, 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 listen. Cut out that Mr. Vincent stuff. I am Killer Vincent. Don't you guys down there in Texas read the sports pages? I'm not a sports writer. Then who are you? What are you doing here? Hey, hey, Gunder. Gunder. Yeah, Tiger? Who let this creep in here? I don't know. I guess he just came in. Yeah. Well, Mr. Creep, beat it, huh? Get out. You know, I don't like being called that. Oh, you don't? <laughs> Isn't that something terrible? Hey, listen, better get out while you still got a chance. Creep. Now, look, Mr. Vincent, I've got something very important to talk to you about, and I'm not leaving until you hear it. Yeah? Supposing I don't want to hear it. Well, then I'll make you hear it. Hey, look. I want to give you five seconds to disappear like the big Texas wind just blew you away. Huh? Or? Or? Just about a week ago, I killed a man in the ring. Did you read about that in your little Texas paper? Yes. I read how you killed a tired old ex-champ just to prove how tough you were. Why, you... <laughs> okay. Okay, now you know, huh? Hey, get up, huh? Hey, get up! Hey, Gunder! Yeah? Better call a doc. <laughs> this, this guy's out cold. <laughs> hit me without warning. Just lie quietly. Lucky he didn't hit you hard. Jack here was sprawled out on the floor when I come in and the doc was helping him come too. I'm no featherweight. I weigh as much as he does. I could give him a good fight if I had a chance. He hit me without warning. That's the kind of man he is, Jack. I told you not to talk to him about us. What did he hit you for? Just for being there, I guess. For not being a reporter or a photographer. He thought I was coming to interview him for a paper. Oh, maybe now you'll listen to me. I warned you not to see him. He's a dangerous man. Laurie, down home, we've got big rattlers. You've seen them. You know what we do about them? We take steady aim and blow their heads off. Oh, come on, Jack. Now, now you're just talking. When you meet a snake, a poisonous snake, you do something about it. Jack, I don't like to hear you talking like that. Come on, laugh it off. Just steer clear of him. Think of it as something that happened that wasn't important at all. It's important to me, Laurie. I love you and I want to marry you. But I couldn't even think of marrying you with that... I don't know, with that, that insult to me. Hey, Tiger. Tiger. Yeah. You told me to tell you when he came in. He's here? Just went into his office. Okay, Gunner. Thanks. Oh, Tiger. I just got here. Yeah, no, I, uh, I want to talk to you, Dusty. I want to talk to you, too. Good, then we can get it off our chest. Right? Okay, uh, you go first. Something eating on you? Uh, not exactly, Tiger. But, uh, I'm getting on. I've been in this fight game for a lot of years. Yeah? I was a pretty good welter in my day. I got right up the first contender. Yeah. Then Harry Kipps busted your jaw and busted your chances for the title. Yeah, that's right. So I quit. Hmm. Number one contender, and I quit. Retired. I knew when to quit, Tiger. I went along teaching guys like you how to handle themselves in the ring. You never had anybody as good as me. And you know it. That's right. No one like you before. Nearly four years, isn't it? I found you a little punk. Okay, okay, okay. I heard that story. I'm getting sick of it. I just want you to know that after I win the championship, you're out. I see. If you let me finish, I was going to tell you the same thing. Hmm? My last job. I'm taking my cut. It'll be a big one. And I'm retiring. Well, then it works out just fine. I've been talking to Big Bill Braden. What? Him? 
I don't like the way you said him. He's a crook, Tiger. A syndicate mobster. Yeah, well, he's going to be my manager. Oh, and another thing. You're going to find you haven't got such a big hunk coming from the next fight. Well, what do you mean? I know how much it's going to be. That was all worked out before when we signed the contract. Bill Braden is getting the manager's cut, Dusty. Oh, come on, Tiger. I was dependent on that. In four years, I never made much with you. Well, I was okay. I didn't mind. I was bringing you along. Ah, shut up. This was going to be my one big take. You're going to get your trainer's money. Peanuts. I can't retire on that. That's all you're going to get. And if you ain't happy with it, tell Braden. See if he'll give it to you. And that's all? That's all. Old man. Tiger Vincent walks out the door and lets it slam shut on his old manager trainer. The old man sits looking into space, seeing all his plans for his future crumbling. He knows that Tiger Vincent can do as he pleases and get away with it. But will he? The hatred Tiger has generated is like a volcano, which has remained quiet for many years, then suddenly bursts into molten lava and fiery destruction. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. before Tiger Vincent fights the heavyweight champion for the world title. The sports sections of the newspapers report that the betting is eight to five in favor of the contender. Killer Vincent, they're calling him, and the word is going around that the killer will win by a knockout in the fifth round. All this gossip has disturbed the boxing commission, and Dusty has just gotten a call at his little office in the gym. You think what, Commissioner? I, I don't I don't care where you hear those things. It isn't true. The fight next Saturday night at the sports arena is going to be on the up and up. As Tiger's manager, I give you my word that I... What? Where'd you hear that? Bill Braden. Yeah, well, he don't come into the picture till I resign. I'm still in charge. When? Right after the fight. Yeah. Uh, thanks for calling. Hey, Dusty. Who were you talking to? Oh, Tiger. I just heard the end of the conversation. Who was it? The commissioner. Yeah? What did he want? Tells me there's lots of talk about the fight being fixed. Where do you hear that? Around. You know how that kind of talk gets around when the bottom man gets a higher percentage in the betting? Who says I'm the bottom man? Oh, come on, Tiger. When you win the championship, then you'll be the top man. Right now, you're still second. Yeah? Right now, the champ's manager knows I can beat him. Beat the champ? How? He just knows. That's all. The champ's over the hill. He told you? No. But he told someone else. And that someone else is Big Bill Braden. Shut up. I never said that. I don't believe it. It just seems to me a little funny that the champ's manager should be spilling out to Big Bill. What's so funny about that? He's a businessman. Braden's a businessman. Just talking business. Like maybe you should take a dive and let the champ win? Is that it? I told you before, keep your big mouth shut. Sure, sure, sure. I always thought he was smart. He's going to be good for you, Tiger. Real good. You want to know how it's going to be? How? It gets out that the champ isn't looking so good in training, right? Like he's overtrained. Stale. His sparring partners are able to get him. One of them catches him with a lucky left and he goes down. This gets out. It's 
supposed to be a secret, but... The press hears about it. Yeah. When they ask the champ's manager, he says it ain't true and he laughs about it. Got it? Smart. But they all know something is wrong in the champ's camp. Is that clear? Like a dirty window. What? Oh, nothing. Go on. Yeah. Well, the whole idea is to get everyone thinking that the champ is... Gonna lose the fight. Yeah. You know what this does? Mm-hmm. Sends up the odds on you to win. I'm eight to five right now. By Saturday, it could be nine to five. Maybe two to one. Hey, this is a great idea. The champ and his manager bet on him to win. This makes it look kosher. And you and Big Bill bet on the champ, too? We get the money placed around through friends. And then you take a dive. In the tenth. We'll clean up with the bookies. Then six months later, I get a return. This time, I win. The smart money will be on me. Tiger, it's crooked and dirty. Uh Your scheme makes me sick. Okay. So what are you going to do about it? I don't sing, Tiger. I just personally don't like it. You know, Dusty, I've been thinking you should get a break. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a cut of the betting. That'll be bigger than the manager's cut. No, thanks. I'll get by without it. Thanks, just the same. Mouth shut. I told you that. You know what could happen if... You don't have to tell me. I know everything there is to know about your new manager. I want to wish you both all the success you deserve. Thanks. You know, uh... You can still come in on the deal. Just bet your dough on the champ. You can't lose. No, Tiger. That'd be a sure thing. I would never bet on a fix. You see, I'm a sport. A real sport. I wouldn't enjoy it. About yesterday. I thought you decided I was too much trouble and going back to Houston. Oh, you're not going to get rid of me that easy. Where were you? Just looking around. What does that mean? Uh, I was sort of watching Tiger Vincent from a distance. Following you? Oh, you might call it that. Just looking for my opportunity. Oh, Jack, what kind of nonsense are you talking? I'm waiting for the chance to give him back what he gave me. Then you'll be happy? When I see him laid out after I hit him. Laid out? Mm. What does that mean? Just what it sounds like. I'm going to lay him out like a dead gopher. Jack, do you love me? Darling, I told you that a million times. Tell me once more that you love me enough to forget all this childish revenge stuff. Lori, I love you, but you're not going to deprive me of the satisfaction of taking a poke at him. A poke? Right on the jaw when he isn't expecting it, the way he did to me. (sighs) And you promise to run after you do it? (laughs) Uh, how about some lunch? Nearly 12.30. No, no, thanks, Tony. I, I got a couple of little errands to do, but I'll be back later. Was there any more word from him? No. I tried to get him on the phone, talk to him, break him down, but I can't reach him. Can't your father talk to him? Oh, not much chance there. He told Dad he was through as his manager. Fired him? Mm. You mean just before... Just before the championship fight? Yep. And not only that. He isn't going to give him his share of the fight money. The manager's share. That's the dirtiest... Hey, that reminds me. Anything arrive here for me? Arrive here? Yeah, uh, just a couple of things that I had sent up from home. I didn't want it sent to the hotel where I'm staying. Mm, Nothing came? I see. Uh, Let me know as soon as it does. hmm? Sure, sure. I gotta run now, Lori. I'll be back later. I didn't know you were here. Hi, Dad. If I'd have known you were here, I wouldn't have to fumble around for my keys with this package in my hands. What is it? I don't know. It's for Jack Huggins. Care of me. Postman, give it to me downstairs as I was coming in. 
That's darn heavy. Oh, well, here, let me have it. Jack told me it was coming. Hey, it is heavy. I, uh... I'm going to open it. Oh, honey, it ain't yours. It's not right to open something that isn't yours. Yeah, I know, but I'm worried. Jack's acting kind of funny. Oh? He's what way? just still steaming about that punch Tiger gave him. He wants to get back at him, huh? Well, he says he just wants to give Tiger what Tiger gave him. A left to the jaw. But I think he's got more on his mind. And I think he's trying to hide it from me. I'm going to open the package. Oh, uh, it uh, looks like a shoebox. Yeah, it's so wrapped up in paper. You... Dad, look. It's a revolver. I brought it over here, Jack, because Lori was upset when she found it. What fool idea did you have to send in for a revolver? Oh, I don't know. It was a foolish idea. Yeah, I, I know that now with my hands on it. Well, I could never use it. You better explain yourself to Laurie if you want to get back into good standing with her. I hope she listens. Tiger Vincent isn't your problem, so stay away from him. Getting mixed up with him can only cause trouble. Is Laurie at your place now? Well, she was when I left to come here. You think she'll talk to me? Well, let me go home first. I'll smooth things over. You come up in about uh, half an hour. You home? I'm in here, Dad. Lori. You all right? <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> Lori, baby. What happened to you? I went to see him. I told him I just had to get a divorce. Then he got real angry when I told him I wanted to marry Jack. Now, don't talk. I'll go down and get you some ice cubes and a towel and bring that swelling down. No, I got cubes right here. He said, he won't want you when I get through making you ugly. And then he began to hit me. He pushed me out into the hall and ran down the stairs. I didn't take the elevator. I was so ashamed for anybody to see how I looked. Those bruises are nasty. Lori, I'm taking you to the hospital. I'm here to see Lori Vincent. I'm sorry, but visiting hours are over. Please, I must see her. She's my fiance. Jack, I'm glad you got here. And the nurse won't let me see Lori. I came right over her. Listen, Jack, he hurt her real bad. But don't you make a fuss. She's upset enough already. And the doctor's given her something so she'll sleep. Lori? Uh, oh, honey. I don't, don't look at me, Jack. She'll be all right. As soon as that swelling goes down. Oh, Lori, honey. I love you. Poor oh, Jack. I'm glad for something. You didn't lose that wild Texas temper of yours. No, I didn't lose my temper. I'm just as calm as can be. I just know now. I gotta kill him. tries to reason with Jack, but he won't listen. He pulls away from her and leaves the hospital room. Dusty goes after him, but he is not fast enough to catch him as the elevator door closes. Now, Dusty is torn between two opposing thoughts. He hates Tiger for what he has done, but feels that Jack's contemplated action is wrong. There must be another way, he thinks, as he turns and slowly walks back to his daughter's hospital room. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. The crust on the volcano is starting to crack. Wisps of smoke reaching up into the air signal the beginning of a frightening eruption. And now Tiger Vincent, Killer Vincent, is beginning to feel the heat that he has generated. The heat of the hatred he is responsible for. His confidence in himself, which he had been so sure of. 
He is beginning to waver. He feels a sense of danger, and he does not know from what quarter it will come. Hello, Braden. It's me, Tiger. I'm sorry to bother you so early, but I uh, had to talk to you, uh, get your advice. I'm having a little trouble. It's my wife. Yeah, yeah. She walked out on me two years ago. No, 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 nothing like that. I, I, I just couldn't take her anymore, and I, uh, well, uh, maybe I hit her a little. What, what, what happened this time? I, I did it again. No, 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 wait, 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 let, let me explain. Huh? Uh, she's in the hospital. Oh, hey, hey uh, Bill, I'll, I'll have to call you later. Uh, uh, someone just come in. Oh, hi, Dusty. Uh, you don't mind I use your phone? No, no, I don't mind. Uh, you uh, been to the hospital this morning? Just came. Uh, oh, uh, how is she? She's all right. Doctor says he'll let her come home. He means to my place tomorrow. Oh, that's good. Uh, look, I'm, I'm sorry I hit her, but she got me all worked up. Yeah. Why ain't you in the gym? Uh, fight's in 36 hours, and I thought... I'm still your trainer till the fight's over. You were supposed to do light work today. A little running, some push-ups, 30 minutes on the heavy bag. Uh, I, I, I don't want to. I feel lousy. I, I didn't get any sleep last night. Oh, uh-huh. why not? The phone kept ringing. Did you turn off the bell? I did. But you couldn't sleep? I couldn't, yeah. It's what he said that kind of bothered me well, when he called the first time. Who said? Yeah, that punk that called me bef- before I shut off the bell. What did he say? I don't know. Uh, say, listen, Dusty, what's, what's the name of that guy that Lori's running around with? She ain't running around. He's a nice guy. And he wants you should give her a divorce so he can marry her. You don't want to stay married to her anyway, so why well, don't that, you... That, that ain't none of your business. She's my wife, and I can do anything I want about her. Then don't ask me for advice. I ain't asking for advice. I just want to know who that guy is who says he's got a gun, and he's going to kill me on sight. You don't look good, Tiger. Not sleeping can be a bad... Yeah, 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 that's right. But, but it ain't because I'm afraid of him. Why should you be afraid? You're Tiger Vincent. Killer Vincent. If you was to get him in the ring... <laughs> One punch and I kill him. But you're not going to get that chance. I know this guy. He's tough. He doesn't take any insults like you hitting him when he don't expect it. <laughs> Cooled him with one punch. That's what he says he's going to do to you. Cool you. Only you won't wake up. Yeah. He, uh, he said he had a gun. He has a gun. And he knows how to use it. I think I'll call the cops. Yeah, I think you should. Can't do any harm. But the main thing is, I don't want to see you worrying about it because worry will make you tired. It'll weigh you down so you look terrible in the ring Saturday night. Yeah, you're right. I gotta look my best. Don't worry about this guy. Right, I, I won't worry. And why should I worry? Maybe he isn't a good shot anyway. <laughs> Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. What? Uh, uh, yeah. Hello, killer. I'm gonna get you tomorrow night. Fifth round. What? Tomorrow night. Fifth round. Fifty guns will be pointed at you, killer. You're through. Tomorrow night, killer. Fifth round. Your last round. Your last. Fifty shots in the fifth round. All of you, killer. You'll die in the fifth. Fifth round in the fifth. Stop him. Stop him, stop him. Stop him before he kills me. Yeah? That punk 
wants to kill me. What are you talking about? He called the night after I went to sleep. Told you to turn off the phone? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I forgot. He he said he was going to shoot me to fight tomorrow night. Fifth round. No, no, no. Stop worrying. You got to be in top shape. You got to look good. I'll get the cops to look out for him. If he's got a gun, he's in big trouble. Nothing to worry about. Yeah, yeah but he says he's going to have 50 guns aimed at me in the fifth round. Isn't that the round you're going to take your dive? Me, yeah. Why? Fool him. Uh, fool him? Yeah. Do it in the fourth. He'll be waiting for the fifth. You'll be all finished and in your dressing room. And there won't be any fifth. Uh, I don't know, Dusty. Uh, Big Bill's got it all set to happen in the fifth. Okay. Do it your way. Then I... No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, we'll, we'll change it to the fourth round. Uh, thanks, Dusty. Don't mention it. Good night. Have a pleasant dream. Hello? Jack, it's going to be the fourth. You got it? I got it, Dusty. Everything's set. <laughs> Laurie, honey, come on in. Better than the hospital, huh? Good to be out of there, isn't it? Yeah, there's no one's here. You expecting someone? I thought maybe... Jack? Oh, you can't expect him to come here after the way you behaved at the hospital. What about him being so childish, getting his gun from Texas? You told him you didn't want to see him anymore. What do you expect? That was two days ago. Then you do want to see him? Of course I do. <laughs> All right, I'll get in touch with him. He moved from the hotel. He took a room in a private house. Why? Why'd he move? Tiger's got the police looking for him. Police? Yeah. Tiger's got some bee in his bonnet that Jack's going to kill him. He says he keeps calling him at night and threatening him. Is that true? Is that really true? Uh, maybe. But I think it's just to throw a scare into Tiger. He hasn't had any sleep since Thursday. Dad, are you sure it's just to scare Tiger? That's what Jack tells me. But you're not sure. I... I don't know. You gotta find him. I gotta talk to him. Well, I'll try. But I don't have much time. This is Saturday and the fight's at the arena tonight. <laughs> championship fight between Tiger Vincent and the champ. This has been the dullest championship fight in my memory. Tiger Vincent has hardly thrown a punch. What happened to the man they were all calling the killer a few months ago? Tiger looks tired, scared. He keeps looking over his shoulder as if he expects there's some danger behind him. This fight is a complete surprise. There's the warning buzzer. Maybe something will happen in the fourth round. Champ is up quickly, rushes at Tiger, who backs away, avoiding him. The champ is motioning for Tiger to get into the fight. The two men are in a clinch. The referee is having trouble breaking them apart. Tiger is holding on. Now the referee has them apart, and Tiger is looking over his shoulder again. He is scared about jumping. Tiger is down. He's laying on the canvas, covering his head. He wasn't hit by a blow. He just went down. It sounds like someone was shooting off firecrackers. The referee is confused. He waves the champ to a neutral corner and is counting. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The fight is over. It's been the most unbelievable experience of my career. A championship fight with hardly a punch thrown. <laughs> I, I never in my life seen anybody as scared as Tiger. <laughs> well, I'm worried about Jack. He said the police picked him up after he shot off the firecracker. And the look on Tiger's face when he heard them shooting off, it was worth the price of admission. 
Jack sure paid him back for that punch in the jaw. Yeah, well, I'm worried. I called Megan. He's uh, gone over to bail him out. Could it be a serious charge again? Oh, maybe that's him. Oh, Jack. Oh, honey. Hi, Lori. As soon as you're free and can open your mouth, I'd like to talk to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dusty. Hi. What happened in court? Oh, Megan got me out on $500 bond. You going to jump it and run back to Texas? Only if Lori comes with me. Well, I don't think there's much worry on that account. Megan says that he can get the divorce easily. Says that after Tiger hit Lori like he did, it's a cinch. Lori? Oh, Jack. I, uh, got some more news for you. The commissioner called me early this morning. About the fight? What else? Did you tell him about the fix? The tiger was supposed to look like he was winning, and then... No, no, no. I said I don't sing. And I meant it. The commissioner said he was declaring it no contest. Does that mean that nobody won? That's right. And the bookies aren't paying anybody. What's more, tiger's been suspended indefinitely. I think we paid him back. You paid him back? No, Dusty. You took the gun away from me. <laughs> and substituted firecrackers. <laughs> I got a smart old man. Let us go back to that zoo we spoke of earlier. Let us look again into that mirrored cage with a sign over it that reads, The Most Dangerous Animal in the World. You know now that it is you who are the most dangerous, not the giant apes in the adjacent cages. After a moment or two, you turn and leave the house of primates, wiser than when you entered. I'll be back shortly. manager, trainer, stood at one of the gates of the airport to bid his daughter and his soon-to-be son-in-law goodbye. He kissed Laurie, shook hands with Jack, and was about to go when Jack produced a third flight ticket. You're coming with us, Laurie said. We need you, and your grandchildren need you. Say yes. Dusty just nodded. He was unable to speak. Our cast included... Fred Gwynn, Robert Dryden, Terry Keane, and Mandel Kramer. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Gwen, what's that? That design on the floor? Oh, it has some Kabbalistic meaning, but there's not a book I can find written about it. I can barely make out an eight-pointed red star in three circles of black. Quite faded. It must have been here a long time. And you haven't any idea what that sign represents. Oh, I didn't say that. I said there's no book on it. I do know it's as old as the Druids. It's called the Devil's Mark. Never heard of it. The Devil's Mark was acquired by a witch at her initiation into the Devil's Service. It's the mark that Satan places on a witch as a token of his authority over her. And what do you suppose it's doing in this tool shed? This is Tammy Grimes, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant dreams.
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. It's a little game many people play on a train or a bus. You look at a complete stranger seated across the aisle. Your mind begins to speculate. Who is he or she? And you go through the standard answers. Rich person, poor person, beggar person, thief, doctor, lawyer, Indian, chief. It's a harmless diversion, and it passes a time. But is it possible to look at someone's face and say, murderer? And be right. You were in on the plan to kill Mr. Rogers. But I didn't know Mr. Rogers. You arranged to meet with him so he could be set up for the murder. That isn't true. Then what were you doing at the railway station in a dangerous neighborhood at midnight? I can't tell you. Please, don't ask me again. I can't tell you. Our mystery drama, A Quiet Evening at Home was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tammy Grimes. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Alicia Merriweather, or as she is listed in the society columns, Mrs. Albert Emmons Merriweather III, is having breakfast in her luxurious penthouse apartment in an eastern city. Her maid has the day off, and her cook is on vacation. And so Mrs. Merriweather is quite alone, and has been compelled to brew her own coffee and burn her own toast, even as you and I. But Mrs. Merriweather doesn't mind. She's a good sport, and not bad-looking, either. As a matter of... Oh, there goes the telephone. And she'll have to answer it herself. Hello? My dear? Yes? Oh, I was so alarmed. Alarmed? Why, Albert, dear? Well, the session broke up rather late last night, and I returned to the hotel, and I telephoned you. And the phone rang and rang without an answer. I couldn't imagine where you might be. I was here. I'd gone to sleep early. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I thought. Just a nice, quiet evening at home. I do hope you aren't bored. Oh, I loved it. How was the convention? Oh, it's rather a drag. Well, try to have a good time. Uh, darling, I, uh, I may be compelled to remain here the rest of the week. I'm sorry. Just be a dear and get everything done and hurry home. Well, I have to say goodbye. It's time for my speech. I know you'll bring them shouting to their feet. Well, I'll get through it somehow. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, dearest. Yes. Such a dear little man. And I just adore him. Really adore him. Hello? Dearest. Alicia. Yes, it's your darling Alicia. Have you forgotten last night? Oh, how can I forget last night? But you, you shouldn't call me here. She'd have answered out of hung up. Oh, that can be just as suspicious. Is she home? No, no, fortunately she has a golf date. Then you can tell me you love me. I love you, Alicia. Even a train announcer puts more passion into his voice than that. I love you, darling. And I love you, Bruce. Oh, how I love you. Look, it, it, it's, it's only 10 o'clock. Is something wrong? Yes. It's wrong that I have to wait two whole hours before I can see you. Ah, uh, well, those two hours will pass before you know it. You sound so cool. So sure of me. Darling, I'll see you at Marvetti's at noon. Bruce, it's possible that we might be seen together in Marvetti's. It's possible. But it'll look as if we merely ran into each other. All right. And besides, by this time tomorrow, will it matter what people think? Alicia. Sit down, Bruce. I've already ordered your drink. Oh, and without ice. 
I see you remembered. I have so much to learn about you and so much to remember. Uh, are, you, are, are you sure you want to go through with this? Yes. And you? Well, you know, when you think of how short life really is, can you waste even a moment without the one you love? Have you really thought about it? What's to think about? She's a very wealthy woman. Well, your Albert's a very wealthy man. You have no money of your own. <laughs> Neither do you. Yes, but... Are you trying to talk me out of it? Oh, no. It's just that you've become used to... to the ease, the luxury of life with her. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what you can never get used to. The knowing glances and the self-righteous smirking of people who consider you a... Man. Bruce. Yeah, yeah, you marry a woman who's ten years older and wealthy, and what's the world supposed to believe? And, and, and it's true. I married her for her money, for her position, and uh, for her influence. Surely you must have loved her a little bit. Well, I loved her as uh, much as you loved Albert Emmons Merriweather III. I tried to love Albert. I tried to be a good wife to him. I just can't live this kind of lie yeah, well, any longer. Neither can I. Oh, darling, it's wonderful that we found each other and fell in love. And we can save each other. You won't be sorry. I'll be with you. How? How could I be sorry? Neither of us have any money of our own. Well, I have a degree in engineering. You know, I can get a job. I, I can even teach in high school. Man. <laughs> Well, what's funny? Oh, you are Bruce Tyler, former millionaire sportsman teaching mathematics. And I can see you in a ready-made corduroy jacket with leather patches on the elbows. Patches I myself sewed on. And, oh, and that beautiful socialite, Mrs. Albert Emmons Merriweather, living in some dusty suburb, doing her own laundry. But I won't be Mrs. Merriweather. I'll be Mrs. Bruce Tyler. Uh, 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 let's finish lunch. Yeah, there's a lot to do. And we'll each take one suitcase. And meet at the station and catch the 10.30. Well, no, no that, that's rather late now that I think of it. For, I mean, for you to go to the station alone. I'm not afraid. Well, well I'll, I'll get there early. You know, still, we could drive to New York. No. Your first instinct was right. If you took a car, it would be her car. Let's each leave with nothing that belongs to them. Darling, you won't be sorry. How can I be sorry? I'll have you. Will you be sorry? Never. This is the happiest day of my life. Bruce? Uh, I'm uh, sorry I'm not Bruce. Oh, excuse me. Oh, no, 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 it's quite all right. I, uh, I was expecting to meet someone here. <laughs> it's Bruce. Yes. Uh, which train are you making? The 10.30 to New York. I think I'm a bit early. Uh, well, I'm uh, early myself. I'm catching the 10.35. I'm going the other way to Washington. It's uh, rather deserted here in the station. Yeah, yeah, in the old days, this railroad station was a busy, bustling place at all hours. <laughs> you seem rather young to remember the old days. I remember some of them. So, where's Bruce? Oh, he'll be here. <laughs> no sign of him. He has to be here. I don't see anybody come up the street either. What time is it? I, uh, I have 10.25. He'll be here any minute. <laughs> so will the train. Are you sure it's 10.25? Well, not anymore. In about 35 seconds, it'll be 10.26. I... Something the matter? He has to be here. He promised. Well, he, <clears throat> he still has a few minutes. What are you grinning at? <laughs> I'm sorry. Middle-aged romance should be touching rather than humorous. What are you talking about? Are you and Bruce, whoever he is, running away? I'm sure that's not your affair. Oh, of course, it's your affair. Somehow, and I don't ask me why, I feel that Bruce is not worthy. I'll thank you to mind your own business. Well, here comes the train. It's that time. But where's Bruce? He's... He'll be here. Bruce. What? Please. Please, conductor, hold the train. Someone's coming. He, he'll be here. He promised he'd be here. What? Please, wait. Well? He's not here. Well, the evening doesn't have to be a total loss. How would you like to go to Washington? Huh? He isn't here. I can promise you an exciting weekend you'll never forget. Is there... A telephone? Does it matter? The train's leaving. Yes. I see one. 
just up ahead, a booth. Well, I never did like Bruce. Something must have happened. He's ill. I must call. Yeah, uh, hurry. The Washington train will be here in five minutes. Sir, I am not going to Washington with you. Well, you don't have to get angry. Besides, these things happen for the best, you know. Please, excuse me. Oh, damn. Sir? Sir, could you... Uh, how can I help? I... I don't have any change. <laughs> you simply weren't prepared for anything. Now, the next time... Do you have a dime? Yeah, sure, of course. Here you are. Thank you. Oh, I wonder what he'll have to say for himself. Poor fella. Lost his nerve at the last minute, I'll wager. Don't tell me. I'll bet his wife answered. You're so smart. You think you know everything. Well, you know, these are familiar dramas. Well, now, we have three minutes and 30 seconds before the Washington train gets in, so why don't you... Why... Why don't you get out of here? What? Get out of here. That's a gun. You got a gun. You're holding a gun. There is going to be trouble. Well, what are you saying? You'll have to run for it. What are you talking about? Who was that? He's shooting at us. Who? Quick. Get on the other side of the billboards and now run. Run toward the other end of the platform. Why? That's why. Now, if there's only one of them, I got a chance. Now run. But you'll be killed. Does that mean you have to be killed, too? I'm, I'm frightened. You don't have time for that. He's working his way in. Why does anyone want to kill you? Run as fast as you can down to the end of the platform. That man. He just stuck behind a post. A short man. Do what I'm telling you. Run to the end of the platform, down the stairs, into the street, and around the corner. Get going. I'm scared. Run. Run. Taxi. Taxi. Take me. Take me to uh, 17 Rossville Circle. And hurry. Hurry, please. <laughs> I, uh, I'm afraid you must have the wrong number. Bruce, is she standing there? Is that why? I'm sorry, there's uh, no one here by that name. Bruce! And are you all right this morning, my dear Estelicia? Yes, Albert, dear. Yes, just fine. Did you do anything last night, darling? Did I do anything last night? Uh, no. I just stayed at home and went to bed early. Just a quiet evening at home. Now, dear, you should get out and have some fun, some excitement. That's all right, dear. I, uh, I don't miss it. Now, dear, I must hang up now. We have a breakfast meeting. I'll be home at the end of the week. Goodbye, Albert. Henrietta, get the door, will you please? Damn, that's right. I gave you the time off. Just a minute. Yes? Good morning. I'm Detective Lieutenant Berger, homicide. Oh? My credentials. I see. May I come in? Thank you. May I ask the purpose of this visit, Lieutenant? I must ask you to come to police headquarters. Police headquarters? Why? What for? There's been a murder. Well, how? How does that concern me? Well, at the very least, you're a material witness. That's impossible. You might even be an accessory. But that's ridiculous. I'm required to tell you that anything you say may be used against you. Material witness, accessory. What's this? We were there. All she wanted to do was run away with her lover. Evidently, that can turn out to be a hazardous pastime. And in this case, it doesn't become very much safer in Act Two, which I shall bring you in just a few moments. Life is filled with little surprises. All that Alicia Merriweather wanted to do was run away with Bruce Pennington. 
They were to meet at the railway station late last night. Well, train time came, but Bruce failed to appear. Another gentleman, however, did show up, but he was murdered. And now, a police detective is saying to Mrs. Merriweather... Mrs. Merriweather, at about 10.30 last night, a man named Cleveland Rogers was shot to death at the Northside Railroad Station. Yes? A cab driver named Barney McCool was cruising about a block away. He heard the shots, but he supposed at the time that they were backfires from a car or a truck. And you follow this? Well, uh, And I... then he saw you. Me? He described you most accurately. He saw you running from the railroad station. You got into his cab, and when he heard about the murder, naturally he reported it to the police. Is he sure it was me? The address is recorded on his trip sheet. Is anyone else living here who resembles you? No, but... Do you deny you were at the railroad station? What were you doing there at that hour? Do you deny that you knew Mr. Rogers? Well, you don't have to talk to me, but you'll have to talk to somebody. I'd advise you to call your attorney. My attorney? Look, Mrs. Merriweather, I'm sure your husband has an attorney. Oh, no. I heard of your husband. A man like him, he's got to have an attorney. No, I couldn't talk to him. All right. Well, let's go. Go? Where? What do you think we've been talking about? The police headquarters. But I can't do that. My husband will find out. I don't see how that can be avoided. But it must be avoided. It must be avoided at all costs. Mrs. Merriweather, we're dealing here with murder. But I had nothing to do with it. What were you doing at the railway station? Now, why do you refuse to answer that question? Because. Because I can't. If you won't say why you were at the station, we will have to conclude it's for a reason you don't want known. For instance, why was Cleveland Rogers at the station? A lonely place like that. Especially since he knew certain people may have been looking for him. Mrs. Merriweather, were you the decoy? What are you saying? Rogers had an eye for a good-looking woman. Were you the one used by the killers to lure him to his death? L lure him to his death? This sounds like a, like a thing in a tabloid paper. Yeah, I'm afraid it does. You're talking to me. I am the wife of Mr. Albert Emmons Merriweather III. What would I know about gangsters, mobsters, killers? I don't know what you do in your spare time. This, this is monstrous. Yeah. Yeah, murder is. And it's not just the murder itself which is bad enough, but the company it keeps, the trail it leaves. The victim isn't the only one whose life has been destroyed. If you do not explain your presence on that platform, people will form their own conclusions. But how? And they will not be flattering to you. And what will you do if the killer claims you were in it with him? And then turn state's evidence to save his own neck? Please, please believe me. I had nothing. Believe me, I'd like to believe you. But you must meet me halfway. What were you doing there? I... Please, leave me alone. Are you protecting someone? How did you know? Are you... I'm... I'm protecting someone. And I'm also protecting myself. No. No, you're not protecting yourself. You're destroying yourself. Now. For there's somebody else. Were you... Were you supposed to meet someone at the station? Yeah, of course. It's the only thing that makes sense. Who? I... I'm not at liberty to tell you. Mrs. Merriweather, you must tell me. Why? Why do you have to know who he is? Because he has to corroborate your story. Oh. Yes, that's what it comes down to. Oh. You see, Mrs. Merriweather, sooner or later, you'll have to tell us his name. <laughs> Mr. Pennington, do you know a Mrs. Alicia Merriweather? Uh, yes, I, uh, yeah, I believe I do. Al, Al Merriweather's wife. May we speak freely here? Are we alone? Yes, and my wife's out playing golf. <laughs> a demon golfer, that woman. Uh, well, what's this all about? Had you planned to leave your wife and go away with Mrs. Merriweather? <sighs> Had I planned... 
Look, I uh, don't understand why you should ask me such a question. Because I want an answer. Since one of the police concerned in such personal matters, huh? We're always involved in personal matters where murder is concerned. Murder? According to Mrs. Merriweather, you and she had planned to run away together to meet at the North Side Station and catch the 1030 train to New York. While she was waiting, there was another man on the platform, and he was shot to death. Huh? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I uh, read about it in the morning paper. Had you planned to meet Mrs. Merriweather at the station? Well, I still don't see why the law would ask such a question. If the two of you had not planned to meet there, Mrs. Merriweather could be in trouble. Trouble? Considerable trouble. Because how could she account for her presence at the station? Oh. Huh. You still haven't answered my question. Uh, your, uh, your question? Had you and Mrs. Merriweather planned to meet at the station last night? Why, no, of course not. She says you did. Does she? Yes. How do you account for it? Well, I, I can't account for it. Well, but on the other hand, maybe I can. Is that so? How? She, uh... Well, you know, she, she always had kind of a crush on me, and... Well, she's a very romantic woman, and so... Perhaps she let herself imagine... Let me get this straight here. What you're saying is you made no arrangements to meet Mrs. Merriweather at the railway station last night. Well, of course not. Oh, well, this is the first I've ever heard of it. But it's true. It's true. I'm sorry, Mrs. Merriweather. We'll see about that. Mrs. Merriweather. We, we agreed to meet. Something happened. He must have been ill. I bet his wife answered. He's ill. That's why he couldn't meet me. He's ill. Well, he appeared in pretty good shape to me. But we... We decided... I wouldn't call again if I were you. The way it looks, he's not going to answer that phone for a long time. You don't understand. We, we're in love. Mm -hmm. I understand this. You're holding the bag. Okay, I believe you. Sure. You did decide to run away together. You did decide to meet last night at the train station. But I spoke to him just before, and he had the look of a guy who changed his mind. Don't say that. He said it to me. He told you he changed his mind? His manner told me. The tone in his voice told me. It's her money, isn't it? How? How did you know? These things show. I caught a glimpse of her as I was leaving. Big, horse-faced dame. Not at all pretty like you. No style. I can see where a guy could get fed up with her. But at the last split second, he remembers why he married her in the first place. The money. But he loves me. Oh, I'm sure. But he loves the money more. Meanwhile, you're in a jam. You can't account for your being at the railroad station. I told you. It was to meet Bruce. I know you told me. You believe me, don't you? I believe you. As a man. But it won't help you. Why not? Because he's going to deny that story. How can he? I'll... I'll face him. I'll... He has to. If he admits it, she'll throw him out in his ear. So it doesn't look good, huh? You better sit down, Mrs. Merriweather. Lieutenant, I'm frightened. My husband is going to find out. I'm sorry. What was a madness? I see now. It was a temporary madness. The whole thing with Bruce. But he came to his senses before I did, that's all. And now I'm going to be disgraced before the entire world. I'm going to be disgraced. I'll be ruined. Now, look, I'll try to help you as much as I can. Nobody can help me. I got into this myself. I'll have to get out of it myself. My problem is I'm getting panicky. I have to be calm. I have to... Think this thing through, logically, and arrive at... Arrive... Yes. Yes, I've got it. I'll deny everything. What will you deny? I'll start right here, right now, and I'll deny everything I ever said to you. And so, therefore, if you have come here to talk to me, you're wasting your time and mine. I was not at the railway station. Oh, come on now, Mrs. Merriweather. We have this cab driver. Yes? And he has his trip ticket. You've already told me about him. What else have you got? 
What else do we need? He says he picked me up a block from the railway station. Less than a block, and you're in a highly agitated state. Was I? That's what he says. You realize it's his word against mine. Oh, now, Mrs. Merriweather. He can say whatever he pleases. I'll deny it. I see. Well, explain why he should falsely identify you. I haven't the faintest idea. It isn't my problem. But what reason could he possibly have? Well, let me see. Suppose I put it this way. At one time, I had refused him my, uh, favors. And he wants his revenge. Mrs. Merriweather, please, make sense. He identifies me, does he? I'll identify him. Let him dare to open his mouth. I'll point to him in that courtroom. I'll recognize him as a cab driver who picked me up some time ago and made me an indecent proposition. I laughed at him. That's the worst thing you can do to a man. Now, look, you know and I know you were at the station last night. I know nothing of the sort. But you admitted it to me. You can't prove it. I'll deny everything. I'll insist this is all some evil plot designed to destroy me and my husband. Remember, all you have is that unsupported word of a cab driver. I see. His word against mine. And now, sir, I bid you good morning. Unless, of course, you intend for me to accompany you to police headquarters. In which case, you will have to take me there by force. Now, look, this isn't your style. You're basically a very nice lady who's been caught up in an indiscretion. I must ask you to leave. Now, first, I must tell you a story. I'm not interested. It's very brief. A playboy named Cleveland Rogers runs up a very large gambling debt with an underworld organization. I've heard that before. And they decide, for a number of reasons, to kill him. You've already told me. And they do kill him. Last night. At the station. You are a witness. You can't prove I was there. Right. I can't. The law can't. But the law is not your problem. Your problem is with the killers of Cleveland Rogers. They know you were there. They know there's a witness. And they know they have to kill you. And I know when somebody's trying to scare me. Let me put it to you this way. We found you. Now... Can you be sure that the killers won't be able to find you? How can they find me? They didn't even see me. From a distance, maybe. But they don't know what I look like. And furthermore... Yes? Oh, my good Lord. Hey, hey, Mrs. Merriwell, what's wrong? Do you want a glass of water? My... My suitcase. Your suitcase? I had, I had brought a suitcase. And when I ran away, I didn't think... I was so scared, I forgot I had it. I left it right there on the platform, outside the telephone booth. We didn't find a suitcase on the platform. Then they have it. The ones who killed Mr. Rogers. They have it. And it has things in it. With... with my name and address. doesn't do things by halves, does she? And when her plans go awry, they go all the way, don't they? Poor Alicia Merriweather. All she wanted was some love, some romance, a dashing husband instead of a dull one. Is that so terrible? Who are we to judge? Well, let's see how things develop in Act Three. suppose you can blame it all on love. The fact is, everybody wants love. The problem is, some people look for it after they're married. Mrs. Alicia Merriweather, bored with an unexciting husband, thought she could do better by running away with someone else, with results that uh, you are already aware of. He knows who I am. That man knows who I am. Which man? The man who killed Mr. Rogers. Then you saw the killer. I heard the shot. I looked down toward the other end of the station. He was running towards us. A short, stocky man. A short? He didn't know Mr. Rogers had a gun. Mr. Rogers let him get close, and then he fired. 
He missed, and the man ducked behind the post. But I saw his face. His face. It was such an evil face. No. What do you mean, evil? You look at that face, and you saw evil. You felt evil. You knew there was evil. But what did it look like? It was... He had a round, small eyes, thin lips, a horrible scar across his cheek. A scar? For a moment, a terrible thought flashed through my mind. I was committing evil in leaving my husband, and now I was being punished. Yeah, it figures. Honeycomb Sweet. I thought he had come to punish me. Donald Sweet, known as Honeycomb. Some name for a hitman, huh? Lieutenant... Why should he want to kill me? Is she a witness to a murder? His murder? Who... Who says I'm going to testify? I mean, is there some way I can assure him he's safe as far as I'm concerned? Is there... Now, look, Mrs. Merriweather, you're becoming hysterical. Certainly, and with good reason. Could I place an ad in the paper? To the gentleman who committed murder on the night of April 11th on the North Side Station platform. I will not testify against you. Sign the witness. Uh, let me get you a glass of water. I can't become involved. I can't. Now, please, get control of yourself. It's all over for me. All over. If this evil man doesn't kill me, Albert will divorce me. The story will come out. It will, won't it? Well, some of it, yeah. And I deserve it. Why? Why did I ever... What did I ever see in Bruce Pennington... Calm yourself, please. A weakling, a coward, a foolish insipid. He didn't mean a word of what he said to me. In the last minute, his true nature... Mrs. Merriweather, you must try to think rationally. What do you suppose I'm doing? Yes, Albert. Calm, patient, kindly. Oh, Albert. Now that it's too late, I realize how much I love you. Mrs. Merriweather, about the murder... Do you realize I've ruined my life completely? Albert was quiet so much of the time. But that's because he was thoughtful. Bruce talked all the time. And I see now it was the chatter of a parrot. Your life is in danger. It doesn't matter. What am I going to live for? Mrs. Merriweather, we have to go downtown. Why? You're not safe here. We'll have to place you under protective custody. Does this mean I'm under arrest? It means we're going to protect you. And... Of course, everyone will know. We'll try to keep it as quiet as we can. I guess your husband will have to know. That's everybody. This can't be helped. Suppose I refuse to go with you. If you agree to drive downtown with me in my car, we can do it quietly. On the other hand, if you want to make an issue of it, you're asking for publicity. I have one hope. One slim, forlorn hope. And that is... That this is a dream, a nightmare, and I'll wake up. I'm sorry. I'm ready. Shall we go? Will, will there be reporters? No, no, not yet. Not yet? You'll be booked quietly. Booked? You see, you're a material witness. But I'll be under arrest. No, not exactly. It's all kind of a gray area. But my connection with this, it will come out. Uh, yes, if we go to trial. I see. Of course, Mr. Merriweather will have to know. Yes. I can tell by that yes that you're frightened. How unbelievably perceptive you are, Lieutenant. Tell him everything. Confess. Are you mad? No, no. If you love him and he loves you, then the truth will only make that love stronger. Where did you read that, Lieutenant? I happen to believe it. Oh. Uh, Lieutenant, could you stop here for a moment in front of that drugstore? Well, I... There are a few things I have to pick up. Uh, all right. I won't be a minute. Do you have a, a telephone booth? Oh, I see it. Oh. Hello, Bruce. Don't hang up. Alicia. You're alone? Uh, yes. 
You're not as alone as I am. Uh, Alicia, I, I, I'm sorry. The truth is, I'm, I'm just I'm just not worthy of you. That's true. I didn't have the courage to go through with it. I'm in trouble, Bruce. I know. My life is in danger. Uh, Alicia, if there's anything I can do, I mean, in, in a quiet, discreet way... I just called to say goodbye. Goodbye? It's enough that I destroyed my own life. I won't ruin Albert's. Well, where are you going? Oh, I, I'm supposed to go to police headquarters. Well, uh, you'll be safe there. Instead, I'll, I'll just sneak out of here the back way. But, 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 but where will you go? As far as my money takes me. And hope that no one ever finds me. Goodbye, Bruce. Uh, uh, Alicia. Yes? Good. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, do you have a rear entrance? Oh, uh, never mind. I see it. Taxi? Are you free? Oh, excuse me. I, I didn't know you had a fare. Get in, sister. It's... It's you. Don't make a sound or I'll cool you off right here. Now get in and sit down. The man on the platform. Let's go, Curly. You... You're the man who... That's right, I'm the man who. I'm always the man who. Where are you taking me? You hear that, Curly? She wants to know where I'm taking her. What are you going to do with me? That's one of those things. One of which things? Why do you use euphemisms? I beg your pardon. Why did you come out and say what you mean? Why don't you admit you're going to kill me? Most people, you know, they don't like to hear the real words. Well, why do you want to kill me? I don't want to kill you. I have to kill you. Why? You know why. Because I can identify you as the murderer of Cleveland Rogers. I tell you, Curly, this is a dame that lays it right in there. Suppose I promise you I won't do that. Yeah? Yes. What do you think I was doing on that platform last night? I never gave it a thought. I was running away from my husband. With Rogers? No. But the man didn't show up. He's a chump. Then you came along and killed Mr. Rogers. If I identify you, then I'll have to answer a certain question. Namely, what were you doing on the station that hour of the night? Exactly. And it would be better for me if that question never came up. I'm married to a very conservative man. I see the diagram. So, I will give you my word that I will never testify against you. And that should solve the problem. Yeah, it should. But it won't. It won't? Why not? In the first place, if I knock you off, I know you'll never testify against me. And I only bet on sure things. But it's against my own interest to identify you. I would never endanger my marriage. I know you say I that. mean it. You think you mean it. But you can't beat the way you were raised. Which was straight. Sooner or later, your conscience is going to start to bother you. You're going to have to do the right thing. You can't fight the way you're made. And you're going to suffer plenty, too. So look, believe me, what I'm going to do, it's going to be the best for the both of us. Hey, Curly, it's a cop's car in back of us. Step on it. Hey, he's gaining on us. Let me bust out the rear window. See if I can stop him. I'll knock that chump off the road. They can't shoot back at us. They'll be scared of the dame. Ah, that made him think twice. Watch me bag him with the next shot. Hey, 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 let go. No. Let go of me, you crazy no. dame. Let go of my arm. I'll kill you. You'll kill me anyhow. I'll kill you now. Try it. You crazy dame. You, behind the wheel. You, Curly. I've got this gun pointed at your head, and I think you better slow down. That's it. Now pull over. Go on, pull over to the side. Mrs. Merriweather, you okay? Here. Yeah. Please take this gun. I think I'm going to faint. <laughs> It was self-defense, so you're in the clear. But, uh, will I get my name in the papers? Well, we decided for your own safety to keep you out of it. The papers will say he was killed in a high-speed chase. Oh. 
So, Mrs. Merriweather, I think you're out of it. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you for everything. You never did tell me how you happened to come along at the right time. <laughs> there was nothing to it. I watched you come out of the phone booth and head for the rear exit. I drove around the block just as the cab was pulling away from the curb. Oh, I, um, I guess this is goodbye. Yes. Goodbye, Mrs. Merriweather. Alicia, my dear. Albert, you're back. Yes, yes, I've had enough of the convention. Oh, Albert, may I present, um, uh, Lieutenant Berger? Of the, uh, police? Uh, yes, yes, I, uh... I'm selling tickets for the police department dance. Oh, well, let's buy some, by all means. Well, I already have. Oh, thank you so much. And good night. No, don't bother. I can let myself out. <laughs> you know, uh, when I heard he was a police officer, for a moment I was afraid something might have happened. Why, Albert, darling, what could possibly happen? <laughs> uh, tell me... How did you spend your time tonight, eh? Oh, it was just another quiet evening at home. Has Alicia learned her lesson? I don't know. Does anyone ever really learn a lesson? You think she'll be happy with Albert now? Will she have her head turned by the next handsome guy who happens along? Another thought. Albert, was he really at a convention? Who can tell? All I know is I'll be back before you have a chance to miss me. a moral to our story, and that is, it may be good to be born intelligent, but it's better to be born lucky. Good looks will probably take a lady further than mere virtue. Consider most of the ladies who have made it in this world. As a rule, were they homely and virtuous, or lucky and beautiful? Well, homely or handsome, intelligent, virtuous, or fortunate, or whatever, you are all welcome to assemble with us here. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Robert Dryden, Leon Janney, and Earl Hammond. Entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. And if you want to join me, join me. Just remember one thing, son. From this day forward, till I give you the nod, we never saw each other any time, anywhere. <laughs> was a night, moon up or moon down, that I don't ache for you, Rainbow. Why did you leave me behind? Yes, yes, Mrs. Moonlight, I know, I know, she's gone. Time for you and me to take the little sleep. The big one is not scheduled for us yet. The future is still ordained. I wonder what it holds. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... where all men meet sooner or later is the grave. It's the place where all roads end. That small model of the barren earth which serves as paste and cover to our bones. What happens then when two old friends meet beyond the grave? When one of them has been living under the threat of death by the other? A threat from the grave? A threat made in a crowded courtroom more than 20 years ago. If not for you, Sammy, I'd have got away with it. But you'll pay for it with your life. My name ain't Johnny Promise for nothing, kid. So just keep your eye on the calendar. Count the days one by one. Because I tell you, after I get mine, I'll see to it that you got no more than one month to live. Remember... Johnny let you have it straight from the grave. Our mystery drama, Deadline for Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss and stars Michael Tolan and Joseph Julian. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Was the threat Johnny Promise made some minutes ago an empty warning? Can a dead man moldering under the damp earth for 20 years doom the life of another man? Can a corpse, long dead, wreak vengeance on another human being from the immeasurable distance of another world? We're about to find out as Johnny Promise talks to his old friend, Sammy Rogers. Sam? Sam Rogers? Answer me, Sam. Sam? It's so dark here, we can't see one another, but we can hear. There's nothing to be afraid of anymore. Sam? Why can't you leave me alone? (laughs) Nobody's bothering you, Sam. Nobody. Just someone to talk to is all. Old friends, old times' sake. Nothing wrong in that, is there? Is there? Nice to talk over old times. Friendly. Makes me feel good. Besides, what else is there to do in this place? I don't want to talk, Johnny. Not again. Oh, don't be unfriendly, Sam. Not here. Get your kick some other way. Leave me alone. Stop torturing me. It's been finished all over for a long time. Oh, tell me again how it was. Just one more time. Like what went wrong on our bank job? How we had it worked out so good? How some way we goofed? How the cops broke in on us and we began to run? How the big one took a shot at me and I shot back and let that cop have it right through the head? How they all started a target in on me? How I called you for help? And how you ran away? And ran and ran and ran? You did manage to save your own little neck, didn't you? Tell it to me again, Sammy. You've heard it a thousand times. I know, Sam, I know. And more than anything, I love the way you tell about the courtroom. That hot summer day, 19... 20 years ago, back in the 50s. I'll never forget that one. Especially your part. You'll never forget it either. Because as long as we're here together, I won't let you forget, Sammy. I won't let you. Johnny Promo, also known as Johnny Promise... A jury of your peers is found you guilty of the murder of Officer Cochran in the first degree. 
Are there any last words you would like to say before I pronounce sentence? Yes, Your Honor. But it's not for the court. It's for Sam Rogers sitting over there, star witness for the prosecution. You saved your own skin, Sammy, by squealing about me to the D.A. If not for you, I'd have got away with it. But you'll pay for it, Sammy boy, with your life. My name ain't Johnny Promise for nothing, kid. So keep an eye on the calendar. Count the days one by one. Because after I get mine, I'll see to it that you get no more than a month to live. Order! Maybe less Order. than a month, but not one minute more. Don't look so scared, Sammy. If you live past the month, you're safe. But I got a lot of friends and a lot of dough to toss around to those friends. Today you buy loyalty like you buy land chops, so don't count on more than a month. And when you get yours, remember Johnny Promise let you have it. Straight from the grave. Remember the date, Sam? The date the judge named for me to burn in the electric chair? I don't remember. Oh, that's not true. You remember? August the 28th. Five o'clock in the morning. Taps for Johnny Promise. A man with a coat of honor. A man whose word was a thing of respect. And above everything else... Your friend. Now, how could you forget that? You will never let me. And little Sammy with his big mouth made the whole thing happen, right? Cut it out, Johnny. I don't want to hear anymore. What do you get from tormenting me like this? <laughs> Laughs. And it passes the time. We got no place to go. We're going to be here for the rest of our... <laughs> Let's say for a long, long time. <laughs> and I like to laugh. And that story of yours is good for a million of them. Let's have it, Sammy boy. What was it like for you after I got mine? Come on, tell it just like it happened. Tell it. After the judge pronounced your sentence, I sat there in the courtroom like it was me he had sentenced. Cold sweat was pouring out of my body. I couldn't move. I could hardly breathe. All I could hear was your voice laughing and saying, a month to live. One month to live. I knew for sure that within the month after you burned, you'd see to it somehow that I got mine. So I holed up in that scrubby hotel room, way up on the ninth floor. And for two whole weeks, I didn't see anyone. I wouldn't answer the phone. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I wouldn't open the door. Except for Linda. She was the only one I could trust. It's me, Sam. Come in quick. Here's your dinner, Sam. Thanks, Linda. And today's newspaper? September the 12th. Fifteen days since Johnny... You've got to stop thinking about it. Stop thinking about it. By 5 a.m. of the 28th, I'll be a dead man. And it could come at any time, in a week, tomorrow, in an hour. But you've taken care, sweetie. Nobody can get at you up here. And once you get past the 28th, you're a free man. Johnny said so, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And he never broke his promise, did he? Yeah, that's what I'm counting on. But just the same, every morning I wake up after a bad night and I hear myself talking to myself. I say, today, today, will it be today? Is this my last day on earth? That's what's driving me crazy. Sam, you've got to find things to take your mind off of it. It's only another couple of weeks. And then... And then? We'll go away someplace. Far away. Start a whole new life. Why don't you eat something? It'll make you feel better. Uh, I'm not hungry. Maybe a little coffee while it's still hot. I got the change from the 20 you gave me. Forget it. It's right here in my bag. What are those? The keys. What keys? To this room. To this room? Oh, of course. Where did you get them? You gave them to me, don't you remember? I never gave you any keys to this room. Who gave you those keys? I told you, Sam, you did. You lousy little liar. Ah. Where did you get those keys? I don't know what you're talking about. He even got to you. Oh, Sam, how could you think that I... He got to that crummy desk clerk first, didn't he? And then to you. 
And you had the duplicate made. Who made the payoff? I said, who made the payoff? Sam, you're insane. Why would I ever do anything to hurt you? Because for 500, 1,000 bucks, you'd do anything. Now get out of here, you little tramp, but fast. Oh, you're wrong, Sam. You're wrong. I love you. Get out. Oh, wait, Sam. I don't need you or anybody. Get out before I kill you. It was the house phone. Not my private line with the unlisted number. Only two people ever knew that number. You, Johnny, and Linda. But this was from the lobby downstairs. I stood there listening to it ring. I didn't dare answer it. The sound began to bore a little hole into my brain. And finally... Yeah? Who was it? It's me, Sam. Linda. You? How could it be you? You just went out of the door. Where are you? In the lobby downstairs. I'm so glad you answered. How did you get down there so fast? Please, Sam, listen to me. I know how you felt about those keys, but you've got to trust me. Yeah, yeah, sure. How did you get to the phone so... You've got to get hold of yourself. Why don't you have the locks changed on your door? Why? For what reason? Call in a locksmith. Somebody who never heard of you, of me, of Johnny, anybody we know. Let him change the locks and give the keys only to you. One of a kind for each lock. No duplicates. Do that, Sam. Please. You know I'd never do anything to hurt you. Yeah, sure, sweetie. That's a good idea. I don't know what got into me. What made me think that you... I'm sorry, Linda, for everything. You call a locksmith, yes? First thing in the morning. I'll be seeing you, Sam. Huh? Oh, yeah, Linda. Right. <laughs> That was real tricky of you, Johnny. Leading me to suspect that Linda might be the one you'd pick to get me. After I put the phone down, an idea came to me. Hit me like a thunderbolt. Made the best sense of anything in the past couple of weeks. What was the point of living holed up like a rat? Like a sitting duck in that lousy hotel room, waiting. Just waiting for you, Johnny, to make me a target for whoever you paid off to let me have it. For once you thought Johnny Promise is going to be outsmarted, right? For once you thought Johnny Big Mouth was going to meet his match. How could you have been so dumb? Why hadn't I thought of it before? All I had to do, Johnny, was to find out who it was you picked to put the finger on me. Once I knew who it was, I could take care of him before he ever got the chance to get to me. Pretty good thinking, Johnny, right? And I knew the first and best place to start looking. alley was one of the crowd's favorite hangouts. If your man was any place, Johnny, this was it. I noticed a couple of familiar faces. Hi, Benny. What's new? How's the wife? Hey, Tommy. Putting on a little weight, huh? Better take it easy with a beer. What do you say, Benny? How's the score? Still over 250? Every one of them. They just walked away, didn't they? Wherever you went, the guys moved away, turned their backs on you without a word. Like you were some kind of bad news, some kind of disease. I went to the bar to order a drink. A beer, Joey. You'd known Joey, the bartender, for years. He gave you your drink without so much as a word. I swallowed my beer, and as I did, I spotted little red Mike down at the other end of the bar. I never liked him from the first time I met him. And everybody knew he never liked you. Something about him, his beady little eyes looked at you like a rat. I walked over to him. Without saying anything, he started to move away from me. I grabbed him by the back of the neck. Don't you walk away from me, you little louse. I know what you're up to. Hey, let go of me. What do you think you're doing? It's you, ain't it? You're the one. You're the one he picked to do his job. What are you talking about? Get your hands off of me. I don't know what you're saying. You sniveling, two-faced rat. You thought I was afraid of you, huh? <laughs> I'm going to let you have it. This minute, before you get me, Johnny promises a little stooly. Keep your hands where they are, Mike. Hey, you're crazy, Sam. Johnny's dead. Put that gun down. Please. Oh. I don't know what you're thinking, but you're making a big mistake. Would a smart crooked like Johnny ever have picked somebody like me to do what you're thinking? Put your gun down and frisk me. Come on. If you don't believe me, frisk me, Sammy. Okay. <laughs> So I made a mistake. But from now on, stay out of my way, understand? Whatever you say. But you really ought to take it easy. 
because you know as well as I do, when your time comes, you'll go. Just like everybody else. Johnny, that's your voice coming out of Red Mike's mouth. Meantime, we got to take care, don't we, Sammy? What kind of crazy trick are you pulling, Johnny? And you can count on me for the best care a fella ever had. Like they say in the cemetery, Sammy. Perpetual care. I promise. There's a delicate little mechanism inside the heads of all of us. When you're threatened by an overpowering fear, for example, whatever or whoever is the cause of that fear turns the little machine on. And wherever you go, you see that person. Hear his voice, feel his touch. Like what's happening to Sammy, right? Just how far and to what ends will the little machine drive Sam Rogers? We'll find out shortly when we return with Act Two. One of the great mysteries is time. It often happens that time seems never to move forward when the minutes are suspended in some terrifying space and refuse to move. And then there is that silent, never resting thing called time that rolls on, rushes along, swift as an ocean tide on which we and the whole universe ride. For Sam Rogers, time was beginning to take on a new meaning. The end of the month was getting closer and closer. The days were racing by. Every night I shut my eyes to try to get just a couple of hours sleep. But I kept myself awake thinking. What were you thinking, Sammy? Tell me. That I had to find the guy you picked. The guy that was going to let me have it. I kept telling myself, get to him before he gets to you. And there'll be nothing to worry about. Sooner or later, I had to find him. Once you made your mind up about that, you began to feel a whole lot better. Yeah, I began to live almost a normal life again. Like the day I went to the custom shop to get fitted for a couple of new suits. I congratulate you on your choice of materials. The uh, silver mohair and silk will make up into a perfectly lovely suit. And uh, so will the tweed. And don't forget the extra padding on the shoulders. Well, if you'll forgive me, it's the natural look this year. The real look of the 50s. No padding. Extra padding on the shoulders. Well, of course, as you wish. I wish. Certainly, certainly, sir. Now, if you'll just uh, stand still for a moment while I drape this material over your shoulder. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Hey, let go of my arm. Put that please. scissors down. Drop it, I tell you. Drop it. <clears throat> well, all I was trying to do, sir. I know what you were trying to do. Well, I'm very sorry, sir. Very sorry. I assure you it won't happen again. But you see, you see, Sammy. You got to realize it could be anybody. Anybody at all. It was happening again. The tailor who was standing there in front of me, right in the middle of a sentence, it was your voice that was coming out of him. Your words. And there was that day in Luigi's barber shop. I hadn't been to the barber in weeks. Luigi had been my barber for 15 years. There was one guy in the world I could trust. It was him. And that's what the guy on the radio says, Sam. If we get the same kind of heat tomorrow like we have today, it's going to set some kind of record. Imagine, the end of September, 96 degrees. Yeah, that's what they call real Indian summer. <laughs> if it don't cool off, Sam, they can give this summer back to the Indians. <laughs> you understand? I sweated out every stroke of that sharp razor. While Luigi went droning on about the weather, I held my breath, thinking he may be my friend. He was your friend too, Johnny. No, so... My eyes are shut. All he has to do is to let that blade slip just one little bit. Accidentally, you know. All right, chin up a little higher, Sam. Just a little more. And who would know the difference? Ah, there we go. Let me just lower the chair a little, huh? Hey, what are you doing? Well, like always, a nice hot towel. Opens up all of the pores. When they're open, a little lotion closes them up again. He could have let me have it right then and there while he was shaving me. But he didn't. When he wrapped that hot towel over my face, instead of it feeling good, 
I suddenly got the idea that this could be it. Luigi could smother me to death. And there I sat, helpless, beneath that hot towel. I ripped it off, screaming, You thought you had me, didn't you, huh? You and your hot towel. What's the matter with you? Here's what you can do with your towel. Hey. I'll have to think up something better than that. Well, you'll never get the chance. You've seen me here for the last time. I don't know what you're talking about, Sam. But it won't do you no good. Getting excited this way. It was your voice again, Johnny. You gotta learn to calm down, take things easy. Listen to me, Sam. Easy does it. After all, there's only three more days to go. Right? all the way back to my hotel. I got to my room, I opened the door, and I slammed it shut. Oh, my lungs were bursting. I sucked in whatever air I could in big gulps. There was a sharp pain in the middle of my chest, like a knife sticking right into me. But I was safe. Nobody could get at me here. Never mind that idiotic idea of trying to find out who was supposed to put the finger on me. Just sit it out. Sit it out. Right here. Right here, I told myself. Play it safe. But when I looked around the room, I knew that I was not safe. Even here. There was a peculiar feeling about the place. You couldn't say exactly what it was until you looked to see what time it was. And then I saw that my little electric clock on the dresser was turned around with its face to the wall. And it was unplugged. In the bathroom, there was broken glass sitting on the sink. Somebody had been there, that's for sure. No, no maids. I never let the maids in. Maids or anybody else. Except Linda. Linda was right. She was right. I had to get those locks changed today without waiting another hour. Well, yes, sir, they may cost you a little more, but, you know, you got the best and safest locks American ingenuity can devise. Well, this makes me feel a whole lot better. Now, when you turn the key, this pin tumbler drops right down into the holes that are waiting for them. Huh? And there you are, safe and sound. <laughs> now you should have real peace of mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, here are your keys, one for each lock. No duplicates, just like you ordered on the phone. Good, that's fine. Uh... Take my advice, sir. Change your mind. Get duplicates made. I don't want any duplicates. Well, it might be a lot of trouble to get them later on. Each key is made on a special machine. The formula of each key is registered. It's the way I want it. But supposing you lose one of them. The only way you're ever going to get in is to call me, which might be somewhat inconvenient for you. Now, suppose you got a real friendly date. You've had a fine dinner... Why was he giving me this big song and dance about the possibility of a lost couple of keys? Why was this guy, guy I'd never seen before, picked the address right out of the yellow pages? Why was he so anxious for me to order duplicate keys? And that's why I recommend you have another pair made. I have no intention of losing these keys. Well, no one ever wants to, but take my advice. I don't want your advice. And suddenly it hit me. This could be the guy you picked to get me. By some crazy coincidence. Who was he, anyway? Somebody I'd picked out of the phone book. And that's why he was selling me this bill of goods about duplicate keys. And the whole thing was a big put-on. Here, here's your money. Thank you. Well, whatever you say, you're the boss. Now, get out of here. Get out before I throw you out. Well, if, if anything should happen, don't say I didn't warn you. A door you can't get into could turn out to be a matter of life and death. But maybe you're right. If someone really wants to get in there... I don't know how you did it, but that trick with the voices was driving me up the wall. I guess a little thing like a couple of keys is not going to stop them. We both know that, Sammy. Don't we? It was trapped. It was bad enough the way it was before. Now with the locks changed by this strange guy, the walls began closing in on me. The room got smaller and smaller. The air I tried to breathe burned my lungs. I threw open the window and took a deep breath. But it didn't do any good. It's like a fire inside of me. If I could only get a little sleep, I would try to face what the next day might bring. After a while, I went into the bathroom. 
You stepped into the shower, turned on the water, right? Hard. Ah, the spray of the shower felt good. It seemed to wash away all the crazy things you were feeling. You gave yourself a good, brisk rub down with a heavy bath towel. Till my skin tingled and glowed from the rubbing. You thought, I'll brush my teeth and hit the sack for a good night's rest. And then... Then as I started to put the toothbrush into my mouth, there in the bathroom mirror, I saw something that blew my mind into little bits. The teeth I was brushing, the eyes that were watching what I did were not my teeth, not my eyes. They were not mine, Johnny. They were yours. <laughs> I'll never see that face in that mirror again. And then, instead of panicking, the funniest thing happened. Everything suddenly became clear. For the first time in weeks, my thoughts were not confused. It all came into focus. For the first time, it got to me that I was letting the whole pattern of my life be spelled out by a dead man. And where the day before, that idea would have hit you like a wallop in the pit of your stomach. Where yesterday, the idea would have made you dizzy and sick. Right that minute, as you looked at the mirror you just smashed, you realized... It didn't have to be this way, didn't you? It was a cinch from this point on. You'd been trying to rattle me, Johnny. But now I knew exactly what I had to do. And that was to stay just where I was, with the door locked, till the month was up. Tell me how you caught the dateline of the newspaper that was lying on the bed. How you stared at it. How it kept moving towards you. The print grew bigger and bigger. It exploded at me. Today was September 27th. One more day. One more day and the month would be over. And you, Johnny, would be out of my life forever. My head began to swim with excitement. I kept telling myself, live through this one day, Sammy. Get through this night. And then five o'clock tomorrow morning, you've got it made. What made me so absolutely 100% sure? Simple. Johnny Promise never went back on his word, right? Right. I made a grab for the phone. Front desk, can I help you? Uh, what time is it, exactly? Exactly 11.15 p.m. You sure? I just checked it with the radio. I'll set my clock. It, uh, it stopped. And today's the 27th? It'll be the 28th and three quarters of an hour at midnight. And don't forget... Thank you very to... much. Uh, uh, by the way, the young lady just came in. She's standing here at the desk. She'd like to talk to you. Uh, what young lady? Oh, your young lady. Oh, oh, uh, put her on. How are you feeling, Sam? It couldn't be better. A couple hours more and it'll all be over. What are you doing down there in the lobby? I thought I'd be close in case you needed anything. Well, uh, why don't you get us a couple of hamburgers and coffee? Right away. See you soon. He's feeling great, he says. Well, that's nice for a change. He's sure that in only a few hours he'll be a free man again. Poor guy. Why don't you tell him? I couldn't. I don't know what he'd do if he knew. Anyway, he'd never believe me. It might be the best way. Tell him the truth. How could I tell him that he's a very sick man? That his whole sense of time is mixed up, confused. That he doesn't know one day from another. In the state he's in... How could I possibly tell him that Johnny Promise actually went to the electric chair almost three years ago? Does one tell a dying man what he's about to meet or keep the secret from him? I suppose it depends on how you see death. If you look at it as a friend, you entertain it. If it comes as an enemy, you prepare to overcome it. Death has its greatest advantage when it comes as a stranger, as it may or may not be coming to Sam Rogers. We'll know the answer when we return shortly with Act Three. said, a man is never less alone than when he is alone. Thoughts crowd in on him. 
his imagination summons up multitudes. And which is harder to bear? The fear of loneliness, or as in the case of Sam Rogers, the loneliness that comes from fear. Somewhere in a lonely graveyard, a cold wind whistles over the moonlit tombs. From a purgatory of his own making, Sam Rogers is forced by Johnny Promise for the 10,000th time to recreate the path of his downfall. In my hotel room, I kept staring at the clock on my dresser. The hands didn't seem to move at all. They smoothed so slowly. And then it was midnight. Midnight at last, right on the nose. Only five more hours to five o'clock. That was when you got yours, Johnny. 5 a.m. And here I was. It was five hours short of the deadline you'd set for me. Five hours, five years. My blood went cold. Little bumps on the back of my neck. My throat scratchy and dry. I wasn't about to fall for any more of your tricks, Johnny. Smart boy. You sat there on the bed waiting... You weren't going to answer. The knocking kept on louder and louder with more and more force. You sat so still the muscles in your back and legs began to stiffen and ache. There was a dull pounding at the base of your skull. Finally, you saw the sheet of paper come sliding under the door. Four words written in red with what seemed to be lipstick. It's me, Linda. Open. Carefully, quietly, I got off the bed. Went to the door and I whispered, Who is it? It's me. Open the door. Did you forget? The hamburgers and the coffee? Get in, quick. Are you all right? Fine. Here's your coffee. Light. The way you like it. And no sugar? No sugar. The rare hamburger is yours. In less than five hours, Linda, we're going to leave this town for good. Never want to see it again. We'll start all over again, fresh. Maybe Alaska or Mexico. <laughs> Whatever you say, Sam. We talked of our plans for the future, where we might go, what we'd do, the family we'd raise, pushing all other thoughts right out of our heads. It was exciting and beautiful. I looked at the clock again. Where had the time gone? It was a quarter to five. I said to Linda, uh, you've got to leave. Why? When I walk out that door, I want to do it alone. You understand why? Of course I understand. I'll meet you in about an hour at your place. Good night, Sam. The next time I looked at the clock, it was a couple of minutes past five. The time had come at last. I'd paid my dues. And I'd showed you up, Johnny Promise. For the first time, your word wasn't worth so much as one bent nickel. I mustn't take any chances. Not at this late date. A hundred and ten percent foolproof. Safe. Give myself every possible break. The benefit of every doubt. No chances. Give myself, uh, what? Half hour cushion? Wait till 5.30 at least. And beat it out of here. Fast and forever. And you hung on. Those last few minutes were the longest in your life, weren't they? Finally, that big hand on the clock dropped down to the six. It was 5.30. A half hour past the deadline I'd set for you. So you took a deep breath and you screamed. <laughs> you lost, Johnny. You lost. Sammy outsmarted you. So run away in your grave, bit by bit, piece by piece. Because I'm alive, Johnny. And I'm going to stay alive. But you, my friend, are dead. As dead as yesterday. 5.40. 20 minutes to 6. I turned the keys. First in one lock. Then the other. I flung open the door. I ran down the hallway. Rang for the elevator. When I got to my floor, the door opened. I took one last look behind me and got into the elevator car. But then you thought, the elevator man... Can I trust him? Was he dependable? Could he possibly? <laughs> no. No, that's all over and done with. I don't have to be afraid of anybody. Not anymore. You had your bad dream. You were finished with waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. The nightmare was over. 
The only thing that was real was that you were alive and breathing. What happened when the car reached the lobby floor? I rushed past the front desk out into the street. There was a chill, penetrating drizzle. It was still dark. The promise of a new day was doing its best to break through in the east. For the first time in I don't know how long, I felt able to slow down. I started walking in the direction of Linda's place. Slow, the sure, firm step. The streets were deserted. It figures. A Sunday morning, quarter to six. Wonderful feeling, wasn't it? Like the whole city belonged to you and you alone. That's right. The buildings took on a look of friendliness. Like I'd never seen them before. The traffic lights were changing from red to green, then back from green to red. But there was no traffic. Like a ghost city. Abandoned. And my own footsteps echoed behind me as I walked. Was it my imagination? I thought I heard two pair of footsteps following mine. But you didn't have the guts to turn around and look back. For a minute, you thought maybe they were your own footsteps echoing down those narrow streets. I stopped. They stopped. I started to walk. They started. I got to a corner and quickly turned into the other street. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw two men. It wasn't light enough to make out their faces. They weren't saying a word. They just seemed to have their minds on one thing, to keep me in their sight no matter where I went. My heart stopped. There they were, less than 50 feet behind me, following, following. A sickening thought came to me, terrifying. Tell me about it. It's possible, I thought. Anything is possible. Suppose, just suppose in some crazy way that I made a mistake. Suppose my clock had been wrong. I think it's a quarter to six, but I suppose... Then all of a sudden you found yourself passing the jewelry shop. You looked up at the big clock that hung over the entrance. I almost passed out with what I saw. I swallowed hard. My mouth felt like it was stuffed with cotton wadding. I looked up once more to make sure. And what did you see? The clock said a quarter to five. A quarter to five, not six. Something was wrong, wasn't it? The whole thing was like crazy. How could it be? And those two faceless men were still there following you. There was a bank on the opposite corner. I raced across to look at the clock outside the bank. I couldn't believe what I saw. That clock, too, said a quarter to five. Then I began running. I didn't know where. I didn't care. If those clocks, for some insane reason, were right, and I was wrong. Then I still owed you 15 minutes, Johnny. You still had 15 minutes to get me. And those two men following me. Oh, it can't be, I told myself. Those clocks are both crazy. It's a quarter to six. It has to be. You checked and double-checked. And then something like a heavy sledgehammer hit you right between the eyes. Sammy, you stupid, ignorant dummy, you said to yourself. How could you be so blind? How could you have missed it? That's what the desk clerk was trying to tell you. It was the last Sunday in September. In those days, daylight savings time ended at 2 o'clock in the morning. The last Sunday in September. Of course. And those clocks had all been turned back one hour. Only I forgot to turn my clock back. It is a quarter to five. It's five, not six. You crazy fool, you thick skull, brainless imbecile. You deserve to die. Now we're getting to the best part, ain't we, Sammy? You began to walk, right? Slow at first, then a little faster. Finally breaking into a run. Whenever you got to a corner, you turned. When you saw an alley, you ran into it. When there was a fence, you vaulted over it. Then out into the streets again. But no matter what you did, wherever you went, those same two characters stuck to your tail. You couldn't shake them. They stuck right behind me, always the same 50 feet away. I kept running until I thought my sides would burst. And then way off in the distance, I heard the deep-throated bombs of a church bell striking the hour. I stopped running. I waited. I counted. Come on, six. Come on, six. Ah! That was it, Sammy boy. You doubled up and fell to the pavement. You never got to the count of six. Because there wasn't any six. You dropped right there where you were standing, right? 
Your body crumpled up like a little rag doll. It was all over just like I promised. Except for one thing. One little thing. Remember, Sammy? I remember. Tell me how it was, Sammy. I dropped, like you said. And then? The two men rushed up. One of them felt my pulse. And the other, my heart. And there was no pulse. There was no heartbeat. I was dead. Go on, Sam. One of the men got up from where he'd been kneeling over my body. Turned slowly to the other fella and said, He's dead all right. And not a mark on him. Uh, that big newspaper delivery truck passed by. Backfired. Just backfired. And this guy drops dead. I guess we'd better call the police. So Johnny kept his word after all, didn't he? And even today, from where he is now, he keeps assuring the rest of his companions. It's like it's my code of honor. Once I give my word, I never break it. That's why they still call me Johnny Promise. Right, Sammy? Right, Johnny. Oh, and, uh, Sammy. Yeah? Tomorrow I want you to tell me the whole story all over again. From the very beginning. Right? Right. I'll be back shortly. Johnny had promised he was going to give Sammy the best of care. Everlasting, perpetual care. Which is exactly what happened. Before he uh, passed away, Johnny signed a contract with the cemetery to provide Sammy Rogers' grave with perpetual care. Weeds removed, flowers four times a year, neat and beautiful till the end of time. Always a man of his word. Our cast included Joseph Julian, Michael Tolan, June Gable, and Guy Rep. production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. This is the Mass of Saint-Cécile. I couldn't bear to look, Father Giles. I couldn't. And yet I couldn't bear not to look. And when he raised the host high for us to see, I couldn't believe what he held in his hands. So to your knees, Louise. But that is not the host. It's black. Black and three-pointed. On your knees, Louise. Oh. This is the mass of Saint-Cécile. The awful mass had started at 11, and now it was drawing to a close as the hour of midnight struck. It is over, Louise. And Peter Sorrell has begun to die. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. All the world loves a love story... Adventure is absorbing, mystery is marvelous, and suspense is superb. But of all the categories, give me first the tale of the old house, the creaking stairs, the wind that moans about the eaves like a human voice, and the jagged flashes of lightning that tantalizingly reveal only the suggestion of the shapeless white figure gliding through the driving rain. The ghost story. Such a one as I bring you now. It's her, the woman in the mirror. Help! Please! Help! We shouldn't have locked her away, Christopher. She's trying to tell us something. Help! Help! Our mystery drama, Legacy of Guilt, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Roberta Maxwell. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The house is some 40 miles outside New York, perched on a bluff over the Hudson. An easy hour's commute... It is a perfect example of American Victorian, with fancy gingerbread moldings, surrounded by a wide porch, the steep roof crowned by a useless tower room. It is rambling without being large, and stands in considerable disrepair, a situation that Tom and Angie Barr, two young New York actors who have just become parents as well as new householders, intend to repair. Tom, what are you doing? Oh, I, uh... Overcut one of the shelves a smidge, so I'm backing it off with a wood rasp. I don't mean that. It's after dinner, and this is supposed to be your day of rest. Angie, Sunday's the only night off I get from the play. Exactly. So you ought to spend it with me, to say nothing of your son. Honey, I spent all day with you and the baby. That was a hardship? Oh, come on. You know it wasn't. Hey, what's the matter with you? Something wrong with uh, his nibs? No, he's fine. Sleeping like a... A uh, uh, baby? <laughs> <laughs> what else? Oh, darling. Uh, Angie. <sighs> Tom, darling, I don't care what you do with your spare time. You just have so little of it. But I do want you to relax. Mm, look at who's talking. You can't kid me anymore since I had the baby. It took Christopher to teach me how to slow down. This time off from the soap opera has been invaluable to me. Mm, this building and remodeling is good for me. It's a uh, sort of therapy. It looks like hard, tiring work to me. But it isn't. It's a joy. It's a real challenge. Like uh, these shelves I'm building into these two alcoves. They're going to be wonderful. We've got crates of books, and the shelves balance the ones around the fireplace on the opposite wall. Now, that's just the point. Why does the wall stick out in the middle here a couple of feet? I thought we knew all about that. It's because the big kitchen fireplace backs up on this, and the stick-out part here is the chimney and the flue. That's what I thought at first, but look, what if it was a double flue, and behind this is a second living room fireplace? So? What if it is? Angie, can't you see? If the living room here had opposing fireplaces, how how it'd make the room uh, stunning instead of just plain marvelous. <laughs> I see what you mean. Hmm. But wouldn't it be a terrible amount of work? <laughs> I'm not suggesting we start tonight. Good. Because I want you to come up to the attic with me. I've been finding all sorts of interesting stuff up there. Mm, like what? Something that would please me... And make me happy if it could be salvaged. An old mirror and vanity. 
I thought they might be just right in the bedroom. Mm, if there's anything connected with the bedroom I haven't provided so far, by all means. <laughs> you <let's>, uh, idiot. <laughs> come on, darling. <laughs> let's have a look at your vanity <laughs> in the attic. I suppose what I found is ours. Didn't the house come as is? As far as I know. Well, it isn't all that great. I'll show you. Uh, <clears throat> see, there's a light somewhere. It's overhead, right in the middle. Half a sec. Uh, there. <clears throat> oh, gesundheit. <laughs> Why, there's enough dust. I don't think anyone's been up here except me in the last 50 years. Yeah, more like the last century. There's a sort of a little lost alcove over here between the eaves and the chimney wall. The stuff's in here. Uh, uh, shall I drag it out? Would you mind? Uh, 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 here's your vanity thing. Ooh, <laughs> heavier than it looks. Gesundheit! Uh, <laughs> turn about is fair play. Still, maybe uh, some tortured spirit from the past is trying to tell us something. What? <laughs> Amidst the dust of ages, from out the grave I cry, open not the pages, let sleeping vanities lie. What's that from? <laughs> I made it up myself. <laughs> okay, I lugged out your dressing table. Does it still grab you? You know what it is? That's mahogany inlaid with rosewood. And look at that marvelous three-quarter length oval mirror. Uh, what about the rest of the junk in here? I don't think it's anything we'd want. Except maybe the trunk. Hmm? What's in there? I don't know. I didn't know if I should open it. Or could. Oh, let's have a look. <gasps> oh, my. What is it? Faded old baby clothes. Oh, aren't they sweet? All handmade. <gasps> and? Well, they've never been used. Any of them. At least, I'm pretty sure not. <laughs> Anything we can use for Christopher? No. They're practically disintegrating. They must be a hundred years old. Anyway, I, I don't want Christopher in any hand-me-downs. Oh, honey, I was only kidding. Oh, look at this. What? An old photograph. Isn't she beautiful? Let me see. Yeah, she is. <laughs> you know why? What do you mean? She looks a lot like you. You see it? She does. Sort of. Only I'm not that pretty. Oh, don't you ever believe it. She looks awful sad, though. Her eyes are kind of... Haunted. Mm. Gives you a shivery feeling. I wonder what got her so uptight. Maybe these clothes were for her baby. And she lost it or something. So, uh, what do I do about this dressing table? Oh, just leave it till we know if it's ours to use. Yeah, check into it first thing tomorrow morning. A racket. It's a wonder I ever got the little king off for his nap. <laughs> I'm sorry, Angie. I just wanted to get this last shelf up before I get back to my uh, other profession. <laughs> I came down to remind you it's time to get showered, shaved, fed, and off for the theater. Okay. Uh, just one last thing before I go. What? Uh, stand back. I can't resist this. <laughs> Are you crazy? What are you doing? Just uh, proving I'm right. Ah, there. You see, there is a fireplace behind here. Okay, you convinced me. But did you have to make all this mess? I just had to convince myself. Leaving me to clean up. Well, I'll do it. You haven't time. Oh, darling, I'm sorry. Don't be. I'd work my fingers to the bone for this house. I love it. Are you sure? You know, it's going to be a tough commute once you're back on the TV series again. You working days, me nights at the theater. We'll be lucky to meet each other coming and going. It won't always be like that. And it's worth it. This is all I ever wanted. Oh, by the way, who was on the phone? Huh? 
Oh, 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 uh, that was uh, Marge from Copley Realty. She got in touch with Mr. Kiever. Who? McChesney Kiever, the old boy who owned this house before we bought it. Says he doesn't know anything about the things we found in the attic, and we're welcome to him. That's wonderful. Mm. Now, you want to uh, lug your famous vanity down to the bedroom before I go clean up? Doesn't it look magnificent? There's no question. It's a handsome piece of furniture in its way. I know it's old-fashioned and Victorian, Tom. But that's its charm. It fits the room. It just sits there by the wall as though it belonged there. If you like it, I like it. And I really do, anyway. It's uh, an unexpected bonanza. Hey, I can't hang around here admiring it. I'm going to miss half hour tonight. Go on and have your shower. What are you going to do? Oh, just take a sponge and clean up the mirror a bit. Well, why don't you do it tomorrow instead? You look tired. Oh, I have it away. Don't know what it is. Although your son and heir did keep me up quite a bit last night. Maybe he's uh, having a tooth? Oh, <laughs> Four and a half weeks? Idiot. <laughs> Go shave. Okay, okay. <sighs> okay, old mirror. Let's see what a little elbow grease and soap can do. <laughs> Come on. We've got to do better than that. It's like looking at someone underwater. Come clean. That's better. That... Oh, oh no. That's not me. That's... Uh, who are you? Who do you want? Who... What is it? What's wrong? Look. Where? In the mirror. What? Can't you see? Well, yes, a, a reflection. It's it's who? not very good, sort of wavy, but... Well, but who is it? Who is it? Well, you, darling, of course. Well, no, no, it's not me. Can't you see? It's her. Her? Who, who's her? The girl. The girl in the old faded photograph. The one in the trunk. What's the matter with you? Can't you recognize her? Angie, Angie, here, here. Uh, come away from that for a minute. No, I can't. Don't you see? She's trying to say something to uh, me. Lie down for a while. Here, l let me hold you. Don't make me leave here. She's counting on me. Now just rest for a moment. You've got nothing to worry about. All right. If you'll just... Just do one thing. What? Look in the mirror again. What? Well, sure. If it'll make you feel better. What do you see? Well, nothing but my own reflection, half shaved, with uh, soap sticking to my face. I don't believe you. Let me look. All right. What do you see? Angie, what do you see? Nothing. But... But my own reflection. But a moment ago, I... Oh, Tom, what's the matter with me? Am I going out of my mind? What is the answer to Angie's question? The only thing one can see in a mirror is a reflection. But supposing, just supposing, you looked in a mirror and found a totally different person staring back at you. Someone who must have been dead long ago. Would your reaction have been so different from Angie Barr's? I shall return shortly with Act Two. In the quiet bedroom, Tom sits holding Angie's hand. She lies in the bed, immobile, perhaps asleep. Tom's eyes are gloomy and brooding, his gaze fixed on the mirror on the vanity, his brow crinkled with concern. 
Now Angie opens her eyes. Tom? Yes, Angie? Forgive me. I don't know what got into me. Neither do I. That's what worries me. It is crazy, isn't it? I guess it was the trunk full of the baby clothes. Stored away and never used. That kind of hit me. I mean, supposing anything had happened to Christopher, I'd... I'd have had the same collection in my... Oh, Angie, stop it. Don't think that way. Thank the Lord we don't have to. But I do understand the way that poor girl must have felt. Honey, we don't even know if it was her baby. Or even if she had one in the first place. <laughs> hey, look at the time. I've got to get you some dinner and get you on the train for New York. Uh, no, I'm not going to the theater tonight. <sighs> what do you mean you're not going? You've got to. It's in your contract. Well, the standby can go on. I'm calling in sick. I can't leave you alone up here, Angie. Not... Not after what happened. I'll be all right. Honest, Tom. Look, I I'll prove it. I'm looking in the mirror, and what do I see? Me. That's all. And I look like something the cat dragged in. Mm, one good reason I'm not leaving you. You can't be alone. I'm not alone. I've got Christopher. Well, I suppose you had another wing ding who'll take care of him. All right. I'll get someone over here to be with me. Marge or someone. But I can't let you miss a performance because of me. Please, Tom. I'd never forgive myself. Okay. Just so long as there's someone here with you. Oh, isn't he a killer? Hey there, Tiger. Say hello to your Andy Marge. What is this kid weigh? Eight pounds, twelve and three quarter ounces. Oh, you better call the Giants. They could draft him for defensive tackle. <laughs> He's not going to be a football player. Come on, Marge. Give him to me. It's his bedtime. Oh, this man is raring to go. He's not going to sleep. He will once we leave. <laughs> I uh, want to take a gander at this famous mirror and the vanity. I, um... Think maybe I don't want to be around it anymore tonight. Oh, okay, skip it. But, uh, you know, as the realtor who sold you this house, I feel responsible. Well, just because I had a sudden attack of the crazies? I don't know what got into me. Oh, neither do I. Oh, that is a beauty. Any idea of what this thing's worth? I didn't think about that. I just had an urge to bring it down here into the bedroom. Mm. Of course, the mirror's pretty well shot, but you can have that replaced. <laughs> I don't wonder you saw visions in it. It's like looking down a well. It's not that bad. Just a couple of spots where the backing is worn off. Oh, and the ripple effect. Phew. I know I'm no beauty, but I get a load of that rattled old bag that's staring back at me. Let's see what it does for you. Go on, go ahead. Sit down. I'm uh, not so anxious to look in it. You might as well. It used to the fact that it makes everybody look like someone else, more or less. Oh, that isn't pretty one. my face I'm looking at. Just as good as you What's are she trying to say to me? And that it wouldn't Why does she reach out her arm? A Angie? Angie, what happened to you? Where'd you go? Uh, nothing. I, uh... I'm right here. You... You saw her again. Saw who? The woman in the mirror. Yes, Marge. I... I saw her. Now listen to me. You just thought you saw her. You couldn't have. I was right here looking into the mirror and I didn't see anything but you. Just the same. She was there. But she couldn't be. I didn't see her. You say Tom didn't. But I saw her. If she is a real person... I never said she was real. You mean she... She's a ghost? Oh, come off it, Angie. There's no such thing. If there isn't, it means I'm hallucinating. Either there's a ghost that lives in that mirror and is trying to tell me something, or... I'm just plain crazy. Oh, of course you aren't. But maybe... Well, you know, having the kid moving, worried about your career, you just got uh, nervous. I wish there was some way I could help, but you... 
Got to see your doctor for this, Angie. I have an appointment with him tomorrow. Good. I, I wish there was something I could do. You can help me, March. How? You sold us this house. Well, if I'd had any idea that... I'm not the... blaming you. I just want to... Do you think you could arrange for me to meet the old gentleman who owned it? Oh, honey, I never even met him myself. It was all done through lawyers. Can I meet the lawyer so I can get around to seeing him? Well, what do you want to see him for? I want to ask him about this vanity and the mirror and a trunk with some baby clothes and who it is in the picture I have. <laughs> Angie, you didn't have to wait up for... Oh, well, I'm sorry, Marge. I uh, saw the light here in the living room. I thought it was Angie. Oh, she just went upstairs a minute. Your son and heir was kicking up a storm. Well, I didn't mean for you to stay so late with Angie. Oh, I would not have left that beautiful wife of yours for anything till you got home. Why? D uh, did something happen? Oh, it sure did. She thought she saw something in that mirror again. How do you know? Well, I was in the room as she was putting Chris down for the night, and... Like a fool, I wanted to have a close look at the piece of furniture. I said something about the mirror being so decrepit. Anyone would look a fright in it. But you know me, that wasn't enough hangnail psychology. I conned her into sitting down and looking at herself in it, just to show it was a plain, ordinary mirror. And before you knew it, she was off on some kind of a trip. You said she saw something in it? Yeah, the, the same woman. Tom, you got to make sure that, that girl of yours gets to the doctor. Uh, she has an appointment with him in the morning. Uh, I was going to babysit while she went. No, look, I'll be glad to babysit for you, Tom. You just make sure she tells the doctor about this fantasy of hers or whatever it is. And... This reflection in the mirror, or this woman who seems to appear, isn't anyone you know. No, Doctor. Well, that is, in a way. I mean, she looks like me, sort of. And also like the picture of the woman Angie found in an old trunk in the attic. Uh, the one with all the unused baby clothes. Yes. What do you think it could be, Doctor? Well, instead of that, let me tell you what I think it isn't. What's that? You're a relatively new patient for me, Mrs. Barr, but... All the records I've received on you from Dr. Frazier, they indicate that you're a healthy, well-balanced young woman. But you are an actress, and you have just had a baby. I don't see what that's got to do with it. I think I do. This mysterious visitor has appeared twice. Once, right after you'd found the old trunk full of baby clothes, and the picture of a woman who, I must say, does look remarkably like you. Very beautiful woman, I might add. Mm, has to be, if she looks like Angie. I agree. Now, Mrs. Barr, you say yourself that you immediately leap to the conclusion that the woman in the picture was a mother who'd lost her baby. Doesn't it seem logical? It could also be logical that this was a woman who couldn't have the baby she wanted, or who had lost her husband before she could, or who lost her life before she could give birth, or... Well, there are many possibilities. The only important thing is that, as an actress, you were sensitive enough to fantasize immediately. You dreamed you saw her. You said you were tired and sleepy at the time. I wasn't tired when I saw her the second time. But you just put your baby to sleep. And unconsciously, this woman was again strongly in the back of your mind. Well, I'm not going to speculate anymore. All I can tell you is that, in my opinion... You're in the pink of good health. And I'd make one simple recommendation. What's that, Doctor? Get rid of the old vanity, Mr. Barr. And with that, I'm sure you'll get rid of your wife's hallucinations also. <sighs> Hello? It's uh, Tom, Angie. Are you all right? Tom, where are you? Aren't you at the theater? Yeah, yeah, it's intermission. I was worrying about you, so I just thought I'd call. Uh, what are you doing? I just finished feeding the baby, and I was putting him to bed. Uh, everything okay? Uh, I mean... Tom, I'm... we took the vanity back up to the attic, even though I felt kind of silly about it. So what could be wrong? Well, I don't know. I'm perfectly all right. I hope. Just wish I'd gotten a nurse for the baby so there'd be someone with you. Cheer up. 
She comes next Monday. I promise you, I'll make out till then. Yeah, well, oh, hang, they're calling places. Uh, Angie, uh, don't stay up for me. <sighs> I won't. As soon as I get Chris off, I'm going to bed myself. And stop worrying about me. I'll try. Angie? Yes? I love you. And I love you. This little darling. Were you jealous because I said I loved another man? <laughs> you know mommy loves you just as much. She knows just how wonderful you are and how much you mean to her. Oh, don't cry, honey. Mommy has you safe in her arms. <gasps> What's that? Well, it sounded as though someone cried out. No! Whatever she has seen in the mirror, Angie, clutching her child to her with one hand, has lunged forward and spun the glass towards the wall so violently that the mirror shatters into a thousand shimmering pieces. Like a wild animal, Angie rushes headlong down the stairs from the attic to lock herself and her baby in her bedroom. I shall return shortly with Act Three. All the way home in the train, Tom Barr has had this twisting of unease below his stomach. Most of us have felt this premonition at one time or another about someone we love, this kinetic feeling that can only be explained by ESP, or simple hunch. From the train, he has hurried to his car, driven to the house recklessly, calmed at the last moment by its quiet exterior as he turns into the drive, with only one light shining from the bedroom. Reassured, he parks the car and walks upstairs to the bedroom door. Oh, Tom, I'm so glad to see you home, darling. Oh, it's all right, Angie. Hey, you're trembling all over. What is it? Oh, it's my fault. What? What is? It happened... It happened just after you called me. I just... I just hung up when... Okay. Okay, <laughs> darling. Oh, Tom, I'm so sorry. I didn't want this to happen. What the hell? After I hung up, I went to talk to Christopher a moment. And suddenly I heard someone. Kind of far off, calling for help. I picked up the baby and went to the attic door to listen. Because it didn't seem like it was coming from outside. When I opened the attic door, it was louder. Are you crazy? You, you thought someone was inside the house and you... Who did you think it was? I didn't have to think. I knew it was her. Oh, no. I wasn't afraid then. I was only sorry for her. I mean, her voice was so sad and desperate. So I... I went up to the attic. For heaven's sake, why? I don't know, darling. I can't explain it. I could hear the voice, and it was echoey and, and strange. And sometimes I felt as if it was even coming from inside me. But I had to go. 
I had to respond to her call for help. You must have been out of your mind carrying the baby. I couldn't leave him alone. And I never thought, I... I never dreamed what could happen. Even after I... I saw her, I... You saw her? Where? In the mirror. When I turned on the attic light. It was... It was like looking through a window into someone else's house. Only it wasn't. It was this house. Our bedrooms. As though I was the one in the mirror and looking through from where the vanity was. Darling, Angie, don't try to go through she now. Was, she was coming through the door, just as you did now. And as if she'd been searching the house. She was crying. Crying out for someone to help her find her child. I wanted to help, only suddenly... Suddenly what? She saw me with the baby in my arms. And she rushed towards me, getting bigger and bigger, till I knew she was going to burst right through the frame. And I thought, she's going to take my baby. And I took the mirror, and I turned it swivel to make the glass face the wall, and I, I guess there wasn't room, so it... It smashed and the mirror flew everywhere. Hush, hush, Angie. It's all right. I'm here now. What are we going to do? Well, well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. One thing for sure. We are going to get out of this house. I don't think I'll ever feel safe again, Tom. Unless whoever she is finds her lost baby. <laughs> Angie. What are you doing? Oh, indulging in some emotional therapy, I guess. Anyway, since we'll have to sell a house, I've got to fix up this wall I broke through to the fireplace. I don't want to move, Tom. This is our house. Why should we be chased out of it? Well, I should think you could answer that easier than me, Angie. I can't help what I saw last night. What I heard. I didn't say you could. I'm not going to be driven out of my house. I won't let it happen. This is a problem that's got to be solved right here. Oh, uh, by the way, Marge called. What does she want? Oh, something about McChesney Kiever. You know, the old boy who owned the house before we bought it. She said he was anxious to talk to us. Well, to you. Did you, uh, ask her to contact him? Yes, I did. Why? Because he's my only hope to establish that there really is a ghost in this house. And perhaps give us a clue how she can be exorcised. <laughs> Angie, Tom, uh, this is Mr. Kiever. How kind of you to come. Mr. Kiever? Under the circumstances, there was little else I could do. Look, uh, why don't I leave you three together, huh? And go up and spend some time with Christopher? Would you, Marge? You're a lifesaver. <laughs> don't ask to see my badge. I failed Girl Scouts. Won't you sit down, Mr. Kiever? No, I think perhaps I'd rather stand... Ah, so you're breaking through that wall there. Yeah, yeah, I um, thought there had to be a fireplace behind there. Oh, no, please don't apologize. Any apologies in this room must come from me. You're perfectly right, of course, there is a fireplace. Oh, but you haven't opened it all the way yet. Well, matter of fact, having uh, satisfied myself my guess was right, I've been considering closing it up again. Ah, I see. Well, we shall leave that decision until I finish my confession. Confession? Whether the facts are proven true or not. From what Mrs. James has told me, since the discovery of the old vanity, you've been plagued by a series of inexplicable events. I'm ashamed to say I realize that I have visited upon you a legacy of guilt. I do wish you would sit down, Mr. Kiever. In due time, my dear. I'll try to make this as brief as possible. It's painful to me. My father was H. Haverford Kiever, a moving spirit in these parts. I was born, I always thought, in this house in 1895. I'm 84. 
Can I get you something to drink, sir? Um, some tea, some water? No, 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 let me finish. Uh, my father was something of a philanderer. Dear me, that, that sounds impossibly old-fashioned. But all those years ago, it was neither simple nor funny. Fortunately, he was rich. So, having got a certain young woman in trouble, when it became no longer possible to conceal her problem, he arranged to have her, what shall I say, um, domiciled nearby in his summer house. This house. That was the lovely young woman in the picture I found? By no means. That picture was of the woman I grew up believing was my mother. But she wasn't? Uh, bear with me. Alexandra, for that was my father's wife's name, was pregnant at the same time as my father's mistress. But when the moment came for both of them to deliver, the mistress delivered first, the wife second, with only one difference. The first baby was alive and healthy. The second lost not only its own life, but the mother's as well. I don't understand which was which. That was the legacy of guilt. You see, I grew up believing that my mother died in childbirth and that the woman my father married after a decent interval was my foster mother. But she was actually your real mother? Yes. But how? What happened to the baby who was stillborn? I have only my father's word for that. I've never wanted to test if it really was the truth. It didn't seem to matter anymore. What do you mean, your father's word? After his death, when the estate was finally settled, I was handed a letter that my father had left for me. I destroyed it after I read it, but I remember very clearly how it began. My dear and only son, I have lived with a lie all my life. And even now, confession comes hard to me. I bear a terrible guilt that I was responsible for destroying your relationship with your mother. There is no way I can make amends. This is only a selfish attempt to clear my own soul. I don't understand. I grew up believing that I had been responsible for my mother's death. And I resented my father's wife for pretending to be my mother, not knowing that she really was. Do you understand now? You were substituted for the child that died. Correct. <sighs> But what happened to the dead baby? It was too late for it to become a matter of record. It had to be disposed of. How? I must admit that after reading my father's letter, I put it out of my mind. You see, it didn't matter anymore. I wasn't even sure if I believed any of it. Because there was always an easy way to prove it. But somehow it didn't seem worth the effort. What was it, sir? Life is so frequently more bizarre and unreal than any story. You see, there's a problem in opposing fireplaces. If one flue draws better than the other, a room can quickly be filled by smoke. At the time I was born, my father was in the process of walling up one of the fireplaces in this room. There was a small and tiny corpse to be disposed of. Where better than a hearth that was about to cease to exist also? Oh, murder. No, 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 no. Not uh, that. I, I just meant that... Now that it's all out in the open, why don't we make sure? Um, uh, no, uh, let me... Won't take a moment to knock out the rest of the bricks. 
So that's why she haunts this house. She's looking for her lost baby. I can't answer that, my dear. But it seemed to me imperative that you know the whole story. I would never have sold you the house if I'd known it was haunted. Then you believe with me it is? Yesterday I would have scoffed at that. Today I... Oh, my Lord. What is it? Look for yourselves. Huh? A skeleton. It's so tiny. But big enough to bring the truth to light at last. <laughs> Okay? Um, I have it. Put it down. All right. Now, you drop your end first. That, that's it. There. There. Back where it belongs. Oh, I don't know how you talk me into these things. <laughs> Why would you want the vanity back down here? I just said it. Because it's where it belongs. Without a mirror? We'll replace that. Oh, that poor old man. Huh? Mr. Kiever. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget his face when he went to touch that little skeleton. And it just powdered to dust. Hmm. It was almost as if his whole life ended in that moment. Angie, what are you doing? Looking in the one piece of the old mirror that's left. You know what it really shows? What? Me. Happy, fulfilled... With my own baby to hold in my arms any time I reach for him. Just as that poor ghost I saw, or dreamed I saw, has hers to comfort her in eternity. We can forget the past. All we have to look forward to is what life is all about. The future. So the ghost is laid to rest. A tiny ghost... Never even born, but one who has perhaps found immortality in the arms of a mother who gave her own life to bear him. The past is buried. The legacy of guilt wiped out. And Tom and Angie Barr can once again look ahead to their marriage promise with as much hope as anyone else can to live happily ever afterwards. We didn't have any flashes of lightning or driving rain, but it was a ghost story all the same. A true ghost story. Because if you don't believe in spirits and beasties and all those other things that are accused of haunting our waking dreams, how do you account for what Angie saw in that fateful mirror? One parting thought. How safe will you feel the next time you look in yours? Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Russell Horton, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. But the autopsy report from the medical examiner's office states that the old man was first rendered unconscious by a blow to the head. And that death by asphyxiation, uh, gas, followed. Someone knocked him out and then turned on the gas? Yes. But he, he, he couldn't have been murdered. If he was, what happened to the murderer? What do you mean? Well, how did he get out of the room? The windows and door were locked on the inside. No, no, that couldn't be. Lieutenant, the key was in the door lock on the inside. This is an old brownstone with old doors, the kind that have those big keys, you know. And there's only one key to each room. Uh, you don't have duplicates? No, and even if I or someone did have a duplicate... You can't unlock the door from the outside without pushing the other key out of the lock. We'd have found it on the floor, not in the lock. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... been the dream of the criminal long before Cain slew Abel. More often than not, however, the dream turns to nightmare. Fate steps in, spins the wheel or throws the dice, and the hunter becomes the hunted. Man, imperfect that he is, falls over his own feet, tripped up by some seemingly inconsequential detail, and the plot is uncovered. Such a tale of mystery we are about to unfold in Murder One. I was thinking I'd like a raise, Mrs. Telford, something like a thousand a month. A thousand? You're only getting five hundred now. Isn't that a little steep? Well, considering my duties here, cook, housekeeper, and actually knowing what I do about so many things, I'd say I'm really worth two thousand a month. <laughs> mystery drama, Murder One, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Tammy Grimes. It is sponsored in part by X-Lax and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The wisest one once said, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? What indeed shall it profit such a wealthy man should he suffer the loss of his life? Such a man was Walter Telford, oil baron, airplane builder, motion picture tycoon, art collector, yet a recluse. Only a handful of men surrounded him kept the world away and formed the nucleus of that giant multinational company, Magna. Three men and one doctor, Telford's personal physician. Only one woman was ever close to him, his young wife, Madge. This is her story. When I woke up this morning, for the first time in 12 years, I felt lighthearted, free, because I was free. Walter was no more. The years of having to put up with this strange, unloving man were over. He had attracted me at first, but it soon wore off. His position, his power, his money. Now he's gone. His ashes lie at the crematorium. Soon I would have to pick them up and have them placed in his private jet. The murder one flown over his oil fields and scattered, just as Walter had instructed it. Come in. What is it, Harriet? This big photograph of Mr. Telford flying his first airplane. I wondered if you'd like it in here. Oh, that terrible picture. It looks like a giraffe. I suppose so. I thought you'd like to be reminded of the good old days. Harriet, there were never any good old days. They may have been old, but they weren't that good. Not until Mr. Telford came round to the stage door entrance. Oh, I enjoyed my acting career, I suppose. But I don't have to tell you, Harriet. You were my dresser and maid for... for how long was it? Five years? Seven. Until you married him. Yes. I gave up a lot. But you took to life among the wealthy like a duck to water. You just went right along from dresser to household cook. You didn't give up a thing, dear, and you know it. You weren't such a hot actress. The best part you ever played was wife to Walter Telford. In fact, as an actress, you were terrible, and the critics said so. How dare you speak to me like that? I have a good mind to fire you. I don't think you will, dear. I know too much. Like what? Oh, perhaps that long trip to Africa wasn't good for Mr. Telford. He enjoyed every minute. His last happiness on Earth, as it turned out. 
But then he took sick and we had a terrible time getting out. Try asking a Stone Age bushman which way is the nearest airport. So you nursed him all by yourself? I did what I could. We had some drugs along, just painkillers. But that jungle fever got to him and he didn't have the resistance. Well, there aren't many young wives married to old fellows who would have done as well by him as you. Harriet! Well, he was old. Can't deny that. I think you'd better get back to the kitchen. You forget yourself. Do I? There are an awful lot of things I just can't seem to forget. The days passed. Walter's business associates were most kind. Jack called several times, assuring me they wanted me on the board of directors of Magna. Not just because I was Walter's wife, a widow, but because they felt a younger voice in the corporation was needed. Not that I was looking forward to becoming a businesswoman, for aside from being a wife, all I knew was the theater. But I felt in Walter's memory I should. I wondered if I ought to give up this big house in Beverly Hills, the two maids, the gardener and chauffeur, and Harriet. But it would be hard for me to leave. Do you have a minute, Madge? Madge? Since when are you being so familiar? And I notice you don't knock anymore, just barge in. I thought we were back to the old days, just the two of us. After all, dear, we've been through an awful lot together. All right, if it pleases you, but not in front of the others. What do you want? I was thinking I'd like a raise, seeing as how you'll be needing me more and more. What do you mean? Well, there may be special errands you'd like me to do, confidentially. Like what? Getting prescriptions filled at the drugstore. Getting stuff to get rid of the rats. You know. How much do you get now? Five hundred a month. I see. How about six fifty? I was thinking something like a thousand. A thousand a month? Well, considering I'm really the housekeeper now, I'll go on cooking, of course. Isn't that a little steep, Harriet? Actually, knowing what I do about so many things around here, there'd be some people who'd say I was really worth 2000 Well, let me... I'll have to think it over. It seems like a great deal of money to me. You'll be inheriting a great deal, and you'd like to keep it. Think that over, too. I don't like your insinuations. I don't like your threats, and you'd better watch out, Harriet. Don't drive me too far. As I said before, you're a very unconvincing actress. I was boiling mad. As she suspected something was strange about Walter's death, the doctors didn't. Dear Arthur Carter, who's crazy about me and his four old colleagues, they'd agreed Walter had picked up something in Africa which caused it. So I was a lousy actress, was I? Well, we would see. Yes, Miss Harriet. I'll make you eat your words. Yes? Is this the Telford residence? Yes, it is. What can I do for you? I'm Sister Teresa of the African Hospital. May I come in? Of course. Certainly, Sister. You must be Harriet. They've told me so much of you. Yes, I am. Oh, what a beautiful room. Fantastic. Oh, is that Mrs. Telford, that portrait over the fireplace? Yes, it is. I thought I recognized her. May I sit down? Would you like me to call her and announce you? Oh, in a moment. Let me catch my breathing first. It is good luck that I'm here. When I saw Mr. and Mrs. Telford last, I had no idea it should be so soon. <laughs> It is, in fact, extraordinary I should come at all. You come from Africa. Mr. Telford, when he was taken ill, he was brought to our little hospital in Ghana. Poor man, he was very sick. But his good wife, she got an airplane and took him to America. I hope he had recovered from his malady. Uh, Sister Therese, what made you come here? i show you. A letter he wrote. He left with the sisters in our little hospital. Uh, I, I read it to you. Dear Sister Therese, 
I can never repay you and all the sisters at the hospital for your goodness and kindness. As I told you, whenever you need something to make a hospital bigger and better with more equipment, please let me know and I shall be very happy to take care of your needs. Very sincerely, Walter Telford. Please, look. A beautiful letter. Oh, yes. I recognize the handwriting. Of course. So, how did I get here? There was a world meeting of our order in Vancouver, and I went, and from Vancouver to California is not so far. So, please, I would like to see him now, Mr. Telford. Please tell him Sister Teresa from Ganema is here. I wish I could do that, Sister, but I'm afraid Mr. Telford passed away a week ago. Oh, mon Dieu. I'm too late. I'm afraid so. All this distance for nothing. If you could have seen what a brave fight he put up against the fever. So many of the native Africans catch it every year. It's, it's terrible. But it is not always fatal. Not always? Ninety percent, yes, it is fatal. But the younger ten percent, they have a chance to come out of it and live. Mr. Telford was not exactly a young man. What is this uh, disease, fever? A parasite. In Africa, these parasites kill people every day. Well, perhaps before I go, I should see Mrs. Telford. I liked her very much. She was devoted to Mr. Telford. Devoted. By all means, sister, I'm sure Mrs. Telford would be happy to see you. Although, on second thought, perhaps not. This must be sad days for her. And for me to come at this time and ask for money, not the right time. No. Just as you wish. But I shall certainly tell her you were here. Thank you very much. I, I shall write to her. Uh, did you come by car, sister, or should I call you a taxi? Oh, my, no. I walk from the railroad. That one gets used to very soon in Africa, walking. It is four kilometers from the train station at Ganema to our hospital. Au revoir, Miss Harriet. Goodbye. I shall remember you in my prayers. Merci. <laughs> Startled me. What are you doing this early in the morning in Mr. Telford's trophy room? Just came to tidy up. We have a maid for that. Two, in fact. Oh, I meant to tell you about that. I thought their work was getting very sloppy, so I've let them go. Without asking me? Well, since I am the housekeeper now, it's my responsibility. I, I thought you'd be leaving those decisions to me. Now, I have two young nieces who are very hard workers. I thought I might ask them. Harriet, I don't like that. Not being consulted. And I'll tell you what else I don't like. There are too many spices in the food. I don't like it that way, and I never have, and you know it. Mr. Telford always did. Well, I'm not. When are you getting these girls? Whenever I can. I have to write to them. They live in Cleveland. I hope you realize this is a large house to run with only a housekeeper, a chauffeur, and a gardener. A uh, matter of fact, dear, they quit. The gardener and the chauffeur. What? Just like that? Just like that. We had a little talk yesterday. I told them what would be expected now that I'm in charge, and this morning they just up and left. Well, that's unbelievable. Yes, it is strange, isn't it? So, for a little while, it'll be just you and me, dear. The two of us in this house, together, alone. <laughs> at the large house in Tudor style set back amid the landscaping and palm trees on Beverly Drive, one would never dream that within those fancy brick walls lived a young widow and her housekeeper. Also, that fear lived at that address. The only terror Madge had known up to now was stage fright. But this was not theater or make-believe. This was real. How real... We shall find out when I return with Act Two. It's 
suspicion is no friend to virtue. Suspicion is an enemy to happiness. So goes the old saying. And so it was in the Telford mansion between the two women living there. Had billionaire Walter Telford died fairly, foully, of known or unknown causes, of those who survived him, which was the cat, which was the mouse? I would lie in bed night after night, hoping sleep would come, but it didn't. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, in a dreaded pattern. I'd get up, wander about the house at night, and end up in Walter's study, straightening the books, the model aeroplanes of the real ones he'd built, the model oil derricks, the miniature sets of the movies he'd made, symbols of all his enterprises. This night, I was particularly keyed up. I had to talk to someone. Arthur was the only one I could think of. Dr. Connor here. Arthur? Are you uh, mad? Yes. Do you know what time it is? I couldn't help it. Something's going on here. Well, what is it? It's Harriet. What? Huh? She's at me in this most peculiar fashion. It's hard to explain. As though... As though I personally had had a hand in Walter's death. I see... But what does she say? Well, for one thing, she wants more money. Much more. So don't give it to her. There are other cooks, you know. It's not that simple. What can I do? Arthur, you're the only man I can turn to. Yes, well, leave it to me, Madge. You mean... I said, leave it to me. Now hang up and come to see me tomorrow at four in the office. Hello, John. Uh, last night I had a call from Mrs. Telford. It seems their cook, Harriet, has been making demands implying she knows something, and I just wanted to be sure where the boys stood. There was absolutely nothing strange about how Walter died, a clear, definable case. She is imagining that her cook is an enemy. Absolutely not. So far as there being any possibility of foul play, forget it. Walter Telford died of natural diseased causes. I'll stake my reputation on it. Good morning, dear. Been for a walk? In the garden, Harriet. What would you like for dinner tonight? I'd plan to have a nice casserole, the one with lentils and beef, Mr. Telford's favorite. Well, I'm not very hungry today. I think I'll take the car and go for a drive. I need some fresh air. Besides... I have an appointment in town. Well, now, that's a good idea. Work up an appetite. Oh, um, a message came for you while you were in the garden. Would you please call the Heavenly Rest Crematorium? Uh, this is the number they gave me. Thank you, Harriet. Are you all right? You seem a little down. I'm fine. Well, I have lots to do. Don't forget to call. Have a nice drive. <sighs> mm. Heavenly Rest Crematorium. Uh, this is Mrs. Telford. Somebody called me earlier. Oh, yes, it was I, Mr. Fisher. Yes? About your husband, uh, Mrs. Telford. Oh, yes, I, I was planning to pick up the ashes just as soon as I got around to it. It's, uh, well, you know, I have a funny feeling about it and... I'm afraid that's the difficulty, Mrs. Telford. But it's no problem if you aren't in any hurry. What do you mean? I regret to say there's been a strike, and so we haven't been able to uh, uh, process Mr. Telford yet. But everything will be in order in a few days. However, I thought I should let you know. Yes. Yes, I, I understand. A few days, a week at the most... And everything will be in order, I can assure you. A few days? A week at the most? Walter was still not... What if someone should want an autopsy? What, what would I say? Jack or Fred or the other Magnum board member? Of course, Arthur would stop them. He signed the death certificate, his word. 
Besides, who could do that without my permission? Unless there was some suspicion of, uh, of, uh... It was narrowing down to Harriet and me. I had to act. Now, first thing, to discredit whatever she might say. I called Arthur's office and said I was too sick to keep my appointment at four. I started eating nothing but toast, a few potatoes for dinner. I began to take a few grains of arsenic at a time. I had to make it believable she was the prisoner and I was the next intended victim. Well, what is it, dear? Three days now and you've hardly touched your food. And what are you doing still in bed? I... I really feel terrible. What's gotten into you? I don't know. I could be... Uh, who knows? Emotional shock of suddenly losing my husband. Oh, you expect me to believe that? I don't care what you believe. You've been taking a great many liberties lately, Harriet, and it aggravates me. Oh, I have, have I? It's perfectly true that at one time we were close. And if it hadn't been for my regard for you, I wouldn't be paying you the exorbitant wages you're getting. I've decided I want more. Don't interrupt me. When I married Walter, you were so grateful to get out of the theatrical rat race, you fell all over yourself. You were so happy I arranged for you to take over our kitchen. And you did fine. I'm not saying you didn't. But since we came back from Africa, since the tragedy, I don't understand your behavior at all. And what I'm saying, Harriet, is cut it out. I don't like it. I'm not going to stand for any attempted blackmail. Should I applaud now? Not a very good scene, dear. You didn't play it very convincingly. You're bluffing, and old Harriet isn't being taken in one bit. Oh! Oh! Get me... Get me the... Doubt... Dr. Carter for me. Oh! Oh! Give me... Hand it... Hand it to me. Hello? This is... Oh! Hello? Uh, Hello. Harriet, tell him I'm in great pain. Hello. Have him, have him come over here. Hello. Hello, doctor. Yes? It's uh, Mrs. Telford. She says she's not feeling well. I'm in terrible pain. She what? says she's in bad pain. Well, where is she in pain, Harriet? He wants to know where. Where? Where? Do I have to talk to him myself? Tell her I'm on my way to the hospital, and take it easy. I'll stop by. All right, doctor. I'll tell her. Thank you. He says he'll stop by on his way to the hospital, and to take it easy. <laughs> of course, if I were the doctor, that is not what I would say. Oh, no? What would that be? I'd say, Madge, dear, what an act. Yeah, but what is it, Arthur? I can't begin to describe it. I felt like death. There's nothing wrong with you, Madge. Nothing at all. Probably picked up some intestinal bug. <sighs> oh, by the way, I am sorry I was so short with you when you called the other night. It's just that <laughs> Cecile has always been jealous of you. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. I was frightened. Why do I have this awful wrenching inside me now? I'm sorry. No, it's not your fault. But Cecile has made me promise to shut off the telephone after midnight. So the service will pick up, and that's that. Shh, shh. Hmm? Is that you outside the door, Harriet? She's spying on me every minute. Harriet! Harriet, will you please come in? You call. If you're listening outside the door, don't. But in case you happen to miss what Dr. Carter was saying, it was that he cannot be reached anymore on the telephone at night. I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about, Mrs. Telford. Do you see Arthur? That's what I have to put up with. She's always there when I least expect her. I feel her waiting, watching, everywhere. It's nerves, Madge. And you're entitled to them. After what you've been through. Oh. Now, look, look, you stay quiet and remain in bed for a few days and eat lightly. Uh, I can't keep anything down. Mm, crackers and tea, then. Or beef consomme. 
I did talk to Harriet a few days ago, as I said I would. I asked her what she was doing. She said she hasn't behaved any differently toward you from way back when she took care of you backstage. I don't want to talk about her. Arthur, do you know how sweet you were? Did I ever tell you? You were so wonderful to me in those last hours. Well, it isn't easy for a wife to watch her husband slipping away. You made it bearable, Arthur. Taking care of all those ghastly details so efficiently. Oh, it wasn't much a certificate to sign and then have, well, the body removed. I shall never forget, ever, how you helped. Isn't it strange, when you think about it, that Walter and I should have the same pain? Right across here. You have an enormous imagination, my dear. I don't think so. Come here. Hmm? Come closer. Bullion in that cup. Mm. I had a little, about half of it. Arthur, it tastes funny. Funny? Take it with you, will you? Would you have it analyzed? Whatever for? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were still here, Doctor. Here, Mrs. Telford, let me clump up that pillow. For... Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, oh, nice bullion. How careless of me. Well, I'll get a dustpan and clear up that mess right away, and then... Go make you some more. And how is our patient today? Oh, good morning, Harriet. It's after 12. You slept very well, didn't you? After 12? I can't believe it. A call came for you while you were asleep. I didn't want to disturb you, so they left a message. Who, uh, who was that? Uh, Mr. Fisher from the crematorium. It seems they're still on strike, and he wondered if you wished to make any other disposition of Mr. Telford. Oh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't know. I always wondered why you wanted him cremated so quickly. It was his wish. Pity. Doesn't look as though he's going to get his wish. Oh, did I ever tell you I had a very interesting visit last week from a Sister Therese of the African Hospital, I think she said. Sister Therese here? In Beverly Hills? She was very concerned about Mr. Telford. She took care of him out there. They said he'd contracted a kind of jungle disease. We know that, Harriet. It occurred to me, now that Mr. Telford's body is still, uh... Oh, how should I say? Intact... Perhaps you'd be doing science a great favor to let it be examined. Think how much they could learn from what he had. Since when are you so interested in medical science? Well, I have a brother in San Francisco who's a medical research doctor. He'd be fascinated to find out something about jungle diseases. I was thinking I might drive up and bring him down. I absolutely forbid it. Well, now, aren't you being selfish? Just supposing, if Mr. Telford were examined, not by Dr. Cotter and the old fogies he brought in, the cause of his death turned out to be something different. Maybe not a jungle disease. Now do you see why I'm worth even more than I'm getting now? I've got all these good ideas. Harriet, will you please leave the room? I'm in no state to argue with you. My hands are perspiring. My feet are icy. I just want to be let alone. I'm only saying if, 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 ifs and ands were pots and pans, there'd be no need of tinkers. Oh, that's from St. Joan, isn't it? I remember you saying those lines when you played the part. You weren't at all bad. Didn't you do it with a French accent? I, I did mention to you, didn't I, a sister Therese with a French accent came by and tried to tell me... Mr. Telford died of this African disease. Something very familiar about her. In police language, murder one is the intent to cause the death of another person. Murder one is also the result of the intent to cause suicide by force, duress, or deception. Surely we have some of those ingredients here. Are there more? They did not surprise me in the least. So let us find out when I return with Act Three.
Once upon a time, there was a billionaire whose empire ranged from oil fields to art museums. He was Walter Telford. He was a difficult man to work for, demanding complete loyalty. His sense of humor was grisly, to say the least, like calling his private plane the Murder One. Unfortunately, fate sometimes plays its own little jokes, and Murder One is one of them. It is surprising how much arsenic the human body can tolerate. Not that I feel tip-top, but I have been gradually taking more and more so that when I get Arthur to examine me, and he will, he will discover it. And how can Arthur help but conclude that someone is trying to poison me? Who else could it be but Harriet? That is the game of suspicion and death. And tonight I play my final hand. Help! Help! Help me! Where is she? Why doesn't she come? Harriet! Please! Help! What is it? What is the matter? It's after midnight. I'm, I'm dying. Get Dr. Carter, get him. Oh, all right, I'll call him. Where is the telephone? That's no use. You heard him yourself. He shuts the phone off at night. Go to his house. Harriet, you know where he lives. Take your car and go right away. Now, in this weather? Harriet, if I die, you won't get anything. Not one penny. It all goes to the Magna Corporation, all of it. Understand? I don't know what you're talking about. It. All right, I'll go. I only hope you're as sick as you make out. You better hope I'm not. Now. Where did I put it? Why do I keep forgetting things? Something seems to be holding me back. It's, it's such an effort to move, to remember. Where is the arsenic? Ah, here, on the pillow. How stupid of me. Wait, 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 wait. Down the hall. Why do I feel so giddy? Maybe I have been dosing myself for too much. Seems to me I, I used much less before, but I had to have enough in my stomach so that oh, good. She's left the door open. No, no, that's not where to hide it. In the bureau. I can't see. Why don't the lights work? The switch, where is it? Ah, here. Hide it under the clothes, way in the back. Can't get it shut. That's all right. Now, get back to bed. Oh. Oh. I really don't feel well at all. So dizzy. Then when Arthur comes, I'll, I'll tell him I suspect I'm being poisoned. Like Walter. He'll figure it out. He always does as I say, old Arthur. <laughs> uh, the way he just... Up and sign the death certificate just on my say-so. Ah! What is it? Oh, I must have been asleep. What time is it? Bedside clock. Two. Two o'clock. Where is she? Harriet! She's not here. How could it take two hours? Arthur would have come back with her right away. Maybe she was in an accident. That could be an accident. Oh, oh, I feel so woozy. The farm, where is it? I can hardly see. Yes. Hello. Hello. Mrs. Telford. This is Mrs. Telford. Yes. Mrs. Telford, this is Mr. Fisher. Yes. Yes, what? Well, I'm sorry to call you so late. But I just got back from San Francisco at a medical research meeting. And I went round locking up and, uh, and I couldn't find Mr. Telford's body. Uh, you didn't have it removed by any chance, did you? It's nowhere on the premises. Mr. Telford's body has disappeared. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Something is closing on me. Get a hold of myself. Think clearly. Harriet is not here. Therefore, Harriet is in an accident. 
What do I have to do now? What do I have to do? Yes. Take my car and drive to Arthur's. Get dressed. It's raining so bad. No. No, no, no. That would be wrong. Put my robe on. Over my pajamas. No slippers. Bare feet. Do you see the road? It's so cold in car. What's wrong with the heater? Got to get to Arthur's. Turn here. It's so cold. There's someone out there. Someone in the road. Waving. Get out of the way, you idiot! What's that over there? Something moving. Help me. Help me, please. Over here. Help me. Harriet. Is that you? Who are you? I can't see. Someone bending over me. Ah! Help! Help! It was a rotten idea. I think we've gone too far. Oh, it's locked. Uh, do you have a front door key, Harriet? Of course I have. Madge? Madge? It's me, Arthur. I'll go upstairs. You check all the rooms down here. We've got to find her. She's not in her bedroom. Not downstairs either. Did you look in your room? My room? Why would she be in there? Will you do as I say? Go look. All right. All right. Stupid, stupid. Oh, because I thought Madge had made a fool of me getting me to sign that death certificate without a... I had a feeling something was wrong with my diagnosis of Walter's death. But I never thought it could be poison. Well, she's not there. But my room is a shambles. Clothes all over the place. Drawers pulled out like a cyclone hit it. And look, I want, I want you to see what I found. Right. This powder. It's not mine. I swear it. Good Lord. What do we do? Where is she? I'm responsible. I am responsible. Check the garage, will you, Harriet? See if her car is there. It isn't. I remember now seeing the garage was empty as we drove up. What are you doing? Calling the cops. Hello, hello, police. This is Dr. Cotter. And one of my patients may be driving around the Hollywood Hills. Yes, she's in no condition to drive. I want you to search Beverly Glen, Coldwater, that whole area. It's Mrs. Walter Telford. Yes, that, Mrs. Walter Telford. I'd say she left here about an hour ago, and I'm afraid she isn't competent to drive. No, I don't know. Wait a minute, hold on. Why would she have gone out tonight? Oh, of course, she was going to my place. She was here waiting, and I called her pretending to be Fisher. I, I didn't show up here. I... Uh, Sergeant, send your men first along Mulholland Drive. Yep. Call me, I'll wait here. The number's 555-8601. As soon as you find out anything. Thank you. It's gone too far, Harriet. Too far. Now, this is Sector 6, Edward to Central. We picked up female on Mulholland and Beverly Glen, unconscious. Thrown from car, which appears wrecked. What is it? Where am I? What are you taking me all the time? Uh, Ma'am, you just sit back there easy and wrap that blanket around your arm. There's blood on me. You on Walter? Uh, no, ma'am, I'm Patrolman Burns. You keep quiet now and we'll have you in the hospital in no time. My name is Madge Telford. Is that Mrs. Walter Telford? Mrs. Walter. 
Telford. Sex Edward to Central. Female has regained consciousness and identifies self as Mrs. Walter Telford. Arsenic. She was poisoning me like she did Walter. In his food. Spicy food. What time is it? A uh, little after seven, Mrs. Telford. Seven? Yeah. In the morning? Uh, yes, ma'am, in the morning. I've been out there all night. How is she? Not responding. I had no idea all this. Can she get better? It's too soon to say. Can't make out where I am. Right in front of me. White sheets. Funny high bed. With white bars. People standing over me. I'm so cold. Chains. Heavy, heavy chains across my chest. Sleepy now. So tired. Go to sleep now. I don't know if she can pull out of this. She's lost a great deal of blood. But you know what she did. She killed... I'm still a doctor. A lifetime of money as a member of Magna doesn't... It can't stop my being a doctor. She brought it all on herself. I was out of my head to have listened to you. I only wanted to frighten her because she'd made such a fool of me. You were more convincing as Mr. Fisher than she was as Sister What's-Her-Name. I can tell you that. <laughs> it's funny. Miss Harriet. She won't have anything now. And there's Arthur. He won't either. They'll find out. I can see them performing the autopsy. Finding all that arsenic in me. No one will believe I could have done it to myself. Do you mean to tell me, Dr. Cotter, you didn't know arsenic poisoning? Murder one, that's the charge. <laughs> All I'm sorry about is I won't be around to have a laugh. We have seen how fear follows crime and is its punishment. We have seen the hand of fate upset the plans of man and deal out its own brand of justice. What happened to Madge Telford? What happened to Dr. Arthur Carter? Harriet? We'll find out in a very few minutes. One hour after having been admitted to the hospital, Madge Telford died, like her husband, from a combination of death-dealing blows, from arsenic poisoning to a crushed body even a destroyed mind. Harriet was absolved of complicity, but her dreams of untold wealth came to nothing. Arthur Carter has been suspended from the roster of doctors, expelled from Magna, and today awaits indictment. Perhaps it is true. Society prepares the crime. The criminal commits it. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Terry Keene, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Exlax. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... enjoyable of human pursuits is piecing together a puzzle. If it's a murder, why did he do it? A grand theft? How did they do it? A great escape? How did he slip through their fingers? Today, a combination of the above, penned by the great French writer of detective fiction, Maurice Leblanc. Leblanc created a Robin Hood Houdini type of brigand, Arsène Lupin, the very first French rogue whose very first adventure is about to be related here. You mean to say if someone swims across this moat around the chateau, bells would sound the alarm? I'm going to throw a rock in the water and see. André, don't. The Count is exceedingly nervous. He has a fortune in paintings and lives in constant fear they will be stolen. This heavy water should do. Ah. Ah. Now see what you have done. I have to go inside and explain to the Count it was all a mistake. I may lose my job over this. <laughs> Mystery drama, My First Rogue, based on a story by Maurice Leblanc, was adapted specially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis. It stars Lee Richardson and Bob Caliban. I shall return shortly with Act One. in the late 1800s. I should be more explicit. We are in Paris, in a cafe, on a sunny Saturday morning. A cafe which no longer exists. However, the Paris sunshine is unchanged. Two men are nursing their cognac. One is reading the morning newspaper, the other writing in a notebook. Well, what is the news, Robert? Dreyfus was finally pardoned. Shocking it should take so long. Oh, and listen to this, Maurice. Someone has put the sounds of birds on some kind of a metal plate. You turn it on and you can hear it again. <laughs> what earthly use is that? Why would I wish to hear the sound of birds at any special time? <laughs> I'm sorry I asked you. Why did you? You only get angry when I talk and you are writing. Why don't you write in your rooms where it is peaceful? It's a choice I don't have anymore. My rent is overdue. Today, the landlord tells me if I don't pay what I owe, he will have me arrested. How much do you owe? I haven't paid my rent since last November. Oh, that much I cannot loan you, Maurice. So, for me, it is prison. Who knows? Perhaps there I shall find some ideas to write about. I hope they will let me have pen and ink. It was in the prison Fontenay that I made the acquaintance with Arsène Lupin. He certainly did not appear as the master thief of the century. I found him a cultured gentleman who, naturally, would seek out the company of another cultured gentleman... Myself. Maurice, how old are you? I will be 35 in June, yes, sir. I will be 30 in July. I am the most talked about thief in Europe, and now America. You've been to America? A quick business trip. A little matter of a Gilbert Stuart painting of America's first president, uh, George Washington. I know the name. I thought it would hang nicely above my mantelpiece in Paris. But Inspector Garimard thought otherwise. He came all the way to Boston and surprised me as I was packing. And so he persuaded me to come to prison. But if you end up in prison, how can you enjoy it? Because I am seldom in prison, and then only when I wish to be. 
You steal also, Maurice. I do? Never. To write about people, you must steal from everyone. But unlike myself, you have not found the right person to steal from. What you are doing is not profitable. I see you in your cell next to mine, your pen in hand, your face gazing at the ceiling, searching for an idea. I lay pity on you, my friend. I'm about to embark upon an adventurous crime against a man who can very well afford a loss, a considerable loss. In fact, he deserves exactly what I'm about to do to him. Count Crespi, a Frenchman of Italian descent, took advantage of other people's distress, bought cheaply, sold handsomely, bought a chateau and filled it with art treasures. To him, Arsène sent a letter. Bonjour, Marcel. Ah, ah André, ah, good postman. What do you have for the count today? Oh, something special. Something special for the count? Yes, registered letter. You will have to sign for it. Oh, where do I sign? Right here where my finger is. Uh, André, uh, supposing someone didn't wish to use the drawbridge across the moat to get into the chateau. Then he couldn't get in. Supposing he swam across the water, what would happen to him? Before he even got to the wall, electric bells would go off. And we are all supposed to run and fetch the police right away. The slightest disturbance in the water sets off his switch. You don't say. A ripple in the water and the bell goes off. Uh, I'm going to try it with this stone. No, they don't. Why not? This everyone should do. Ah. Ah, see what you have done. I didn't believe it. Now I will have to go inside and explain to the Count it was only a mistake. I may lose my job over this. The postman accidentally dropped a rock into the moat. Marcel, what are you telling me? His foot, Count Crespi. His foot accidentally dislodged a stone and it fell in. What do you have in your hand? Oh, a registered letter, Count. For me? I don't wish to see it. I didn't sign for it myself, so I don't know you have it. I don't like registered letters. Well, shall I open it and uh, read it to you, sir? Uh, that's a good idea. Go ahead, Marcel. Read it. Oh, Count Crespi, cher monsieur, le comte, I have come to admire greatly the Rubens and Wattos in your gallery. In addition to those paintings, I also know the Beauvais tapestries to the right, and uh, in the room to the left, the cases of miniatures and the Louis XIII table. These objects can readily be turned into cash. Therefore... I ask you have them properly packed and sent to my name, care of Le Garde de Batignol. You have one week. If not received, I shall see to their removal on the night of Wednesday the 27th. Believe me to be yours very truly, Arsène Lupin. A P.S. Don't send me the larger of the two Watteaus. It's a copy. The original was burned by Barat during the Revolution. Ah, and, and don't send the Louis XVI Chatelaine, the authenticity of which is exceedingly doubtful. That's all he says, sir. Oh, no. Did you ever hear anything like that? He seems very sure of himself. I cannot understand how he has such precise knowledge of the rooms in the chateau where the paintings are hung. Who told him? I never permit anyone in here. I read that Arsène Lupin is in jail. So did I. He was arrested in America by Chief Inspector Gallimard. Marcel, take pen to paper. I wish you to write a letter to the public prosecutor at Rouen. Enclose this letter from Arsène Lupin and demand police protection. <laughs> Count Crespi, I came myself from Rouen. 
I have investigated and I thought the matter too delicate not to speak to you in person. Mr. Prosecutor, I am honored. It has taken me three days to ascertain the facts. I might begin by saying your chateau is quite impregnable. I had to call to the gatekeeper, identify myself, and the drawbridge was lowered over the moat, and your secretary came out to meet me and took me through four heavily barred and locked doors. You are right. Why I suddenly became so concerned, I do not know. (laughs) No one, not even Arsène Lupin, could get in here. I know the gentleman. Lupin? A gentleman? Yes. He's the gentleman thief. Uh, We became acquainted during the theft of the Mona Lisa, which finally the government had to ransom. Steal the Mona Lisa? A sacrilege. They should have locked up Arsène Lupin in the Bastille and thrown away the key. Ah, but nothing was ever proved. As for this matter, Count, I am informed Arsène Lupin is now safely under lock and key. His every move is watched. Inspector Gallimard has given strict instructions. Lupin is not allowed even to write. Therefore, one must conclude this letter to you is a fake. Whoever has written it is not Arsène Lupin. Are you the postman? Yes. Are you the postman who delivers mail here? Yes, I am, sir. And uh, who might you be? I am Count Crespi. Count? I have never had the pleasure. I am generally met at the drawbridge by Marcel, your secretary. This morning I put on my old clothes and decided to walk around the property. Is there any mail for me? No, your grace. Not a thing today. Uh, That uh, is in the way of correspondence. Uh, Only this newspaper. Uh, It is uh, yours. Uh, Please forgive me. I was just reading about uh, Arsène Lupin. What about Arsène Lupin? Uh, Here, uh, on the second page. Uh, Show me, please. I came out without my glasses. Right at the top where it says, uh, Welcome visitor. Would you read it to me? Oh, certainly. Welcome to our distinguished visitor, Chief Inspector Gallimard, one of the veterans of the detective service whose recent feat of arresting Arsène Lupin has won him international fame. Monsieur Gallimard is enjoying his rest and will be spending his holiday in our village fishing. Gallimard is here, right here. Most interesting. And I confess to have uh, played no little part in the new story. You know the inspector? Oh, I am one of the few people of the village with whom he is on speaking terms. On Sunday, I was fishing on the dock, and I noticed a gentleman next to me, frock coat, straw hat, and I saw on his fishing rod the name Gallimard. And I said just one thing to him. I said... Congratulations, Monsieur Gallimard. If you catch fish as easily as you caught Orsan Lupin, <laughs> you should do well. What did he answer? He said, thank you, reeled in his line and uh, walked away. That's all he said? Not one word more. Where did you say you saw the inspector fishing on Sunday? On the dock. He fishes there every day. <laughs> That, in effect, is how Arsène Lupin's latest escapade was revealed to me. The following day, my old friend Robert, the salesman at Beaumarchais, came to see me. Robert, ah, nice of you to visit me in jail. Maurice, I've decided to bail you out of prison. Thank you very much, but, uh, no. What? I am at the beginning of a fascinating story of a man. Who is it? My first rogue. And if I leave the prison, I shall never know what happens to him. Uh, Let me say two words to you, and then you'll understand. Arsène Lupin. Some have likened Arsène Lupin to Robin Hood. Others less charitable accuse him of robbing Peter to pay Paul. 
which I'd like to observe was first said in 1560. Then, the estates of St. Peter's Cathedral were appropriated to repair the Cathedral of St. Paul. That's how these catchphrasings begin, but not how they end. More on that when I return shortly with Act Two. a small French village outside of Paris, a town noted for its ancient chateau, surrounded by a wide moat owned by Count Crespi. The Count has been politely requested by that master of the picklock, Arsène Lupin, to divest himself of some of his art treasures. But Lupin is in jail. Did he write that letter, or is it a hoax? Author Maurice Leblanc picks up the story. Not only was I in the prison cell right next to Arsène Lupin, but we had occasion often to talk in the exercise yard. The guards took no notice. Lupin was a favorite prisoner. Stealing was essentially a game to him, and I remember him laughing and saying, I am sure I have thrown that miserable millionaire count into quite a frenzy, which he had. Marcel! Marcel, where are you? Count, I'm terribly sorry, but I did not hear you at first. I hope you hadn't been calling me long. I was just supervising the locksmith putting a new lock at the servant's entrance. He has gone, has he? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I made sure he left and locked up. I don't want anyone on the premises, understand? Yes, I do, Count. Uh... Why did you call? Did you know Gallimard is here? He is? The inspector who arrested? Uh, oh, he's here, is he? In the chateau? No, you fool. In the village. I got the news from the postman. It's in the local paper. I shall go find him and talk to him. The inspector. Imagine that. Right in our own backyard, so to speak. <laughs> Inspector Gallimard? You know me. We have met. Uh, no, sir. I have not been that fortunate. I am sorry if I disturb your fishing. I'm surprised you recognize me. I generally keep out of the public eye. Your fishing rod, sir. It has your name on the brass plate. Mm, very observant. Inspector, my name is Count Crespi. I own the chateau one kilometer from town. It's an old chateau a moat around it. I am very well protected. Do you have need for a moat? It came with a moat. I see. I have a very fine collection of paintings, objets d'art, miniatures, and almost a week ago, I received a letter. Whoever wrote it knows exactly where each of my works of art is kept. Now... Who else but Arsène Lupin? Sir, I... if I had the smallest doubt of the authenticity of your letter, believe me, the pleasure of once more looking up that dear Lupin would outweigh every consideration. Unfortunately, the man is already in prison. Suppose he escapes. From the Fontenay prison, no one escapes. But Lupin is known for that. He is slippery, he is daring. If he does escape, so much the better I will catch him again. Go home, Count. I tell you, you can sleep soundly. Nothing will happen. But I fear... Go away and stop frightening my fish. Count Crespi, I saw you yesterday. Now you appear again. I am displeased. Let me make this plain. I'm here on holiday. I've come to this village hoping to enjoy peace and catch fish. Please... Go away. Inspector, there is a new development. Another communication from Arsène Lupin. A telegram. Ah, look at it. No goods received in Patignols. Get everything ready for tomorrow night. Arsène. Well? Tomorrow is the 27th. Wednesday. It's fixed for tomorrow. Just as he warned me. What is? The burglary. The theft of my collection. A tremendous loss. 
You are the only person in the world who always knows how to catch that man. And I, I thought, I hoped... Well, that's that... not true. The famous theft of the Mona Lisa, which Lupin was most certainly responsible for, although we could never actually pin it on him, we never caught him. Ah, you see, it is art that interests him. It is not art that attracts Lupin, far from it. It's the ransom money. You had to pay a big ransom to have the Mona Lisa returned? I didn't pay it. The French government did. Hefty ransom it was, too. And the trouble we had to keep it all a secret. <laughs> Very embarrassing for the security of the Louvre, you can imagine. But whether the money went to Lupin or Lupin engineered the theft, it was never proved. Inspector Gallimard, what fee would you take to spend Wednesday night at my chateau? Not a penny. Don't bother me. And uh, name your own price. I am a rich man, a very rich man. I am here on vacation. I really have no right to take care of the case. No uh, one shall know. A matter between you and me. Would 10,000 francs be enough? Just one night. When the... Oh, very well. But it's only fair to tell you you are throwing your money away. I don't mind. In that case, I agree. Besides, one can never be absolutely sure with Lupin. He's bound to have a whole gang working with him. Yes, yes, I've heard that. That letter and this telegram are a case in point. Here is a man in one of our most secure prisons who is being watched every hour, held incommunicado, and yet able to send them to whomsoever he pleases. Incroyable. Now, you had better leave me. We must not be seen together. Who knows who in this village is not in the pay of Lupin? Tomorrow evening, the chateau, nine o'clock. On the evening of the 27th, the Count dismissed his servants and his secretary and sent them off to their wing of the chateau to retire. As soon as he was alone, he let down the drawbridge, unlocked all four of the bolted doors, and waited. Promptly at nine, Inspector Gallimard and two other burly gentlemen arrived. Count Crespi, my two assistants, Detective Poignard and Detective Calimbar. Oh, good, yes. Good, good. Enchanté. Yeah, these gentlemen and I have worked together on many a case. Poignard, I'd like you to examine the walls for any unusual openings. And Calimbar, I rely on you to look behind all the paintings and tapestries for any hidden doors and to see to it that all windows are bolted shut when we settle down to await the arrival of the ingenious Monsieur Lupin. Uh, yes, Inspector, as you wish. Good. Lead the way, Count. I've decided the best place for both of you to be on guard is inside the gallery itself. The Count and I will take up our post on the other side of the courtyard, for I doubt very much an attempt will be made through the front. So, we shall keep watch at the back. Count, the central gallery can only be reached through one door. Just one door. That's correct, Inspector. This, this is the gallery. I keep it locked. It is just this one door, right? Absolutely. May I have the keys, please? Bonyard, Gallenberg. After you have made your examination of the walls and windows, etc., etc., the Count tells me there are plenty of chairs and benches so you can both make yourselves comfortable. Not too comfortable, mind you. Eyes and ears alert. Gentlemen, in you go. There are oil lamps on a table. I shall now lock you in, and we shall greet one another in the morning. See you then, Inspector. Now, Count, to our post. Morning, Count Crispy. Well, nothing happened during the night. Or not a single sound. I was awake while you dozed off. Shall we have a look? You look out the side towards the moat, see if there's anything unusual. I look down into the courtyard. Uh, I can never find my glasses when I need them. <laughs> yeah, ah, yeah, always on top of my head. Mm. Not a stone out of place in the courtyard. Inspector, do you think that if no robbery took place last night, then it won't happen another night? <laughs> My dear Count, 
Even you, with all your wealth, could not engage me indefinitely. I am so relieved that nothing was taken. I can only presume, in the same way Lupin knew where my treasures were kept, he knew you were here and he called it off. Hmm. Well, let's go to the gallery and talk to our men this time. Count, you shall be the one to unlock the door. <laughs> Canember! Look at them both fast asleep. Look, look! The walls are bare! The two Rubens are gone! The, the, what two? Where? Where are the tapestries? Oh, no, no, both of them gone! All the miniatures in the glass cases, nothing is left! Not one little miniature! My, my Louis says sconces! My lord, look up there, that empty chain. That's where I had my agency chandelier. Oh, no, my 12th century virgin has been taken. Uh, uh, I cannot believe my eyes. The windows, no, fastened securely. There's not a crack in the ceiling. There's not a hole in the floor. Everything's in perfect order. Ah, everything happens to me. I have lost millions. The whole event has been carried out with method and speed and great artistry, I'm ashamed to say. He must have had an extraordinary plan. I hate him. How can you talk like you admire him? I hate him. You, Poignard, wake up. Calembert. Stupid fool! How can they still sleep? Don't they hear us? Let me get closer to them. Calembert. Poignard. His breath smells as if he's been drugged. But they've both been drugged. By whom? By whom? By him, of course, or by his gang acting under his instructions. Ah, it's a trick of his. Come to remember. At the Louvre, when the Mona Lisa was stolen, the two security guards on the floor were also drugged. That's it, then. It was definitely Arsène Lupin. It's hopeless. I shall never see my treasures again. My dear Count, you must immediately make a list of what is missing and report it. But what is the use? You might as well try. The law has its resources. What you are saying is... I might as well give up hope of ever recovering my pictures. He has stolen the pearls of my collection. Inspector, I would give a fortune to get them back. If you feel there is nothing the law can do to him, then let him name his price. Now, that is a reasonable idea. Do you mean it? Every word. Every single word. Yes, I mean it. Why do you ask? I have an idea. Uh, we'll discuss it in due time. Only, Count, not a word about my involvement to a soul. If you wish to succeed. I understand. You will be using underworld contacts, informers, and so forth. I swear to you, I shall catch him. As I look at this unfolding account of a miraculous theft by that Gallic gamester Arsène Lupin, I realize what Lupin has achieved by attacking the chateau as one would a fortress in wartime. Planning, logistics, and a shrewd knowledge of the opponent. A masterstroke by a Napoleon of crime. One of Sherlock Holmes's favorite phrases to describe his enemy Moriarty. I shall return shortly with Act Three. act begins to the sound of lamentations from a distraught millionaire who has just been robbed of what he calls the pearls of his collection. Despite all the efforts of Chief Inspector Gallimard, the suspected thief has made off with everything from miniatures to a chandelier without leaving a clue. How did he do it? If he did it, is incomprehensible in view of the fact that as our curtain rises, Arsène Lupin is still in a cell in Fontenay Prison. Author Maurice Leblanc continues. As Lupin's 
myself, neighbor. I am sworn to secrecy as to what actually took place at Count Crespi's chateau. Today, a visitor appeared. Someone who knew Lupin. Victor, the public prosecutor from Rouen. Thank you, God. I'll signal you when I'm ready to leave. You may lock me in with the prisoner. I cannot believe my eyes. Victor, I haven't seen you since, sir. Uh, when was it? And you haven't changed in ten years, Arsène. No, you have not seen me since the affair of the Mona Lisa. That's right. You were in charge of the security of the Louvre. What happened to you? Well, after the scandal of the sleeping guards and the enormous sum the treasury had to pay out for the return of the masterpiece, I was fired. Now I am public prosecutor in Rouen. Ah, Rouen. Lovely place, lovely cathedral. Isn't that quite near, uh, what's his name? Uh, it escapes me. Uh, uh, Count Crespi Chateau. Uh, so it is. Uh, and why are you here in Paris, Victor? The chief sent for me. Dubois. Ooh, the head, the entire department. He knew of our former association, and he hoped there would be a meeting of the minds. You know, Victor, I've always had the greatest regard for you. Well, <laughs> coming from a man at the top of his profession... I'm pleased to hear that. Oh, I said it a thousand times. That Victor is the most dedicated man I know. No, sit. Do sit. Oh, glad to. What a treat to see a decent man. Victor, through all these years, tell me to what I owe the honor of this visit. The Count Crespi case. Stop. Wait a bit. I have so many in hand. Uh, let me just tickle my brain. Crespi, Crespi. I have it. Of course. Two Rubens, a Watto, and a few minor trifles. No, trifles. A Regency chandelier, Beauvais tapestries. The poor man says he's been robbed of millions. You're not going to believe that, are you? And by the way, aside from the chief, how did you get involved in this? The Count sent me your letter, which at the time I believed was a forgery, and I told him so. And the police, I don't have to tell you how little they know. I've seen the morning papers. Again, they're crying for somebody's head. That's why, for old time's sake, I've come to you hat in hand. You are decent to me in the Mona Lisa affair and organized the ransom. That's true. Tell me, what can I do? First of all, the whole Crespi affair was done by you, wasn't it? Off the record. From start to finish. The registered letter to the Count, the telegram... Were sent by yours truly. In fact, I ought to have the receipts uh, somewhere. They've given me a table with one drawer. Uh, I'm sure I can find them. Uh, but this is for the registered letter and this for the telegram. I thought you were being kept under constant observation and searched on the slightest pretext... Yet you seem to read the morning papers and collect post office receipts. Victor, you have no idea what fools run this place. They rip up the lining of my waistcoat, explore the soles of my boots, uh, listen to the walls of my cell. But not one of them would believe Arsène Lupin would use a drawer in a table as a hiding place. Too obvious. Are you going to explain the crespy theft a little more? Uh, not too fast. The letter was the essential beginning. Yes? The essential starting point? Indispensable. The mainspring that set the whole machine in motion. The chateau was impregnable. A moat, electric warning bells, bolted doors, etc. How do I go about it? I know the owner, that fat-headed count, lives in fear. One day, he receives a letter from Arsène Lupin. Notorious housebreaker. What does he do? Sends the letter to me, the prosecutor. Who will laugh at him because said Lupin is under lock and key. <laughs> I'm afraid I did just that. <laughs> and if he happens to read the local newspaper, he learns the famous detective Gallimard is on vacation within walking distance. He believes what he reads. How did that get into the papers? I had put there. 
Then the fish, I mean the count, rises to the bait and makes the acquaintance of the man he thinks is the Inspector Gallimard, and he begs this man to assist him against me. This is becoming more and more original. So the detective engaged by the count was not Gallimard. I told you that. Thereupon a telegram. The count quivers with fear. He entreats the false Gallimard to protect him, and the so-called Gallimard brings in two of the boys from our gang who during the night remove certain objects through the window and lower them with ropes into a boat floating on the moat. And all night long the count is kept in sight by his protector in a far part of the chateau. Count Crespi will be notifying the police within a few hours that he doesn't wish to pursue the matter. But that's not possible. The chief never mentioned it. Are you saying the chief knows more than I do about my business? This so-called Gallimard was authorized by the Count to negotiate a deal with me. And chances are when the business arrangements are concluded, the Count will have all his collection returned. And so he withdraws the charge. So there is no question of theft. It never happened and even if you care to, you, my dear Victor, the public prosecutor of Rouen, will have nothing to prosecute. Oh, God, I'm not ready to leave yet. Well, he didn't come for you. He's brought me my breakfast. But do set the tray on the table, Pierre. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> Look at that. Bread, ham, sausages, boiled egg, and coffee. They treat you well in the Fontenay. Of course, over the years, I've been able to secure jobs for many of those who work here. A few false papers, and they're hired, and they enjoy it. You have some of your own people working in the prison? <laughs> it's hard work, but they like it. Uh, where was I? Well, you tell me the Count is about to withdraw charges of grand theft. How do you know all this? I have just received the telegram I was expecting. Whatever you're talking about, you received no telegram. When was this? This very moment, my friend. Uh, Victor, have the kindness to cut off the top of that boiled egg for me. Gently. You will see for yourself I'm not making fun of you. It's an empty shell. There's nothing inside. Are you sure? Uh, uh, let me just reach my fingers into it. Uh, little lower. There we are. Victor, I hand you a piece of blue paper folded quite small. Would you please read it? Yes. It is a telegram. Uh, arrangement settled. 100,000 paid over. All well. 100,000 paid over? 100,000 francs. It's not much, but these are hard times. So you have managed another ransom. I was getting bored in here. I had to do something to amuse myself, to occupy my spare time. Especially since the swindle could only succeed while I was in prison. I would rather enjoyed playing the part of Inspector Gallimard. I think I did it rather better than he does. You mean that was you? Not an accomplice? Of course it was me. But how did you get out of here? I walked out. How could you do that? As easily as having a telegram brought to me in an eggshell. You simply walked out of this prison and no one said anything? What should they say? They knew I'd come back as soon as my business was completed. Did the warden know... He was the only one in the entire Fontenay prison who was deceived. The rest of the prison staff reported I was in my cell, asleep, awake at meals, in the exercise yard, etc., etc. Why did they cover for you like that? I told you, the guards are my friends. Arsène Lupin remains in prison as long as he wishes to, and not a moment longer. Oh, God, will you open up the cell door, please? Uh, Victor, a moment. Ah, huh? what is it? You've forgotten your new gold watch. I have? No. Yes. I just happened to find it in my pocket. Here, 
Please forgive me. <laughs> An old bad habit. Uh, they've taken mine, but that's no reason why I should rob you of yours. Especially since I have a watch here which keeps perfect time. Did I show it to you? Isn't this a beauty? Also, solid gold. Heavy gold chain. And out of whose pocket did it come? A good question. I never look. J.G. The initial is J.G. on the case. Now, what on earth does that stand for? Of course I remember. Jean Gallimard. The real Gallimard. Who arrested me in Boston. Not many people know his first name is Jean. You ask me how I know all this. These extraordinary machinations of one Arsène Lupin. How could I not? I occupied the cell next to his. The day before he skipped out of prison for good, I had to delicately put to him that I'd been spying on him and that he so inspired me, I hoped to write a series of Arsène Lupin books and would he give me his permission to do it? And he said, My dear Maurice, of course you can. I like the name you have chosen to call me. Arsène Lupin. It looks sinful and wolfish. Since it is a name you made up and not my real name, why not? No one in France would recognize it as me because you will probably have a difficult time making me appear as clever as I am. Au revoir, mon vieux. Au bon succès with your books. Maurice Leblanc's creation, Arsène Lupin, from the moment it was first published, took France and the continent by storm, then crossed the oceans and the English and Americans took the light-fingered gentleman housebreaker to their hearts. In a way, we can sympathize with a man like that who can bring crime, culture, and cleverness to our imagination. Vicariously, we can steal with him without any of the dangers. I shall return shortly. of robbing only the rich, Arsène Lupin observed, of course, one doesn't rob the poor. They have nothing worth taking. How like his 12th century ancestor, Robin Hood. It is said of him, poor men's goods he spared, abundantly rewarding them with that which by theft he got from abbeys and houses of the rich. It's always a joy to remember a man who is cleverer than his pursuers. As I said before, it gives one a vicarious thrill. Our cast included Lee Richardson, Bob Caliban, Louis Turenne, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by White Westinghouse Appliance Company. This is Tammy Grimes, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Good speed to your youthful valor, boy. So shall you scale the stars. To scale the stars. 
to the great Virgil who penned those words 2,000 years ago, it was merely a poetic metaphor in the same league with climbing the highest mountain and reaching for the moon. And although today all three phrases have become tantalizing realities, they are still deeds associated with the bravest, the noblest, and most sparkling of creatures, the explorer. Yes, they're still around. Some reaching for that distant star. Of course, nobody ever tells them what to do if and when they finally get there. And that can be downright disastrous. You are talking about them as if they were animals. They are animals. They're intelligent beings. Rubbish. And they deserve to be treated with dignity, even respect. You are coming dangerously close to losing your job, Doctor. Justify it any way you want. There's only one word for what you intend to do. And what is that? Murder. Plain and simple murder. <laughs> mystery drama, Stranded, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Victoria Dan and stars Marion Seldes and Gordon Gould. I'll be back shortly with Act One. They are two astronauts, the best and the brightest. They have been sent out further than any manned probe has ever gone past the farthest moon, past the most distant planet in the solar system, out beyond the loneliest outpost. For the past three years, they have been gathering data from their survey of the nearest star, a star with a ring of planets all its own. But now begins the most treacherous part of the mission, the journey home. And you know the first thing I'm going to do when we get back, Barry? Take one of those long, wet showers in real water. Turn the spigot on full force and let that steam just bake right in. What are you going to do? Oh, uh, <laughs> I haven't thought about it much. <laughs> you crazy. All I've been thinking about is that nice little reunion with my wife and my kid. Would you believe he's four? He wasn't even walking when I left. Oh, come on, Perry. Isn't there anybody you'll be happy to see? No, no, Raymond. You should have gotten married. Just knowing that my wife is waiting for me. I like it my way. No family, no ties. Yeah, but three years out and another three back. I like space. I don't want to go home. They're going to make you a general? Yeah, yeah. And put me behind some desk. And if I want to sign up for another mission, I'll be competing with guys who are brighter and every year always younger. Well, I've had it with space. As soon as we get back, I'm quitting. To do what? Make a bushel of money publishing my findings. What findings? The preliminary studies of this solar system. I know you've logged your opinion, but I still maintain that a strong possibility exists that one or two of the inner planets contain atmospheres capable of sustaining life. Perhaps intelligent life. Let's hear this. What if... Just what if... It's a life form even more intelligent than we are. What? Oh. Are you picking up anything on the screen? No. What about ultrasound? Holy cow. A meteor swarm and closing fast. It can't be. It would have shown up on the screen. And the dark screen isn't working. I just checked the circuits yesterday. Maybe we can program a course out of this. Go to auxiliary. Right. We're right in the center of it, Perry. Evasive maneuver. Come on, come on. Another one like that, we've had it. It's, it's responding. Oh, yeah. We're, we're clear now. Yes, for a minute, I thought we'd had it. Oh, no. What is it? What's wrong? Just look at the signal light. It's still at cold yellow. But how bad could the damage be? We're about to find out. Well, how bad? We're out of the meteor shower, all right, but not soon enough. I don't think I like the look on your face. That first meteor, it glanced off the hull. And? It ruptured the seal. Uh, are you sure? Code orange. Yeah, I'm sure. Do you realize what this means? Yeah. 
We've got maybe five minutes until the pressure blows this thing apart. Oh, how can this be happening? How can this be happening now? Get your oxygen helmet on, Ray. This is Mega 7. I repeat, Mega 7. Abandoning main craft. We have sustained severe structural damage. Repeat, we are abandoning ship. Code red. Less than four minutes. Harry, wait. Get to the lifeboat. Listen, please. What the devil's the matter with you? Just listen. There's got to be another Move way. It. Harry, get down the ladder now. But the lifeboat hasn't got enough. That's an order. There she goes. Blown apart like a piece of fruit. Maybe it's a blessing there isn't any sound in outer space. At least we didn't have to hear it explode. Yeah. It's time to talk, Ray. Our first choice is just to float free until we stretch out all the oxygen and fuel. Now, I, I figure that way we might be able to last four, maybe five months. I'll never see my kid. I'll never get to talk to him. The second choice, the one I think we ought to go with, is to keep heading in the opposite direction of home. It's a long shot, I know. But heading towards some of the inner planets, utilizing the remaining fuel... The opposite direction of home? Forget home, Ray. But, Perry, even if we make it to one of these planets, even if the atmosphere is livable... The chances are a million to one. Those odds are a lot better than the ones we have now. This is a lifeboat. It's not equipped for anything but docking. Yeah. Well, that's a risk we'll have to take. It's also not designed for heavy landings. So what's the alternative? If the re-entry doesn't kill us, the impact will. We'll die anyway. Yeah. I suppose we will at that. I must have drifted off for a minute. Don't you remember? You took a sleep pill. Did I? Uses up less oxygen that way. How long? Oh, eight, maybe nine hours. Oh, no, no. How long have we been in here? How long since the accident? Don't you remember? No. Three months... One day, seven hours and 42 minutes. It's the air, isn't it? That's why my mind is so slow. It's down as thin as we can stand it. I never wanted to die in space. I always figured I'd die in bed at a ripe old age. Did I ever tell you about the old tri-level house we bought by the lake? Wait. Can you see it? What? Look how close we are now. Is that the planet? The one can't be more than a million miles away. What do you think? It's very small, isn't it? We'll have just enough fuel to make it into their atmosphere. Well, we'll burn up like a match. Oh, you know I'm a little fed up with your negative attitude. We're going to die. That's a fact. If you say that one more time. Up here, down there, what's the difference? Right. Please, just try to hang on a little longer. Don't crack up on me. I'm scared, Perry. I can't help myself. I'm scared. I'm scared, too. Do you think they look like us? Who? The creatures on that planet we're going to try to land on? What makes you think there'll be any life there at all? I'm a scientist. I sense these things. Oh, come on, Ray. Go, go back to sleep. Very intelligent creatures, I'll bet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With two heads and green hair. Go to sleep. How long do we get there? Ten solar days. You feel better? My head's a lot clearer, if that's what you mean. I raised the oxygen levels. I figure in a few moments it won't make a difference one way or the other. Fifteen seconds to re-entry. 
Ten seconds. What kind of a world is waiting for us down there? Whatever it is, it's the only one we've got. Five seconds. Oh, just pray our parachute slows down a little. Two. One. Brace yourself. External temperature, 1,000 degrees. We're not slowing down enough. It's still too fast. We're going to hit hard. It's going to crash. Barry? Barry? I'm over here. We're actually alive. <laughs> we actually made it. Ray, my leg. Uh, it's pinned under the console. I'll get you out. Don't worry. I'll get you out. Oh! Oh, oh. Ash. It, it, it must be broken. Now, now lean on me. Uh, oh. Come on. Just lean on me. Oh, oh, oh. oh. We've got to get out of here. It's an oven. I can't breathe. Help me open the hatch. Oh, hurry. Oh. Oh. Look. Just look at this. Such a vast open space. Miles and miles of flat open space. It's barren. The sky. Look at the sky. It's flame. The sun. It's on fire. It's so bright. Have you ever seen such colors in a sunset? Uh, uh, the rock oh, over there. Help me. Help me, would you? Yeah. I, I can't stand on my feet any longer. Here. Here. Take it easy. This sounds crazy, but I think the air here is richer in oxygen than home. Oh, my leg. Just, just sit still. I'll find something to set it with. You see? What did I tell you? The odds were in our favor. We made it. We're still alive. So far, so good. But what we really need is water. Yeah. Yeah. There might be... Some sort of underground well. Harry? Yes? Listen. To what? Can't you hear it? All I hear is a, a rumble in my ears. A pounding in my head. That noise. That rumbling. It's coming this way. Wait. Yeah. Yes. I think I hear something. An earthquake. No, no, no. no. Oh, it's something... Something familiar. Something... Wait a minute. That's... That's a mechanical sound. A motor. Not just one, though. Two, three, maybe more. A motor? What am I saying? What am I saying? Who built the motors? There's your answer. Vehicles. Motorized vehicles. That's impossible. Why? Why is it impossible? Because it takes intelligent life to build mechanical devices. There's no camouflage. We're exposed on all sides. We, we don't even have our guns. Harry, what makes you think this is going to be some kind of massacre? They might be aliens, but they're obviously highly intelligent. Or they wouldn't be driving those trucks or whatever they are. They could have two heads, you know that. They could have two heads. <laughs> Would you listen to me? I'm, I'm babbling like an idiot. It's just my leg. I'm so dizzy. I, I can't think straight. They're not close enough to see. Wait. What kind of monsters are they? Look at their faces. They're moving closer. I can't see. Good Lord. Look at their faces. I can't focus, Ray. What do you see? Look at their faces. In the name of heaven, Ray. Tell me what you see. She 
fear, it is said, creates an ugliness all its own. In the backwaters of our minds, lurking in the dark recesses of our subconscious, are the shadowy creatures that nightmares are made of. But what substance do the monsters of our dreams have in reality? Are they manufactured from fairy tales and horror stories of our childhood? Or is there really an ugliness beyond our wildest fantasies waiting for us somewhere out there? Or maybe just as far away as Act Two. Can life exist on other worlds? To be specific, can intelligent beings exist in places so far away they are merely points of light in the midnight sky? And if so, what will they look like? Might they be green-skinned, two-headed creatures? Or perhaps monsters so hideous that like the Medusa in ancient legend, the very sight of them would turn a man to stone? On the other hand, might such alien beings not be so very frightful to look at after all? Our two astronauts, who have just crash-landed on the unexplored planet, are about to find out. What do you see, Ray? Their faces. I still can't... Tell. They're coming closer. Can you see it now? Yes. But... But... It's impossible. Impossible? It can't be. They... They look like us. Exactly like us. But they're aliens. No. We're the aliens. Out of a million planets and a million star systems, how can such a coincidence happen? It can't be coincidence. It has to be something more. They're surrounding us, getting into some kind of ring. What is it? Don't you recognize a military formation? They are soldiers. What do they intend to do? The one with all the insignia. He must be the ranking officer. Yes. You there, the leader. Uh, we come in peace. Ray, no. He, he's coming toward us. Don't, 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 don't make any sudden moves. They're taking aim. No. Don't move. But they've got to understand that we don't mean them any harm. Ray, keep your hands at your sides. We've got to communicate with them. Can't you see? They're just as frightened as we are. They're going to kill us. Oh, look at them. I think what we have here is an old-fashioned standoff. Oh. So, what now? Hold on to my arm. I can't seem to stand up without help. <laughs> oh, the pain is shooting up my spine. What? What is it, Perry? The, the sun. It, it's so bright. Why, why, why are you... It's getting so hot. Harry! I can't seem to keep my eyes open. Harry, what is wrong? Pain. pain. You've got to stay awake. I've got to hold on. I've got to keep my eyes open. Look, they're moving closer. They're too civilized to kill. Must get them. Harry, they're closing in I on us. and black on my no, no, no. Harry! Oh. Harry, wake up. I can't face them alone. Whoever, whatever you are, stay away. Don't kill us. Who, uh, who are you? So, you are awake at last. You, you understand me? Yes. But how can you... I am a doctor of languages. For the past two weeks, I have been intensely studying the common sounds and symbols which your words have. Two weeks? I've been unconscious for two weeks? The sleeping injection to ease the pain of your injury was most effective. Your leg has been set by surgeons. Wait a minute, hold on. What do you mean, surgeons? Uh, am I home? The tissue should mend quite effectively. No, I can't be home. I, I remember now. Raymond. Where's Raymond? Your companion, the Major. Where is he? I assure you, he is quite well. But where is he? The Major has explained to us about your scientific mission. Look, whatever your name is, what... I am called Dr. Rea, and you are Colonel 
Perry. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is all a dream, isn't it? I'm... <laughs> I'm in some padded white room on some alien planet talking to some female who looks for all the world like... Like what? I haven't seen a female in over three years. Of course, this is a dream. I assure you, Colonel, you are quite conscious. Except for your hair. I've never seen hair that color before. What kind of chemical pigment do you treat it with? This is its natural state. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that's what they all say. I'm... I'm not dreaming, then. This is all real. This is happening. All right. Who and what are you? As I have previously stated, my name is Dr. Rea. I am a linguist. You're an alien. This word, alien. The Major has also repeatedly used such a word. In this case, however, the term is inaccurate. You are the aliens. Okay, we are the aliens. So how can you look like we do? We have asked the same question. How can you look like us? I hope you've had better luck answering it than I have. The greatest scientists in the land are even now working night and day to discover the answer. First, we... If you were a doctor, why, why do you sound like a nurse? I was about to explain that this experience is quite new to us. It's new to me, too. When your space Craft first appeared on our radar screens, there was much fear. You mean you tracked our ship? So did our enemies. What enemies? There was a worldwide war alert. An object was descending into the atmosphere at high speed. No one could believe that the object, your ship, was actually what it appeared to be, a vehicle approaching from outer space. One enemy accused Look, another. I'm, I'm not interested in your petty squabbles. Even now, the situation on the planet grows tense. Only the highest powers in each nation are aware of your existence. What are you talking about? There could be great panic in the world if it was known we had been invaded. Invaded? By... Wait, you, you think that we... Literally, Colonel Perry. The term is correct. You will excuse me, I must go now and make my report. Wait a minute. Why am I strapped into this bed? It is a necessary precaution. A precaution against what? Believe me, it is all rather embarrassing. I, I asked you a question. I must go now. Answer me! Doctor! Is that really you? Oh, I've never been so glad to see anybody in my entire life. Ray? I kept asking them to let me see you. They wouldn't. I thought you were dead. Ray, what's going on out there? Out where? Outside this padded cell without windows. What kind of people are they? Have you talked to anybody in charge? In charge? The only one I've seen so far is that female, the, the, the doctor. Ray, it's, it's been a month since we crashed. In that time, they've kept me in this little cubicle. I want someone to tell me what's going on. They don't know what to do with us. They? The aliens. I mean, the people who are holding us. You see, where we landed, it wasn't just any place. Uh, I don't understand. The first few weeks when I was learning about them, I found out that they're still behind us in certain ways. They're still divided into countries of power. And where we landed was in a special place, a secret place in one of those countries. A secret place? A kind of war base, a weapons installation. Are you serious? I'm not sure what kind of weapons. But from the nature of what I've been able to figure out so far, it's probably nuclear. Nuclear? Is that possible? Theoretically, anything's possible. How advanced do you think they are? I really haven't given it much thought. We have to make plans for our escape, Barry. If you're talking like this is some sort of prison. It is a prison. It's a planet. And we're stuck here whether we like it or not. I don't like it. Nobody's asking you to like it. 
There's nothing we can do about it. Besides, you're the award-winning scientist. Now, here's the opportunity most men dream of. This world, so much like our own. Did it evolve separately from us? Or perhaps an earlier civilization? Oh, who cares about that now? But, Raymond, why else did they send us into space? And why else did you go? I'm sorry I ever went. Anyway, do you think that's what we are to them? Scientists? Explorers of the unknown? No. I'll tell you what we are. We're invaders. Creatures from outer space. And I'll tell you what else we are. Laboratory specimens. Oh, come on, Ray. You think I'm overreacting? I'm a scientist, remember? If a couple of aliens landed on our world, how would we behave? Would we treat them any differently than they've treated us? I don't know. Oh, yes, you do. First thing we'd do is keep them in isolation. Then we get the best scientists on the planet to study them the way they're studying us. Studying us? Those tiny little spaces in the ceiling, they're miniature cameras. Every sound we make, every move is watched, observed, cataloged. That's all we are. Laboratory animals. Well, surely they realize how advanced we are. And that's all we'll ever be. Stuck in little cages for the rest of our lives. Even if what you say is true, there isn't much we can do about it. We can escape. You keep using that word. We have to escape. 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 Where? And how am I to face the odds of man's bedevilment and God's? I, a stranger and afraid, in a world I never made. Great words from Mr. Houseman. And what better way to leave us hanging as the fate of our two travelers is temporarily suspended until, of course, we return to face the odds in Act Three. So far, we've presented a tale of two stranded astronauts forced to spend the rest of their lives on a strange, distant world. You might very well declare that here is just an updated version of Robinson Crusoe. Instead of the loneliness of a desert island, Colonel Perry and Major Raymond face the bitter isolation of four walls. And instead of an ocean to separate them from civilization, there lies the infinity of space. And something else, too. Mysterious jailers, the inhabitants of this alien planet, who, with one exception, have chosen to remain hidden from view. Although, perhaps in the name of fair play, it is time we examine their side of the story. Order. Can we have a little order here? General, what do you intend to do with the aliens? Mr. Secretary, one question at a time. Aliens, the whole thing's a hoax, and you know it. Gentlemen, please. You'll all have a chance to say what you've come here to say. Now, we have before us a most delicate situation. After one month of intensive examination, our findings prove quite conclusive. These two men, most definitely, are from another world. Uh, would you present your findings, Professor Ulto? The uh, two creatures come from a planet in the next star system, approximately five light years away. The velocity required for such a lengthy voyage indicates a technology far exceeding our own. These are highly intelligent beings. But how do we know the whole thing isn't an elaborate fake? A fake? The intricate workings of their spacecraft... The materials of their clothes unlike anything we've ever come across. No, I assure you, this is not a fake. Thank you, Professor. Uh, gentlemen, we are faced with a dilemma. If the existence of these creatures were to become common knowledge, worldwide hysteria could result. The question I put to you is, can we afford a mass panic? <laughs> Come in. Ah, doctor. How are you? 
General, I must speak to you. Have I told you what an incredible job you've done with those aliens? Thank you. Deciphering that mysterious alphabet of theirs, unlocking their strange language. Yes, well... Genius. Sheer genius is what it is. Don't think you won't be rewarded for your efforts. General... This is very important. I have heard a rather disturbing rumor. This is a top-secret installation. There aren't supposed to be any kind of rumors. Is it true you plan to keep the existence of these two aliens a complete mystery? Doctor... Don't put me in this position. I can understand the rationale. The world isn't ready for such a revelation. But how long do you intend to keep them down here? Creatures that look like us? How can we let them loose on the planet? It's one thing if they were monsters or just different. But these aliens could blend right in with the population. We would never be able to identify them. Then what you're saying is they will remain here, underground, permanently? Is it better to have mass panic? People suspecting each other of being aliens? General, I must know. If you must know anything else, do me a favor and ask Professor Ulto. Professor Ulto, what does he have to do? Why don't you go ask him, Doctor? Ah, Miss Rea. Always such a pleasure to see your pretty face. Yes, Professor Otto. It concerns the two aliens. The aliens, Miss Rea? It's Dr. Rea. Oh, of course. Forgive me, but you are so young for such an achievement. I naturally forget. About the aliens. Yes, Doctor. Is it true? Is what true? Don't fence with me. You know what I'm talking about. Doctor, you really must learn to control your sharp tongue. Did the security committee grant you a free hand with the aliens? What if they did? What do you intend to do with them? Why such a personal interest? I have been in on this thing since the beginning. I was the first person to communicate with them. I learned their language. Jealous, I... Doctor? No. Of course. You feel slighted, overlooked. It's just... That... I've heard stories, Professor. Stories? About experiments you conduct when you can get volunteers. And you object to these experiments? Then the stories are true. What if they are? But it's barbaric. Probing the mysteries of life is not barbaric. Is that what you intend to do with my two aliens? Your two aliens. We have been gifted by the visit of a shining new culture. The treasure of a new language, a magnificent language. I really don't see the point in becoming hysterical. Certainly not over a couple of creatures. But you're talking about them as if they were animals. They are animals. They're intelligent Beings. They deserve to be treated with dignity, even respect. If I became sentimental over every creature I dissected... Dissected? You out of your mind. There's only one word for what you intend to do. And what is that? Murder. <laughs> Plain and simple murder. <laughs> This is the evidence I spoke of, General. Evidence? What are you talking about? These documents here, which I will ask you to circulate, which will prove this entire alien business was simply a hoax. Yes, that's what I thought you said, but... We both know that these two aliens are genuine. But what good does it do either of us? I don't understand. By some incredible... Twist of fate or coincidence of evolution. They look like human beings. But you and I, General, know that they are from another world. We know they truly are aliens. Don't we? Yes. The spaceship and their clothing proved it. But we must change that. We must agree on what the facts really were... And what the facts are going to become. I have absolutely no idea what you're getting at, Doctor. Then listen to me. These are the new facts. 
you are going to release a statement that what crashed in the desert was some kind of manned probe. Experimental, of course, belonging to another department. Well, what other department? Oh, who cares? You make one up. There are so many secret projects these days who can keep track. You're suggesting that we fabricate some lie? Yes, we cannot afford to let the world find out the truth. You heard them all at the security meeting. They want to believe it was a hoax. Well, make it easy on yourself. Let it be a hoax. Oh, of all the ridiculous... Admit it, General, isn't that how you'd like to see the problem resolved? As a hoax? Well, even if I did, there's still no way. There are many ways. The first is to destroy what's left of their clothing and spaceship, the only proof that the two of them are aliens. And then we must substitute proof that they are human. But they are not human. Agreed. But with a couple of false birth certificates and other necessary identification papers, quite simple to produce, who is going to know different? Uh, you make it sound very simple. Give me a year, General. And some of our best personnel. We could teach the aliens our ways, our customs. Well, what if these creatures don't want to cooperate? But they want to survive, don't they? For all intents and purposes, this is their home now. They'll have to learn to live in it. Well, I don't know. I just don't know. By the way, General, there are several people who would prefer to take care of the situation my way. What people? The right people. The people you, for example, depend upon for your next promotion. What are you saying? I'm saying, General, that I have connections. Uh-huh. Go on. There is an isolated spot in the west by the sea. It's peaceful, beautiful, secure, but not a prison underground like here. It would be the perfect place to take them, to re-educate them. Why? Why what, sir? Why are you doing this? I thought that was obvious, General. I want them to live. Raymond, yesterday you came to see me. Today I'm visiting you. <laughs> I've learned how to move on these crutches. <laughs> Something crazy is going on here. No one is guarding us anymore. Someone unstrapped my bed, left the door unlocked, and a pair of crutches by... Ray, what's the matter with you? You know what this place is? A great big laboratory. <laughs> we could have died out there in space. We'd have been better off. Instead, we survive a crash landing on an unknown planet. Against all odds, it's a, a planet within the range of our lifestyle. A planet with an oxygen atmosphere. With a, with yes, it would have been better to die in space. It's never better to die when you can live. Ray, you've got to pull yourself together. I call it a living death. No, no, I call it surviving. Well, if it isn't the good doctor... You will both please change into these garments. Why? What's going on? Once clothed in these work uniforms, you could pass for a couple of technicians. Here are your identification badges. Wait a minute. What are you up Quickly, to? Quickly. There's not much time. Time for what? For your escape, of course. Escape? They've staged a safety drill and cleared the halls for 30 minutes. That will give us just enough time to make it up to level one. And what, may I ask, is waiting for us at level one? Transportation out of here. To where? Do you trust me, Colonel? Why should I trust anybody on this planet? Because you need a friend. Doctor, why the sudden change? Why are you doing this? Because like you... I am an explorer. Escape? That's a joke. Escape where? Major Raymond, there's a whole world outside. But it's the wrong world. Gentlemen, you can come willingly or not at all. Raymond. It's the wrong world. Raymond. It's the only world we've got now. <laughs> 
Is your planet all like this? A desert? No. When we head northwest, you'll be able to see the ocean. I'm glad you decided to come with us, Major Raymond. Very glad. Did I have a choice? Perhaps someday you might even learn to call our planet home. No, Doctor. Home is a billion miles away. And what about you, Colonel? I don't really know. You say this vehicle is headed in the direction of the ocean? Yes. Uh, tell me more about an ocean. There is water as far as the eye can see. Is such a thing possible? In fact, water makes up three quarters of our world. Three quarters? Why, that's fantastic. It's impossible, Perry. I assure you it is quite possible, Major. There are many amazing things we can see, if you will let us show them to you. Yes, this is a most amazing planet. What do you call it, Doctor? I call it home. And one day you will also. For the meantime, Colonel, you can just call it... Earth. Earth, the third planet from a tiny yellow star, perched near the edge of a somewhat insignificant galaxy, swallowed up in an infinity of galaxies in an endless universe. Yet... For all our unimportance, who knows how brightly the light of our little world might shine in some distant night sky, billions of light years away. I'll be back shortly. How wise was Lord Tennyson? Surely a man before his time. I am part of all that I have met, he wrote. Yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world. And that is what we do here. Present archways to untraveled worlds. Worlds not only light years away, but yesterdays away. Worlds of tomorrow. And then again, worlds not far beyond our backyard. It all depends on where one's interests lie. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Gordon Gould, and Bernie Grant. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Most of us have read or at least heard of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. But by the time it appeared in 1850, its author, then 46 years old, had been writing and publishing since his graduation from college collections of short stories. It is one of these that we are about to bring you, written long before The Scarlet Letter and titled The Birthmark. Watch closely. The slender stalk shoots upward. The leaves unfold. And there, in the center, a perfect flower. Pluck it, my love. I dare not. I dare not touch it. 
It's magical. Our mystery drama, The Birthmark, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Tony Roberts and Gordon Heath. It is sponsored in part by General Electric Citizen Band Radios and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. part of the 18th century, when this country was being born and the recent discovery of electricity and kindred mysteries of nature seemed to open paths into the region of miracle, it was not uncommon for the love of science to rival the love of woman. This is the story of one such rivalry. <laughs> the great man is late again. Late yesterday, late today, and probably late tomorrow. The laboratory awaits him. The distiller bubbles and waits. The retorts, the tubes, the cylinders, the crucibles, all are immaculate and sparkling and waiting for him. Soon the glow of the furnace will be red as rubies. Oh! All attend upon the appearance of the great man. And where is he? Good morning, Aminadab. A fine morning to you, master. I'm a trifle late. A new bridegroom is permitted a little tardiness. And how is the bride? Georgiana. Georgiana is... Do you know her, Aminadab? How should such a one as I know such a one as she? Have you ever seen her? From a distance only. Ah. I know what I hear. That she is adored by men. Envied by women. Mm, that's true. In short, perfection. That's not quite true. Oh? Did you not know that the beautiful, the exquisite Georgiana has a birthmark? I may have heard something. Mm, in the center of her cheek, her left cheek, a peculiar mark, woven deep, you might say, into the texture and substance of her face. The mark is shaped like a hand, a tiny hand. They say many an enamored swain would have risked his life to press his lips to that hand. Mm. I suppose that's true. Conversely, some ladies call it the bloody hand. They go so far as to say that it quite destroys the effect of her beauty, even renders her hideous. Of course, it is the ladies who say that. But the gentlemen, if their admiration is not actually heightened by the little flaw, they simply wish it would go away, so that this imperfect world might possess one living specimen of ideal loveliness. Uh, they say that is the feeling of some. Mm. It's beginning to be my own. Oh? Before we were married, I gave it no thought. So caught up was I with her incomparable loveliness. But now, your feeling has changed? In the usual state of her complexion, which is a healthy though delicate bloom, the birthmark wears only a tint of deeper crimson, imperfectly defining its pygmy hand shaped amid the surrounding rosiness. When Georgiana blushes, as she so often does, it becomes more and more indistinct and finally vanishes amid the triumphant rush of blood that bathes her whole cheek with its brilliant glow. Ah, then... But if any shifting motion causes her to turn pale, there is the mark again, a crimson stain upon the virgin snow. Ah. Hmm. If only she were less beautiful, I could forgive it. She is otherwise so perfect. The birthmark disturbs you. I find it intolerable. Intolerable? And more so with each passing moment. The fatal flaw which nature stamps ineffaceably on all her productions. Why must it be so? I will not accept it. It sucks at the very heart of her beauty. 
It crushes my love for her. It poisons my marriage. I will not accept it. No. Never. What can you do, master, but accept it? Remove it. Remove it? I'm convinced it can be done. That you can do it? Would I entrust my beloved to the coarse, indifferent hands of another? Have you suggested this possibility to your wife? Shortly after we were married, yes. And what was her response? At first she smiled. Then she saw that I was serious. She blushed and said that her birthmark had often been considered one of her charms. And that she herself had been simple enough to imagine it might well be. And so it might. On another face than hers, it might indeed. But not on yours, I told her. You came so nearly perfect from the hand of nature, I said, that the slightest possible defect shocks me as being the visible mark of earthly imperfection. That you should be shocked by her imperfection. Oh, my. Yes. Shocked. That was the word that did it. She burst into tears and said I could not possibly love what shocked me. Better we had never married, she said. But try as I might, I could not retract my words. God help me. God help us both. They were true. With that, the great man turns away from me. To hide tears, perhaps. Who knows? And he applies himself to a study of the notes for his current experiment. I dare not presume further upon our relationship by pursuing the topic. But the demeanor of the great man continues downcast through the next days. Nothing goes right. Nothing. Nothing. Master. Hmm? Consider resting from your efforts for a brief span. <sighs> Very well. And uh, he will rest. Agreed. We'll um, smoke a pipe together and try to cleanse our minds. Mm. Sit down. Thank you, Master. You, you remember what we talked of a few days back? Your wife, her birthmark, the possibility of removing it. Yes, I remember too well. It occurs to me that things may be going poorly for you here in the laboratory because... Your mind is still occupied with that problem. My mind is obsessed with it. Consumed by it. You cannot believe how it has taken over my thoughts. I am destroyed by my obsession with my beloved's birthmark and how to be rid of it. Have you spoken of it further? To her? I cannot help it. I mean not to speak of it. Wrench my thoughts and my words away from it. Firmly, purposefully. But no matter what my intent, what my effort, I revert inevitably to the subject of the birthmark. A minute habit has become the central point of my existence. With the morning light, I open my eyes to my wife's face and see immediately the sign of imperfection. When we sit together at the evening hearth, my eyes wander stealthily to her cheek and behold, flickering with the blaze of the wood fire, the spectral hand. And is your young wife aware of your furtive spying? Unhappily, she is. Now she shudders at my gaze. Ah, uh, my poor master. The other night, I had a dream. You know, Aminadab, that I place great store by dreams and their meaning. Georgiana woke me and told me that I had cried out in my sleep, that I had shouted. It is in her heart now. We must have it out. She asked me, did I have any recollection of the dream that had caused me to utter those horrendous words? And did you? I told her no, and it was true. I had no remembrance whatsoever, though I might understandably have had a dream about the birthmark since before I fell asleep it had taken a firm hold on my musings. And you cannot remember the dream? No. And yet... Yes? And yet? Speaking with you here, now... Uh, relaxed. Relaxed the way we are. Yes. There's a spark. There's a glimmer. Yes, master. You. You were in my dream, Aminadab. I, master? Yes. You. You and I were together. We... We were attempting... 
an operation for the removal of the crimson hand. Oh, master. But the deeper went the knife, the deeper sank the little hand, until, at length, its tiny grasp caught hold upon her heart. Master, for the love of... But even then, even then, I was resolved, inexorably resolved, to cut it out or wrench it away. Oh, master, what's to be done? I must tell Georgiana the dream. Must you? Truth finds its way to the mind close muffled in robes of sleep. Until now, I had not known of the absolute tyranny this one idea has had over my mind. Until now, I have not known the lengths I might go to to give myself peace. Then you are determined... I am a scientist, Aminadab. I cannot think of myself as anything else. And science demands that we follow every scrap of revealed truth, no matter where it leads. The great man sits by the stove. His notebooks have not been opened. The tubes and retorts have not been touched. The chemicals sit upon the shelf. I move quietly about the laboratory. He seems not to know I am here. Master. Oh. Oh, I mean it, Dad. You're not disposed to continue the experiment we started some weeks past? Oh, I cannot even remember it. Oh, Master. I mean it, Dad. I have told Georgiana the dream. And what did she respond, if I may ask? She said... She said... Aylmer, I know not what may be the cost to rid me of this fatal birthmark. Perhaps its removal may cause cureless deformity. Or it may be that the stain goes deep as life itself. Besides, do we know that a possibility even exists of unclasping the grip of this little hand which was laid upon me before I came into the world? All through. What could you say? I said what I believe that I am convinced of the perfect practicability of its removal. And then she said, Aylmer, let the attempt be made. Danger is nothing to me. Life is a burden while this hateful mark makes me the object of your horror and disgust. Aylmer, she said, remove this dreadful hand or take my wretched life. Brave woman. Spare me not, Aylmer, though you should find the birthmark in my heart. And so I kissed her on the cheek, her right cheek, not the cheek that bore the impress of the crimson hand. I tremble for my master. I tremble for his bride. I think I tremble for myself, for I am not of Aylmer's stature. I am but a poor clod, meant to serve, never to command, meant to assist, never to initiate. Yet, where he leads, I must follow. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Love is not love that alters when it alteration finds. Shakespeare wrote that in a sonnet. What would he say of a birthmark in the shape of a tiny hand and the alteration necessary to remove it and the insistent desire to do away with it? We'll return shortly with Act Two. sooner had the great scientist married the most beautiful of women than his critical eye fastened upon a flaw in her beauty, a tiny birthmark in the shape of a hand which glowed fiery red against the pallor of one cheek. Haunted by the desire to erase the slight blemish, he has attained her consent to attempt the erasure himself, no matter what the consequence. Work on our current experiments has been suspended for a full two weeks. 
we are in a fever of remodeling and refurbishing. You must understand that before he married the lovely Georgiana, my master had occupied certain extensive inner chambers connected to his laboratory. Here he had lived during his toilsome youth, while he made those discoveries that had roused the admiration of all the learned societies in Europe. Now he proposed to use these apartments for another purpose. It's a perfect plan, I mean, Adap. It will give me the opportunity for the intense thought and constant watchfulness the coming operation will require. And Georgiana will enjoy the perfect repose essential to its success. You will bring her here? We will live in the inner chambers together, seclude ourselves there. She will not enter the working laboratory until the crucial day. But the adjacent rooms will be a sort of private paradise. I want the walls hung with the most gorgeous curtains. I shall select them myself since you are scarcely capable. Quite so. It will be all grandeur and grace. The draperies will fall from ceiling to floor in rich and ponderous folds concealing all angles and straight lines. The sunshine will be excluded lest it interfere with my chemical processes. But there will be instead the most beautiful perfumed lamps emitting flames of various hues uniting all in a soft impurpled radiance you follow me yes master those smoky dingy somber rooms will change to an exquisite abode for the loveliest of women i can scarce contain my excitement my palms sweat my breath comes rapidly my eyes are glazed with anticipation, for soon the door will open and the fabled Georgiana will walk through it. I shall see her. Yes, I, I, the stunted, the ugly, the hairy, the grimy, the earthy, shall see her. I shall see her close. Enter, my love. What do you think of your new abode? Exquisite. My dear, you're trembling. It can't be helped. Noblest, dearest, tenderest wife. Do not doubt my power. I have given this matter the deepest thought. I know. Then why do you tremble? Why are you so cold? Why so pale? You're white as a ghost, my Am love. Am I? Let me reassure you, dear heart. Come into my arms. Oh, Elma. There, now. No. Oh, do not turn away. Elma. A minute, Ab. I'm right here, Master. Take her to the boudoir. As Elma moved close to take her in his arms... The birthmark glowed scarlet on her white cheek. And even as he tried to embrace her, so intense was the glow that he could not hold back a strong, convulsive shudder. Seeing the revulsion on her husband's face, Georgiana had cried out and fainted. Now I pick up her still form, cradle it gently in my strong arms, and gently carry it to the boudoir. At last, I stare down into that ineffably lovely face. It is closer to mine than it will ever be again. And I drink in its beauty as I muse to myself. Were she my wife, I should never part with that birthmark. Never. I have hardly left her bedside. Elma has been working feverishly in the laboratory proper, only summoning me when he needed my brute strength or my delicate accuracy. His slender finger and pale intellectual face bend over his notes, while I, bulky, ungainly, grimed with the vapors of the furnace, crouch in a corner of her boudoir. That is where I am when she wakes from her faint. Elma! Oh, Elma. Mistress. What? Who? Don't Where? be frightened, mistress. Where is my husband? In his laboratory. Hard at work. Oh, oh, yes. The operation to remove 
this? Oh, mistress, fear not. Who are you? His servant, Aminadab. Privileged to be his assistant from time to time when he needs my mechanical readiness. But you must have more than that, Aminadab. I have a skill, an ability to execute the details of my master's experiments. But I assure you, mistress, I have not the wit to comprehend the slightest details of any of those experiments. But what do you think of this, this uh, latest of his experiments? The removal of the little hand, you mean, that rests upon your cheek. And gives him no rest until he exorcises it. Well, tell me. I really want to know. Uh, Mistress, there is a truth which all seekers stumble upon sooner or later. And what is that? Our great creative mother, while she amuses us by apparently working in the broadest sunshine, is yet severely careful to keep her own secrets. And despite her pretended openness, shows us nothing but results. She permits us to mar, but seldom to mend, and on no account to make. I cannot tell if my words have meaning for her. Indeed, I do not know myself the precise significance of what I say. The days drag on, and I am living in a fever of dread and anticipation. I am living within the hearts of both my master and my mistress. In the intervals of study and experiment, he comes to her flushed and exhausted and speaks glowingly of the resources of his art. This small vial contains a gentle but powerful fragrance which can impregnate all the breezes that blow across a kingdom. And this... This gold-colored liquid in a crystal vial? Ah, that. That is the most precious poison ever concocted. By its aid, I could apportion the lifetime of any mortal at whom you might point your finger. The strength of the dose would determine whether he were to linger out years or drop dead in the midst of a breath. Elmer, you chill me to the marrow of my bones. Why do you keep such a fearful drug? Trust me, my beloved, trust me. I do trust you. But why Look do you... here. Here is a powerful cosmetic. With a few drops in a vase of water, freckles may be washed away as easily as the hands are cleansed. A stronger infusion would take the blood out of the cheek and leave the rosiest beauty a pale ghost. Is it with this lotion that you intend to bathe my cheek? Oh, no, my darling. No, this is only superficial. Your case demands a remedy that shall go deeper. Far deeper, my sweet girl. Far, far deeper. He has been locked in his laboratory for a full week now, absorbed in his labors. I am crouched in the corner of her boudoir, as I always am when not actively assisting him. She is reading. Beside her bed are ponderous volumes. I recognize them as coming from his scientific library. I dare to approach her where she lies. Have you finished with these books, mistress? Those? Oh, yes. Shall I return them to the shelves? If you like. Ah, uh, Albertus Magnus, Cornelius Agrippa. You have been reading the antique naturalists. Paracelsus and the Red. Paracelsus. The great Swiss physician and philosopher of the 16th century. He who speaks of the portals of man's deep within. When one is conquered or thrown off the thraldom of matter in his own body. You have studied him well, mistress. Yeah. But this, the value I am perusing now, this is my favorite. Why? Why, it is the master's own folio. He gave it to me to read. Oh, it's a rare privilege, mistress, to read in that folio. He has recorded there every experiment of his scientific career, its original aim, the methods for its development, and its final success or failure. It is the history and emblem of his life. She reads on. I return to my corner. She grows more and more absorbed in the folio. The color comes and goes in her face. 
the birthmark appears and disappears as her cheek alternately flushes and pales. Then, all at once... A minute, love. Yes, mistress. You know that each time he has been with me here, he has inquired as to my sensations whether the confinement of the room and the temperature of the atmosphere agree with me. Yes, mistress. I've begun to think that I'm being subjected to certain influences that I have been for some time. What influences? I'm not sure. Nor am I sure how they are brought to bear, whether breathed in with the fragrant air or taken with my food. Merely your fancy, perhaps? Perhaps. But if so, then I have another fancy. And what is that? That there is a... Um, stirring in my system a strange, indefinite sensation creeping through my veins, tingling half painfully, half pleasurably at my heart. Oh, mistress. Still, when I dare to look into the mirror, there I behold myself, pale as a white rose, still with the crimson birthmark stamped upon my cheek. And I hate it. I hate it. Not even my husband now hates it so much as I. Mistress, sweet mistress. And another thing, something I've told no one, not even Aylmer. Yes, mistress. These past few hours, two or, or three perhaps, I've noticed a sensation in the awful birthmark itself. Is it painful? No, not painful. But it induces a certain restlessness throughout my system, a stirring, craving, a desire to... to... I'm, in debt. I'm going in to venture into the laboratory where my husband works. Wait. Don't try to stop me. Don't interrupt him. I must, I must. Through the open door, I can see him, pale as death. Anxious and absorbed as he hangs over the distiller, as though it depended upon his utmost watchfulness whether or not the liquid within would be the draft of immortal happiness or eternal despair. The world of science is one I know little of. The reasoning and the deductions of great scientists are beyond my comprehension. But this I do know. All their arduous journeys to logical deductions, all their fevered experiments along the way, all these descend directly from the ancient fervid belief in magic. We shall return to you presently with the concluding act. installed his young wife, Georgiana, in the inner chambers adjoining his laboratory. When, attempting to reassure her, he leaned to embrace her, he was struck afresh with horror at the sight of the little red birthmark that tainted the perfection of her cheek. Seeing his revulsion, Georgiana fainted, and it was Aylmer's servant, Aminadab, who carried her to the sumptuous boudoir so lovingly prepared for her. Since that moment, Aminadab has spent every free moment with Georgiana. Until, at last... Aminadab, I'm venturing into the laboratory. Wait, mistress. Don't try to stop me. Don't interrupt him. I must. Elm. What? Who dared? Georgiana. Why have you come here? It was necessary. Have you no trust in your husband? Oh, Elm. Will you throw the blight of that fateful birthmark over my labors? Emma, no, no. Go, woman, go. I implore you, tell me all the risk we run. No, Georgiana. Fear not that I shall shrink. My share in it is far less than your own. I can conceal nothing from you, nor will I. I ask no more than that, nor ever did. Know then that this crimson hand upon your cheek, superficial as it seems has clutched its grasp into your being with a strength of which I had no previous conception. 
I've already administered agents powerful enough to do everything but change your entire physical system. Only one thing remains to be tried. Only one? If that fails us, we are ruined. But why did you hesitate to tell me this? Because, Georgiana, there is danger. Danger? There is but one danger. That this horrible stigma shall be left upon my cheek. Remove it. Whatever the cost, remove it or we shall both go mad. Heaven knows your words are true. Now, my dear one, return to your boudoir. In a short while, all will be tested. All this I watch from the door of the boudoir. Now he conducts her to her bed. And I watch this, too. He takes leave of her with a solemn tenderness which speaks far more than words. How much is now at stake? A minute, Ab. A minute, Ab, are you here? I am here, mistress. What is this that hangs over my head? A mirror, mistress. But it is a scant meter from my face. It is a mirror, mistress. The master bade me place it there. Oh. Oh, I see now. I see my face and I see the despicable birthmark as well. Do not dwell upon it. No. I shall muse upon more easeful things. My husband, for example. A great man. His character. His love for me. He does indeed love you. I never knew till now how much he loves me. My heart is exultant, a minute up, even though it trembles at the purity, the loftiness of his love. It will accept nothing less than perfection. Oh, mistress. With my whole soul, I pray that for a single moment I may satisfy his highest and deepest conception. Longer than a moment, I know it not possible to be. For his spirit is ever on the march, ever ascending, each instant requiring something that lies beyond the scope of the instant before. Georgiana. My dear. Elmer. The concoction of the draft has been perfect. Unless all my science has deceived me, it cannot fail. Were it not for you, my dearest husband, I might wish to put off my birthmark of mortality by relinquishing mortality itself. Life is a sad possession to those who have attained the degree of moral advancement at which I stand. Were I weaker and blinder, it might be happiness. Were I stronger, it might be endured. But being what I find myself to be, methinks I am of all mortals, the most fit to die. Why do we speak of dying? The draft cannot fail. Give me the goblet. Georgiana. I joyfully stake all upon your word. Drink, then. Drink. The liquid is like water from a heavenly fountain. Now, my dearest, let me sleep. My earthly senses are closing over my spirit like the leaves around the heart of a rose at sunset. A minute, Ab. Yes, Buster. Oh, there you are. Come here. Yes, Buster. Uh, fetch me my folio volume. It is right there, Master, by her bed. She was reading in it. Uh, you will inscribe in it what I dictate. I shall watch her for symptoms and relay them to you. Yes, Master. I am ready. Her cheeks are flushed. Cheeks flushed. Be sure to note down the precise time of each entry. Yes, Master. Breath uh, slightly irregular. Slightly irregular breath. Left eyelid quivers. Left eyelid. A tremor, a tremor barely perceptible, but a tremor through the frame. Oh, 
all the while, the great man fails not to gaze at the fatal crimson hand. And not without a shudder of disgust. You mean it, Ab? Do my eyes deceive me? Is the crimson hand more faintly outlined? It has faded a trifle, Master. Yet, yet she is pale as ever. But the birthmark is less distinct. I shall conquer. I shall conquer. I know it. I shall conquer. The presence of the scarlet hand has been awful. God knows. But its departure is more awful still. Watch the stain of a rainbow fade out of the sky. And you will know of the passing of the birthmark. By heaven, it is well nigh gone. I can scarcely trace it now. Success! Success! Yes, success. Now it is like the faintest rose color. The lightest flush of blood across her cheek would overcome it. But she is so pale. Draw the window curtain. Suffer the light of natural day to fall into the room and rest upon her cheek. Yes, master. I mean it, Ab. You'll serve me well. You and I, matter and spirit, earth and heaven, both have done their part in this. <laughs> laugh, you thing of the senses. You have earned the right to laugh, and so have I. Success is ours, yours and mine. His wild exclamations break her sleep. Slowly she uncloses her eyes and gazes into the mirror above her face, which she has arranged for and I have set up. A faint smile flits over her lips when she recognizes how barely perceptible is now the crimson hand which had once blazed forth with such disastrous brilliance as to frighten away their happiness. But now her eyes seek his face with a look of trouble and anxiety. My poor Elmer. Poor? Nay, richest, happiest. Most favored. Dear love. My peerless bride, it is successful. Dearest. Husband. You are perfect. You have aimed loftily. You have done nobly. Georgiana, my <laughs> precious wife. Oh, Elmer. Dearest Elmer. I am dying. Alas, it is too true. The fatal hand has grappled with the mystery of life, had been the bond by which an angelic spirit kept itself in union with a mortal frame. The last crimson tint of the birthmark, that sole token of human imperfection, fades from her cheek. My master stares with eyes that seem to see nothing save the spot where it had been and is no more. He is still staring down into her face when something causes me to glance upward to a spot just above her recumbent form. A puff of smoke, a fragment of cloud vapor. What is it that seems to rise from her body Linger a moment near him, then take its flight toward heaven. She's dead. She's lost to me forever. Where did I fail? Where did I go astray? <laughs> How can you laugh? You lump of earth, you mass of clay. Oh, man of intellect. Oh, great man of science. Oh, eminent philosopher who seeks to penetrate every secret of our great mother. You see before you the last result of your impudence. Thus ever does the gross fatality of earth exult in its invariable triumph over the immortal essence. I only tried, had you, oh, great man reached a profounder wisdom. 
You need not thus have flung away the happiness which would have woven your mortal life of the self-same texture with the celestial. I only wish... A momentary circumstance was too strong for you. You did not look beyond the shadowy scope of time. And living once and for all in eternity, you failed to find the perfect future in the present. I pity you, great man, from the depths of my soul. You loved her. You loved her. You. I loved her. Yes. Just as she was. I loved her. Just as God sent her into this world. I loved her. And would have loved her all my days. What have I done? What have I done? What men of your stamp must inevitably do. You have pursued your dream, followed your star. That is what you have done, master. Given what you are, that is what you must always do. <laughs> The story of the birthmark was written over a hundred years ago, at a time when the worship of science was sweeping over the world. In the last century, this worship has grown to a frenzy. We bow before its power. We refuse to believe that it cannot resolve all our woes. When will we learn that science is not a god? That it was never meant to be worshipped? That it is our servant only, never our master. I'll be back shortly. Though Nathaniel Hawthorne lived in relative obscurity until the Scarlet Letter made him famous, he was never ignored by his fellow writers. Longfellow admired him hugely. And so did Herman Melville. And Edgar Allan Poe called him the example par excellence of the privately admired and publicly unappreciated man of genius. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Gordon Heath, and Marion Seldes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Once upon a time, they were the proud queens of the seas till the airplane and a swifter tempo of life chased most of them to the dry docks. Still, a few remain, for nothing can quite replace the sumptuous ease and romance of a trip by sea. Most are cruise ships, but some dauntless ladies are still ocean-going liners. So, will you join me in an ocean voyage? Although I can't promise you that this one will be as restful as most. First, I find the light... There. Now, <laughs> I carry you a 
have crossed the threshold. I hope I'm not too heavy. <laughs> Light as a feather. Watch it, Jim. What? There's a man. Oh. Oh. Look out, Mary. I'm, I'm falling. Oh. You, you all right? Yes. Who was it? Somebody broke into the cabin. Oh, no. He acted like he tried to, tried to kill us. Our mystery drama, The Bittersweet Honeymoon, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jada Rowland and Russell Horton. It's sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The beginning of a sea voyage is an excitement that cannot be matched by any other form of traveling. The people who are already aboard line the rail, the officers and crew in their crisp dress uniforms, the vibration from generators below, the urgent message of the ship's horn, everywhere the ring of voices. Well, it's an experience to be cherished and never forgotten. Especially if you are sailing from Naples, Italy, and you have been married less than three hours, and you are young. Uh, excuse me, Mr. and Mrs. James Shelton. Uh, that's right. I'm Mr. Braithwaite, the chief purser. I, uh, I wonder if we could have a little chat at my office. <laughs> Why? Is something wrong? Uh, not wrong. No, no, nothing wrong. Just something irregular and uh, <laughs> unfortunate. Oh, Jim, I hope it isn't my passport. Well, they said at the embassy everything was in order. Uh, uh, Mr. Braith uh, wait. Braithwaite, yes. Uh, well, we do have the wedding certificate and all the papers. Oh, there's no question of that. Uh, after you, please. We're just about to sail. If we're going along. You don't think... There we are. Now, that's better. Won't you uh, sit down and let me explain? You've got us on pins and needles, sir. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Shelton, you, you should have no embarrassments. It's the shipping line that has to face up to that. I, I um... <clears throat> I have an apology to make to you. I don't understand. An unfortunate mistake was made when you booked your cabin. It is not, um... It is not available. It's already occupied. Oh, no. You mean we can't sail with you? Well, there are no other accommodations. But we're on our honeymoon. We just got married. The Mansard Line would be most happy to get you a berth on a later ship or some other line. Well, or... that's no good. I, I can't get back home later than next Monday. I'm starting a job. Ah, uh, well, then the, the office is ready to help book any plane, flight, first class. Or... Well, that isn't the same. Like, the only reason we got married was so we could go by ship. I mean... Well, you see, we got this crazy notion that the best honeymoon we could have would be shipboard, so, uh... You don't know what we went through to cut all the red tape and make the marriage possible. Yeah, and the papers picked up the story, the press services are all wiring it back to the States. We're going to look like a couple of fools. Uh, <clears throat> you, you, you say you've received some publicity? <laughs> I, I didn't realize you were quite so famous. Oh, well, we're not really. It was just kind of an accident the way it happened. Uh, it wasn't an accident, Jim. Well, you see, Mary Jane had just graduated from college. Uh, she's a music major, and just for kick, she was a contestant on What's That Title? On what? Uh, What's That Title? It's a TV game show. Yeah, and she won. <laughs> a lot of kooky things I didn't exactly want or need. A car and this trip to Italy. That's how we met. At the Villa d'Este. Halfway down the hill. Yeah, I was in love with her from the first moment I saw her. Well, I was over on a trip my dad blew me to after I got out of law school and before I went to work. Well, I had more time than Mary. Two weeks more. So she wired home for some more dough. She decided not to go home till I did. But I still had this return ticket. So we went out to the airport to try to cash it in. But they wouldn't, of course. Only this little nun. The, 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 this little what? A nun. Oh, oh. a dear little lady. She'd been saving up all these years to take a trip to America to see her sister. Somebody picked her pocket, or took her pocketbook, or whatever nuns have. Yeah, with all her money. So Mary got this swell notion, and she managed to sell the airline on the idea of letting the, letting the nun use her ticket. Well, there was this big man with a cigar listening to all this. 
and everybody was yakking about it. So, Signor Fratelli, uh, that was the big man with the cigar, he went round and took a collection from all the other passengers waiting for planes and got enough for her passage back and some money to spend in New York. So, that's the way it happened. Uh, uh, uh what happened? Well, this publicity representative for the airlines wrote up a story about it. I told him because we were going to get married so we could have our honeymoon the way both of us had always dreamed. By boat. The SS Queen Victoria. And this was her last transatlantic crossing before she became a cruise ship. It was kind of a drag in some ways. But pretty good publicity for your shipping line. Uh, yes, it it it, uh, it was, wasn't it? <laughs> well, un under the circumstances, I, I feel it is up to the Mansard Lions to make a, 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 an adjustment. On second thought, I think I can find you uh, accommodations. I thought you said there weren't any. Well, uh, uh, not in uh, tourist class. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, there are very few people in the world who could afford these particular accommodations. What do you mean? Well, now, we had a last-minute cancellation from the Shah. Well, the country is not important since he wished to remain incognito. But I'm sure that you will like the suite. Suite? Oh, yes, it's quite extensive as well as uh, uh, expensive. <laughs> we call it the Royal Suite. The Royal Suite. Well, how do you like it, Mrs. Shelton? Oh, it's fabulous. Priceless. Uh, almost. For this one crossing, this suite costs $21,000, or if you prefer, $3,000 per day. Uh, fresh flowers, of course, are included. <laughs> well, enjoy your honeymoon. You mean it's, it's all ours? Just like that? It's all yours. Gee, how can we ever thank you, Mr. Braithwaite? Ah, don't thank me. Thank your lucky stars and uh, whoever fouled up in our office when they booked you. And the fact that, well, we happen to be a little bit in the news. Gee, I just can't believe the way we've lucked out. <laughs> well, we've cast off, so you must allow me to send up a bottle of champagne with your bags to say bon voyage. And, of course, so you can toast each other... And your good luck. Oh, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Can you believe it? Oh, I must be dreaming. <laughs> I just hope I don't wake up. Me too. As long as I'm sharing the dream. Well, that'll take forever. A whole lifetime. Oh, Jim. I love you so. Mary, I love you. What a way to live. And what a way to die. Jim. What? Did you say a thing like that? Oh, honey, it's just a thing to say. <gasps> hey, don't let it get to you. What is it? Somebody walked across my grave. Another thing you say. What's the matter with you, honey? I don't know. I'm scared to be so happy and so lucky. What was it Lord Byron said? Whom the gods love die young. <laughs> Magnificent sight, you know? Oh, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. And exciting and breathtaking. See Naples and die. What a place of beauty this whole harbor is. You are Americans. Uh, yes, uh, Jim Shelton. Uh, this is my wife, Mrs. Shelton. How do you do? I am Enzio Abruzzi. Allow me to shake your hand. Oh, sure. No, Caesar. Oh, uh, I, I didn't see your dog. Uh, he is always with me. Oh, he's beautiful. I have a German shepherd just like him at home. I hope he won't be jealous when he finds he has a rival. A rival? Your new husband. Oh, how did you know we were newlyweds? Does it show that much? It was a guess, but not too hard, eh? There is so much youth and so much love in both voices. Surely you cannot have been married long. <laughs> Less than four hours. Uh, three hours, 42 minutes, and eight seconds. Ah, mirabile. <laughs> you must allow me to buy you a drink to celebrate. Perhaps now. 
Oh, no thanks, sir. We, uh, uh, we have some champagne back in our cabin. And we haven't even unpacked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, see, sir. My dog is telling me that the light is going and it is time for his dinner. So, perhaps after dinner tonight or some other time. It's a long voyage. Oh, we'll look forward to it, sir. Good. Good evening. Arrivederci. Arrivederla. Ah, you speak Italian. A cosi cosi. <laughs> we shall try next time we meet. Basta, sister. Maja. You lead the way. Oh, he's blind. But he kept talking about seeing things. Only in his mind's eye. Or he remembers. You can see, he can't see. I was wondering how he could have a dog on board, but... Well, that's why he's blind. It's, uh, getting pretty late, darling. Oh, let's stay on deck and look at the moon just a little longer. Please, Jim. Okay. But you, uh, you do realize we still haven't really unpacked. Oh, who cares? By the time we finally got the bags and fished out something to wear to dinner and guzzled up the purser's lovely champagne and ate and danced and came out here to romance in the moonlight. Well, oh, darling, I wish this night could go on forever. The whole trip. It will. This is only the beginning. Mm. I wonder where that nice Mr. Abruzzi went after dinner. Probably to his cabin. Well, that's it. It's, uh, it's, um, cold out here. Uh, time to get back in. <laughs> You're right. It's time to go in. I uh, should have left a light on. Who needed it? <laughs> With the moon? Uh, it's just gone behind a cloud. Can't you find the door to our stateroom? Well, if I can't, I know my wife has cat's eyes. <laughs> oh, here we are. Ladies first. Uh-huh. First I'll find a light... <laughs> I carry you across the threshold. Oh, my darling. It's all such heaven, such rapture. Here we go. Watch the bulkhead. Now, the last thing I'd ever do is drop you. My... Oh! Oh! Are you out of your mind? Oh! Who Who are you? When... Oh! Oh! Jim! Uh... Uh, Jim! He acted like he wanted to kill us. Who was that? Jim! Oh, good Lord, you're bleeding. What happened, darling? happened indeed. This honeymoon idol has been rudely shattered as Mary and Jim surprised an intruder in their stateroom. A prowler? An enemy of either of them? An assassin who still thought the mysterious Shah was the occupant of the royal suite? At all events, an inauspicious beginning for a honeymoon. We'll see how the rest of it turns out when I bring you Act Two. Shelton had surprised a mysterious invader in the sumptuous royal suite aboard the SS Queen Victoria, a set of staterooms that became theirs by what seemed to be sheer happy luck. Now knocked to the floor by a fleeing criminal, whoever he was, Mary kneels by her unconscious husband. Jim? Jim, darling, can you hear me? What happened? I don't know. There was someone here in the cabin. Oh, darling, you're bleeding. I must have hit my head on the corner of the table. I... Hey, he, he knocked me over. Don't try to get up. Uh, where'd he go? Out, on deck. He may be armed. Uh, let me close the door. I'll get it. Please, honey, just stay there a moment. Okay. I am a bit woozy. Uh, but, but get the door. I will. Boy, that was a whack. Mary, what are you waiting for? Shh. Honey, will you get the door closed and locked? <sighs> yes, Jim. Honey, what were you waiting for before you closed the door? I heard something. What? It sounded like... like Mr. Bootsy's cane tapping. 
Now, let me have a good look at you. Oh, thank heaven. It's just a scratch. I'll get some water and... Uh, no, 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 never mind that. Now, did you, did you get a look at the guy? No, not really. How about you? Uh, I had you in my arms and he came from behind the door and knocked me over before I could even turn my head. What do you suppose he was looking for? <laughs> the crown jewels, I guess. The what? Face it, baby, we've got nothing could interest a thief, so it must be someone who didn't know the Shaw wasn't here. Of course. And I thought we were so lucky. Hey, cheer up, Mary. Once the whole ship knows the Shaw isn't aboard, no one's going to bother us again. How can we be sure they do? Simple. Just call Mr. Braithwaite and make sure the word gets around. What do you suppose Mr. Brutzi was doing up on our deck? Well, it's a free ship. He has a right to promenade anywhere he wants. But so late at night, in the dark? Uh, hello? Uh, yeah, I want to speak to the purser, please. No, I mean the chief purser, Mr. Braithwaite. Yeah, well, I'm afraid you'd better disturb him. Uh, this is Mr. Shelton speaking, and it's urgent. I'm, I'm calling from the Royal Suite. <laughs> Behind the ventilator funnel. Good. I can stand with my back to you in case anyone comes by. So, what happened? It was no problem to get into the cabin. But I could not call you because... Because what? It was occupied. What? Yes. Fortunately, whoever it is, they were not there. But as soon as I saw the bags and some clothes around, I put out the light fast. And you left unseen? I hope so. There were some young people on the deck. Who? I don't know. Americans in love talking about the honeymoon. I was waiting for them to pass. But instead, they came straight to the suite. And? I had only time to step behind the door. They saw you? I don't think so, but uh, he was carrying her in his arms as they entered. That was my chance. I pushed them both aside and ran out. You think they recognized you? I don't think so. It was too fast. But if the place is occupied... What now do we do? I don't know. Somehow I must gain access. I must think. In the meanwhile, in case you are recognized, it is all the more reason that there must be no connection between us. We should not meet again. I think not, Gino. Unless I send you the sign. You're, um, sure that you could not recognize this man? Well, I didn't see him at all. Uh, Mrs. Shelton? Well, I... Did you see him? Just a, a glimpse as I was falling. Enough to identify him? I don't think so. Well, did you see what he was wearing? Well, yes, I have an impression that he had on a... a white coat. A tuxedo or a steward's coat, perhaps? Oh, it's so hard to say. A because... ship's uniform or a waiter's jacket. I honestly don't know. Well, I only trying to narrow it down whether it was a passenger or a member of the crew. I realize. But I, I didn't see clearly enough to tell you. Well, never mind that. The important thing is, what was this guy after? Well, I can only assume that it was something that belonged to the Shah. Well, as I said, he wished to remain incognito. So let us say the man who originally booked the royal suite. Jewelry or something? Probably. You know, it could be a heck of a lot worse than that. Maybe he wanted to assassinate him. Oh, Jim. Uh, take it easy, Mary. Uh, look, Mr. Braithwaite, I I'm, I'm afraid these honeymoon accommodations have turned kind of sour. Uh, we want out, or I, I mean off this boat. Oh, dear me, dear me, that would be most difficult. We don't stop at any other port. Well, we're not out of the Mediterranean yet. You could call ship to shore for a boat to pick us up. Well, of course I could, but uh, I really don't think that is necessary. The little incident of tonight will never happen again. How can you be sure? Because once everyone on board knows that you are in the suite, there will be no cause for any more incidents. But how are they going to know? <laughs> Because I'm going to give a party for you, a honeymoon party. By tomorrow morning, the ship will be blanketed with notices and announcements on the closed-circuit radio and the public address system. I don't want a party. 
We just want to be alone. Well, in these palatial apartments, you can always be alone. But think how nice to have a thousand guests and the entire crew celebrating your marriage. <laughs> well, I, I don't care for myself. And then but, think uh, of the other side. What other side? Well, now, <clears throat> if I let you leave the ship, I would be party to a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a thief aboard, someone guilty of at least breaking and entering, and I want to find that thief. No, no, stay aboard and keep your eyes open, and if you can recognize him, help me to apprehend him, please. Well, I... Uh... I've, um, I have tried to do you children a favor. Do me one in return. Mary? It's the least we can do. And I promise you, you will be guarded around the clock. You can spend the rest of this night in peace. Well, I could settle for that. So far, it's been some wedding night. Good morning, Mr. Sheldon. Mrs. Shelton, you have never looked lovelier. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, what's the second one for? That's for not adding to your compliment some piece of male chauvinism like, and it took you long enough. Um, did it uh, take you that long to dress? You mean you didn't miss me? It didn't seem that long at all. Why, you... <laughs> Or maybe you're not putting me on. Why were you staring out the window so intently? Another woman? Mm, if she is, she's a lot more than one man could handle. What do you mean? Why, you can't even see the pool from here. Yeah, I was looking at the rock. What rock? Gibraltar. We've burned our boats, all right. Oh, come on, Jim. It's been two old days. Two wonderful days in our palace. And on deck in the sun. <laughs> Just the way we'd imagined it. I've forgotten all about that first night. What made you think of it? No, I guess because tonight's our party. Well, it was very sweet of Mr. Braithwaite. He certainly lives up to all his promises. Mm. He's a funny, prissy little guy, but he's an all right Joe. Well, we've got a lot to thank him for. All this. Sometimes all the munificence scares me. Why? Well, no struggling lawyer like me is going to be able to support you in the style to which you're becoming accustomed. Don't you ever kid yourself. This is just icing on the cake. Hmm. Oh, uh, speaking of cake, it's uh, like almost noon. How about breakfast? Sure. Well, aren't you hungry? Oh, of course. I, I was just looking down on the fantail there. At what? Signor Abruzzi, walking with his dog. Oh, he's so lonely, always prowling around the ship. He scarcely talks to anyone. Well... Hey, cheer up. He's talking to a deck steward now. Let's see if he'll have breakfast with us, Jim. Would you mind? No, of course not. Although after buying us all those drinks last night, we're probably the last people he wants to see. Uh, oh, darn it. I mean, uh, talk to. He's a beautiful dog, senor. Yes, Stuart. I don't know what I'd do without him. It, uh... We are alone on deck. You sent me a signal? Yes, Gino. Tonight, there is a party for the two young people, you know. The whole ship knows. This is our chance. Can you get the key? Oh, I still have the one from before. Maybe you should give it to me and let me do it. No, no, Enzio. If you get the court, you have no excuse. With me, I am a crew member. I can always say the door was open. I was just uh, checking the cabin. Uh, too bad you did not say that the first time. Yes, uh, that was bad. It was so unexpected, I thought that no one was there. I shall excuse myself early from the party. You will call me in my cabin when you are sure it's safe, and I come immediately. Good. The moment I see you leave, I... I'll watch it. The young couple is coming. Uh, you sure you don't want a chair? Uh, no, thank you, Stuart. Morning, Signor Abruzzi. Ah, who is that? Ah, uh, my young friend, Jim Shelton. No. <laughs> me and my better half... Mary and I were thinking if you hadn't had breakfast... Oh, uh, uh, it is so late. Uh, I have already eaten. Maybe it's it's just as well, Jim. I, I, well, what is it, honey? I, I'm feeling a little sick. 
Uh, could you take me back to the stateroom? Oh, sure, darling, but... I am so sorry. But the sea is a little rough today. I hope you will be all right for the party, uh, Mary. Oh, sure. This is nothing. Just, uh, will you excuse us? Of course. I hope you feel better soon. All right. Honey, you uh, want to lean on me? Yes, please. Well, how did you get sick all of a sudden? I'm not like... sick, Jim. Not like that. No, keep going. Don't stop. What is it? The deck hand who was patting the dog. Did you see his hand? Uh, what about it? What hand? The right hand. He has no little finger. Well, I, I didn't notice, but so what? The first night, the man who broke into our cabin, his hand on my arm as he shoved us off balance. I didn't remember till now. It was missing the little finger. <laughs> Shelton is staring at his wife in a kind of dismay. Is her memory accurate? Will the rest of their trip be a nightmare of sworn statements, being involved in investigation instead of relaxation and enjoyment? But for their decision and the surprising results, we'll have to wait till I return shortly with Act Three. a long brunch, but not quite the leisurely one that the Sheltons had planned. Mary's accidental identification of the man they had surprised in their stateroom the first night aboard has faced them with an uncomfortable decision. Seated in the dining saloon of the ship, they are still thrashing it out. At least I'd like to pop him one for that crack on the head I got because of him. Oh, Jim, don't you think I'd like to get even with him for that, too? The trouble is... What? I'm not 100% sure, really. It's more... Well, more an impression. If you saw it, you saw it. I... I think I saw it. Honey, there's a heck of a lot of difference between having four fingers on a hand instead of five. Please try to understand, Jim. Getting bowled over like that, knocked down in your own... Oh, it is like our home for this little while. It really gave me a jolt. It's a nightmare. And besides, he he is a deckhand. Maybe he had a right to be there. In our stateroom? He could have thought it was empty. Well, then why did he have to act the way he did? Well, he might have thought we could make trouble for him, lose him his job. Mary, face it, he might have been a terrorist about to plant a bomb to blow the shaw of whatever it is into the Muslim paradise, whatever it's called. You want a nut like that running around loose? Oh, I guess you're right, Jim. Let's go see Mr. Braithwaite. But, um, as you say, you are not absolutely certain that a finger was missing from the hand that, that pushed you. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm right. <laughs> it doesn't leave us too much to go on, does it? Well, I guess it doesn't. Well, it would just be my word against his. Oh, now, come on. Don't look so glum. If I locate him, you don't think for a moment I won't shake him up all I can. And that he's not going to be watched like a hawk every moment of this voyage. I can promise you personally that this man is not going to get away with anything. Oh, I feel terrible dumping all our problems in your lap, Mr. Braithwaite. I guess we both do. Well, now, don't give it a thought, Mr. Shelton. I don't want one solitary thing to interfere with you both enjoying your party tonight. Well, that's another kind thing we have to thank you for. Well, as it turns out, it may be the high point of the crossing. And I wish by now you would call me Cyril. I'm sure I think of you as Mary and Jim. <laughs> it, it, it'd be nice to be on a, a first-name basis. Oh, yes. Cyril? So, there we are. That's all solved. Now, all we have to do is look ahead to tonight and your party. sponsor's name. Dear Cyril. Hey, look, it's a man's name. Oh, don't be stuffy. Hey, 
say, it's getting late, and you've only got as far as the bath towel. Ten more minutes, I'll be a sartorial masterpiece, but how about you? Oh, now that I've finished my face, the clothes take no time. How could you improve that face? You get away from me, husband. Why should I? It's legal. And with you, it's lethal. <laughs> you get me under your spell, and we'll never get to our own wedding party. <laughs> I don't wait. I'll be lookout. Caesar and I will take care of the rest. Hold it. Right there. Don't move. Put your hands up. Uh, Senor Braithwaite, I, I, I can't see you with your flashlight in my eyes. So well, if you can't see, you'd better be sure I have a gun in my hands. What are you doing here? Uh, I was uh, passing the door. I thought I heard a noise inside. I... I know the senor and the senora were at the party. All right, you can save the lies. Tell the truth or else. Or else what? I can have you put in the brig for breaking and entering. Or just shoot you out of hand for the same reason. I don't think you'd risk that. Why not? This isn't the first time you've broken into this cabin. I will only be protecting the passengers against a common thief. You would be making a mistake. I am not a thief. I am Sergeant Gino Mascara of the Naples Police. Turn around. Why? Don't ask questions. Turn. Unless you want me to shoot. You know, honey, we should have used the elevator instead of these deck stairs. Well, I had to get a little air, Jim. Well, you're getting your hairdo blown to a fair be well. I don't care. Let's just stay here, outside for a moment. It's your party. If you want to keep them waiting. I don't want to. It's just... Oh. If only the bow would stop rolling. Oh, I can't face a dinner party feeling like this. Mary, you seasick? Oh, I, I guess so. Well, come on over to the rail. No. I want to go back and lie down. Just for a moment. Oh, I can't tell you. All of a sudden, I just want to die. Yeah, I'll fix that, baby. I got some pills in the stateroom that'll settle your stomach. Come on, let's get back there fast. I was a fool to turn my back on you. You can't get away with it. Why not? I'm an officer of this ship with the right to carry arms. You're breaking and entering, and not for the first time. You couldn't prove that. If it to... happens, I can. Because you're missing one finger, you're easy to identify, as Mrs. Shelton already has done. And if I turn to my back, you think you can knock me out and dump me over the side? Even the weather is cooperating with you, but it won't work. What do you mean? We really know too much, Brett White. Uh, you see, we have interrogated the member of the show's entourage who is part blood. We know what is involved and who it is to be delivered to. And we know who the delivery boy is. The only thing left is, where is the stuff? How much would it be worth to you hmm. to know? No deals. We've been after you for a long time. But you asked for it. I'm not going to be taken. <laughs> Still going over the side. And who will be the wiser? What's the matter, Mary? Oh, that sounded like a shot, Jim. Well, now, you just forget about everything except yourself. All right, darling. Oh, I'm so sick. Now, hold everything till I can get the door open. Now, the light. Uh... <gasps> Mr. Braithwaite. Oh, uh, uh, just come in, both of you, and, and uh, close the door. Uh, what's the gun for? Now, you heard me come in. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, the man on the floor. That's the man who broke in. Look at his hand. Yes, I, uh, um, I surprised him, and unfortunately, I had to shoot him. I'm sorry this had to happen tonight, of all nights. But what was he looking for? 
Look, I mean, now that everyone knows the Shaw isn't aboard and, and we're in this cabin. Well, apparently our public relations didn't get to everyone. <laughs> now, look, I suggest that you go back down to your party and let me take care of this man. Well, uh, first off, Mary has to get a pill. She's suddenly come up seasick. Let me take her down to the dispensary. We can help you in no time, Mr. Well, Chilton. Well, what about him? Oh, we can leave him up to the authorities. Yeah. Well, we better make sure the door is locked. It was open when we came in. From now on, we are going to make sure of a lot of things. <laughs> well, come along. Let's go, shall we? You can all stop oh, right there. <gasps> How did you get in? The door was open. Drop the gun, Mr. Braithwaite. Your gun against mine. Drop yours. See there. No, no. Drop the gun. Yes. Down, down. Get over and lean on the wall. Hands over your head. I can't. My, my hand is, is agonizing. It's, it's only bruised. Caesar didn't even break the skin. Go on, march. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Shelton, sit down, please. No, over there on the couch. Why, you can see. You're not blind. No, I'm not. I can get rid of these glasses now. Who are you? What do you want? Now, look. You make one move against Mary. Relax, Mr. Shelton. I have nothing against you two. Only against that blubbering little crumb against the wall. Just let me check and make sure it's clean. I'm not armed anymore. Please, can I take my hands down? The one your dog grabbed is killing me. I only wish it were. What is going on here? Mr. Braithwaite? Why don't you ask the man with a gun? Mr. Brucey, can I help? No. No one can now. He's dead. He killed him. Well, I, I, I caught him breaking into your cabin. He threatened me. I, I, I had to defend myself. You slimy little worm. He wasn't armed. Well, I had no way of knowing that. I'd still like to know what this all is about. Uh, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Henry Bruce, Drug Enforcement FBI. The man this miserable creature shot is... was... Sergeant Gino Mascera, Naples Police. We've been working together trying to trap Mr. Braithwaite for smuggling drugs into the U.S. We suspect they are hidden in this suite of rooms. Why would he hide drugs here? Oh, he's a slippery little character with more ingenious ways to get around the law. This caper was a Lulu. The Shaw, who was supposed to travel in these staterooms, was, of course, above suspicion and had diplomatic immunity. The stuff would have gone ashore in his luggage. You mean a head of state would smuggle? No. One of his servants was the go-between, the one we got our information from. Once through customs, he'd have recovered it and made the delivery. Uh-huh. Only the Shaw canceled out. And the drugs were already aboard. The break we got is that Braithwaite reneged on payment to the servant, so the guy blew the whistle on our purser. We wanted to make absolutely sure the drugs were on board, and of course we didn't know the suite had new occupants. But if he was hiding heroin or, or whatever it is in here, why would he have given us the suite? No, you were a gift from heaven, almost as good as the shore. No matter how well you packed, somehow the stuff would have found its way into your luggage and sailed through customs. But how would he have gotten it back? Well, this little toad deals with some rough customers. They'd have turned up and taken it away. And probably you, too. Oh, you mean... He... he would have just thrown us to the wolves like that? He had no second thoughts about shooting Gino in the back. Now, now, just a minute. I don't know who this man is, but I, I, I wouldn't listen to this ridiculous nonsense, Mary and Jim. Uh, this nonsense about drugs and heroin. Why don't you just show us where it is and save time and trouble? You uh, won't find a thing here. I would. If I could tear the place apart. Oh, do you seriously think you could get such an authorization on such flimsy evidence? <laughs> you played your ace. Now let me trump it. See there. No. Perhaps my little masquerade as a blind man seemed a bit much, but not when you know about Caesar. As well as an attack dog, he has been trained to sniff out heroin and cocaine. We've covered most of the boat except this very private area. Now we'll do that too. Caesar, go find it, boy. Go find it. And don't think he won't. Well, Jim, Mary, 
At least the last few days turned out to be a honeymoon. <laughs> Thanks to you, Mr. Bruce. Uh, and Caesar. I still can't believe it. How much heroin was behind that panel? Two and a half kilos. About ten million dollars worth. Wow. And Braithwaite? A first-degree murder will put him away for the rest of his life. The drug rap we might have had more trouble with. Small consolation to Gino. But at least he didn't die in vain. I guess you... You saved our lives, too. It's been a jolt for me. You know, I'm thinking of changing my mind about practicing criminal law. Uh, one thing we cops can always use is a nice, smart, tough district attorney. <laughs> us will run up against anything like Mary and Jim encountered. Yet, maybe there is a sort of message underneath all this. It is human nature to try to go through life leaving everything up to George. But sooner or later, the opportunity or the necessity develops. And if and when it does, shouldn't we be ready to put our shoulder to the wheel? I'll be back shortly. Braithwaite was indicted and convicted for first-degree murder. Henry Bruce was promoted for his work on this case. And Mary and Jim Shelton very shortly found themselves involved in another case history, just as crazy as the one they started married life with. The twins were easily named Henry for the boy and Jean after Gino. Our cast included Jada Rowland, Russell Horton, Ian Martin, and Gordon Heath. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Uh, someone get the fire department. Looks like the bank's on fire. Well, do something, somebody. The Union Bank's just been blown up. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Pinkerton, we just got a wire from the American Bankers Association. Two men blew open one of their banks the night before last and got away with $28,000. Uh, who is the law there? Oh, Tom Birch. He's the sheriff of Union. Any word from him? Well, a phone there. He's been sick for a week, so nobody's made up a posse. And the robbers got away. Are they sure there were only two? Yep. I made a mess of Main Street between them. All right, CJ, it's your case. Find those two robbers and find them good. <laughs> Not fast. <laughs> yep. Find them good and fast. Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Death is a much maligned figure. An unwelcome visitor to most. But to some, he comes as a friend and a healer, much prayed for and sought. To them, he is Johann Sebastian Bach's Zisser Tod, Sweet Death, who comes to bind up unbearable wounds. 
But not to everyone who prays for his soothing touch is he allowed. Some crimes are too great to be forgiven by death. You could handle it alone, Ted? Duck soup, Si. Just be ready to take off when I come out. I watched Ted saunter into the bank. Then nothing but waiting. When I finally heard them, like I guess I knew all along I was going to, I knew this was one heist which wasn't going to work. Our mystery drama, The Curse of Conscience, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by General Electric Citizen Band Radios and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The young, strong hands are clenched so tightly on the cell bars that all the blood is squeezed out of them, and the veins stand out dark and distended against the chalk-white skin. His eyes are glassy, and his voice has the edge of hysteria. His name is Simon Berman, or once was before he changed it for a number. And he is not alone. He is never, never alone. Anymore. Uh, I'm not. I'm not looking around. She's sitting there waiting for me too, but I ain't fighting. She just start talking to me, and I don't want that. That's the way it all began. But now it's all over. It's gotta be. She ain't there. She can't be. That's the way it is. She's just not there. Don't be ridiculous, Simon. Of course I'm here. No. You know it as well as I do. No. I'm never going to go away. So you might as well turn around. Oh, I, I don't want to start anything again. Very well. Suit yourself. But I won't ever go away. One thing I got to say is she don't change. I mean, she's like that old crumb in ancient history or something who wanted to get across the river. And the fool who let him climb on his back uh, never could get him off again. It's crazy. I mean, you know, who could have figured the way it began? A couple of years ago, I'm, I'm stuck in Cleveland. The town is dead. I mean, dead. You can't turn a buck doing nothing. So I pick up this girl, some Jane, I don't even remember her name now. She drags me into some church social. Hm. That's where I meet Cousin Anne. Hello, my dears. You uh, want some tickets to dance? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Uh, how much are they? Well, that's our theme of the evening, all for the church. Ten cents a dance. Uh, well, I'll spring for a buck's worth. You might want our special two dollars to dance all night. Oh, gee, that's romantic, huh, Si? Dance all night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me, uh, give me two, uh, two dollar special. Then. You'd uh, like some refreshment? We have a nice punch. No, thanks. No, just the dancing. Maybe after you've danced, you'd like a cool, refreshing drink. Yeah, what is it? Lemonade? Well, that's what the church provides. <laughs> how much is it a shot? The church set a price of twenty-five cents a glass. Okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, we'll be back, ma'am. Okay, Candy. Oh, sure, Sally. Come on, let's dance. What do you say, Candy? Shall we uh, cut out? Oh, no. I'm having a good time. Aren't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. Uh, it's a two-bit church recreation hall and a jukebox. Uh, <laughs> a stardust ballroom, it ain't, you know. Well, if you want to take me somewhere better, like maybe the disco or... One of the big hotel ballrooms? Well, I was figuring, like, uh, maybe I'd uh, take you home, you know? At nine o'clock in the evening? Oh, you promised me a big time. Yeah, 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 sure I did. But... I thought you were the big spender. What's your rush? You turn me on, Mama. <laughs> well, so that's all right, but, but a girl doesn't like to be rushed all that much, you know? Yeah, and if we hang around here for a while? Well, then maybe we could, like, you know... Stop at your place. 
Ah, yeah, no, I just had it painted. Look, uh, the, the place ain't fit to live in. I mean, how about your place? Well, I... You got a roommate or something? Oh, no, but I... Yeah, but what? Well, like, I don't even hardly know you. Hey, what do you want? My life history? Uh, fingerprints? Uh, social security number? Oh, come on. I don't need anything like that. I, I I can tell you, you're a real nice guy. So, uh, so after another dance, uh, we go to your place. Huh? Oh, okay. Uh, but first, I, I gotta go to the, you know, and, like, when I get back, I could use some of that lemonade. You spring for some for us? Yeah, sure, so long as we got that deal, huh? Oh, you got it made, handsome. Time you get back, I'll be waiting for you over in the corner there. Go to my place. <laughs> That's a laugh. I'm down on my last double fin and a cardboard suitcase full of dirty laundry and a locker at the bus station. I gotta make some kind of score and I need a pad. That's where the doll comes in and I gotta play her along till I make some kind of connection. So I figure I can afford to invest four bits making her happy, and I, I mooch over to the old dame at the punch bowl. Well, young man, now would you like some punch? A uh, glass for my old lady, uh, anyways. Old lady? Yeah, the girl I was with, ma'am, you know. Oh. Well, now, maybe you ought to try some yourself first. No, no, that's all right. I uh, don't go in much for, uh, you know, uh, soft drinks. You might like this one. <laughs> Try it. We'll make it on the house. On the house, huh? <laughs> well, uh, I never refuse a lady. <coughs> That's lemonade. What kind of church dance is this? Oh, I have them once a month. Most of the customers are regular. Yeah, well, I can see why. Would you, uh, would you like another? You wouldn't have to twist my arm. Hmm, Thanks. Here's, uh, here's looking at you. And I'll take uh, one more and two for my girlfriend, huh? I thought I'd make a sale. There. And there. Let's see now. That's um, one on the house. Two for you and two for the young lady. Mm -hmm. That'll be uh, four dollars, please. Yeah. Four dollars. Hey, uh, uh, look, I thought you said a quarter. Uh, there was there was a sign up. That was before the punch was uh, uh, spiked. Yeah, well, look, I, I ain't got that kind of dough. Oh, dear, I hope you're not going to... You're not going to welch. You, you've drunk two glasses, you know. I'd hate to have to turn you over to the boys. The, the boys? They're such nice boys to play at such a brutal game. And they have the church hall here Wednesdays. For their karate class. Uh, Cousin Han, uh, look if I may call you that. Oh, yes, please do. Everybody does. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, from, uh, from one, uh... <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, you are something else. Well, thank you. Well, that's quite a compliment for an old lady in her 85th year. Are you 85? I said year, 84. Please don't rush me as... I must you. The four dollars, please. Well, uh, except for some change, all I got is a ten dollar bill. Oh, I can make change. You win. I wonder what happened to my girl. Where did she go? The, uh, uh, the powder room. Oh, I can find out for you. Uh, would you mind running my stand till I come back? Uh, here's your six dollars change. Hey, you trust me with this? Why shouldn't I? Are you all right, my dear? What? Oh, oh, yes, thank you. I... Cousin Anne. Oh, I'm Candy Minton. Well, why did you ask if I was all right? Oh, well, because um, your young man was worried about you. Oh, he's I... not my young man. I, I just came with him and I... And now I... you're sorry you did, huh? I didn't say that. You didn't have to. He's a bit of a swinger. Is that what it is, Candy? Yeah. Like, well, like, he, he wants to take me home, see? Well, naturally. Yeah, but you don't see it. I I live alone, you know, and I can feel this is like he's trouble, and I don't want any. Fascinating. How do you know? Well, I, I wasn't born yesterday. I, 
I know his type by now. He's some kind of drifter, deadbeat. I, I don't know what. All you got to do is look in his eyes. This dude is trouble. Oh, I don't think so. Seemed like quite a nice boy to me. Oh, don't let him fool you. I think he's just lonely. Maybe a bit scared. Oh, not him. But what am I going to do? Well, if you if you want to go home without him, nothing's easier. But I can't slip him. I I just know it. He he's watching for me to come out. Well, he won't be when you do. I'll make sure of that. How? Very simple. I'm going out now, and I'm going to ask him to dance with me. <laughs> dance with you? Why not? I've always been a very good dancer. Just a minute. How oh, nice, just my speed and right on cue. <laughs> They're playing a waltz. Now, Candy, while he's dancing with me, you watch. And when you get the chance, duck down the back car to the rear door and out of his life. He won't see you, I guarantee. I'll keep him busy. <laughs> I'm standing by the punch bowl when this uh, wrinkled-up little prune blows back, almost catching me sneaking the last drink in the bowl. I figure the best defense is attack since I see she's uh, alone. Huh? Hey, uh, where's my girl? Oh, she's um, otherwise engaged for the moment. Well, I see the bowl is empty. I'm not surprised. Well, I've been doing a Russian business here. Uh, let's see, uh, 23 bucks. Thank you. Well, that frees me from my duties. So while we're waiting for your young lady, why don't you ask me to dance? To dance? They're playing a waltz. My favorite. Uh, well, I ain't much on that kind of dancing, cousin. You know. Cousin Anne, please. Use my name. And there's no problem. I can show you very easily. <laughs> hey. Hey, you know, you dance pretty good. So do you, um... Uh, Psy. Is that with a C? Uh, no, it's with an S. You know, for Simon. Simon. Oh, I might have known it. He looks so much like him. It's almost as if he were alive all over again. Uh, some guy you know named Simon? No, his name was Peter. But that's just the same, isn't it? Oh, dig ya. Oh, it's in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. It all just seems as though it's fated, Si. What's that? That I should command you, as our Lord did to the man Simon called Peter, to follow me. Yeah, where? Oh, I would hope to your salvation. Well, now, that's sort of a rocker for a number one man whose life is dedicated to the pursuit of the easy buck, isn't it? To say nothing of the fact that he's a man who doesn't need an elastic conscience. Because in his life to date, he's never needed one at all. Just how do you suppose he'll make out if he ever has to use one? Let's see when I return with Act Two. The tall, dark, handsome boy dances with the little sparrow bird of a woman. A half a century lies between them. The boy, for all his easy carriage, is a coiled spring, tensed, dangerous. His agate bright eyes, afraid and menacing, behind the surface charm. The little old lady is serene and unafraid, with the dauntless armor of extreme age and inner faith. An ill-assorted couple, joined by an accident of fate, which can lead only to disaster. Hey, you're too much for me, Cousin Anne. I don't think so, Simon. Maybe just enough, or at least what you need. You're up against it, aren't you? Come again? You're broke. Practically down to your last dime. And you're looking for a meal ticket. <laughs> Lady, you fracture me, you know? I mean, how's an old woman like you know where anything's at? <laughs> I put in my apprenticeship finding out. 
I've lived a lot of years. Yeah, in the past. Oh, I'm still here. You'll have to tell me if I'm right. I think you've run out the string side. That ten bucks I changed for you was your last line of defense. <laughs> hey, what is this? I know I'm right, and so do you. And this girl tonight, she was just a means to an end, a place to spend the night, huh? What do you What do you mean, uh, was? Hey, look, I I gotta find her, and I. She isn't here anymore. How do you know? Well, you scared her. She wanted to go home. And she's gone, alone. I'm sorry if I broke up your date, but it really was for the best. Yeah, I'm glad you figure it that way. Now, before you get too mad, why don't you listen to me? Yeah, listen to what? I don't have a date. So you can be mine. The party's over, Simon. Will you see me home? I never figured this. Me... Walking a little old bundle of bones couldn't weigh over 85 pounds soaking wet home. But what else have I got going for me, you know? So, that's my proposition. Now, how does it feel for a change? What do you mean, uh, change? <laughs> well, aren't you the one who usually makes the proposition? <laughs> I say it again, Cousin Ann. You are really something else. Something else from you, Simon, baby. I'd like you to cross over and join my world. Well, what's your world? Well, I told you. The way to salvation. You mean you're ready to take me in? Uh, you stake me till I find a job? Get back on my feet? But what's the payoff? Payoff? What am I letting myself in for? What, what have I got to pay back? Oh, nothing really, except companionship and maybe sort of the miracle of a memory coming alive for even only a little while. You're so like him, Simon. Well, here we are home. We can say good night and you keep on walking or you come in with me and make it yours too. You're taking some risk. <laughs> At 85. Uh, 84. <laughs> you uh, really want me to come stay with you? I really do, Simon. I think it would be very good for both of us. I got a suitcase down at the bus station with my things. I, I could go fetch it and come back. You do that. And I'll have a nice little supper waiting for you by the time you come back, Peter. I, I mean, Simon. This'll be your room, Simon. With your own bath right across the hall. Put out towels for you. Oh, uh, th there's a closet over there. And whenever you're ready, have a little surprise for you. Keep it hot in the kitchen. Yeah, well, I can unpack later. Uh, why don't I come on down with you now? Whatever you want. From now on, you're home. You buy this? You can see this happen? I had to shake all the cobwebs from that loaded punch out of my head to make sure it was for real, and, I, and I'd fallen knee-deep in it. Suddenly, I was cold sober, and I knew I'd hit the jackpot if I just played it right. I washed my face quickly, I combed my hair, and went down to supper in the kitchen. More coffee? As much as you want. How is the pizza? Oh, it's the most... I don't eat it myself. I really don't remember just why I bought it. Maybe someone nudged my elbow. Huh? Well, since it wasn't my idea, it must have come from above. I don't think you crossed my path by accident. Mm. I don't know what else. Well, you don't believe in him as easily as I do. Yeah, you know, religion uh, ain't my speed. Perhaps you know. not yet. Ah, oh, you're so like him. We're back to Peter again, eh? Simon called Peter. Does that upset you? Yeah, well, you know, I kind of like to be number one guy. Who was this Peter guy, anyway? It was the man I should have married. The man I should have made marry me. I was too romantic for our own good, so I just let him walk out of my life. Uh, he ditched you? No, not exactly. 
No, he had another appointment, which kept him in, in France. Villa Wood, near Chateau Thierry. Yeah, that's what I say, another dame. No. No, a gentleman with a scythe. Huh? Death, Simon. Death. In the Dark Ages, long before you were born, May 27th, 1918, a German machine gun cut him down. Peter. Peter Hurst, who should have been my husband, except that he refused to marry me. Why? Oh, just exactly because of what happened. When he marched away to war, he had a premonition he'd never come back. He thought that 28 would be too young for a widow. And I was fool enough to let him have his way. Well, I don't know, Cousin Anne. Uh, maybe he pegged it right. In no sense for making a... Well, you know, like uh, making a commitment to some poor Joe couldn't be around. Now, this way he lets you swing free. You know what I mean? If we'd been married, we'd have been together. And if we'd been together, I know we'd have had a child. This way, I was left with nothing. You mean you never... Nothing to bother about. Yet. But if I had had that child, he might have looked just like you. Oh, come on, Cousin Annie. BBB would have been old enough to be my father. I could have been a girl. Either way, I might have ended up with a grandson. <laughs> I ain't a guy. No, not yet. Huh? Oh, forget that. Now, the first thing to do is get you a job, isn't it? Well, how would you like to work in a bank? A bank? Yes, Mr. Gillette is the man who handles my affairs. And I'm sure if I recommended you, he might find something for you. Should I recommend you, Simon? Why not? Oh, I'm the one who was asking the questions. I mean, can you be trusted? <laughs> Well, what do you think? I mean, uh, what do you think? I want to heist the joint? Well, I'd like to feel that I could be sure you wouldn't. I told you I was interested in your salvation. I get a job at the bank. Interest clerk in the savings department. <laughs> and I lived with Cousin Anne, and she, she tried to make my peace with her God. And uh, maybe it wasn't all con, because she sort of got to me, you know, and... Who knows, the way things could have gone, except for Ted Slade turning up one day. Hey, man, I've been waiting for you. Yeah? <laughs> you don't recognize me? Ted. Ted yeah. Slade. Yeah, I know. Hey, where you heading? It's my lunch hour. I got some place to grab a fast sandwich. Okay, I'll walk with you. Hey, working in joint? Yeah. <laughs> Man, I never thought I'd see you go square. I gotta eat. Yeah. Best you could do. It ain't like that. So how is it? And tell me. Shut up. Well, just figured you for a little inside info. Yeah? About what? Mm, the way banks work. Like, uh, since you're on the inside. What do you got in mind? Hey, I'll buy you lunch. Maybe we could get our heads together, huh? <laughs> I'm not copping out. I'm not trying to duck it. I, I knew as well as Ted did where he was heading, you know. We we were both main chance boys, and the way it stacked up, whatever religion I'd got kind of, like, melted. It all looked so easy. Ah, uh, who's trying to knock off your bank, chum, huh? Yeah, then what? Well, I've cased this little neighborhood bank corner of Stillwell and Seven. Same pattern as yours. Now, Friday should be the big day when the cash is still alive, not buried in a vault. You drive. That's all the risk you take. I pay off one-third. Yeah, is it worth it? <laughs> you gotta know it is. That's payday for the consolidated machine plant. There's like 150,000 riding on this. You want in? Hmm? Yeah, you got me. I want in. When? Next Friday. Take off sick. In the morning, you pick up the getaway car. From then on in, 
It's smooth sailing. Sure, I should have told him to get lost, you know? You think I don't know that? But there were other things going for me right then. Like I was broke. And anyway, I, I had a grab at it. Huh. What did you say? Cousin Ann? Ah, oh, come on. She was just a lucky break I'd latched on to. Or was she? Wasn't she maybe a... I don't know what to call it, like... Maybe a force that was shoving me into a corner. I couldn't break out of it. Say, so maybe Ted was handing me a brass ring. I I could grab it and I could get off the merry-go-round. Wrong or right, I grabbed it. You okay? Sure. All right, I'm going out now. I just saw a consolidator make the big deposit. Hey, you can handle it alone? <laughs> Duck soup. You just hold fast. Be ready to take off when I come out. No rough stuff? Hey, you playing with children. Not unless there has to be. Hang in there, partner. I saw him saunter into the bank. Then nothing. But the waiting. When I finally heard them, like... Like I guess I knew all along I was going to. That this was one heist which wasn't going to work. Problem. I shoved that getaway car into gear and took off. I junked it four blocks away. I went back meekly to my job as interest clerk. But I knew right then, no matter how it went, I had to get out. Even away from Cousin Ann. Oh, terrible. What a waste. Hmm? A young man robbing a bank, shot to death. And what for? Let me see. Ted Slade. Oh, did you know him? Uh, I'm just uh, reading his name here in a paper. Where? Yeah, right there. Oh, oh, at the end of the story, I hadn't got that far. Police speculated that the robber could not have been alone... Mrs. James C. Nielsen, returning from lunch, remembers a gray sedan sitting near the bank with its engine running. A search is being made for the car and a possible driver. Oh, what a terrible thing. A young man throwing away his life for a, a few dollars. You wouldn't have to do that, Simon. Huh? You have a future if you want it with me. May not be much. But all I have when I die is going to you. And I just hope you're willing to wait. But I wasn't. And I was too scared some smart cop would get a make on me. And I was long past being Mama's boy. So that night, I picked up stakes and I took off for the Big Apple. If you want to get lost, where else is better than New York? Hmm? And I thought I'd said goodbye to Cousin Ann... Forever. Sooner or later, every grifter, every guy with an angle, gravitates to New York. The city isn't to blame. It's just so big that, like blotting paper, it absorbs and disidentifies anyone who wants to become anonymous. A petty crook like Sai could have remained forever that way if... But that's the story. So we'll save that Till I return shortly with Act Three. Three months in New York have not been very kind to Cy Berman. Oh, he has a new girl. There's always a girl in the life of a man like Cy, but what he doesn't have is money, or what he would call a connection to raise any. Worse than that, he's in the hands of the loan sharks. So he's not at his best this morning. Lou! Hey, Lou! Yes, I am. <laughs> what is it? That devil is a wreck. Oh, they're tearing down the building next door. They've been at it since 8 o'clock this morning. Shut the window, will you? Put down the noise. Oh, the place will get like a steam bag. I don't care. I'd rather sweat than have my brain scrambled. Come on, move it. Do what I say. Yes, sure, Sai, sure. Don't, don't flip. Huh. Huh. How's that? 
Vibration's still enough to knock my head off. I need a drink. Where's a bottle? I threw it out. What? Now, take it easy, Si. You'll knock me up again. It was empty. You've been hitting it again? Si, no. You, you knocked it off yourself last night. Oh, please, you're hurting me. I ought to lay one across you. Go on, get out of here. Get me another one. Oh, what'll I use for money? We clean again? You ought to know. Oh, jeez, what are we going to do, Si? I don't know. I can't get nowhere. Well, if it hadn't been for me, we'd have been on welfare the past month and a half. Sure, sure. Big deal your brother rung me in on. Get me in the hands of the loan sharks. How am I going to dig myself out of that, huh? Oh, if you could only get something going. Yeah, not legitimate, that's for sure. You know, I'm never going to dig myself out that... Who's that? I don't know. Maybe Sal. Yeah? Give him my gun just in case. Now, don't go off like a rocket, Si. I'm sure it's only my brother. Yeah, I'm not taking any chances. Who is it? It's Sal. You alone? Sure. What do you think? You better be. I'm nervous. I'm real edgy. Open that door, Si. Go ahead, Lou. Open it up. Ah, you put the gun away, Si. I'm alone. This time. What do you want? <sighs> You're overdue, Si. Oh, I haven't got it. Well, you'd better get it. You know, the man gets nervous when it goes over a gram. A thousand bucks? Mm -hmm. Hey, I only borrowed three bills. Well, that's the way it is with interest. <laughs> it mounts up. How am I going to get that kind of dough? Search me. But if I was you, I'd, I'd get it. I mean, by Monday next week. That's all the time you got. Oh, Sal, can't you give him a break? You're my brother, after all. Lou, hon, there ain't no family connections with the man. Now, I am just a messenger. It's my neck or size. So who's do you figure I'm going to look out for? Yeah, but he hasn't got it, honest. Well, he'd better find some way to get it. Hey, ain't you got no family you can put the bee on, huh, Si? Nah, I've been on my own ever since I was a... Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Maybe there is a way. It took me pretty near ten minutes on the phone to get Cousin Ann to stop trying to hang up on me. She sure soured on me the way I walked out on her. But when the chips are down, I can wheedle with the best. Well, I'm probably being very foolish, Simon. And that's another privilege of old age. Do you want to come home again? Oh, more than anything, Cousin Ann, but... Well, only I can't, see? What's the matter? You're in trouble? Yeah. With, with the police? Oh, no, 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 nothing like that. Uh, a girl? Well, no, I, I don't have any trouble with them. Yes, I don't imagine you do. Well, what is it, then? I... I was very foolish, see? I... I had to live. I'm... I'm in hock. You mean you owe money? Yeah, you can say that again. Well, how much? A thousand dollars. <laughs> but maybe I could I could stave them off, you know, uh, with less. You're asking me for the money, Simon? Just just as a loan. Uh, but you'd rather have it as a gift, huh? Oh well, you you know you once said something about putting me in your will. Um, I'm 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 sure I'd rather have it now, you know. A thousand dollars. You gotta help me, uh, cousin Ann, please. Well, give me your New York address and phone number, Simon, and I I'll think it over. I guess I don't have to tell nobody how I sweated out the next couple of days. Like, uh, I must have jumped a foot every time the phone rang. And I had Lou running up and down the stairs ten times a day looking for the mail. <laughs> Who's that, Lou? Search me. Look, they said I had till Monday. I still got time. Yeah? Yeah, who is it? It's Cousin Ann, Simon. Will you come down and, and help me with my bags, please? Who is it? It's Cousin Ann. What the devil is she doing here in New York? So, this is how you're living. Uh, yeah, it's the best I've been able to manage. Well, now that Cousin Ann is here, we'll see if we can't improve things for you. You mean, uh, you brought the... I mean, uh... I mean the money? Now, that's something we can discuss when I get settled in. <laughs> I want us to enjoy my visit while I'm here, before we go back to Cleveland. 
The next few days was enough to get me annoyed enough to murder this old babe. Like it gets to be Saturday, and I sneak out of the house to phone Lou from a booth and let her know how the land lays, see? Sal ain't here right now, Si. Nothing he could do anyways. Hey, look, Lou, don't be mad at me. I'm just trying to play the angles, only nothing pays off. She hasn't come up with the dough? Nah. She says it's uh, usury and uh, it's against the law. She 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 wanted to bring in the cops. Oh, no. Yeah. It was all I could do to stop her. Lou, what am I going to do? Don't tell me you've run out of snake oil, charm boy. Lay you off. Yeah. I tell you, I'm scared silly. And what's driving me bananas is all she's got to do is write a check and I'm home free. I've only got today and tomorrow to make her see reason. If she doesn't come through, I'm going to murder her. <laughs> Oh, there you are, Simon. I didn't know where you'd got to. I was afraid you'd forgotten our little trip to the Metropolitan Art Museum today. Look, uh, Cousin Anne, uh, maybe this trip here is a big blast to you, but uh, with me, it's uh, life and death. I got less than 24 hours to come up with a thousand big ones or else I'm going to get hurt. I'm hurt bad. I gotta know. You're going to give it to me or not? I have no intention of having any traffic with crooks and criminals or of condoning usury. I am not going to pay it, and neither are you. What? The matter is in much better hands than ours, Simon. And that's the last I intend to say about it. Whose hands? You think this is something that, uh, that guy you pray to is going to take care of? I have no doubt in the last analysis. I am sure when we go to church tomorrow, he will answer my prayers. There's a right way and a wrong way to go about things. Now, you listen to me, Simon. No! I... Now, you listen to me, you silly old doll. You're going to make that payoff. You see this? Yes, it's a pistol. Yeah, with real bullets. One of which, so help me, is going to make you very dead if you don't sit down and write me a check for that thousand. I can't do that, Simon. You better, cousin. I am not kidding. I'm desperate. I, I, it, it wouldn't do any good even if, if I had a check, which I haven't. I haven't even a bank account. And I haven't any money. Certainly not a thousand dollars. What are you talking about? You're loaded. I have a small insurance annuity policy which pays me barely enough to live on. Yeah, but the, but the house... Oh, I don't own that. The church has been kind enough to let me use it these last years rent-free in return... But you said I'd be in your will. You are, but well, it's only a few dollars that I thought might help Why, me. you silly old fraud. You led me down a garden path, and because of you, I'm going to get my brains knocked out. I could kill you for that. Only you won't. Because God wouldn't allow a boy like you. Damn you! And your... Ah. Ah. <gasps> oh, oh no. C Cousin Anne, look. I didn't mean it. Please! Drop your gun and open up. When the door opens, you better have your hands off top of your head. Okay. Okay, I dropped the gun. Uh, I'm opening up. That's nice, buddy. Just hold it like that. See to the old lady there. Right, sir. How did you know to be here? We weren't looking for homicide, buddy. Just answering a complaint at the precinct two days back by the old lady. Something about usury and loan shocks. We just came by to check it out. What's the matter, Crumb? She didn't want to pay off? They had me dead to rights. They threw the book at me. Maximum security. Solitary. The night I arrived here in jail, so did Cousin Anne. I was getting ready to turn in. Washing my face. As I reached for the towel, there she was. Sitting on the bed. Knitting on something. Hello, Simon. What are you doing here? Keeping you company. Yeah, but you... You can't. You're dead. Oh, no. No, you took my life in the midst of a deception. And my punishment is I cannot die till you do. We're 
We're going to be together a long time. Now. 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 Get me out of here. God. God. Get me out. I can't stand it. I'd rather die. I'd rather be dead. Not a pleasant story, I'm sorry to say. But then, Simon Berman wasn't, uh, I should say isn't, a very pleasant character. So perhaps the punishment fits the crime. He'll have a long, long time to learn with Hamlet that conscience doth make cowards of us all. I'll be back shortly. Cy Berman is no longer housed on death row. He lives part of the time in a padded cell when he doesn't have to be confined to a straitjacket in his own room. They've even given up treatments. No form of therapy helps. He lives in his private world with only one other companion, a gentle ghost named Cousin Anne, whose kindly presence, far from soothing him, has driven him mad. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Mary Jane Higby, Bryna Rayburn, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine, and Exlax. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Today's mystery drama is drawn from life... When the curtain rises on this presentation of the Mystery Theater, you will be drawn into that maelstrom that in our lifetime has affected more people than in any century before this, the Holocaust. But we are not here to survey millions. This is one woman's vengeance, an eye for an eye and blood for blood. Carl, I was so worried. You staying out so late and not coming home until morning. I was afraid to. Afraid of me? Your wife? Why didn't you call me? I was afraid the telephone was tapped. Why would they do that? Anna, the past is returning to haunt me. I must be careful. I think I am a marked man. Our mystery drama, The Final Step was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Marion Seldes and Roberta Maxwell. I shall return shortly with Act One. The time is now. It is late evening. Fog rolls in across the Jersey meadows. On the turnpike, cars venture carefully, making allowances for vision obscured through their windshields. Up ahead, flares announce an accident. Like an overturned bug, sprawled across the highway, a sedan lies on its roof. An ambulance swings away with its passenger. 
medic, ma'am. I'm not a policeman. You don't have to explain anything to me. Uh, the trooper behind us will ask all the questions when we get to the hospital. I'm sorry about all this. Now, are you from Market Street Hospital? Yeah, how'd you know? You're a, a paramedic with the ambulance service. I, do I know you? No, no, I, I work at General Hospital. I'm a nurse's aide. No kidding. Yeah, what lousy luck for you. I mean, it's good luck that you're getting out of the wreck. It, you know, it could have been worse. Uh, did I make the bandage on your arm too tight? No, no, it's all right. I'm fine. You sure? Uh, maybe, maybe I better do it again. Mm-hmm. Oh, it, it is too tight. Look, I'll redo it nice and easy and careful. Don't you worry. There, it's all off. Hey, what are those numbers on your arm? What do you know? You mind me asking, what does uh, one eight three 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 mean, huh? It was out. The tattoo I'd hidden for years from everybody except Jacob. Marks no one had ever seen since I'd grown up. They couldn't find anything wrong with me at the hospital, and I called home. You what? I'm all right, Jacob. I'm all right. I was beginning to get really worried. I was just going to call the police. Yes, you don't have to. I'm right here at General... Come to the emergency entrance. There's a state trooper here. He's going to ask me some questions. Sweetheart, are you sure you're all right? I'm fine. Uh, The car is a mess. I can go home as soon as you come to get me. I'll be there in half an hour. Well, hurry, will you, darling? Of course I will. But I'm not going to go so fast on a foggy night to have an accident like some people I know. How did it happen? I'll tell you the whole story as soon as you get here. Goodbye. Uh, oh, I'd like to know the whole story, too. Uh, are you Mrs. Naomi Berger? Yes, I am. Yes, well, my name is Johnson. I'm a state trooper. I know. I can tell by your hat. Hmm. Well, I, I'm sorry to have to detain you this late at night, but I have to file this report. My husband won't be here right away. He drives so slowly. Yes, it's not a bad idea. You're pretty lucky, Mrs. Berger. I mean, real lucky, I'd say. Car turned over like that. Uh, now, the doctor tells me a couple of bruises and scratches. Do you think you can remember what happened? Oh, yes. And, and did you ask the other driver? Well, there was another driver? Well, the man who stopped short in front of me, he caused the whole thing. Oh, well, uh, there was nobody there but you when we got there. Uh, what can you tell me? I was behind a car, and he suddenly put on his brakes, and I tried to avoid him, and... Well, then I'm not exactly sure what happened after that. According to a witness, your car climbed the guardrail and then flipped over. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, uh, could you describe the car in front of you that suddenly stopped? I don't think so. It all happened so fast. Uh, well, I don't suppose you saw anything of the license plate, did you? Yes, I did. There were three threes in it. And the letter A. And the letter A and three threes. Now, uh, do you remember any more than that? More than what? Well, do you remember any more numbers or letters on that license plate? What are you talking about? Uh, the car in front of you that stopped without warning. You said you saw the letter A and the uh, three threes on the plate. I did. Oh, I said... I said... Oh, I don't know why I said that. When is my husband coming to take me home? I don't want to say anything until he gets here. I guess, well, uh, I'll tell you what. I won't ask you any more questions tonight. I'll stop by your house tomorrow and we'll go on from there. Is that okay? Yes, yes. I'm all right. I just want to go home. Good morning, Naomi. I thought we'd have breakfast in the garden today. Oh, Jacob, you're the sweetest husband. Oh, you made breakfast and everything. The least I could do for an injured wife. How do you feel this morning, darling? Oh, let me have some coffee first, then I'll tell you. <laughs> Help yourself. And the toast before it gets too cold. Mm. Uh, there was a state trooper who phoned earlier he was to come to see you. I told him you were still asleep. He's coming over this afternoon. Oh, oh. Darling, what, what is it? You dropped your cup. I don't know what it is. My hand started to shake. <laughs> After last night, that is not so strange. Oh. Well, we won't talk about what happened. We'll put it all out of our minds. But I want to talk about it. Are you sure? Yeah. 
Uh, where's the marmalade? That's right in front of you. Oh. Anyway, the troopers said that I should tell you they were trying to track down the license plate with the letter A and the three threes. When he realized he had not asked you the color of the plate, you know, so they could uh, identify which state it was. I never said anything to him about A and three threes. By all means. Could you have said that because, well, oh, you know... Out of shock, maybe. In the ambulance, this young paramedic saw the A18333 on my arm. Could I have been so confused that I said that about the license plate of the car I almost ran into? I didn't tell you, did I? He was driving that car. Carl Durer. Naomi makes sense. How could it have been him? Now, I wish you would put all this behind you. It's making you see things, and what is worse, believe him. Now, give it up, sweetheart. Give it all up. What is past is past. I'll never give up. How can I? How could you have seen the face of a man in a car in front of you at night? Oh, Jacob, you just know it. You remember London? Huh? It was like that? When you spotted him on Waterloo Bridge and he ran away from you? Tonight he knew I was right there behind him. <laughs> if he did and he stopped short on purpose, what well, you might have been killed. The Lord has other plans for me. Don't make it too hard for the Lord to protect you. Ah, how many years is it now that you've been following this I man? I don't count it in years, Jacob. I count it in lives. My mother's, my father's, and my sister's. You didn't know them or you wouldn't dream of saying to me, give up. My darling Naomi, they are gone. Death camps, Nazis, crematoria. They made it all part of history. It is over now. Not for me. Ever. Well, look at it dispassionately. Let us say that Carl Dürer is here in New Jersey. He is. And you have chased him, hunted him down from Auschwitz to Genoa to London to Argentina to New Jersey. Are you denying it was him? Of course it was. So he is here now, somewhere, in some town or city. Where does he live? Under what name? I have found out before. I can do it again. Why is he driving in front of you on the turnpike at night or know it was you behind him? Professor, what point are you making? Ah, Naomi. Is it not possible it has become an obsession? It is an obsession. I don't deny that. You ask how did he know, I'll answer. When I came out of the hospital after the night shift, there was a car parked ahead of mine. Carl Dürer walked to that car and unlocked it. He turned for a moment and looked at me. Then he got in it and drove off. Ah, so that is how the accident happened. You were chasing him. So he recognized you, you say. But he did not know who you were. Maybe somebody from his past, somebody who could identify him. He knows I've seen him before. If the man in the car is the camp doctor who caused the death of your family... Oh, Jacob, don't be so mealy-mouthed. Caused the death. Killed them. Murdered them. If you want now to bring him to justice, you have to stop putting him on his guard by chasing him. Now, we may have to enlist the help of a, uh, an international lawyer. We, we have to get enough evidence together to punish him legally. You may have to do it that way, Jacob. I don't have to. All I have to do is follow him until he stands still long enough for me to kill him. Carl, what did you ring for? Don't you have your key? Where have you been? I, uh, I lost my house key and my key to work. I told you to put them on the same ring with the car keys. Look what time it is. I'm uh, please. I can't think anymore. Uh, can I have some coffee? Of course. Carl, take your shoes off. Sit in the big chair. Uh, this was a bad night for me, Anna. A whole night. And what time is it now? Ten o'clock in the morning and you're not at work. What will Mr. Perlman say? What will he say? Carl, I hired you at the recommendation of my foreman, Ernst. Yeah, good work with your fingers assembling the transistors. I made you a section supervisor. We have a small shop here, Carl, and not to shop for work is serious. That's what he will say. What are you talking so crazily for? Mr. Perlman is your friend. Here's the coffee. Yeah. Drink it slowly. I made it strong. I was so worried. It's not like you not to call me. Mm, oh, that's good. I was afraid to, Anna. What are you talking about? 
Afraid of me? No, no, afraid the telephone was tapped. Somebody listening. What do they know about you to listen? Who is it? Well, that's the problem. I, I wish I could be sure, but I don't know who they are. Last night, we, we had our usual game, you know. I left Fritz and Heinz and Ernst about 11 and a little after. I go to my car... And there is this woman getting into her car behind me. And I know her right away. Ah, uh, it's not her, is it? Yes, it is. And she knows who I am. The same woman from London and Buenos Aires? The same. How could it be? The same red hair. That moment we looked at each other at night, only an instant. I know her. She knows me. What happened then? Well, well, she shouts something at me, but I'm in my car and driving away fast, and, and she follows in her car. She's crazy. Well, we are on the parkway going north away from town. I cannot shake her. She's very close behind me. And suddenly there is a, a dog. Well, you know how I feel about animals. I pull the brake down not to hit it. The woman is too close. She hits in the back of my car. You know, the bumper is bent, the fender... <laughs> My neck, it hurts. But, well, I stop. She has hit the guardrail and her car is turned over. What did you do? Well, there are no flames. I get back into my car and I can see her crawling out. Then I hear sirens, the police cars. I go. I go as fast as I can and I keep going. Is that what you were doing? Driving all night? No, 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 not all night. I stop up in uh, Caddy Falls and I go into a diner and have some coffee. The woman in the accident... Was she hurt badly? I told you she was crawling away. So she couldn't be hurt too bad. But it was her fault following me so close like that. I can't have good thoughts about her. She could be from the FBI or Interpol. Anna, Anna, they are watching. Still, after all these years. I don't know if there are limitations on what they call... War crimes. What crime did you commit? You were like a soldier. You followed orders. A highly respected doctor who helped his country in the prison camp. Yes, you think so. Huh? I, I thought so. But the Russians and the British and the Americans and the Israelis, so, huh? they don't think so. I thought when we finally came to America, we could live new lives and the past would be dead. Buried forever. Oh, yes, uh, I almost forgot. One good thing did happen in all this horror. And I'm proud of myself, at least for that. Ah, what happened? The dog that ran out in front of the car, I told you. Well, I didn't hit him. The poor little thing out late at night. You see so many dead little animals on the highways, run over by thoughtless people. It could make you cry. <laughs> I think you're getting the drift of where all this is leading. This is no mere tale of retribution or revenge. It involves a crime of war. All societies, it's been said, are capable of committing war atrocities. So who are we to cast the first stone? I shall continue our account of Naomi's pursuit of such a criminal when I return shortly with Act Two. Volunteer nurse's aide who has suffered the loss of her family in the Nazi extermination camp of Auschwitz some 35 years ago has made it her mission in life to bring the prison doctor responsible for the murders to justice and has pursued his shadow across two continents. This is the incomprehensible position I find myself in. Me. Karl Dürer, graduate of the Medical Academy at Dresden, honored in Stuttgart and Berlin for outstanding genetic research. I conducted bona fide medical experiments at Auschwitz. They don't believe that. I was never a Nazi. They don't believe that. So for years, I've been on the run. It is unjust. This creature with the red hair, she must have survived somehow. What does she want from me? Naomi. 
Naomi, there's a man from the police here to see you. Uh, she will be right down. I'm uh, sorry I couldn't get here yesterday. You're her husband? Ah, I always forget to introduce myself. Jacob Berger. Ah, yeah, well, uh, here, let's see. Oh, you teach uh, classical literature and German history at the junior college. Huh? You know a great deal about me. And your wife does volunteer work at General Hospital. In the laboratory, not with the patients. Uh, but why such uh, investigation, Mr. Johnson? Well, sir, Mrs. Berger narrowly escaped with her life, so naturally we check everybody and everything. Good morning, I... Forgot your name? Oh, uh, Johnson, Mrs. Berger, state trooper. May I sit down? Yes, and you may take your hat off. Ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, now, uh, let's see, you told me the night of the accident you observed the license plate of the car you hit had the letter A and three threes. Now, uh, do you remember the color of the plate by any chance? No, I don't. I see. Yeah, the color of the car? Blue. Uh, blue sedan. Mm. How far in front of you was he? I don't know. It's kind of hard to say how far. Uh, it... One car length, uh, two car lengths, three, four, huh? I'm not sure. Well, you were following this car for some distance. I guess so. You say you didn't know the identity of the driver or any occupant of the car you hit. How could I know them? So there's no basis in the fact for presuming you might have been chasing this car. Chasing? Why would I do that? Well, you were not on your way home from the hospital, were you? Uh, if I may interrupt, I get the impression that the police believe there's something suspicious in my wife's actions and she's being accused of something. Uh, well, sir, we have two eyewitness accounts, uh, Mrs. Berger, of uh, which I'd like to check with you. Uh, witness one told us that a gentleman alone got into a car opposite the general hospital at 11.10 the night before last, uh, that you were parked behind him. The witness was passing along the sidewalk when you shouted from your car, Mrs. Berger. I'll get you yet. Uh, the man drove off, and you started your vehicle and drove off after him. Tell me, what is this? Jacob, it's false. Now, I... The second eyewitness account was given to me personally at the Turnpike Toll Booth by the attendant on duty. Uh, he told me that on the night in question, a woman with red hair followed a blue sedan which had just passed and asked the attendant if that car had taken the service road or continued along the Turnpike. And because this woman had red hair, you are saying it was me? No, ma'am. I'm asking, was it you? I, I think, Mr. Johnson, before this questioning goes any further, my wife ought to have legal advice. Oh, well, you're entitled. But I'd like you to accompany me now to the police station so that the two eyewitnesses could make positive identification. Well, my wife would be happy to comply, but I think in this case also she is entitled to consult legal counsel. <laughs> I can't deny you that, sir, either. Uh... Give us a call tomorrow, will you? Or have your attorney call and we'll arrange for the witnesses. Now, in the meantime, I must warn you, Mrs. Berger, not to leave town. Uh, good day to you. Uh, tomorrow, don't forget. So long, folks. Do we have to get ourselves a lawyer? I don't know. Ah, oh, you were very foolish. After all these years to betray yourself like that, shouting threats into the street. Oh. It was just too much to see him so close like that. But why didn't you tell me the truth? I did, but I didn't tell you all of it. Jacob, I feel we are at the end of the trail. We've talked about this so often, but he's here now. He must be living in this area and working here. Now we should put the main plan into operation. That plan? You don't have to be part of it, Jacob, if you don't wish to be. We agreed on that. I always said that when the time comes and you can't go the final step, I'll let you out. I'll do it alone. No. No, no, we are in this together. Everything. The final step included. When I married you, your mother and father and your sister Lisa became my mother and father and sister. I want Carl Dill to pay the ultimate price as much as you do. He's had the luck to escape for a long time. I think it is over. Anna, luck will not always be mine. How much longer can I escape this woman with the red hair? There is a way. To be rid of her. Forever. Chase her. Find her. Speak to her. Ask her why for the last 15 years. Is, is that when we were in London 15 years ago? 
Why does she follow you? What does she want? If instead of running from her, Carl, as if you had done something wrong, as if you were guilty of something, you spoke together. Anna, you don't know what you're talking about. I can't do that. Why not? What did you do wrong? So you were a doctor in a prison camp. It wasn't by choice. You were conscripted. They wanted an expert in genetics. You treated everyone who was sick. Well, I, 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 I did what I was ordered. Were you ordered something so terrible you have to be running all your life? No, Anna, Anna, it's the unspoken part of my life. You've been wise enough not to ask me what I did, why after the war I had to give up being a doctor, and why I disappeared from Germany for so long. And then, when I finally wrote you under a new name from London, you came and joined me and never asked me why. Ask me nothing now, also. <laughs> You know what I'm going to tell that state trooper, don't you? Yes, and I, just exactly how much. I prayed last night, Jacob. So did I. I said to Mama and Papa and Lisa, now is almost the end of the trail. Did you make the phone calls? Yeah, two newspapers. How did you say it? Well, I told him who we were, that you were going to the police station today to give information about a Nazi prison camp doctor. That here in our small town in New Jersey, a murderer lives among us. Perfect. Well, good day, folks. Oh, I'm sorry we have to meet out here, but space is at a premium today. I understand you wish to change your story, Mrs. Berger? No, not change. Add to it. I did recognize the man who got into the car in front of me when I left the hospital that night. And I did follow him. I wanted to know where he lived. Mr. Johnson, he is a murderer. Ah, uh, I see. So you ran into him deliberately? No, that was an accident, just as I told you. His name is... was Dr. Carl Durer. Hmm? And you have a basis for your accusation of murder? I was there when he killed three people, if that's what you mean. This happened recently? A long time ago. Did you report it? No, I didn't. Well, why not? No, you see, what my wife has not made clear is that this Dr. Durer performed medical experiments, so-called, in a Nazi prison camp, which resulted in the death of her father and mother and twin sister. Well, who was she to report this to? The man is a Nazi. Do I have to say any more? I'm afraid you'll have to tell me a great deal more, Mrs. Berger. you? Yes, I'm home, Anna. Oh, I get the phone. No, don't answer it. Don't answer it, please, Carl. Uh, why not? It's been ringing all day, since you went to work. Uh, why don't you answer the phone? This is too stupid. Carl, please. Uh, hello? Hello? Who is this? Who is this? Who are you? It was one of them, wasn't it? Uh, has this been going on all day? Horrible. He... He called me a Nazi murderer. That's why I stopped answering the phone. Didn't you see the morning paper? No. Here. Look. On the front page. Oh, Anna, please, you read it. A murderer in our midst. Mrs. Naomi Berger accuses Carl Durer of being a Nazi torturer at Auschwitz, the infamous Nazi extermination camp of World War II. The wife of Jacob Berger, professor of German history, made a statement today at police headquarters denouncing... Oh, stop it! Stop it! All day, people have been calling here. They look us up in the telephone book. What are we going to do? We have to go away. Where can we go, Carl? You must stand up to this woman. See her. Go there. What do you have to fear? It's all lies. Make her believe you, this Mrs. Jacob Berger. And it's no use. The authorities will come, and they won't listen either. Yes, I performed experiments under orders. Of course people die. They would have died anyway. I put them to sleep. Wasn't it a better death than being shot or gassed like the others? You 
could be accused of murdering, like it says. Anna, Anna, I have got to go out. I'm going to find that woman. I am going to face her, as you say. Oh, where's the telephone book? Where it always is, next to the telephone. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, 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 yes, here it is. It's like any other name. Now, what is her husband's name? Uh, Jacob. Yes, Jacob. Yes, Jacob Berger. Who are you calling? Mrs. Jacob Berger. I am going to tell her that Dr. Carl Dura is on his way over to pay her a house call. Don't. Don't go over there, Carl, yet. Oh, Mrs. Berger? This is Carl Dura. No, Carl, no. Just a moment, please. Anna, please. If you are determined to see her, don't warn her when you're coming. Suppose she has some police with her when you get there. Do as I say, Carl. Hang up. You're right. For a change, I will be the hunter, and she, the hunted, let her wonder what I am going to do next. It has often been said that the mills of the gods grind slowly, yet they grind exceeding small. In other words, the reward of patience is justice. Naomi Berger sees no evidence that patience would even ultimately redress wrongs. So she herself has decided to play Nemesis, a most dangerous game. I shall return shortly with Act Three. When you consider a woman who has waited 30 years to confront the very doctor who assisted the infamous Dr. Mengele by the injection of phenolic acid, benzene, or air, which killed in seconds. When you consider she watched her mother, father, and sister die that way, the way of human guinea pigs, when you consider all that, perhaps you can understand Naomi's feelings at this moment. He's coming here. I know it, Jacob. I know he's coming. What did he say on the phone just now? He said, Mrs. Berger, this is Carl Dura. And then I heard a woman's voice say, Carl, don't. And then he said, just a moment, please. And then they talked. He had his hand over the receiver. Then he hung up. Jacob, he saw the newspaper story. He swallowed the bait. He's coming because he has to silence me. But he doesn't know who I am. I could be related to any of the thousands of deaths. Are you ready, Jacob? The car has gas in it, and it is standing right by the back door. The hypodermic? Everything is laid out on the kitchen table. But not all of them. Only one. The other two should be in your briefcase. Don't worry, they are. Now, where will you be standing when he comes through the door? Right there, just as we planned. The hammer? You have the hammer? I, I have it, I have it. I'm... Looking at my wife, planning this so matter-of-factly, and I... I don't know you. Yes, you do. The final step. We've always talked about it. It has to be. There's no other way. Who would do it for us? The courts. Oh, bring him to court. You think he would answer charges in a court? Uh, what time is it? Maybe he won't come. He'll come, he'll come. He'll has to. He has to know who I am. What evidence do I have? How safe is he? What do I know? Suppose he carries a pistol. Have you considered that? Why do you think I am answering the door? And you are standing behind it with a hammer in your hand. Oh, let him come now. <laughs> ring of authority. Are you going to answer it? The, open the door before he goes away. I have the hammer. I told you that I have it, you see? All right, all right. No, wait. What for? If he has got a gun, warn me. I'm coming. Mrs. Berger? Yes? Is your husband home? I'm afraid not. I am Carl Dürer. I think you wish to talk to me. May I come in? I have been waiting for you to call on me. Please come in. Go right ahead. Into the living room. Oh, well, did 
I killed him. No, he's still breathing. You did fine. Help me move him so I can close the yeah. door. All right, then we'll drag him into the kitchen. Yeah. About the injections, will you do it or should I? I'll show you how to do it, Jacob. Don't worry. He's coming to. How is he going to react when he is fully conscious? His mind will be fairly clear, but he'll have no power over his body. Uh, he'll be able to talk slowly, but overall he'll be very weak and defenseless. Just like his victims at Auschwitz. Uh, where am I? Uh, you are in the kitchen of my house. I introduce myself to you, Dr. Dürer. I am Naomi Berger, and this is my husband, Jacob. What have you given me? Why do I feel so weak? Don't you recognize it, Herr Doctor? You use so much of it. It is the same drug you gave my mother and father and sister many years ago to quiet them. So that when you were quite ready to administer... You, you are mistaking me for someone else. I thought as a genetic scientist you would like to experience this sensation firsthand. I can't move. Well, perhaps it is not entirely the drug. Perhaps you are paralyzed with fear. Three doses tonight. One for my mother... One for my father and one for my sister, Lisa. Why do you accuse me of these things? Because I was there. I was in that hospital. The four of us. I saw with my own eyes. I saw your doctor, Mengele, say to you, Carl, take care of these biologically inferior specimens. So it was time for the second treatment, and you injected the specimens. Mother, father, and Lisa. No, you are wrong. I was not a camp doctor at Auschwitz. But then it was time for lunch, and you said to me, Little girl, wait there, so your father and father and sister will see you when they wake up. And then you went to lunch. It was not me. You are mistaken. It was someone else. Only I knew they would never wake up. And for some reason, I wasn't weak. I was strong. And I ran away and I hid. Naomi, is it time for the next injection? No, not yet. The redhead. You. You are the redhead. Can you remember now, Herr Dürer? Fifteen years ago... Twenty. I never forgot you, Herr Dürer. Everything is fine, Jacob, all in order. I'll help you carry the doctor to the car. Where are we? We have traveled an hour and a half. You have been asleep. How am I going to die? Two injections, 15 minutes apart. Doing this does not bother you, huh? What are you, a teacher? I teach the classics, German. Yes, literature. I am not a beast. I am not inhuman. Perhaps not now, but then you lost touch with reality. Those were human beings you experimented with. I was a doctor, highly qualified. Do you know what the word conscience means? I know what the word duty means. An order is an order, and it must be obeyed. You believe that I would be here today if I had disobeyed? You would have been here with a clear conscience. Conscience? This is the only world you know. <laughs> Can you move your arms or hands, Dr. Durer? No. My body will not obey me. I couldn't even spit in your eye. Then you will have no difficulty in holding still while I roll up your right sleeve. Oh, Carl, I've been so worried. Mrs. Oh. Durer? Yeah, yes? I'm uh, State Trooper Johnson... Now, these keys were found on the turnpike a few days ago. I traced one to the Acme Transistor Corporation, where I believe Mr. Durer works. 
Now, I spoke to a Mr. Perlman. My husband's boss, yes. Yeah. Uh, may I come in? Excuse me. I was expecting my husband. <clears throat> well, Mr. Perlman identified one of the keys as from a locker of your husband's. The other one is our front door key. Carl lost them. Well, may I ask, is your husband in good health? Is something wrong? Well, he wasn't at work, and Mr. Perlman said he's been absent a lot lately. You sound like a sympathetic man, and I'm going to tell you something. Last night, Carl was very upset. Uh, because his name was in the newspaper? Yes. He said he had to talk to that woman who said he was a Nazi, and he went out to talk to her, and he hasn't come back home yet. It is all over. I hid the body in a cave by the reservoir. Did anyone see you? No. I pulled the car off the turnpike. When I walked back to it, I did not turn the lights on until I was on the road coming home. No one saw me. So, it's done. The final step. I do not share your feeling of relief. Uh, the hypodermics are in the briefcase. What did he say in the end? Did he confess? Did he weep and grovel like so many of them did? He just went to sleep. Now, I'll take these hypodermics and uh, wash them out. I know it's late, Jacob. Would you like something to eat? I do not think I could ever get food past my lips. You can pour me a whiskey. I'll be back in a moment. Oh, hello? Mrs. Berger? Yes, this is she. Uh, this is Trooper Johnson. I know it's very late, but something important has just developed, and I have to talk to you, ma'am. Well, come on over. We're still up. I'll leave the light on outside. Oh, good. I'll be there in five minutes. All right. Jacob, come here quickly. Uh, what is it? Who is that on the telephone? Our friend Johnson, that state trooper. He's going to be here in five minutes. Oh, my Lord. Now, put the briefcase in the upstairs closet with my nurse's aid uniform. Are the instruments clean? Yes, yes. Oh, how could they have found him so quickly? Now, remember, you were here all evening. Uh, put your slippers on. Uh, well, go sit on the sofa. Uh, open a book. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Berger, I am going to dispense with the apologies for the lateness of the hour. Now, I've been to see the wife of Carl Durer. He left home to come here, Mrs. Berger. Now, did you see him? No, I can't say I did. At no time today has Carl Durer been to see either of you? But Jacob and I have been here alone all evening. Ah, I see. I haven't yet informed Mrs. Durer, so I shall ask you to keep this to yourselves uh, for the present. Two hours ago, in the Reservoir District, Carl Durer was discovered, run over, on the turnpike, dead. Now, he was apparently hit by some vehicle. Ah, you... you think he was walking along the highway and he was hit by a car? Well, he's been taken to the morgue, and after a thorough examination, we ought to be able to pinpoint the cause of his death. I, uh, I'd better go now and inform Mrs. Durer. <laughs> He suspects us. They're going to find traces of the poison in him. I... I don't understand how, after those injections, he could get up and walk to the turnpike. It was the identical phenolic acid he used on mother and father and Lisa. It is just beyond me. Naomi. You told me you left him hidden in a cave by the reservoir. But that's over a mile from the main road. Jacob, what happened... Naomi, I... I could not do it. I did not inject anything lethal at all. I started to roll up his sleeve. I took out the hypo and, and he passed out. Fear, shock, or what remained from the original tranquilizer, I do not know. I pulled him out of the car. I propped him against a tree. And I drove off. I knew he would wake up sometime. I'm... I'm sorry, Naomi. You didn't do it. I couldn't. I could not take that final step. Oh, my dear Jacob. How could I have asked it of you? He must have come to and started to walk home and somebody else. He could have been blinded by headlights. Oh, Jacob. All these years, and we never punished him. Isn't it enough? 
that we brought him to the edge of death. We who live by principles to maintain a peaceful society cannot bring ourselves to fight fire with fire, death with death, as did Naomi in her pursuit of a 30-year-old murder. Unhappily, as long as humans are capable of inhumanity, we are destined to live in an armed camp. That appears to be man's fate. I shall return shortly with some closing words. None have defined man's nature better than Rudyard Kipling. He observed the struggle between the law-abiding and the lawless and translated it into the law of the jungle. Now this is the law of the jungle, he wrote, as old and as true as the sky. And the wolf that shall keep it may prosper, but the wolf that shall break it must die. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Roberta Maxwell, Norman Rose, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. All of us are selfish to some degree. We protect our own desires and dreams, but within reason. For we inhabit a world where we must make certain compromises and respect other people's feelings. We had better. For the quickest way to lose everything is to try to have everything the way we want it. For then the fates that dog all our heels have a way of catching up. from here. mystery drama, The Plastic Man, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Don Scardino. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. As I said in the beginning... This is a story of an extraordinarily selfish man, a sort of product of our times. George Hartford, who could well be named the Plastic Man. Note his action and reaction to the oldest and most productive relationship in the history of man. Come on, Jane, knock it off. It isn't the end of the world. 
Not yours, George. You've made that quite clear. I wanted to lay it on the table. No messing around. A clean break. The least sweat. The least sweat? Well, it's one description for the end of a... of a love affair, I suppose. Now, don't get me wrong, babe. I really don't anymore. You shook me up, but you woke me up. Now you're with it, kid. Look, if we don't swing anymore, there's oh, no... Oh, I love your succinct statement in mod lingo. We don't swing anymore. May I remind you that we were going to be married? I wasn't swinging with you. I thought I was building something for the future. Okay, Jane. So it just didn't work out like that. Someone else? No. Mm -hmm. You're cutting out because this was getting just a little too serious for you. It might be the end of fun and games. You were on the point of being asked to contribute something in return. Jane, does it have to be all this much of a drag? Oh, perish the thought. I wouldn't want to ruffle your peacock feathers for the moment. But just one comment. You are heading for a rude awakening. Someday, one of your women won't be as accommodating as I am. Stop the car. What are you talking about? You're only halfway home. I just discovered I'm not even that far. All I want is to get off. <laughs> George? Hey, Big Brad. How's it going, Matt? Hey, fine. Just fine. Hey, what are you doing home so early? I thought you had a big heavy date with Jane. We split. Split? Just like that? Just like that. Well, what was the quarrel? Ah, I was getting kind of heavy, so I wanted out. Mm-hmm. How did she take it? Oh, you know, dames. Big fuss over nothing. Got anything to eat in the joint? Nothing but uh, humble pie, little brud. Huh? A cupboard is bare. And you wouldn't eat any of it, even if it was there. So I'll settle for a beer. Then maybe I'll do a little prowling. Pick up a pizza and, who knows, maybe even something more nourishing. Huh? Mm. You know, you ought to do something about that sex drive. Now, one of these days, you're going to get your head caught in a ringer. <laughs> okay, why don't you give me a reading, Shrink, huh? I'm all stretched out on the couch. How'd you like to probe my inner psyche? You haven't got a psyche. All you've got is one large itch and no conscience. Oh, so much for brotherly love. I can't even get a free treatment from the family psychiatrist. So, you don't want to talk to me? I'll have now, to... Now, hold it, George. Matter of fact, I do want to talk to you. Um, I'm moving out. Hey, wait a minute. I'm that bad? You really saw me? No, no, that's beside the point at the moment. You, you know, I'm a full resident now, and Fran just got a raise, so we've been looking at apartments. We figure we can go ahead now and get married. The ball and chain, huh? <laughs> oh, it's a big step, Matt. Why rush it? Well, I wouldn't expect you to understand, George. I want to live with Fran. Okay, fine. But married? I mean, who needs it these days? Look, why tie yourself down? I wouldn't expect you to understand that either, George. Ah, oh, come on, old sober sides. You just don't see where it's at. I mean, like, today is all wide open. It doesn't work that way for everybody, George. Okay, okay. What's your bag is yours, and what's mine is mine. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, gorgeous G, you keep trapping the other sex in it like you were a bounty hunter. It worries me. Why? Well, first of all, because some pretty nice girls get damn roughed up by you. Jane, for one. Oh, come on. Look, don't make me sound like a child molester. Any dame I play around with is old enough to know the score. It's more than just a game. It's an obsession, my friend. And as a psychiatrist, I don't particularly like its implications. Oh, brother. Here we go with the Don Juan Casanova bit again. It's uh, basically an inferiority complex, and I'm driven to prove myself. Or else it's uh, an edifice complex. Down deep in my id or whatever, I hated pop, and I... Yeah, was... yeah, yeah. It may be funny to you. But you might be surprised if you could understand how much basic truth there is in it. But that isn't the main thing. So what is? It's just your arrogant, selfish insensitivity. You know what you are? You're a plastic man. You haven't got one real human emotion in you, and I'm sorry for all the nice girls you've twisted up inside. Give the next one a break. 
Let her know about you from the start, so at least she goes into it with her eyes open. You got the wrong idea about women, Matt. They're a hell of a lot tougher than we are. I am not going to get trapped in an argument. I just... I just hope you don't get trapped one of these days with one of them who won't be as obliging as they all have been up to now. Your luck can't last forever. Sooner or later, you are going to get caught in a buzzsaw. Don't say I didn't warn you. My brother Matt was a good guy, but just a little square. And the chicks? Well, you know how it is. You take them as they come. Like I say, it's a big world, and if you want to hang yourself up with one old lady permanently, that's your own business. Me, I like to hang loose. I never figured old George here would get hung up on one, and surely not the way it happened. Hi. You, uh, you dropped your sun oil in the sand. Oh, did I? You're very kind. Are you one of the staff here? No, I'm a guest. Why? Oh, just your... I mean, you look like one of them. Well, thanks for the good word. These jocks that work the staff here are really built. <laughs> no, I'm just taking a week off from the daily grind. And a friend said these Club Pacificos really swing. I don't know, maybe I missed the season. Till now. What do you mean? Well, I haven't run into you up till now. Uh, you just get here? Why, no. We've been here a couple of days, but we drove down. We've been touring the countryside some. Hot work, this weather. Uh, Me, I'll take the water. Or a nice, long drink by the pool. Huh? Hey, it's about that time. Can I buy you one? Well, I... Why not? If you'll wait long enough for me to take one quick dip in the sea to wash the sand off. She came up from that beach lounger in one long, fluid move like a cat. My breed. I watched her run down and into the water. A one-piece suit, but it didn't hide any of that figure. Long waist, long legs. The club was beginning to live up to its reputation. Per no law, right? Right. How many beads do you want? Hey, I said the drinks were on me. <laughs> I pay my own freight, the way we travel. Ah, there's that we again. Roommate? Husband. Oh, and he lets you out without a leash? <laughs> it's a free country. He's confined to our cabin. He picked up amoebic dysentery some years ago in India. It's hell to get rid of. India? You travel a lot? He does. He's a parapsychologist. I uh, heard the word. Did it clue me in a little deeper? It's the branch of psychology that deals with unexplained phenomena. Clairvoyance, ESP, mental telepathy. Have you had enough? Ask a silly question, you get a... a complex answer. So, no more questions, except like... Well, my name's George. George Hartford. What's yours? You're not an insurance salesman. <laughs> no, cars. Business is a little slow right now. That's why I thought I'd catch a week off. Or was till I met... Uh, did I catch your name? <laughs> Laura. Laura Prentice. Here's looking at you. That's fair enough. It's all I've done since I set eyes on you. I noticed. Listen, it's, uh, it's kind of hot out here in the sun. My cabin is air-conditioned. So is ours. I just meant, why disturb your husband? Now, that is definitely not a silly question. Here. What's this? My beads. Buy us both another drink, George. And let's see how cool your pad really is. Oh, why did I do this? Come on, Laura. It's no crime. I know it isn't to you. Some of us are fashioned a little differently. Hey, that's only an illusion, baby. It's natural. And whatever is natural is right. You wouldn't understand. It isn't morals I'm concerned with. Well, then what? Oh. I could never make you understand in a million years, George. So, that's the kiss-off, huh? 
It ought to be. But it's too good for me to have the strength of will to let it go that easily. Now you're talking. No, not here. Tomorrow, away from the club. I have my car. We'll drive somewhere for the day. I'll say I'm going shopping in Puerto Valerso or Guadalajara. <laughs> You're the lucky sinner. You don't need any excuse. I'll meet you at the parking lot after breakfast. Oh, well, how do I find you? It isn't hard. It's the only green Mercedes. And the license plate is $69.99. <laughs> I wanted 7000 for luck, but I never could swing it. Till tomorrow. If you want to risk it. She was kind of offbeat, this chick, and married and all, so I might have passed her up. If it hadn't been for the car, I flipped when I saw it. A Mercedes 56, gold-wing coupe in British racing green, like she said. A dream classic. Zero to 60 in nine seconds flat. Quick ratio steering, independent suspension, and handles like it's part of the road. Plus the price tag. 12 to 15 thou in mint condition. And this baby was. While I was drooling over it, my other babe, also mint condition, arrived. This yours? A gift from my husband. <laughs> you know what you've got here? I ought to. It's what I asked for. I never saw a 56 in green before. It took a little digging to find it. I wanted it to match my eyes. Cat's eyes. <laughs> the better to see you with. Do you want to drive it? Uh, do I? <laughs> Climb in, big mama. You can like my car. But only if it's second. After me. <laughs> it's a tough choice. But I like your moving parts better. Okay, where to? Straight to hell, lover. Or heaven. I started up that dream boat and she was heaven under my hands. Just as Laura would be later. What I didn't know was that her husband was watching us. And the living hell that was in store for me. It's hard to have much sympathy, if any, for our plastic man, George. He's an expert in taking without giving. But you may have a little sympathy soon as we watch a punishment which is infinitely more infernal than the crime. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. George Hartford drive that Mercedes that hugged the road, floating as though on rails and cornering to perfection, to watch his face and the fanaticism of the fattest suffusing it was to know our plastic man had an Achilles heel, one spot where he was vulnerable, his passion for classic cars. And in Laura, he had found an unlikely companion. It looks as if I lost you just when I found you. But, oh... I'm sorry, babe, but a car like this, uh, I mean, like, man, this is far out. I know. Why do you think I wanted it? it took four years of begging and, and other things to get it. Greatest feeling in the world, right? It was. Or at least a substitute till... Till there was us, huh? <laughs> if I'm really included in. Come again? Forget it. It's our karma. Too late to offer you a way out. Wait a minute. You, you lost me somewhere. So... I should probably never have found you. George, there could be danger. You want to turn back. I, I don't make all this. You mean your husband? Yes. Well, what is he? I mean, King Kong or the Godfather? Oh, no. Horace is quite small and very mild and very rich. I'm quite willing to admit the last is what attracted me to him. I didn't know then about... 
about the other. The other what? How deep his interest in psychical research was. Or how powerful some of the forces involved are. Hey, you know something, babe? You're talking kind of weird. Six years with Horace would make any woman a little offbeat. I've been rocking in a bad dream. You woke me up, love. Oh, look. There's a motel, George. Or whatever you call them in old Mexico. It's too much talking that gets everybody into trouble. Now you're talking, Laura. But making sense. It was still early in the afternoon, but something wakened me suddenly. For a moment, I didn't know where I was. Then as my eyes focused on the bright yellow ceilings of the Casa Romantica, I realized that the whimpers were coming from the girl by my side. Hey, Laura? Laura, hey. Hey, baby. What? Oh. Hey. Oh, George. Don't say anything. Just hold me. Hold me a moment. Uh, okay. Hey, hey, stay loose. Oh. We didn't blow up the Capitol or anything. I mean, we're not on the wanted list. He knows. Who? Horace. Knows what? About us. Hon, if you got a guilty conscience... No, no, this isn't conscience. It's beyond it. Let me go, George. Let me go. Uh, where are you going? I just have to get up to the window and get some air. Here, uh, why don't you wrap something around you? Uh, will that make me decent? All right. George? What? You're a very selfish man. I know this is just a casual affair for you that you drifted into. I suppose I shouldn't worry about you. But you asked for it. Let me say it once. I'm sorry. But it's way too late for either of us to back out. Now, let's get dressed and back to the club. I'll say one thing for you, Laura. You do come up with the surprises. But I must say, this is one bummer of a so long death. Oh, you and I haven't finished, George. We've only begun. That's part of the karma, too. I didn't like this whole gig. I was into something I, I couldn't grab. Kind of a nowhere for me, because I'm the one who usually decides where it's at. Driving to the bus stop, too, I... I had this crazy notion that maybe it was the Mercedes 56 I'd miss more than her. It was all mixed up. And coming home to my cabin late in the evening, just at dark, I got shook up some more. Have a nice bus ride, Mr. Hartford. What? Who the hell are you? What are you doing in my cabin? I'm sorry. I, I thought for me, in a sense, it was kind of a home away from home. How'd you get in here? I locked the door. How could you lock it against Laura's husband? Laura? Oh, oh uh, yeah. I, uh, I met her on the beach. Hi, Mr. Prentice. Interesting to meet you, Mr. Hartford. I guess Laura, uh, Mrs. Prentice mentioned my name. Mm-hmm. Can I get you a drink? No, thanks. Can I get you a cover-up for your embarrassment? What? I think we can dispense with unnecessary questions. I want you to leave my wife alone. Now, just a minute. I know what's happened between you and Laura, who happens to be my wife. You didn't know what you were getting into. I considered having you roughed up, but I'll let that go. Excuse me, I must leave now. I'll say goodbye for all of us. If you have a brain in your head, Mr. Hartford, you'll echo that sentiment. Just for curiosity's sake, with a slight flapping under my heart, I checked the following morning. The M56 was gone, and the desk clerk informed me so were the premises. I breathed easier, lived out my week without a pigeon worth making a pass at, and went back to my office in Los Angeles. It was nice to get back to plain living. Hey, you look great, George. You picked up a lot of sun, huh? 
That's about all that was going there, Matt. How about you? You set the wedding date? Yep. Three weeks from today. Can you make it? Hey, can you see me not? No. <laughs> How could you turn down another opportunity to be best man? Okay, work me over. I deserve it, I guess. George, uh, what's the matter? Uh, don't tell me the leopard is changing his spots. You meet someone on your little cruise casing Mexican talent? Uh, I met someone. Not Mexican. Just real offbeat. What do you think of parapsychology, Matt? Oh, brother. I mean, in more ways than one, I have enough trouble handling my own specialty in the vagaries of the human brain, psyche, condition, however you define it. Parapsychology. That's another breed of cat. Cat? Huh? Uh, nothing. You didn't answer. Well... I don't know how to answer. It's it's a gray area. The research is too new, too limited to prove anything or mean much. Why? Uh, just an idle question. Yeah, don't try to kid me, George. Nothing you ask is idle. Okay. I met a dame who was hung up on this scene, and I just wondered how much there might be to it. Well, you want my opinion? It's not too much. Now, that's in general. But specifically for you, if you're asking my advice... Give her a wide berth. Your life is mixed up enough as it is without voluntarily trying to complicate it any further. Okay? Right on. Because no matter how much I object to your personal life, <laughs> you're my brother. Means a hell of a lot to me to know you'll be standing next to me when I get married. <laughs> I'd have to be dead or nowhere before I missed that. The day after I had lunch with my brother Matt, she rolled into my dealer's lot. I should say they. The Mercedes 56. English green with that unforgettable license plate. And the equally unforgettable Laura behind the wheel. I had no escape. Our office building is all glass. As the lesser of two evils, I went out to meet her myself. Yes, madam? What can I do for you? Oh, of all people. How could you ask? Are you crazy blowing in here? Doesn't your husband Ours know... Ours is on the other side of the world, in India. He's gone on retreat for a month. <laughs> Whatever that means. It means he's in transcendental meditation. You'd call it out of this world. It also means I am free. Look, Laura, I like to swing as much as the next man, but... Baby, I think we ought to drop it. That little guy scared me. And you... Yes... And me? You really got through. You got to me. I, I can't comb you out. So climb in. This time I'll be driving and I'll show you I can handle this baby just as well as you can. Uh, I, I can't just walk out of my business like that. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'll meet you in half an hour at, say, uh, Wilshire and Beverly, northwest corner. That's a date. Don't you miss it. It was a date, all right. A date with destiny. Though, how could I have known it then? I cleaned up my desk, turned the agency over to my head salesman, and drove out of the lot. I parked my heap short of Beverly and walked the rest of the way. She was waiting for me. I climbed in and we drove off to her house in Bel Air. him too. What are you talking about? Horace, my husband. He knows about us. You gotta be kidding. I, I mean, if he really is in India... Oh, he's there. It doesn't make any difference. Look, I don't dig any of this. It's, it's too wide out. All I know is I'm getting out right now. I never should have climbed back in. We're committed now. No way, baby. It's out of our hands. Horace doesn't want me back. How do you know? He's telling me right now. From India? I warned you you were getting into something beyond your understanding. Okay, so great. Now I'm on my way out. You can't. This just isn't a silly girl who's trying to hang on. I told you the moment I laid eyes on you. I knew you were my karma. Hey, what's this karma, Jive? My fate. 
And yours. You can try. But you'll never escape me. <laughs> Don't kid yourself. I know when I've had enough. I'm blowing this scene, and this is goodbye. I lit out of there like my tail was on fire. Matt had warned me I'd get caught in a nutcracker one of these days. And this looked like one of them. And man, it was weird. When I read about the crash the next day, I felt like a real heel. But I heaved a sigh of relief just the same. I didn't have any feeling of guilt. Or did I? Why should I? If only I had known what she was thinking on that last ride, maybe... But how could I know? There's no going back. There's no going forward. Where do I go from here? You've lost me, Laura. And you can't have him. papers. Woman plunges to fiery death off Coldwater Canyon. Both car and driver completely destroyed by fire. Police determine by one remaining license plate that the victim must have been Mrs. Laura Prentice. I felt kind of sick, but relieved. That was the end of that. Only as we shall discover, that was not the end of either car or driver. The world is full of George Hartfords who get away with murder in a general sense. But odds have a way of evening up. And this time, George isn't going to get away with anything. I'll return shortly with Act Three. This story is a snowball, starting from microscopic beginnings, gathering momentum and mass as it rushes down the hill, the tension and terror building from nothing to a massive and inevitable crash, and, like the snowball, being fractionalized into nothing again. It was less than a week since Laura and the Mercedes 56 had been burned to cinders. I was crossing the canyon from my pad in Van Nuys, taking Matt over to meet his bride. What's the matter with you lately, George? Ah, don't worry about me. Let's concentrate on the big date, huh? How many days to the wedding, Matt? <laughs> a little over a week. Can't wait. But that makes me kind of sad, little brother. I wish you could meet a girl you could settle down with. I'm off dames for the moment. This girl, I... Hey! What kind of crazy... It's the Mercedes, and Laura at the wheel. Look out! What, what is the matter with you? You out of your mind? I, I had to go off the road. Matt, that crazy broad would have rammed into us head on. What are you talking about? The green Mercedes that came around the bend. Didn't you see it? Or her? The, round what bend? I'm Coming the other way, headed towards us. George, we haven't passed any cars coming or going in the last few minutes. We just about rammed one going the opposite way less than a minute ago. The, the green Mercedes? Yeah, a 56, a classic. Didn't you see it? No, I didn't because it wasn't there. I tell you, plain as day, it was broad daylight. I saw it and her. I tell you. A green Mercedes with a girl named Laura at the wheel. Yes. Now, the same girl. And the same car you say you read about in the paper a few days ago, who went up in flames. Uh, that must have been some coincidence, some mistake. I don't know. Well, we're going to check it out, George. Now, you said the police found a license plate. Yes, but they didn't give the numbers in the paper. Yeah, but if it should be 6999, 
You'd have to agree with me there wasn't any car today that you had to avoid, right? But I saw it. What you saw could have been a hallucination. Now, we, we better pin it down right now. I could have told Matt what he'd find out. I knew it even before he checked with the police. I knew the plate number would be 6999. And I knew something else. It didn't matter what he found out. I hadn't seen the last of the green Mercedes 56 or the girl who drove it, dead or alive. I took a fast powder and went out to get loaded. The name's Ginny. Ginny Blank. Oh, uh, George here. George Hartford. So, now we're bosom buddies. Buy me a drink? Sure. What's your poison? You'll laugh. <laughs> I could use one. A horse's neck. Plain soda, anything soft. Funny, huh? No, except... Why would you... Well, what are you wasting your time on a guy like me for? Oh, I don't know. I come here sometimes, and... Either I'm too shy to say hello to anyone, or I don't like the guys who try to turn me on. I'm lonely. That's why I come. You really want that drink? No. I'm up to here already. So am I. How'd you like to drive me home, Ginny? And then I'll give you car fare back to your pair. Oh, when do I leave for my place? Right after you drop me at my door. I'm not looking to make out tonight. That's a new line. Could be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Come on. I'll take a chance. You don't seem all that loaded to me. I'm not. I've got other problems. You got a habit? No, nothing like that. I got a bigger monkey on my back. You're kind of screwed up, George, and I'm sorry for you. I, I'd honestly like to help, if I could. Well, I don't think anyone can. I guess I went out and bought my own private set of... <gasps> Look out! What is it? Can't you see it? The Mercedes hit it straight for us. <laughs> no, you've got to get out of the way. Didn't you see the car? It... It, it went right through us. As if we weren't there. What car? There wasn't any car. Boy, are you on some trip. Boy, George, I had it with you. There's a bus stop here. I can find my own way home. You don't need company. What you need is a head doctor. I don't know how long I lay parked there. I'd close my eyes. Maybe I went to sleep. But all of a sudden, I realized that the Mercedes had driven up alongside of me. And Laura was leaning towards me to talk. Come on, George. I've been looking for you. Let's go. No. I, I can't. I'm not ready. Sooner or later. Why not now? I'm waiting for you. How long do I have to wait? My car was still running. I threw her into first and cut out sharp in the traffic. The hood of my car, bumper all the way to the windshield, cut through the Mercedes like it was drawn in midair. Or just wasn't there at all. I don't remember how I got home or to bed. I only know that with the help of five or six black coffees, I found myself able to face my brother Matt the next morning. So you proved it to yourself? The car, the, the woman, was a hallucination. No. She was there. I heard her speak twice now. George, I checked out the license plate with a friend at police headquarters. There's no doubt that she crashed in that car. Then why do I keep seeing her and hearing her? It's a fixation, guilt reflex. So get rid of it for me. Well, that's your job, isn't no, it? No, sir, that's your job, if you can. I can't. Well, possibly, certainly not alone. You gotta have help, George. That's what I'm asking you for. Oh, no, not me. My own brother? Am I that much of a heel no, to you? That is not the point. I just started my residency in psychiatry. You're way beyond me, George. Well, then give me a man to go to. Some doctor who can handle me. She was always there. Trailing me in the M56. 
not 15 feet behind me. But that wasn't the worst part. Through the car, I could see the line of traffic stretching behind her, with sometimes a car coming up behind and cutting right through the spectral green vehicle that wasn't there for anyone but me. I made up my mind to have it out and headed for the house in Bel Air. Come in, Mr. Hartford. I've been expecting you. Thank you. There's no need to thank me. Oh, well, anyway. Thank heaven you're here. I thought you might still be in India. Oh, no. I came back for my wife's death. What? For? I landed from the plane at the moment she went over the cliff. You see, I knew she was going. But, but... But how could you? I sent her to her death. You know, she... She's following me. I, I can't get rid of her. Or the car. I know. And you came to ask me for help. Oh, yes. I... Please. Please help me. You must help yourself, George. You didn't hesitate to in the beginning when it was something that didn't belong to you. Why hold back now? What do you mean? You'll never be rid of her as long as you live. Why don't you join her, George? You see? There she is. She's waiting for you. Join her! I was outside the house. The door shut in my face. And parked in the driveway facing me was the green Mercedes. I went a little berserk, hurling myself into my own car, ramming her into first and driving in a scattering of gravel and dust straight through that infernal vision. I smashed into sunset, turning left in a screech of tires, heading for Coldwater Canyon and back to the valley. But all the time, my nemesis followed me, riding up my back, tailgating me. Then, at the top of the hill, suddenly riding on air, right out over the valley, the Mercedes drew abreast of me. Why don't you join me, lover? I'm away. Matt, your poor brother. I'm so sorry for so many things, Fran. For what he was, for what he made of himself, for the help I couldn't give him. <laughs> but most of all, for calling him a plastic man. What do you mean, darling? Turns out he wasn't. There was a chink in his armor, whether he knew it or not. His conscience. You mean? For that woman's suicide? The one with the Mercedes? Yes. They hadn't even had time to repair the guardrail. He went right through the same gap she did. <laughs> well, no sense agonizing about it. What's done is done. At least she won't be haunting him anymore. <laughs> I wonder, there's quite a legend grown up about that stretch of road. On misty nights or dark ones with the moon seen fitfully through clouds, a lot of people swear they pass a Mercedes colored English green. Some say the woman was driving, some say the man. But then, that would be easy to confuse, since by now the paint is peeling, the clothing is half rotted away, and the figures themselves are little more than skin and bone. The hands that grasp the wheel, those of a skeleton. I'll be back shortly. One further note. Shortly after Fran and Matt were married, 
A large sum of money was given to them by an anonymous source. And at the same time, Horace stripped himself of all his possessions and gave the bulk of his fortune to the School for Psychic Research, where he had taught so long. He left for India and was never heard of again. One story has it that he sits in meditation somewhere high in the Himalayas, treated by the nearby villagers as a holy man. Perhaps so. But is it meditation or expiation? We'll never know. Our cast included Don Scardino, Joan Loring, Russell Horton, and Catherine Byers. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Lieutenant Kaufman, I was sent in here to see you. Uh, how can I help? A man named Tom Beckwith was murdered last night. Ah, uh, that's right. Do you have any information that would... Yes, uh, I, uh... I'm responsible for his death. Uh, uh, what are you saying, Mr. Uh, Wilson? Uh, Roger Wilson. I caused his death. Are you confessing to the crime? I suppose that's the only way to put it. I... I wished him dead. You wished him dead? Yes, Lieutenant. I wished him dead. I wished it with all my strength. He was killed by two shots from a thirty-eight caliber pistol. Now, did you fire them? That's immaterial. Uh, Mr. Wilson, you don't look well at all. Now, I'll have an officer see you to your home. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Do little girls still dream of growing up and becoming queens? Probably not. Queens are no longer glamorous. And yet, there is a country in this world where a queen still holds power. Where she rules, as well as reigns, an absolute monarch who holds her throne by divine right. A queen whose smile may mean life and whose frown can mean death. I'm afraid I must insist, Miss Dennison. I'll be forced to kill you. You can't kill me. How can you say that? Because you don't exist. Miss Dennison, I do exist. No, you don't. Because this is a dream. You are not dreaming. This knife is real. If you insist on dying, it's your fault. <gasps> oh, you... You stop. Oh, why, why don't I wake up? Why, why don't I wake up? Why? Our mystery drama, The Queen of Darkness, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars... Julie Harris. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One.
statistics say that many of them have problems making a living. The record shows that even the successful ones burn out quickly. And yet, we have no shortage of actors and actresses. By acting, we mean that mysterious magical force which creates in an audience the almost religious conviction that the performer on stage is the embodiment of a living truth. Josephine Dennison is such an actress. Some say she was born with the gift. Others claim it was refined and purified by long years of tedious application. Does it matter? Josephine Dennison only knows this. She is 38 years old and she is out of work. Well, she's been out of work before, but never has she been so absolutely, completely, and totally out of work as she is right now. Joe, you've had it. Don't say that. I have to say that. You're washed up, through, finished. How, how, how could this happen to me? It's, it's ridiculous. I'm a good actress. You're a great actress. I don't know why it happened. It's just, Joe, you know the only call I had for you in the last week? Somebody wanted me? Some clown, some character wanted you to be the queen in some pageant. And, and you turned it down. Joe, you played Joan of Arc. You've done Shakespeare. What are you supposed to do now? Go back to cheesecake like some winner in a beauty contest? If that's all there is. If you need money to pay the rent, I'm always... I don't need money. I need a job. Jimmy, what kind of queen was I supposed to be, and, and who wanted me? Ah, some phony. You could tell by looking at him. A smooth talker. I think he was some kind of foreigner. But what was it about? We'll never know. I threw him out of the office. Jimmy, I'll do anything. You know how it is. Yeah, I know how it is. But you don't. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I just don't know what's the matter. I can't figure people out. I don't know why these things happen. Well, don't feel so bad, Jimmy. Sooner or later, the longest streak of luck, good or bad, has to change. Quit dreaming, Joe. Don't tell me to stop dreaming, Jimmy. What else is left? What? Why are my lights on? Good evening, Miss Dennison. Who... Who are you? How did you get into my apartment? What do you want? You have just asked me a complex question. It consists of three parts. Just tell me. Of course. I will tell you everything in good time. What do you mean in good time? Uh, my dear Miss Dennison, I am a native of a civilized country... One does not boorishly blurt out one's business upon initial confrontation. <laughs> Americans seem to have so little time for the ceremonies, the niceties. I am here to offer you a job. You'll have to speak to my agent. I have spoken to your agent. The man is an idiot. Are you a theatrical producer? No. What are you? I am a grand duke. A what? I am the Grand Duke Arsan of Dalran. Dalran? Well, surely you have heard of my country. Oh, I think so. Uh, what, what do you want with me? First, we shall have dinner. You must be my guest. I, I don't feel like going anywhere. We shall dine here. I don't want to sound inhospitable, but uh, I have nothing in the house. Wait a minute... Yes. Sniff again. That heavenly aroma is coming from your own kitchen. But how? My servants are preparing a feast fit for a queen. Raina, Loro, wheel in the table at once. I, I don't... I, I can't believe it. None of this can be happening. Trust the evidence of your senses, my dear. But what is the meaning? The wine will grow warm and the food become cold later. Right now, we must perform a ritual, Miss Dennison. We shall celebrate dinner. May I fill your glass? No, no, thank you. I, 
I've had enough of everything. <laughs> I hope you have enjoyed your dinner. I've read of feasts like this, but I never thought... Would you care to dine this way every night? No, I don't think I could stand it. You could learn? Your Highness, or Your Excellency, is it? No, our son is good enough. Is it permissible to talk about business now? Entirely appropriate. Uh, you are wondering why I am here. Let's say I'm at least mildly curious. Mm. You know very little about my country. Well, that's true. But my country knows a great deal about you. Do you know you are the most popular actress in Dalran? Oh, you're joking. Uh -huh. I haven't been in a movie in almost four years. How about your television series? Was... Well, why must we talk about uh, dead things? Everything in which you ever appeared lives, flourishes in Dalran. <laughs> Do you know what all this is? It's a dream. No, Miss Dennison. Yes, it's a dream. Miss Dennison, a dream. I assure you, I am real. Oh, please. Now, be good enough to hear me out. Besides, this is my dream, and I should like to do some of the talking. But why do you insist you are dreaming? <laughs> because I need this dream. I must have this fantasy. You see, I have reached what can only be considered the nadir of my existence. Nonsense. Oh, you're very kind, but the handwriting is on the wall. We simply disappear. Some of us drop by the wayside as soldiers fall in battle, victims of random misfortune. And now, it seems, a whole new generation of producers has come along, and they never heard of me. I insist that you listen to me. You are practically worshipped in Dalran. <laughs> of course. Yeah, see... What I have in this folder. Newspaper clippings. Magazine articles. Ah, you cannot read the Ranis, but you can make out your name and you can certainly recognize your pictures. Certainly. Uh huh. What do you say now? I say it's significant. Let me tell you about the job I wish to offer you. No. <laughs> Not now. Right now, I'm tired. I'm even too tired to dream anymore. Very well, then. I shall call on you tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. You do that. Call on me tomorrow. <laughs> Joe. Huh? Joe, wake up. Huh? It's noontime. Oh, oh. Oh, Sally, you've got to get up. You should be making the rounds. Or you should be out there roiling the water. What are you doing here, Sally? Oh, uh, the show folded. Well, why don't you go to your own place? My marriage folded, too. Mm. He gets custody of the apartment. Do you uh, mind if I move in with you for a while? Oh, let me go back to sleep. I was having such a fantastic dream. <laughs> Hey, what kind of party did you have here last night? Party? Yeah, the kitchen. It's loaded with champagne. Champagne? And in the refrigerator. Caviar and steak. What are you talking about? And there's an enormous basket of fresh fruit. And Sally. Sally. What's the matter? I'm dreaming. I'm still dreaming. Oh, how can you be dreaming? You're wide awake. No, I am dreaming. And you're part of it. <laughs> now, let me get out of bed. I'll prove it. Come with me. Prove what? Prove this is a dream. Sure. Here they are. They're still here. Look at these papers, these, these magazines. Mm. Hey, what language is that? A phony language from a phony country that I'm dreaming about. Dalran. <gasps> Did you ever hear of Dalran? <sighs> well, I, I can't read this, but well, I see your pictures. Oh, you must be the hottest property in that country. Ah, here you thought you were all washed up. I told you, you must never quit on yourself. I know, that's why I'm dreaming. Answer it. Oh, it has to be for you. Well, go ahead, if it keeps ringing, it'll wake me up, and this right. dream is too beautiful to lose right now. Hello? Is Miss Dennison at home? 
Is that the Grand Duke Arsan? Who's calling, please? The Grand Duke Arsan. Joe, how did you know? It's my dream. I know everything. I'll speak with him. But, Joe, you're not... Hello? Miss Denison, uh, would it be convenient to come by and discuss an important matter of business, say, in about an hour? Uh, let me consult my calendar. Ah, uh, yes. It so happens I shall be free. In an hour, then. Oh, one moment, sir. I assume you wish to discuss an acting assignment. Of course. You should be apprised of the fact that my minimum fee is $25,000 in advance. Of course. In exactly one hour, then, I shall grant you an interview. Joe, what were you saying? <laughs> Does it matter? Oh, what do I have to lose? It's only a dream. I... I think you ought to see a doctor. And so, we should like you to come to Dalran to be the star of our millennia. Your what? Your country has merely approached its bicentennial. Mine is celebrating the 1,000th year of our holy monarchy. I see. The greatest moment of our history occurred when our first queen was crowned a thousand years ago. Her immortal speech is memorized by every schoolchild. Someone had the idea to have an actress portray our legendary empress. And at first, everyone shouted blasphemy. But then I said... Let us invite Josephine Dennison, who is idolized by our population. How can I deliver this speech? I can't speak your language. Oh, you are an actress with a marvelous ear. You could recite it perfectly. On Saturday, you will appear before the country in our national network, in ceremonial robes, as Queen Amara. That's the day after tomorrow, Joe. Coronation Day. Let us discuss my fee. A certified check for $25,000 has already been deposited in your bank. The royal plane leaves at 7 this evening. You will be picked up here at 5. Good day. Well, what do you say now? Still think you're dreaming? Oh, come on. The Grand Duke of San, the Kingdom of Dalran, the Warrior Queen. Oh, it's a crazy fantasy. Dream mixture of a thousand plays I've been in. Or read. Well, is it a dream or isn't it? Whatever it is, Josephine Dennison is in the grip of it. I'll be back with both dreams and realities in just a few moments. Every actress yearns for a dream part. But Josephine Dennison is convinced she is playing a part in a dream. But for an actress, the only reality is the theater. And so, awake or asleep, she is determined to prepare for the part of the Queen of Dalran. How does an absolute monarch hold her head, her shoulders? What is a regal smile, a royal frown, an imperial gesture? Joe, don't you want to think about this? Think about what? Well, it's, it's now just ten minutes before noon. A man offers you a job. He's not just a man. He's a grand duke. In five hours, you'll be out of the country. Well, what's the problem? Well, shouldn't you check this out a bit more carefully? It, 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 it's all happening too quickly. Suppose there's some danger involved here. Sally, nothing can happen to me. Why do you say that? Because this is only a dream. Look, look, Joe, call your bank. A ask if the money was deposited. Of course it was. Well, call them. Do me the favor. Certainly. Is there anything else you want me to do? Oh, please. Take this thing seriously. Yes? Oh, Mr. Howland, please. And also call Jimmy Higgins. Uh, uh, this is Miss Dennison. Has a deposit been made to my account today? 
I know Jimmy hasn't done much for you lately. Now, that's the understatement of the year. How much? A certified check for $25,000. Thank you. Oh! You should have heard the tone of absolute deference in that little flunky's voice. He made me feel like a queen. <laughs> Just a minute. Yes? Are you Miss Josephine Dennison? Oh, well, that's hardly a flattering question to ask an actress. I'm not in the flattery business. Well, whatever business you're in, I'm afraid I don't have time to talk to you. I'm about to leave the country. I'm in the intelligence business with your government. I beg your pardon? My name is Harold Foster. My credentials. Oh. Well, I'm impressed. May I come in? Well, I'll have to pack while we talk. Well, sit down anywhere. Thank you. Miss Dennison, why are you going to Dalran? Why is that your affair? Your government is interested. Why? You're the first American private citizen who has been permitted to enter that country in 50 years. Really? Dalran is an absolute monarchy. The queen rules by divine right. She holds the power of life and death. Sounds medieval. It is. Why are you going there? I've been invited to appear in their millennial celebration to play the part of their legendary queen. I find that difficult to believe. Do you? Why? How would they ever have heard of you? Mr. Foster, I admit I haven't been working lately, but I am a rather well-known actress. The most famous actress in the world would still be unknown to the natives of Dauran. And why do you say that, Mr. Forster? Because the monarchy does not allow the import of any foreign films or books or publications of any sort. How do you know? Miss Dennison, it's a fact. The monarchy is afraid the pure and innocent and orthodox minds of the Dauranese will be subverted by dangerous democratic ideas. But I have been informed that I am the favorite actress of the Dalranese. My films, my TV... Impossible. No American film has ever been permitted to be shown there. Suppose I were to tell you that the movie fan magazines in Dalran are constantly filled with articles about me. It would be my sad duty to inform you that you're mistaken. Why? Because it's impossible. There are no movie fan magazines in Dalran. There aren't? Definitely not. We've been assured by our experts on Dalranese affairs that such trivial publications are banned in the interests of the state. It's comforting to know that we have such knowledgeable experts. Would you care to look at these? Well, what a... Well, obviously, these are Dalranese magazines. Obviously, they are about the movies. Obviously, those are my pictures. But this is... Yes? <sighs> may... May I take these back to the office? Oh, certainly. Miss Dennison, could you postpone your trip? There's something about this entire setup. I don't like it. I say this... For your own safety. What could happen to me? Miss Dennison, I wish you would listen. I have a commitment to appear before the cameras the day after tomorrow. I'm asking you to wait. And I'm asking you to tell me why. Well, all I have to go on is my instinct as an intelligence officer. Is your instinct worth $25,000? <sighs> I know it's a lot of money, but... And even if they weren't paying me a nickel, I'd go no matter what. I'm afraid I don't understand. Why? It's very simple. The show must go on. Well, how do I look? Magnificent. You are the queen, the warrior queen. Why did you want me in costume? It is not a costume, my dear. This is how every queen of Dalran has dressed since Amara the First. When we land at the airport, we shall be greeted by a god of honor, a band, a crowd. You have no idea how popular you are in my country. But a god of honor? Everyone knows you shall be portraying our ancient and holy queen, Amara. Couldn't I just go quietly to my hotel and study my lines? Let me hear you speak them again. Ide me, ide tu, ide me, ishedu. Ah, spoken like a native. 
What does it mean? Our first queen, our immortal Amara, stood triumphantly on the battlefield and said, In God's name, I conquer. In God's name, I rule. Ah, home was never like this, was it? Why? Why are they so fond of me? Oh, no, it, it can't be the crowd. People are bowing, kneeling. Why? The Lenya has begun. You are the ancient queen. I never saw anything so good as possible. You have never lived in a monarchy. Oh, but you must be tired. I shall radio the escort to move quickly. Where am I staying? As a royal guest, you must stay at the palace. Oh, it's the most magnificent room I've ever seen. I'm sure you must be very tired. I am. (laughs) Strange. You can get tired of dreaming. I hope I don't wake up before my great speech. Everything you will need is here... And this is Tecla. She does not speak a word of English, but you will find her a splendid maid. Why, she's... Oh, she's beautiful with her looks and... Well, she should... She could go far. In Dalran, one follows the fortunes of one's family. For a thousand years, the women in her family were servants. But that... That's... That's an excellent arrangement. People know their place. They know who they are, what they are, what's required of them. Thus, we have no problems of identity, no feelings of insecurity. I think that's ridiculous. Obviously, we differ. Till tomorrow. Good night. Uh, Well, um, Tekla, Uh, is that your name? Tekla? Well, I I don't think I'll need anything, so you're free to go. Oh, I I forget you don't speak English. I speak English. Oh, oh well, then. Mm. that's great. I need, I want culture. In my mother's time, culture people speak French. Before then, culture people speak German. Today, culture people speak English. Even you, even Queen, you do not speak the run. You speak English. Did you say I was the Queen? I work hard to get job in palace. So one day, I can kill you. What are you saying? For one thousand years, you and nobility have oppressed common people. Now, you pay. But I'm not, uh, look, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm a movie actress. What? Is movie actress. I am Josephine Dennison. I'm I'm Dalran's favorite actress. You are Queen Amara. Oh, hey. I will kill you. Hey, put down that knife. In name of the people. All right, I might just as well get out of the stream right now. I kill you. In name of freedom. Oh, oh, why, oh, why don't I? Wake up. Oh, why don't I wake up? Why doesn't she wake up? There can be only one reason. Perhaps she wasn't asleep in the first place. One thing should be obvious. It's a hazardous business to impersonate a queen in a country like Dalran, where evidently they take these things quite seriously. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. There are 
are people who find excitement in dreams. The dream world can be filled with the most dangerous hazards, and these can be faced boldly, resolutely, without hesitation. Because, after all, what can happen? At the point where one falls into the sea among the ravenous sharks, or the split second before the bullet enters the brain, or the knife pierces the heart, one wakes up and is saved. Josephine Dennison has been counting on being rescued by reality, but she has already taken the point of the knife, and there is blood and pain. And either she isn't waking up, or she's been wide awake all the time. No! I... I... Oh... No. I cannot. I see blood. I cannot. I cannot murder. Oh, get me a a handkerchief, sir. sir. Oh, some cold water. Take the knife. Kill me. Kill me. I deserve to die. Now, nobody's going to die. Oh, what am I doing here? Why don't I wake up? For years, I have planned to kill the queen, to free the people. I'm not dreaming. But when I see blood, I have no courage. Oh, kill me. Kill me. You might just... Oh, shut up, will you? I have raised my hand to my ruler. I must die. Now, that's enough. I'm not the queen. You know me. I'm Josephine Dennison. Josephine? Dennison? Yes, your favorite actress. The biggest hit in all Dalran. I have never heard. I have come here to read the speech of Queen Amara in the millennial celebration. Oh, yes. Queen Amara... You are Queen Amara. No, I'm not the queen. I'm an actress dressed as the queen. What? It is death for any to dress as the queen. I'm going to read the queen's speech. The speech Queen Amara the first made a thousand years ago. Speech? Yes, the speech. The speech that begins, Ide me, Ide tu. No. Ide me, Ide tu. No. No. Please. What's the matter? I try to kill you be- before I know you. But you are good, kind. Oh, do not, do not leave us. Do not, do not. Oh, what, what is English word in, in Dalran mean? Step down from throne. Abdicate. Do not abdicate. You are good queen. But I'm not saying anything like that. It means, in God's name I conquer, in God's name I rule. No. It means, ide me, ide tu, ide me, ishe do. It means, in God's eyes, I am unworthy. In God's name, I Abdicate. Well, that's... That's impossible. Oh, why do I say it's impossible, Tetla? Listen. Listen to the rest of the speech. And tell me what it means. Yeah. That's the guy. That's the one I threw out of my office. It's Jessup. Is he the man? The one who made Miss Dennison the offer? Well, there's no doubt at all in my mind. Oh, what kind of a con artist are we dealing with here, Mr. Forster? He's not a con artist. He's actually the Grand Duke Arsan of Dalran. You mean there is such a guy? There is such a place? Oh, yes. Well, if everything's on the level, why are we worried? Especially the government. In the first place, there is no such thing in Dalran as a millennial celebration. Well, then why would the guy There are no movie fan magazines published there either. I saw them. And you've got them on your desk. These are fakes. They were printed over here. But if this guy's legit, what's with the phony story? I have a picture here. Recognize it? Yeah, sure, it's Joe. Miss Jessup? Well, she never wore her hair like that, but it's Joe. No, it's Queen Amara of Dalran. 
The queen? But she looked... She's the image of Joe. Yeah. For a reason we're unaware of, they want somebody in that country to impersonate the queen. What's going to happen to Joe? Hopefully nothing. What do you mean, hopefully? Well, it's a very violent country. Tomorrow she'll be on the national network. At least we know she'll be okay till then. Now, look, you just can't sit around here and do nothing. I'm not going to be sitting around here. I'm leaving for Dalran. <laughs> I don't believe it. I can't believe it. In this speech, you say, I am too weak, too ill, too unworthy. I abdicate my throne in favor of Eola Arti. Eola Arti? That's someone's name? Yes. That is sister of... Grand Duke Arsan. Oh, let me get this whole business straight. The Grand Duke wants to get his sister made the queen. So he creates a story to get me here to pose as the present queen and abdicate in her favor. Do you understand what I'm telling you? No. How does he know your people will accept his sister as the queen? Ah, the old queen appoints. New queen. What do you mean? When old queen wish to rule no more, she appoint new queen. Where is the queen? The queen. The queen is here. You are queen. No, no, I'm talking about the queen. Now, where is the real queen? <laughs> Queen? Uh, well, uh, you see, the queen is not well. Oh? In the ordinary way, she would read the traditional speech, but uh, since she is indisposed, you are, as you would say in your country, pinch hitting. Oh. Then I suppose we could say that... Uh... I'm not here as an actress playing a part. I'm actually posing as the queen. Precisely. That isn't quite the way this job was sold to me. Ah, well... And my opening lines do not really mean in God's name I conquer, in God's name I rule. No? What do they mean? In God's name I am unworthy. In God's name I abdicate. Whatever gave you such an idea? And I abdicate in favor of Iola R.D., who happens to be your sister. So, what has become of the queen? Queen Amara is dead. Really? How did it happen? Well, let us say her time had come. Ah, and who knows about it in addition to you and me? A small, select group, no doubt. <laughs> you are a brilliant woman, Miss Denison. And afterward, what was supposed to become of me? In time, you would be released quietly and you could return home. That's an unfortunate word, released. It implies that I would be a prisoner. Well, you are a prisoner. You will be in a form of custody... Restricted to an estate in a remote province. Uh, you would live comfortably, even luxuriously. Well, I'm not interested in the part as it has been rewritten. And I shall not appear. May I have a lift to the airport? I'm afraid not. You can't force me to read that speech. Would you rather be shot? Oh, I see. The sophistication is only a veneer. You're basically a barbarian. You have, as I said, two choices. Read the speech or die. You think you can get away with killing me? Duke Arsan. Who? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. I shall speak with him immediately. Show him into the audience chamber. <laughs> How 
may I serve you, Mr. Uh, Foster? Your Highness, I wish to speak with Josephine Dennison. Uh, Miss Dennison? Yes. She is here to portray your queen. Ah, uh, Mr. Foster, if you knew anything at all about our customs, you would know it is sacrilege for an actress... We know, to... sir, that you engaged her in New York City for precisely this purpose. Who dares accuse me of this utterly false and criminal... I... I resent this baseless accusation, this slur upon my personal integrity. Your Highness, I have never heard of Miss Josephine Dennison. I have never met Miss Josephine Dennison. I can tell you nothing of Miss Josephine Dennison. And that, sir, must end the matter. <laughs> Miss Dennison, obviously there shall be no international incident. How do I know that I won't be quietly disposed of after I abdicate? Now, what motive would I have for killing you? How do I know I won't be shot or killed afterward? Refuse to deliver the speech and you will be killed immediately. This way, at least you can enjoy the suspense. <laughs> Your Majesty, do not leave. Look, Tekla, how many times do I have to tell you I'm not the queen? You are the queen. Why do you think I'm the queen? Because God says you are queen. And I see now, you are good queen. Tell me, if you were queen... I? Queen? Suppose God says Tekla shall be queen. What would you do? What? Would I do? You wanted to kill me because I was bad. What would a good queen do? A good queen would help the people. The poor people. Peasant people. A good queen would not be queen of darkness. A queen of darkness? All queens are queen of darkness. I see. What are you going to do? My dear, I shall wait. I shall wait for God to tell me. Peers of the land, nobles, gentry, soldiers, and people, silence for the Queen of Darkness. Speak, speak. People of Dalran, I choose to speak in English. Oh, what are you? I am queen. A divine voice speaks within me. Oh, she, she's not the queen. Arrest him. Uh, uh, Listen to me, people. She is... Silence him. Uh, 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 Listen. Uh, uh, remove him. Uh, uh, people. I have been commanded by the divine voice to abdicate the throne. It is to be my fate to leave this lovely country. I have been commanded to appoint a new queen. From now on, the queen shall no longer be a queen of darkness. She shall be known as the queen of light. The divine voice within me commands that the first queen of light shall be Tekla. Your majesty. I kneel before the new queen. Let the multitude kneel also. What, your majesty? You wanted to help your people. Now let's see you do it. How will you turn out? A queen of light or a queen of darkness? But I... Hail the queen! <laughs> Can I ever thank you? What can I do for you? Put me on the first plane headed for America. You remember, of course, the queen who abdicated some time ago and came here. She pursued a rather successful career as an actress. She reminded so many people of an actress. Uh, Josephine Dennis, uh, Denson, uh, something like that. 
You know how it is in showbiz. People come and go. Like skyrockets, they flare up in momentary brilliance and then fall silently into the unknown darkness. I, however, shall return with some light in just a few moments. How are things in Dalran? What kind of queen did Tekla turn out to be? I'm sorry. We only give you one story at a time. It is certainly the classic situation. The idealistic young reformer who wishes to change the system suddenly acquires unlimited power. Who changes? What changes? The system or the reformer? Well, we don't have definite answers to these philosophical questions, but you must admit, we certainly kick them around. Our cast included Julie Harris, Robert Dryden, Evie Juster, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. But who could that be? I'm afraid I know. Jerry Ferris tried to reach you half hour ago. He left word to call him. Honey, why didn't you tell I me? I did want you at least to have your dinner. Oh, well. Hello? Bill, saddle and ride. No, not me, friend, Jerry. I'm starting my 48 hours off. We got us a homicide. The address is 718 Hayes. You don't need more than 15 minutes to get here. Ferris? Uh, yeah, I better run. Can't you just finish? No, dear. I don't even know what kind of homicide we're up against. I better get right over there. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it isn't as if you didn't warn me before we were married. 718 Hayes. 718 Hayes. What, Bill? It's the address where I'm supposed to meet Jerry. That's northeast, isn't it? Yeah. Now, why should that address sound familiar? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. And Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Bang, bang, you're dead, shouts a little child. And his playmate clutches at his heart and collapses to the ground. Now, when children play this game, are they innocently imitating their elders? Or are they expressing some deep-seated biological urge? Are professional killers basically children who have never outgrown the game? Is the taste for murder ingrained or acquired? Questions like these should never be answered quickly. Lieutenant Kaufman? I was sent in here to see you. Uh, how can I help? A man named Tom Beckwith was murdered last night. Ah, uh, that's right. Do you have any information that would... Yes, uh... I, uh... I'm responsible for his death. Uh, uh, what are you saying, Mr., uh... Wilson. Uh... Roger Wilson. I caused his death. Are you confessing to the crime? I suppose that's the only way to put it. How did you murder Tom Beckwith? I... I wished him dead. You wished him dead? Yes, Lieutenant. I wished him dead. I wished it with all my strength. <laughs> <laughs>
He was killed by two shots from a thirty-eight caliber pistol. Now, did you fire them? That's immaterial. Uh, Mr. Wilson, you don't look well at all. I'll, I'll have an officer see you to your home. I see. Well, let the record show that I did my duty as a citizen. mystery drama, The Transformer, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. strange and mysterious transformations. Life changes from one shape, one form, yes, one existence, to another. What were we before? Were you always the same? Have you always harbored the same hopes, ideas, ambitions? Suppose the person you were ten years ago should meet the person you are today. Would it be a happy meeting? Let us meet Roger Wilson. Roger Wilson, 42 years of age, just beginning to lose hair and gain weight. Roger Wilson, who has already accepted the fact that while he will not set the world on fire, he will at least bask in a cheery, comfortable glow. Roger? You were expecting... I was expecting a knight in shining armor. Again? I thought I showed up 15 years ago. Why didn't you call from the airport in Chicago and tell me which flight you'd be on so I'd know what to do about dinner? The only thing I have to do about dinner tonight is eat it. Get your coat. Which one? The mink. Oh, which client are we supposed to impress tonight? Tonight? (laughs) Tonight is all fun. We're never supposed to have fun at dinner. We're supposed to be in there selling away. Oh, come on. It's not that bad. Oh, the nonsense I've had to hold still for these past 15 years. Well, Dolly, if you sold your soul, at least it wasn't for a mess of pottage. It's been first class all the way. Whose ego do I have to flatter tonight? Tonight, you're going to meet the greatest guy in all the world. All right, I'll laugh at his jokes. After all, he's a client. He's not a client. He's not. (laughs) You'll be crazy about Chappie. Chappie? Beryl Spencer Chapman. Beryl? Well, you know, some people's parents have absolutely no sense of the fitness of things. They named his sister Sam. Anyhow, everyone calls him Chappie. What good is Chappie able to do you, uh, business-wise? Dolly, I don't even know what business he's in. Roger. He told me he's in the transformer business, but we didn't go into it. We were just so happy to see each other. (laughs) It's going to be 25 years, a quarter of a century. Where did it go? Don't ask me. There we were, two kids in Korea. And suddenly, it's all these years later. (laughs) Uh, I guess that's life. And I guess this is going to be one of your nights for deep philosophical statements, hmm? (laughs) There I am in the passenger lounge at O'Hare Airport in Chicago. I'm looking at this guy, and he's looking at me. And suddenly I yell out, Chappie! Just the exact same split second he hollers, Roger! (laughs) How would you feel if you ran to somebody you knew 25 years ago? I can't think of anybody I knew 25 years ago that I'd care to see today. He hadn't changed a bit. Well, where is this legendary chappy? Where? If he was such a great buddy, why didn't you bring him home? He has this business meeting at 6.15. That's why he came here. If he has a meeting at a quarter after six, how can he have dinner with us? What are you talking about? A man comes all the way into New York for an evening meeting and it doesn't include dinner? Well, what's... Well, what's so radical about that? Well, you could never treat a client like that and get away with it. Well, maybe he's the client. Anyhow... He's going to meet us in Luigi's at 6.45. You mean he came all the way to New York for a meeting that will hardly last a half hour? He's a man of very few words. Oh, really? Well, that should be quite refreshing. You must be a very efficient businessman, Chappie. Why? 
Well, I'm simply amazed at how quickly you're able to conclude a business meeting. Are you? <laughs> when Roger gets involved in these things, they can go on for hours, even days. Do they? I can never get Dolly to understand. There's so much to talk about. How do you avoid all that talk, Chappie? Well, what's to talk about? You know the deal? You go in and close it. <laughs> what kind of business are you in? Transformer business. Oh, well, tell me all about it. It's kind of technical. Well, I was a science major at college. A transformer is an instrument used for changing voltage. You have a step-down transformer. You have step-up transformers. Oh, darling. I'm sure Chappie doesn't really want to talk shop. All right, you're absolutely right. When a couple of old war buddies get together, I'm sure they can't wait to swap stories. I'll sit here quiet as a mouse and just let you boys talk. Uh, <laughs> Dolly, when you see... Chappie and I were very close. Very close. And one of the reasons we got along so well was because we could just sit there in that foxhole for hours and just say nothing. How could you just sit there for hours and, and say nothing? Well, sometimes by saying nothing, you say everything. How about dessert? Uh, nothing for me. Cheesecake. <laughs> Good morning. We have bacon and eggs, toast. <laughs> Why do you always make breakfast? You know I only want coffee. I don't make it. I only say I do to maintain the franchise. Well, how'd you like Chappie? I like strong, silent men, but... Yeah, we would sit there in the mud and the snow day after day, night after night. We'd hardly speak a word. How did you communicate? Uh, extrasensory perception? We only had one aim, to keep alive. I would look out for him and he would look out for me. Well, I can't imagine you not saying a word for days on end. You haven't answered my question. Which question? How'd you like Chappie? Has he left town? No, he plans to stay for a week or two. As a matter of fact, we're having lunch. A quiet lunch, no doubt. Now for your morning news headline. Oh, must we? Gangster Chief Tony Arman was murdered last night. The victim, obviously, of a gangland execution. The medical examiner places the time of death at about 6.30 p.m. The killer fired two lethal shots and disappeared as if into thin air. No one in the neighborhood, 3rd Avenue and 67th Street, heard or saw anything suspicious. Your next headline report in 10 minutes. 3rd Avenue and 67th Street? Oh, we were just two blocks north of there at Luigi's. You still haven't told me what you think about Chappie. Oh. Um... Well, he doesn't seem to be your type. I mean, you appear to have nothing in common. Oh, when you're huddled in a foxhole, you have everything in common. Because after the war, you drift apart. But there's always that, that deep feeling of friendship. He has fascinating eyes. Yeah? When he first came into the restaurant, they had sort of a, a glow. And then they changed, and they seemed to grow... Softer. As soon as she spoke about that look in his eyes, I got a sudden chill down my spine. I knew that look. I remembered that look. That funny look that glowed in his eyes. Every time. Each time. Each time. Each time it would be crouching there, freezing peering desperately into the darkness. Raj. Yeah? You hear something? Yeah. Yeah, Chappie. Something's moving. Where? I don't know. Wait, I see him. Where? That clump of bushes at 10 o'clock. See? Yeah. Must be 500 yards. More like six. Uh, let me raise my sights. Chappie. Yeah? He's... He's headed home. Let him go. Let him go? He's just some goof-off. They got goof-offs on their side, too. He got lost. Let him go home. Watch this, Raj. Watch me squeeze it off. Got him. And the body that was crawling in the snow suddenly stiffened and became still. It would remain still forever. I looked at Chappie. He was breathing very slowly through his mouth. 
And there was that look. The look I can neither explain nor describe in his eyes. Roger, I'm glad you made it. <laughs> made what? It. Remember the it we used to talk about back there? Come home, marry a good-looking dame, get a good deal. Oh, well. Did you make it too, Chappie? Sure. Everything except the dame, but I'm still looking. Well, marriage. It has its good points, has its bad points. You know, I love Dolly, but <laughs> there are times when I could kill her. Yeah? Oh, I'm just kidding. I worried about you, Roger. Why? You saved my life. You saved mine, too. Well, that don't make it even. I worried you wouldn't make it when you got back home. Why? Because you're soft. But now I feel better. I see you're all set. You must have a great job. Well, I thought it was a great job five years ago. Something wrong with it now? Yeah. It's the end of the line. No? It's only one place I can go, and that's general sales manager. It sounds big. Oh, sure. But you see, Chappie, it won't happen. Why not? You've got the stuff. I've also got a problem. His name is Tom Beckwith. Tom Beckwith? Thomas Eldon Beckwith, Jr. Why is he a problem? Well, he's alive. Yeah. Well, you see, Chappie, he happens to be my age, and so I'm kind of stuck out on a siding with no way of getting switched out of the main line. I see. Well, I, I won't starve, exactly. How's the transformer business? Chappie? Hmm? Oh, uh, what time you got? That's about a quarter after. Uh, you know, I just remembered I got to see a guy. Let me have the check. Huh? No, no, I'll, no, come I'll on, come on, come no, on. It's my party. Breakfast is ready. Just coffee. What's on our schedule this evening? Well, Chappie wants to take us to dinner. Ah, another restful evening. He wants to celebrate. Celebrate? What? Well, he called me at the office late yesterday afternoon. He said he expected to make a killing. A killing in Transformers? Sounds fascinating. Now, you don't like Chappie. Admit it. I didn't at first, but he kind of grows on you. Time for another morning headline. Ah, good news, Harry himself. Electronics company executive Thomas Eldon Beckwith, Jr., was shot and killed late last night in the garden of his summer cottage at Fashionable Lake Surrey. Huh. State police theorize that Mr. Beckwith surprised a prowler. So far, there are no leads or clues. Anyone with any information at all that could be useful is asked to call a special number, 227-8308. We shall have another headline report in 10 minutes. <laughs> doubt he will, but it's hard to imagine another headline of any kind that would equal this one in impact on Roger Wilson. Well, what do we have here? Is Chappie a professional killer, or is it all coincidence? Don't downgrade coincidence. Better still, don't do anything. Just wait here for a few moments, and I shall return with Act Two. There's a man named Thomas Eldon Beckwith, Jr. Or, uh, we should say, there was a man named Thomas Eldon Beckwith, Jr. We never met Mr. Beckwith, and, uh, of course, now, we never will. The late Mr. Beckwith happened to stand in the way of Roger Wilson's promotion. Roger casually mentioned this fact to his old army buddy, Chappie. Thomas Eldon Beckwith, Jr. was shot to death last night. Are we dealing here with cause and effect? Tommy Beckwith. I can't believe it. Neither can I. Oh, who could that be? I don't know. You want me to answer it? No, no. I'll get it. Yes? Mr. Roger Wilson? Yes. I am a police officer, Lieutenant Kaufman of the Homicide Division. Homicide? Yes. May I come in? Oh, oh sure. My wife, Mrs. Wilson. Dolly, this is Lieutenant... Uh... Uh, Kaufman. Will you have a cup of coffee, mm. Lieutenant? No, thank you. We just heard about Tom Beckwith's death. It was on the radio. Oh, I suppose that's why you're here. Yes. Well, what do you want to ask me? 
Did uh, Mr. Beckwith have any enemies that you know of? Well, I thought the radio said he was killed by a prowler. Well, he may have been, but a prowler would have robbed him. He was still wearing an expensive ring and a gold watch, and he had $200 in his pocket. Oh. Well, the prowler might have been frightened by the killing and ran away without... Yes, that's quite possible, Mr. Wilson. Anything's possible. That's why we're following every line of approach. Oh, well, what can I tell you? And you could answer my question. Did he have any enemies? Tom? Hmm? No. No. <laughs> so why do I say that? You see, I really didn't know Tom very well. Well, you worked with him for over 15 years. Well, we knew each other at the office. I, I, we didn't socialize too much, did we, did we Dolly? Uh, no. I know very little about his personal life. Uh, well, uh, had Mr. Beckwith been behaving in a way that uh, might be considered unusual lately? No. No, I don't think so. Yeah, well, do you know anyone who stands to benefit by his death? No, I, I couldn't say. Yeah, well, I understand you would. Me? Yes. Some of the people I spoke to at your office tell me that uh, you're next in line for his job. Oh, well, that doesn't mean I killed him, does it? <laughs> no, no, not at all. But you're just as, as, as good accused me. Well, no, 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 I, I made no accusation. Well, then what are you, what are you talking about? Uh, Mr. Wilson, we can travel down one of two ways. Now, we can assume he was killed by a prowler. Now, this then becomes a, a random murder, which has nothing to do with the personal life of Mr. Beckwith. He was killed because of uh, where he was. Or we can say he was killed because he happened to be Thomas Eldon Beckwith, Jr. Now, this means he was killed because of who he was. Now, do you follow me? Hmm? Yes, I think so. So... We're asking questions, exploring possibilities, no matter how far out they may seem. And I would like you to help. How? Well, just don't inhibit your thinking. Uh, let your mind travel. If you have any kind of suspicion, any kind of supposition, no matter how far-fetched, uh, don't be afraid to mention it. All right. Good. Now, here. Please take this card. It has my number on it. And if anything occurs to you... Uh... Okay. Okay. All right. That's, that's all for now. Well, thank you for your time, Mr. Wilson, Mrs. Wilson. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Oh, no, no, don't bother. I can let myself out. Tom Beckwith. Who could have killed Tom Beckwith? Evidently, that lieutenant thinks I did. Oh, Roger, come on. He doesn't think anything of the sort. Besides, how could you have done it? You were home with me all night. Yeah. That's an advantage of married life. You have a built-in alibi. Roger? You're white as a ghost. You're shaking. I'll be all right. Roger, death is always a tragedy. It's too bad about Tom Beckwith, but by no stretch of the imagination can you pretend you two were friends. It's one thing to be sorry, but how can you be so cut up about it? I'm not cut up. Roger, tell me. What's the matter? What was I going to tell her? I didn't even know what to tell myself. Chappie. Was it possible? It was just a vague suspicion. But now, this... Don't inhibit your thinking, said the lieutenant. Let your mind travel. No matter how far-fetched... All right, Lieutenant. What do you want me to tell you? A war buddy of mine is a professional killer? Just suppose, just suppose for the sake of argument, that I went to your office right now and tried to explore this far-fetched suspicion with you. How, how would you react? Lieutenant, I know who killed Tom Beckwith. Do you? A man named Beryl Spencer Chapman. I uh, go slow. Now, I have to write it all down. He likes to kill. I know that from when we were in Korea 25 years ago. He used to get a look in his eyes. A look? Well, you know this gangster who was gunned down the other night, Tony Armin? Yeah. A few minutes after Armin was shot, Chappie joined us at a nearby restaurant, and he had this killer's look in his eyes. Now, let me write this down. The killer's look. The next day, I mentioned, I just happened to mention that... Yeah? Then what? 
that Tom Beckwith was the one who was standing in the way of my promotion to general sales manager. I better write that down. And last night, Beckwith was shot to death. Why did you mention it to Chappie? Why? Yes. Why? Well, because... Because... Was it because you hoped that Chappie would kill him? No, no, no. That thought never entered my mind. You suspected Chappie of being a professional killer. Well, I, uh... You wanted Chappie to kill Beckwith. No. Subconsciously, you wanted him to kill Beckwith. You wanted him to kill Beckwith. Where were you? Huh? Chappie and I have been sitting here for about ten minutes now, waiting for you to come out of that trance. What trance? You have been sitting there, your eyes wide open. But I'm sure you must have been dreaming. Was he like that when you were in Korea, Chappie? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I guess I must have dozed off. I stared closely at Chappie. What I had come to think of as the killer look was nowhere evident in his eyes. Oh, maybe it never existed. Maybe it was all my imagination. All of this was being constructed from a fragment of a shrouded memory that was almost 25 years old when we were 19-year-old kids. Chappie, the smiling, happy, quiet man, a killer? No, I'm sure he isn't. Even Dolly likes him. Dolly has an instinct for people. If Chappie were evil, Dolly would automatically shy away from him. Yes? Now send him in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Struthers? Uh, yes, I want to see you, Roger. You know why? Well, I... You're under the impression that I'm going to offer you back with job, aren't you? Well, Mr. Struthers, I... Now, everywhere I go around here, I hear the same thing. Roger Wilson's going to be the next general sales manager. Well, I did have reason to believe I was next in line. I... Line? <sighs> what line? What is this, a bus station? I've given this company 20 years. I know, I... and you have been well paid for it. Now, Beckwith is dead. Yes, sir. Now, why should I replace him with another Beckwith? Sir? You're another Beckwith. You're the same style. Oh, no, sir. With all due respect, I think I'd be a better sales manager than Tom was. Well, you'll have to prove it. And there's one account this company must have. Webster. Webster? Webster, right now, buys 20% of all the components manufactured in this industry. Now, Webster's growing every day. I want that account in this house. But, sir... Beckwith couldn't bring it in. Can you? Do you realize there's a deep personal situation that exists at Webster? Well, we make a better product. We can give them a better deal. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> now, listen. You want me to give you the sales manager's job? You give me Webster. Say, what is this? Darling, it's your victory celebration. Candlelight, silver, champagne. A victory. Your appointment to general sales manager calls for a very special dinner. Well, uh, who's that, I wonder? That's Chappie. Chappie? Your best and closest friend. I thought you'd want him to be part of it. Well, sure. You let him in. Give him a drink. I'll check the roast. Chappie, come in. How's it? Well, join me in a little libation here. Mm-hmm. To the new job. Well, uh... Well, what? Well, about that new job. You didn't get it? Well, there's a condition... Yeah? The top account in the industry is an outfit called Webster Manufacturing. And they don't buy from us unless I can bring them in. Yeah? <laughs> well, I can see the old man's point. We should have that account. And would. Except, well, it's something personal. Personal? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have a competitor. And they have a salesman. We don't know how he does it, but he's got Webster all wrapped up. He has, hmm? Yeah, I spoke to Jim Webster himself. Mm-hmm. He as much as told me, Roger, he said, I'd buy from you folks in a flash. You got the product, you got the price, but... But what? But as long as Jerry's alive, he said, I'm obligated. Why is he obligated to Jerry? I don't know. Ah, it doesn't matter. As long as he feels that way. Yeah. So that's that. Sure. Well, maybe it's time I found another job anyhow. What's Jerry's last name? What'd you say? I said, what's Jerry's last name? Why, is that important? Well, what is it? Well, why would you want to know his last name? I'm just curious. Okay, forget it. How about a refill? Sure. <sighs> his name is Trask. 
Jerry Trask. Jerry Trask. A name suddenly surfaces. Is Mr. Trask about to meet with a violent end? Well, who among us can guarantee tomorrow? But this does not seem to be a happy time for those people who stand in the way of our friend Roger Wilson. Is war buddy Chappie expressing professional curiosity? Indeed, is he even a professional? Well, we usually answer these questions in Act 3, which I shall bring you in just a few moments. named Jerome J. Trask is walking his dog very late one night along a quiet street in New York City. He approaches the corner. Someone is standing in the shadow of an apartment building. That someone cannot be discerned in the darkness. And that gleam is the shine that is reflected from a steel pistol barrel. coffee? No, this is fine. What'd you say? Well, let's turn this thing off so we can hear ourselves talk. No, leave it on. Why? I want to hear the morning headlines. I can't imagine what for. They're always so depressing. It's always some murder. Roger? Hmm? Is something wrong? No. Are you sure? Nothing's wrong. But why do you insist? It's just that you seem to be so nervous this morning. I'm not nervous. Did, uh, the Chappie enjoy dinner last night? Sure. I mean, I think so. Why do you ask? Well, he left early. Why, do you suppose? Now, your morning news headline. Well, here he is again, Doleful Donald. Is our city in for a wave of random murders? Is a mad killer loose in the streets? Early this morning, another senseless shooting, another tragic death. Just before dawn, Jerome J. Trask, 37, was shot to death as he was walking his dog along East End Avenue and 77th Street. At this moment, police are unable to supply further details. We shall return in ten minutes with your next headline report. Well, another morning, another murder. Roger? <clears throat> you know, lately you've been getting a funny look on your face. What kind of funny look? Just kind of funny and, and far away, as if as if you're not with us. You just kind of disappear. What do you mean, disappear? You sit there and you give the impression that you're off somewhere in another time or another place. I just had some things to think about. Some, some very puzzling things. Like what? Like... I'm not even sure I know. Well, you're a fountain of information. Did you call in and get us a starting time? Starting time? At the club. We're playing golf this morning. You and I and Chappie. Golf? Oh, Roger, we spoke about it last night. Now oh, that has to be Chappie. I'll get it. You pour him a cup of coffee. Hello, Chappie. Come Morning. on in. We probably won't tee off until after lunch. Roger forgot to get us a starting time. Was he this absent-minded in the Army? <laughs> Sometimes. We uh, were just talking about you, Chappie. I was hoping you had a good time last night. I did. It's just that you left so early. Oh, it was a business appointment. Ten o'clock at night? That's the Transformer business. Transformer. That word hit a chord. Struck a nerve the way he said, Transformer. It was the way I had said Transformer years ago in a foxhole in Korea. They were attacking us in force, and we were throwing everything we had at them. Okay, Jimmy, okay. Okay, you're wasting the taxpayers' money. There's nothing to hit out there anymore. They all went home. You got any water? Yeah. I get so thirsty after a firefight, I could just keep drinking for hours. All I've got is half a canteen. Honey, how many of them did you get, Rog? None. I just fired into the air. I counted 14. 14 definite. I saw him go down. It could have been more. 
You want to stand guard a while? i got to clean my rifle. Now? Rifle should be cleaned every time it's been fired. All right, go ahead. When's the last time you cleaned yours, Raj? Oh, let me see. I mean, just because nobody comes around for inspection, that doesn't mean that... Don't worry about me, chappy. i got to worry. You're my buddy, aren't you? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Oh, nothing. Yeah? <laughs> well, it's the way you handle that rifle. In your hands, it isn't just some standard government issue. It's a... It's what? It's a mystical object. Yeah? What's that? Well, let's say it's a kind of cosmic transformer. A transformer because it... Well, it works like a... It works like cataclysmic transformation. <laughs> Where do you get all them big words, Raj? That's what you learn in co college. Where was I? Oh, yes. A rifle is a transformer. It transforms the living into the dead. How do you like that? I like it. Yeah, I like it pretty good. You know something, Raj? I may even go into the transformer business when I get home. Transformer business? Why not? Well, for one thing, it's against the law. That ain't gonna bother me. Why not? Them laws are passed by fat politicians. I already broke a bigger law. Which one is that? God's law. Don't it say in the Bible, thou shalt not kill? So what are we doing out here? This is different. It's always different. There's an explanation. There's a what million you... explanations, Raj. I figure I'm in bed already, so go all the way. All the way? Where? Here I've been killing people for the government for less than 200 a month. That's not the way to look at it. I know guys who pay better. A whole lot better. Yeah. Transformer business. You want to go in it with me when we get home? No, thanks. You see, Chappie, that's what I meant. He just disappears on us. Well, what are you, what are you talking about? You. You were sitting there for over a minute with a blank look in your eyes, wasn't he, Chappie? Anybody mind if I have another glass of orange juice? Oh, help yourself. You must be very thirsty this morning. Yeah. I get that way sometimes. <laughs> Who is it? He's a police detective, a Lieutenant Kaufman. Oh, send him in. Well, I'm uh, sorry to barge in on you at your office, Mr. Wilson. Sit down, uh, Lieutenant... Uh... Uh, Kaufman. That's right. What can I do for you? I don't know. <laughs> well, then. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, let me speak frankly and off the record. Uh, Mr. Beckwith is shot to death. Soon after, uh, Mr. Trask is murdered. Do you know who would be my prime suspect in both cases if he didn't have an ironclad alibi, huh? You. Me? Why? Mr. Beckwith stood in your path for promotion. But I haven't been promoted yet. Yet. Mr. Trask was a most formidable competitor. You admit I have an alibi, and I know I didn't do it. Mr. Wilson, last time I asked you to think, to explore any angle, any glimmer regardless of how crazy it might seem. Well, nothing occurs to me. Uh -huh. Well, could you, <clears throat> could you advance any theory why two men, both of whom were known to you, should be mysteriously murdered within the same week? Could you? Could I? Could I? Could I say I suspect my friend Chappie of being a professional killer? All I have to do is say that. The lieutenant will counter with why did I use him? But I didn't use him. I didn't know for a fact the chappie is killer. I still don't know. Don't I? He is. He is, and I used him. I needed him. The fact is, I would have killed Beckwith for his job, and I would have killed Trask for the Webster account. I would have, if I could. But I can't kill. So I used Chappie. Just as I depended on him to kill for me back in the war. No, Lieutenant, you're right. I'm your prime suspect. But the case has to be closed. Excuse me, Lieutenant. Yes? Hey, Roger. What are you doing right now? I, uh... I'm in a meeting, Mr. Struthers. Well, when you're finished, go outside in the corridor and see the new name that's being painted on what used to be Beckwith's door. Mr. Struthers. Webster called me personally. He told me that we were getting his business thanks to your efforts. He thinks very highly of you. Sir, I don't know how to thank you. Well, I know how you can thank me. Double our value. 
Well, Mr. Wilson? Huh? Uh, does uh, anything at all uh, occur to you? Uh, no, Lieutenant. I'm sorry. I don't have the faintest idea why those two men could have been killed. Hello? Dolly? Roger, are you at the airport? Yes, I'm at the airport in Kansas City. Roger, it's my birthday. I know, but I had to close this deal. You haven't been home in two weeks. Look, I can't help it. All right. Listen, I'm sorry. I'll be home Tuesday, okay? Okay. Hello? Dolly, I... Uh... Oh, what is it this time? It's kind of overcast here in Atlanta, and I can't get out tonight. Dolly? All right, Roger. Where are you now? Uh, Roger. Oh, hello, Mr. Struthers. I'm glad I caught you before you left. Now, we have to get to the airport. Now? This minute. There's a bad problem in Denver. Well, tonight is my anniversary. Uh, well, uh, congratulations. Now, uh, do we have a file on... Sir, the... my wife is waiting for me. You call her up. Tell her uh, something much more important has happened. Well, Mr. Struthers, I can't say that to my wife. You can if it's the truth. Now, is it more important to drink some champagne in a nightclub than to protect your job? Chappie. Dolly. Come in. Well, sit down. Have a drink? Sure. Roger's due home from Denver at six. Unless... Unless what? Unless he calls at the last minute and says he has to go somewhere else. Chappie, I don't know what I'd have done without you to keep me company. You know... Roger has changed. Yeah? It's as if some demon has possessed him. It's that job of his. That's all he lives for. He certainly doesn't care about me anymore. You know, there are times... Times when... When what? I better not say it. You can say anything to me. Even to you. Go ahead. There are times when I... I would like to kill him. Yeah? Well, here I am. Hello, Dolly. Honey. Hello, Chappie. I'm glad you yeah. could make it, Roger. You sure you don't have anything more important to do? Oh, come on, honey. You have to understand it. My job makes demands. Let's not start that again. You boys have a drink. I'll see about dinner. Sure. Yeah, she can knock the job, all right, but you'll notice she has no objection to all the money. She's changed, Chappie. <laughs> She's not the same sweet, understanding kid I married. She gets me so mad, I wish. Yeah? Ah, forget it. Sure. <laughs> there were times I wish. I wish I could kill her. for driving me out to the airport, Chappy. Sure. I know it's an imposition. <laughs> Where would I get a cab at this hour of the night? It's okay, it's okay. I, I couldn't ask Dolly to drive me. I, I mean, I, I I wouldn't. What's that, what's that noise in the engine? I don't hear anything. Well, it sounds like something got loose. Better have a look. Uh, you want to hold the flashlight? Do you know what to do? I mean, un underneath that hood, <laughs> it's all a mystery to me. Do you have any tools? Oh, I need one tool, Roger. I carry it with me all the time. What's that? A transformer. <laughs> Chappie, what are you going to do? I'm going to make a transformation. Chappie, <laughs> you can't. You know, Raj, I've been making transformations for the government, for personal clients, for friends... And now, for the first time in my life, I'm making one for me. You... You're not going to kill me, Chappie. No, I'm just going to transform you. Why? Why? Because Dolly asked me to. But Dolly doesn't know. She knows. Like you knew. 
That's why you kept asking, didn't you, Raj? Asking me to transform those guys. But, but why... Why kill me? Because she needs this transformation to make her happy. And so do I. Chappy! It won't hurt. Oh. And that morning, there was another headline. And Lieutenant Kaufman of Homicide was even more puzzled than ever. His only comfort might be derived from the fact that sometimes bad things occur in a series of three. And if he can't find the killer, at least there won't be any more of those particular killings. I don't know. It all depends on what Dolly's needs are. I'll be back shortly. game of death. It begins innocently enough in childhood and progresses into more and more serious variations as we grow older. Still, it must remain a game. After all, if you look at it, it has rules, it has penalties, and when it's over, everyone goes home and becomes friends again. Isn't that the story of the world? Aren't so many of yesterday's enemies today's bosom friends. It's all a question of changing, of evolving. And it goes on all the time. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Terry Keene, Mandel Kramer, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. 3,000, right? Where? All three of us? No. All right. Will do. We're to put the money in a book in the 42nd Street Library. Put the book back on the shelf at exactly 5 p.m., walk out, and stand for a few minutes chatting near the lions on the library steps. And then, split. Oh, they're kidding. Oh, no. We're in earnest. Deadly earnest. Why hang around on the steps? <laughs> I should imagine somebody wants to get a good look at us. The killer? Yes. It would be a shame to rub out the wrong guys. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sign Off, the Sinus Medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio. Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Suppose you stepped into an elevator or walked up to a counter and found yourself looking at a familiar face, but groping at the same time to identify it. Then, supposing further, that recognition came to you with an icy shock, and you had to absorb the eerie realization that the face you were looking at was your own. Well, 
Suppose we don't just suppose, but we follow the result of what occurred when this actually became reality. Suppose he don't come through. Suppose he's not such a patsy as you think. Then what happens to your share the wealth plan? Not to worry, baby. No matter what happens, this is the one I won't let get away. Our mystery drama, Two's a Crowd, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Earl Hammond and Mandel Kramer. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There was a poet named Lee who wrote in the 19th century, In form and feature, face and limb, I grew so much like my brother that folks got taking me for him and each one for the other. Since the dawn of time, identical twins have never ceased to amaze and intrigue us. Growing up together, sprung from one egg, it is not so surprising that more and more they grow into each other's inner selves as well as the outer. But what happens if they are separated at birth, unaware that each of them is duplicated, and they don't find out about each other till they are men and grown? Sorry, drugstore's closed. Uh, I don't want a prescription. I uh, just want a pack of cigarettes. Well, we closed the ten. I guess I forgot to lock. Holy cow. Don't get excited, mister. Just do as... It... No. Who are you? Uh, I'm, I'm just... Who the heck are you? I'm Phil Henderson. I own the store. What's your name? Len. Uh, Len Brock. You live in Manhattan? No, no, Brooklyn. You? Oh, no, Man Manhattan, right, right here in this building. I just can't believe it. Oh, that knocks me out. How long you lived in New York? 28 years. How long have you been in Brooklyn? The same. Hey, 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 what's your birthday? The 29th of April. Now, don't tell me that you... You got it. The 29th of April. Did you come here looking for me? No, I can't get to uh, let me get a pack of cigarettes. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let, let me lock the door before somebody else barges in. You know, it's it's just pure luck that you found me here. Why, uh, I thought you said you owned the joint. Well, I do. Well, well, technically my mother does, but the thing is I don't work here, you see. Well, what are you doing in here tonight? Well, the help got fouled up. One guy on vacation, one out sick... And the kid who helps assemble the Sunday papers was supposed to bring his brother to help him out, and neither of them showed, and the pharmacist goes off at nine. So he called me, and I've been breaking my back ever since then. Huh. Well, I'll, I'll get you your cigarettes. Uh, you want me to give you a hand with the papers? Yeah, that'd be swell. I mean, we, you know, we gotta, we gotta talk anyway. Hey, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we gotta talk, all right. Here you go. Here are your cigarettes. No, here, here, I'll pay you. Now, forget it. They're on the house. Look, I'm the one to pay you if you're going to help. Oh, no, no, no. Forget it. Forget it. It's all in the family like, you know. You see it the way I do, huh? Like looking in a mirror. And it's just got to be. I mean, I, I can tell you right now, it's got to be. See, I guess I, I'm the one that had to be farmed out. I mean, I was adopted. So was I. How about that? It, boy, that's kind of a rocker. Why? Well, like the moment I saw you, I figure uh, we got to be brothers, uh, twins. No way it could be anything else. Mm -hmm. Then when I hear we got the same birthdays and the same age, I figure now I'm going to meet my real mom and pop. You're going you're gonna to take me to meet them. That's what I thought you'd do. You ever know them? My real parents? I, I mean, our parents? Uh, yeah, yeah. No. How about you? Uh-huh. I ask about them plenty of times, but my foster parents always claim they, they didn't know. Your foster parents? Uh-huh. You still live with them? No, no, no. The old, the old man skipped out when I was 15. Arlene, I mean, my, well, the one I call mom, she kicked the bucket about six, seven years ago. I, I heard. You heard? 
You'd moved out? Uh, <laughs> moved out. <laughs> More like she did. Eh, well, it's, it's a long story. Hey, come on. Come on. We better start stacking the Sunday paper together. Yeah, we can talk while we're at it. I have a better idea. Hmm. Let's get this over with and go somewhere we can really talk. Well, you said you lived in a building. You know, we could go to your place. No, no. You see, Mother, well, the lady I call Mother is very sick. Look, there's a bar right next door. We can go there and talk. All right, all right. Where's the fire? Who is it? It's Ace. Open up. Hold it. What do you want? Well, take the chain off, Maisie, will you? Don't call me that. All right, all right, May. Will you let me in? I want to talk to your boyfriend. Lenny isn't here. Come on, come on. Stop kidding around, will you? The man sent me. The man? You heard me. Lenny still isn't here. Come in. Come in. See for yourself. That's more like it. So, where's the hot shot? Out. Why do you care? I don't. I told you the man sent me. So what the shark you want for... Well, don't tell me Lenny's been gambling again. Oh, that's right, and losing. Oh, no. How deep in is he? Plenty. What do you think I was sent after him for? You... You gonna hurt him? Oh, yeah, just slow up, Maisie. You know that ain't my style. A strong arm stuff is up the bunny. Uh, how long is it gonna take you, sister, to learn that the guy is just no good, that he's a deadbeat? Oh, I know that. So what do you hang out with him for? Because I love him. Look, Maisie. And I keep thinking one of these times he'll live up to all his promises. <laughs> I guess I mean hoping. Yeah. And don't call me Maisie. All right, all right, May. Look, for your sake, you know, I can keep Sharky off his back another week. Maybe two. But if he can't bail himself out, Sharky's going to lower the boom. <laughs> Well, here's looking at you, Phil. I guess I should have said, here's looking at me. <laughs> I tell you, Len, I can't believe it yet. You're my twin, all right. Oh, yeah, your own flesh and blood. <laughs> Hi, brother. That's me. Imagine the two of us living right here in the same city and never even knowing about each other. <laughs> tell me about you. Me, uh... Well, I just wouldn't know where to start. Well, back at the store, you said something funny. Huh? You said you didn't move out on your mother. Oh, I mean the woman who brought you up. That it was more as though she moved out on you. What do you mean by that? Oh, oh. Well, see, I told you my old man, I, well, I, I mean, her husband took a walk on her, you know? You mean when you were 15? Well, almost 16. Huh? He left us flat. We were on the rocks, you know? Yeah, no money, huh? Well, yeah, we owed everybody. The best Arlene could get was a receptionist job, so I, uh, well, I had to drop out of high school to help keep us going, and, yeah, I had to go to work. Doing what? Yeah, jobs. Anything I could get to raise some scratch. Well, I didn't mind it first, you see, but her, well, she changed a lot, and inside a year, you know, the Joes were coming around, and, well, one morning I woke up to find out she'd walked out on me, too. Walked out on you? Yeah, 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 she said she found this crumb who was willing to make a life for her, but uh, he didn't want me around. So I joined the service, the Navy. I did a hitch, and, and then I come back with a steak and found out she died. And they, oh, can we, hey, come on, now that's enough about me. One more question. What do you do now? Me? Yeah. Oh, I, I'm in insurance. Oh, come on, come on, now let's hear about you, huh? Well, compared to you, Len, I, I've been lucky. I mean, my mother and father, you know, the people who adopted me, who were older people. They'd never been able to have any children, so, you know, I was really the fair-haired boy. All the time I was growing up, I can't remember ever not getting anything that I wanted. Oh, boy, lucky, lucky. And they're pretty well fixed, huh, with the store and all? Well, the drugstore does all right, but Dad really only hung on to it for sentimental reasons, because that's where he got his start. What do you mean, his start? Well, the old man had always wanted to be a doctor. When he was young, he had to settle for being a pharmacist. But he had a flair for invention in the pharmaceutical field. Now, one of them was some kind of a skin lotion that went over big with his customers. Well, it got to be such a hot item that he finally was able to sell the formula to one of the big houses for a bundle and royalties. You mean he's really loaded? Was. 
Too bad he had a heart attack and died before he could really enjoy it. Uh, but he left you pretty well fixed, huh? Well, all the money went to Mother. I mean, I don't get anything until she dies. I have a roof over my head, and I'm fed, and I get enough money to get by on. Oh, well, the old lady keeps you on an allowance, huh? Well, that's the way my dad set it up. I guess he wanted to make sure that I'd be around to take care of Mother. And uh, you say uh, your mother's sick, huh? Yeah. Uh, what's the matter with her? Oh, I... I don't want to talk about it. No. Well, is she, uh, is she uh, dying? Yeah. Yeah, she's oh. dying. I mean, it won't, you know, won't be very long now. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, it's really funny, you know. I thought I was going to be all alone in the world. And now, you turn up just in the nick of time. My twin. <laughs> yeah. You're identical twin. Are you married? No. Are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Greatest girl in the world. Any children? Well, not yet. Can't give us a chance. We're just getting settled. Oh, it's that recent, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I hope I'm going to get a chance to meet, uh... May. May. Yeah, yeah. First chance, we'll have you over to dinner in the evening, huh? And we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot of get-togethers. I'd like that. Uh, I'm afraid, though, it's going to have to wait until Mother... Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Sure, I understand, Phil. But, you know, we got to keep in touch. Of course. Look, I'll give you my phone number. You just call me. And you better give me yours. You know, we got to keep in touch. We will. I wouldn't want to lose you now. Uh-huh. Don't worry. There is no way you can shake me, brother. May? May, you haven't heard a word I said. Well, you listening? Yeah, I heard, I heard. You pick a drugstore, you go in to knock it over, and instead you get knocked over. Because the guy in there looks like you. He didn't look just like me. He's my twin, my identical twin. We're brothers. Oh, spare me the hearts and flowers. So what good does that do us? Did you get any dough off him? No, no, not yet. But uh, you know me. I will. When? Just as soon as his old lady kicks off, he'll be rolling in it. Hey, we'll be on easy street. <laughs> How many times I heard that? Now, let me ask you a question. Did you hear what I've been trying to tell you? About what? About them markers of yours, about how Sharky's on your tail. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but you fixed that with Ace. Yeah, huh? only for a week, maybe a couple. Well, you can get around, Ace, you know. Have him hold off until... Well, this... maybe I could, but you know something? I won't. I'm not going out on the limb for you again till you put up or shut up. I'm tired of living on promises that always turn out to be lies. Sweetie, this time it is the real thing. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, the big hit. Now, this guy, Phil, is big for the family stuff. Now, he's almost in tears. He dug up his own brother. Look, don't you see? I got a ripe pigeon to pluck. And suppose he don't come through? Suppose he's not such a patsy as you think. Then how do you glom onto him, and what happens to your share the wealth plan? Not to worry, baby. No matter what happens, this is the one I won't let get away. It seems as if Philip Henderson's joy in his reunion with his brother may not turn out to be as unalloyed as he might have wished. Will Len, bitter and disappointed at the shambles of his own life, be driven to take advantage of his newfound sibling? And what will happen if Phil should not be as generous as Len expects? I shall return shortly with Act Two. always fascinated doctors to have the opportunity to study identical twins who have been brought up, for whatever reason, apart. Their findings? That environmental differences produce little physical effect or changes in mental ability. Educational achievement is affected more, and personality and temperament the most. Now, let us pursue our private study further as we examine Philip, the other twin, on his home grounds. How is she, Dr. Clayton? Uh, well, she seems to have perked up quite a bit these last few days, Phil. You mean she's getting better? No, 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 I didn't say that. I Just that she seems to have more energy. You know, these cancers are always unpredictable. I 
I can't honestly hold out any more hope for you in the long run. <clears throat> uh, uh, cigarette? Oh, you know I don't smoke, Doc. Eh? Oh, yes, pardon me. I, I've forgotten. Uh, do you mind if I do? No, not at all. Mm. Doctor? Yes, son? How long do you think she's got? Well, it's hard to say. Sometimes they linger indefinitely, you know. Beth Henderson and I go back a long way. Yes, I guess I'd do anything for that girl. Girl? <laughs> yes, it's the way I'll always remember her. Well, there's no rest for the weary. I've got to get back to the hospital for afternoon rounds. Thanks for coming in, Dr. Clayton. Mm -hmm. Uh, does she need anything else? Well, right at the moment, mostly you. Mostly for her is to have you with her. I'll uh, let myself out. Go on in, lad. Cheer her up. I'll do anything that's best for her. Hi, Mother. Hello, son. Come and sit by me, Philip. How are you feeling? I was thinking of getting up. Well, Dr. Clayton didn't seem to feel... Oh, pay no attention to Porky. He's an old funny daddy. Porky? Oh, that's what we always used to call him. Dr. Clayton. Porky. It wasn't that he was so fat. He just had this little round belly. <laughs> Can I get you anything? It isn't time for my medicine yet, is it? Almost. Well, then, maybe... Would you give it to me, son? Oh, I'm so tired. And I hurt a little. I'd like to rest. Okay, Mother. That's what you want. All I ever wanted was a son. And I found him in you. Oh. What's that? Oh, it's the phone ringing, Mother. Well, answer it. It sounds so far away. Well, I disconnected it in here. I, I didn't want it to disturb you. Excuse me. Huh? Oh, yes, yes. Just come back. It's lonely without you. I won't be long. Hello? Uh, Phil? Yes, who's this? Oh, Lynn? Yeah, 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 your brand new brother. I've been uh, sort of hanging around waiting for a call from you. Oh, gee, I'm sorry, Lynn. I've been tied up with Mother. Ah, uh, is she any worse? Well, uh, no. It was just that the doctor's been here, and I have to stick around and take care of her. Uh, well, I was hoping we could get together. You know, how about having dinner with May and me tonight? I'd love to, but I really don't think I can make it. Well, uh, well how's about if uh, we should drop by this afternoon and pay your mom a visit? Are you going to cheer her up? Uh, well, I don't really think she's up to it, Lynn, but... Yeah? What? Well, oh, look, I want to see you, and I want to meet your wife. Why don't you and May meet me at the birdcage? Huh? You know, the place we had drinks last night. Mother has to rest from, oh, you know, like 12 to 2.30 or so, so why don't you come and be my guest there for lunch? Well, if you say so. I do know. say so. I don't want to lose you, brother, now that I've found you. if I want to go. Oh, come on now, May. This is our whole future. Well, why'd you have to go and tell him I was your wife? Well, you know, it, it just came out like that. You know, I guess maybe I wanted him to think I was a solid citizen. Oh, that's a laugh. Well, won't be if we can hit him up for a steak. Well, why should he give you any handouts? Well, he's my brother, ain't he? You say. So, come on. I'll prove it. <laughs> So, what do you think now you've seen the two of us together, huh, May? You could knock me for a loop. Not much doubt we're brothers, is there, Mrs. Brock? Oh, if I came into this restaurant and Len wasn't sitting right next to you, I'd figure you for my boy, uh, my husband. Uh, excuse me, check, sir. Oh, just leave it right there. Uh, you people want anything else? No, I'll... I'll just finish my coffee. Yeah, that goes with me. Oh, listen, I wonder if you two will excuse me. I've been gone nearly two hours. I want to call and see how Mother is. Sure, sure, go ahead. Be right back. Well, what do you say, May? Oh, 
I gotta eat crow. He's the spit image. Like I said, and top drawer all the way. Mm, he wears the best. That suit, that tie, and the wristwatch and the name bracelet are solid gold. Oh, he spells real money. And all we gotta do is pry our share of it away, huh? Mm, I don't know, Len. Maybe a hip pay dirt. And then again... Hold it. Listen, you two. You, you have to forgive me. Mother's taking a turn for the worse, and I have to get there right away. May, it was real nice to admit you, and we'll have to see each other again. Len, I'll keep in touch. Oh. How do you like that? Your big, generous twin brother has stuck us with the check? How's the chicken coming, May? Oh, it's under control. I wish I thought you had your pigeon the same. He's coming here for dinner tonight. Now, this is the night I hit him up for good. How is this old lady? Uh, he's hanging on. Then where is Phil going to get the dough for you to hit him up for? Look, 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 do me a favor, would you? Let me handle this. Hey, that was a wonderful dinner, mate. You're really a good cook. My brother is one lucky guy. Thanks, Phil. Anyone for more coffee or brandy? No, I don't want any more. No, I'll, I'll pass, too. Why don't you boys chew the fat while I clear the table and get rid of the dishes, huh? Can I help? Oh, no, no, you're the guest. And anyway, there's only room in our kitchen for one. Yeah, if you want anything. Hey, that's a wonderful wife you have there, Len. Hmm? I said that's a wonderful wife. Oh, oh, oh me, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Oh, you got to know it. Yeah. You seemed a little abstracted, Len. What was that word? Abstracted, you know, thinking of something else, maybe. Oh, yeah. Well, you see, I uh, I got this deal on my mind. Deal? Yeah, yeah. I haven't told you, Phil, but yeah, you know, business is just terrific for me. Now, I'm selling insurance like it it just came into style. But what ginches me is I'm not selling it for myself. You know what I mean? No. I'm working for a company. I put out the sweat and they lick up all the gravy. So, me and this other guy, uh, we want to go into business for ourselves. You know, each put up half the capital. Why not? Sounds like a great idea. <sighs> but I ain't got the do re me. Oh, well, can't you raise it somewhere? Mm. I ain't got what you might call a cash flow problem right now. Well, can't you borrow it? Well, that's what I wanted to... What I wanted to talk to you about. I haven't got it, Lynn. Well, well look, well, you know, it isn't all that much, and I, I, all I'd ask you to do Lynn, is to... please. I'm sorry, I just can't do it. Hey, look at the time. I had no idea I'd been here this long. I shouldn't have left Mother by herself. Oh, I thought she had a nurse with her. Well, she does, but she depends on me so much. Look, uh, you have to forgive me for rushing, huh? And say goodnight to May for me, will you? I'm right here, Phil. You have to leave so soon? Yeah, it's Mother. If I'm going too long, you know, it just upsets her. Besides, I have to give her her medicine. Thanks for a lovely dinner. Oh, yeah, any time. I hope I can reciprocate someday. Oh, that'd be nice. Good night, Lynn. We'll keep in touch. Uh, yeah, yeah, Phil. Uh, we'll be in touch. Good night. Night. Did you hear? I heard your loving twin give you the ever-loving brush-off. Well, now, 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 maybe it wasn't. You know, he, he does worry about his old lady, and, well, he doesn't have the cash either at the moment. Look, but when I show him I only want him to co-sign a loan, he'll go along. Hmm? What do you think? I think you're identical twins, except for one thing. Why? He's a bigger deadbeat than you are. Nuts. No luck? Yeah, two days now, and all I get is a busy signal, or, or that nurse saying he isn't home, or he can't come to the phone. Mm, the runaround. But I can't figure that. Not the way he was so glad and excited to see me when I turned up as his twin. Now, the only thing I can... Hello? Lynn? Yeah? Who is this? Ace. Hey, hey, uh, what, what do you want? You know. Well, you gave me an extension, you... I tried to buy you one, but there had to be a limit. Your time has run out, Lynn. Hey, look, uh, well, yeah, well, wait a minute, Ace. You got more than a minute, but not much. Tomorrow night, 9 p.m., I'm coming by. If you can't pay off by then... Sharky will. Well, suppose I can. I mean, then what? It ain't a matter of breaking bones anymore, Len. You don't come through after the extension I bought you. The man is going to be mad. I mean, real mad. He's going to have to make an example. 
I mean, no, no, wait, 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 Ace. Ace, just, just wait until I tell you. There's nothing to tell me, Len. You put up by tomorrow at nine, and the answer is, you'll be shut up. I, 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 I... Len? Len? Yeah. Did you hear any of that, May? I was listening on the bedroom extension. What are you going to do? I'm going to see Phil. He's not going to come through for you. Uh, he better or else. Or else what? There ain't going to be twins anymore. Only one left. Me. I'm going to kill him. How will that help? It'll be the only way left to buy myself out of the hole I'm in. I'd have to take his place. <laughs> be possible for one person to step into another's shoes. Someone from a totally different background, upbringing, education. Someone who had only the most recent and fragmentary knowledge of the man he hoped to personify. And even if successful at that, how could he dispose of his other self? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Given the characters of the twins involved and the circumstances of their divergent backgrounds ever since their meeting, this chronicle has been building to a sensational denouement. Would it be possible for the one twin, Len, to carry off this grand deception? Can he be as successful as Sidney Carton in The Tale of Two Cities or Rudolf Rassendel in The Prisoner of Zenda? If he can, should he be? Their motives were unselfish. Len Brock's surely mercenary and criminal. Before we judge, let's find out exactly what he has in mind. What do you mean, take his place? If my twin brother Phil is out of the way, who's to know that I'm not him? Oh, you couldn't get away with that? Why not, May? You said yourself you wouldn't know him from me. To look at, sure. But there is one way anybody could... How? Your voice, the way you talk. Well, well, I've been doing a lot of thinking about that. You know the way I've always kidded around with impersonations and stuff? Oh, yeah, but that's... Uh, that... Yeah, yeah, well, listen. <clears throat> it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's mother. If I'm gone too long, it upsets her. Besides, I have to give her her medicine. Hey, thanks for a lovely dinner. So, what do you think? Well, there you really sounded like, like Phil. You could have fooled me, but I don't know about people who know him. Well, look, if I could get away with it with you, well as you know me, I can hack it with anyone. Well, yeah, but, but Lynn, kill him? How? Well, I, 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 I think I know if I have to. I'm hoping it won't come to that. Look, I got one more angle left. What? Well, like I said, see, I'm going into New York to see Phil. Now, you give him one last chance to bail me out. If he won't, well, what the heck? It's his neck or mine. And I ain't going to be the one to end up with it in a sling. <laughs> What are you doing here? Oh, I, I've been trying to get you on the phone for two days with no luck. I, uh, well, I thought I'd try in person. Uh, can I come in? Yeah, sure. How'd you get up here? Oh, that was for laughs. I walked in downstairs and the doorman said, Hello, Mr. Henderson. I uh, didn't see you. You go out. So I said, You got to be on the ball every moment. Keep that security tight. And he said, Hey, that sounded just like me. I mean, what you said to, uh, to Donald, the doorman. Well, I uh, didn't want anyone to think you were living a double life. <laughs> I mean, I've been getting the message the last couple of days. Maybe you're sorry a twin ever turned out. Oh, no, no, no. It isn't like that, Len. It's just that Mother's been through a very bad period. I mean, we almost lost her. Oh, how is she now? Well, she's she's all right. Dr. Clayton says she's out of danger. Oh, that's good. Why were you so anxious to try and reach me? Oh, come on. We just found each other as brothers. And then there was, well, you know, that last discussion when you were to my place for dinner. And, well, I just wanted to Look, say... Look, that's been that bothering that... me too, Len. 
So just let me try to apologize. I mean, even if I wanted to help you out financially, I can't. Until I come into my own money. Uh, okay, okay, I can see that. But more than that, I didn't want our relationship to start out on a financial basis. I mean... Oh, no, no, I know what you mean, Phil. No, I don't think you do. So you think I've had the best of our being adopted. Well, maybe you're, maybe you're right. But there's one thing that you don't understand. My foster parents, my mother and dad, were too old ever to have had a kid. I mean, I could have been little Lord Fauntleroy or something. And they wanted to keep me that way all my life. Ever since I was 18, I've been waiting to get hold of some of the money that was coming my way, and instead I've been kept on a leash like a pet poodle. So when I finally get it, Len, it's only going to be spent my way. I'm not giving any handouts to anyone. Oh, look, I, uh, I didn't come here to, to ask for one. Well, why are you here? Well, I, I just wanted to... Uh... Oh, I, uh, I May was kind of upset the other night that you ran out. Uh, she blamed it on me I, that I hit you up for a loan. I said you wouldn't hold it against me, but uh, then when I couldn't reach you... I you told you, Mother's been very sick. I didn't have time for anyone but her. Oh, I see, but she's better now. Well, she's in a remission period. You know, it's like a pendulum. You know, it's back and forth, and one of these times it's going to swing too far. Well, have you uh, anyone to take care of her? Got nurses around the clock now. Yeah. Well, then, uh, you ought to take a little time off. You know, you need to rest yourself. Well, it has been quite a strain. Yeah. Well, why don't you come tomorrow night and have dinner with us? Uh, May asked me to ask you. No, I don't know. Look, you could eat and run. This time I won't give you any reason to, and we'll understand. Uh, I appreciate that, Lynn. Yeah, we're brothers, you know. We got to stick to each other through thick and thin, huh? <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Okay, what time? Ah, say, uh, 6.30 to 7. I promise you, you'll be gone by 9. Hey, uh, what time is it, May? About 10 to 7. Hey, you, uh, you don't suppose he won't show, huh? Well, maybe it'd be better if he didn't. Uh, uh, now, hold on to yourself. Now, look, look. Let's go over it again. No, I, I can't. Boy, it is so hot. I turned up the heat. That's the plan. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Now, as soon as he gets here, he can... Oh, oh. That, that's him now. When? The sooner the better. Uh, don't forget the high five. No, no, I won't. Okay. Well, here goes nothing. Hi, Phil. Hi. Hey, glad to see you could make it. I'm just glad that uh, there are no hard feelings. What? Over money? Oh, that's t that's the least of our problems. Here, let me take your coat. Hello, May. Oh, it's so nice to see you again. Well, I hope you won't think I'm just a freeloader. Ah, come on. Who are you kidding? Whew, it's hot in here. Here, uh, let me take your jacket, too. All right. These landlords in the heat, you know, feast or famine. Yeah. All uh, right, sit on the couch, Phil. Make yourself at home. Uh, May, uh, how about turning on the hi-fi? Okay. Ah, this is nice. Nice to have a brother. Yeah, that was my idea for a while. Now I find I can do without him. What? Turn up the hi-fi, May. What are you doing with the gun? There's no room for twins, Philip. Just for one of us. No. No, you can't. I'm not... Ah! Ah! All right, May. All right, turn it down. Did... did you... Uh, there's only one twin left. Now, here... Help me get his clothes off and dress him in mine. Oh, when I... Don't pass out on me now. You know what to do when Ace comes? Yeah. Where will you be? I'll be at Phil's apartment from now on till the old lady dies. And from then on, we will be in Clover. Phil, I'm glad you got home. Uh, what are you doing here? I want you to get a hold of yourself, son. Your mother's had a very violent attack. The nurse called me, and we've got her under sedation now. And we're just waiting for the ambulance. Oh, you mean, uh, you mean mother is dying? Well, we've always known it was just a matter of time. You know, as a doctor, I've uh, tried to get you to face that for a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, doctor. I realize it's uh, it's uh, just a sudden. 
Yes, it caught me off balance, too. Uh, you weren't aware of how rapidly she was deteriorating? Uh, no, no, Doctor, no. Oh, that's strange. On my daily visits, I was constantly surprised at how well she was weathering it. <laughs> well, there's no way of ever telling. Every case is individual. Yeah, I uh, suppose it is. Uh... Yes. <clears throat> Uh, care for a cigarette? Hmm? No, 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 no. For once, I, I don't feel like one. Uh, when did you start smoking again? Huh? Oh, oh, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, just the pressure, I guess. <laughs> yes, it, uh, it gets to all of us, yes. What? Uh, sounds like the ambulance now. Uh, do you want to go with us? Well, maybe, uh, maybe I just better trail along by myself. Well, I can't hold out much hope. Brace yourself. It's uh, never an easy time. Death is always the most unwelcome of visitors. Hi, little sister. Come in, quick, Ace. Hey, how come I'm welcome for a change? No, don't, don't get around, Ace. I'm, I'm in terrible trouble. With that Welsher you hang around with, I ain't surprised. Well, just cheer up, sis. Me and the organization are going to take them off your hands. You're too late. What do you mean? Come in the living room. Look. Holy Toledo. What happened? I didn't mean to shoot him, but he just drove me up the wall. Lynn, him with his lies and his double dealing, using me to front for him. Well, all the time he was double crossing us, pretending he could deliver something he couldn't. Now, Doe, huh? Are you kidding? Everything he did got us deeper in debt. He was crossing everybody up, including me. I just couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed his gun and blew him out. All right, all right, just take it easy, sis. <laughs> take it easy. Between you and me. If you hadn't taken him out, the boss would have arranged the same thing. What am I going to do, Ace? I don't want to go to prison. Why, you think I'm going to let that happen to my little sister? There's nothing to worry about, I tell you. Just let your big brother handle this. How? Look, it's my business, baby. Right as from now and here on in, it's like Len Brock never even was. He's not only dead, he's already buried. It's, uh, it's the way it is, Phil. She's... she's dead? Yes, before we could get her here to the hospital. I don't understand how it could be so sudden. Well, neither do I, son, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Man proposes and God disposes. Huh? Mm, figure of speech. Well, I see you're smoking, huh? Oh, yeah, I, yes, well, I'm sorry to see you started again. It's a bad habit. You should leave it to us doctors to drive nails in our own coffins. Oh, uh, speaking of that, uh, do you want an autopsy? Well, I'll leave that up to you, Doc. Mm. Well, thank you, Phil. If you don't think it's necessary... Well, why would it be? Well, just a matter of form. Whatever so much money is involved, it's a sensible precaution. And it helps to advance the cause of medical science. Well, like I said... You are the doctor. And uh, this here, I guess, is what you'd call the solarium. Oh, gee. It's also oh, so rich. One eight room duplex, baby, and it is all ours. <laughs> <laughs> you think you can get away with this? What's to stop me? They won't know the. You're not really Phil Henderson? Ah, they couldn't even guess, particularly when I remember to <coughs> talk just the way my identical twin did. <laughs> but su suppose they ever found his body. After the organization took care of it? Oh, me, honey. That's the way they stay in business. They're the only ones who ever know where the body is buried. But if Ace or any of them ever saw you... They... Baby, baby, Brooklyn is their territory. They don't move off the turf. Anyways, you know, I'm lying low until the will is probated, and when we get our hot little hands on the dough, then we will be long gone. You sure we're safe? Nobody ever saw us together. Nobody, nobody never knew there was twins except him, me... And you. We're home safe. Who's that? Huh? Well, I don't know. Let's have a look. Oh, hey, it's the doctor and some other guy. What do they want? Hmm? You're going to find out. 
Well, if, uh, if it isn't the good Dr. Clayton, come on in. Uh, thank you, thank you. Who's your friend? Uh, Detective Sergeant McGuire, the New York Police. You, Philip Henderson? That's right. What did... I got a warrant here for your arrest on the charge of murder in the first degree. Murder? What are you talking about? Well, I should have known it from the first, Phil, but I couldn't believe that you would do such a thing, except uh, you were the only one who could have. Could have what? You made two mistakes. First of all, in small doses, arsenic works as a tonic. It helped keep your mother alive. After, when you increased the dosage to kill her, you forgot one thing. The body doesn't throw off arsenic. It builds up. The autopsy proved your mother died of massive arsenic poisoning. Mr. Henderson, I better tell you your rights before you say anything. Hey, no, 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 you, you got it wrong. It's, it's all wrong. I am not Phil Henderson. You certainly weren't acting like him towards the end, smoking, lapses of memory, sometimes not even talking like yourself. But don't you see that? That's why, that's why, because I am someone else. I am not Phil Henderson. I Come on, I'm, Mr. Henderson. No, you, Save it for the judge and the jury. Who are you kidding? Who else could you be? A desperate Len Brock faces his accusers, frantic to defend himself. But already, the sick knowledge has sunk to the pit of his stomach that he can't. His twin, his other self, is dead and buried. There is no way to prove that he is Len Brock. By his own action, he has made himself into his other half, Philip Henderson who murdered his mother. I shall return shortly. Might cavil at coincidence. Just recently, all the media carried a story of two adopted twins who lived in the same city for 18 years before they happened to cross each other. Naturally, nothing like our story happened to them, but truth once again was stranger than fiction. In their case, the publicity over their reunion unearthed a third brother, identical to the other two. There's no way fiction could ever top that. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Earl Hammond, and E.V. Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. To my surprise, I discovered that it was Lord Byron in his famous poem, Don Juan, who first said, For truth is always strange, stranger than fiction. Others, I'm sure, have said it in their own ways. Edmund Burke, the great British statesman and orator, phrased it, Truth lags behind fiction. And Bob Ripley, the cartoonist, made a life work and a fortune out of this simple statement. The following story is fiction, but it is founded on a strange truth. That nice little lady, 
she couldn't commit a murder over a cat. Let me tell you something, Detective Trout. Most murders are committed by otherwise nice people. And motive? Sometimes all it takes is a hot night or a sneeze or the wrong words put together. Don't you ever forget it, Miss Detective. The right time, the right place, the right circumstances. Anyone can commit homicide. <laughs> mystery drama, Checkmate, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Robert Dryden and Marion Haley. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Detective Sergeant Digger Bowles of the 4th Precinct is looking forward to his approaching retirement from the force. In his nearly 30 years in the police department, over 20 of them as a plainclothes detective, he's been happy and proud in his work. But uh, he's a man of habit, and change irritates him more and more. Most of all, this new breed of officers... He doesn't particularly appreciate it when they come in a form that is anathema to him in the hallowed precincts of the station house. A fourth precinct, Detective Trout. Help! Help! I... I'm murdered! Well, hold it a minute. Uh, who are you? So... Fender. Address and phone number? Wait, was that a five or a nine? A five. I didn't get that last. Please. I'm a... I'm a bee. I can't. I can't. Mr. Fender. Uh. Mr. Fender. Are you all right? Hello? Where you got that, detective? The big one, Sergeant Foles. Homicide. Who says? The guy on the phone. What guy? Who? Saul Fender. He just got murdered. Who got murdered? Saul Fender, the man on the phone. The victim called up to say he was being murdered. No, that he just had been. I got the address. We'd better go over there right away. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean he's still on the phone? He was. He isn't anymore. Here, listen. Hello? Hello? Mr. Fender? Mr. Fender? You see, he was talking, and then I heard him fall, but he said he'd been murdered. I don't know, Trout. My feet are killing me. I just hope this isn't somebody's idea of a joke. All right, come on. Let's go see. Why don't you use the siren? Because I ain't no show-off. Besides, it makes too much noise. Disturbs people, including me. Yes, but it's important to get there. We'll get there. Fast. Just as fast. Well, how do you know? Because I've been driving this city just uh -huh. this way for, for 25, 25 years, years and, and it's, it's always been... been good enough. Smart, huh? Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you know? You're just beginning. You think this is a game? No, I don't. I'm just enthusiastic about my job and I'd like to be good at it. Just like. Don't enthuse. You don't like me, do you, Digger? Did I say that? Well, you don't have to. You think I'm just a wet-behind-the-ears young punk. Don't tell me what I think, Detective Trout. Uh -huh, well, then you tell me. I think... I know you're a dame. That's all. And dames don't have any place in your thinking. Not on the force. Well, not in homicide, no. anyway. <laughs> Why? Women get killed, too. Yeah, that's right. So maybe it's just lucky we're at the scene of the crime that's already been committed. All right, come on. Let's go play cop. Now, just let me get this straight, Miss... Uh... Mrs. Applebaum. Oh, yeah. You say you're out walking your dog. Cat. Cat. 
The cat. Walking a cat. Sure. He likes his evening stroll, Marsters. What do you think? He looks like a dog, that cat? You see a leash, you figure a dog at the other end. And you're a detective. Maybe I'm too busy looking at that weapon in your other hand. What's that for? Oh, this neighborhood. A person isn't safe even if it's still light. Nobody bothers me no more since I stuffed a couple of them with this. What is it? It's a hat pin. Madam, that's a dangerous weapon. You have to tell me. Mrs. Applebaum, how come when we got here, you were with the dead man? He was the super. I, I had a complaint. Uh, and you usually just walk right into his apartment to complain? Listen, Miss Cop. Usually I can't even get him to answer the bell when all the things need fixing. Plumbing, heat, the cockroaches. And yesterday, even the toilets wouldn't flush. You don't like Mr. Fender? Anybody doesn't like cats. Can't be any good. God forgive me for saying that, the poor man dead. He was dead when you came in. Just like you see him. What time was this? Oh, I guess a uh, few minutes after nine. I, I got a watch, but I, I couldn't see without my glasses. How did you get in, Mrs. Applebaum? Well, I just turned the handle and the door opened. So anyone could have got in, huh? I guess, if they had the new key. What new key? Well, to the outside door. Well, we got a new lock. Burglar proof, it's supposed to be. <laughs> I'd still like to see the day. Well, how many people have keys to the outside lot? Oh, just the people in the building. Unless they had copies made. Oh, first off, you can't. You gotta send to the company. And second, we all just got them this morning. Who's all? I mean, who else is in the building? Oh, well, you see, there's that dryer person on the first floor back. Me, second floor front. And Miss Dimby, second back. And the doctor on third floor back. The doctor? Oh, that's what we all call Mr. Porter. Oh, is he smart? He plays chess with eight, ten people at a time and wins from them all. Get right in the window there at, at Boardwalk and 52nd Street. He, he does what? Yeah, I know where she means. It's an amusement palace. Pinball machines, skeet ball, shooting gallery, and Professor Porter, the human chess machine. You pay to play him. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Applebaum. Yes, honey. Uh, there are six apartments in this building. Who occupies the other two? Well, the, the first floor front is Mr. Kelly with the birds. Uh, he had to go back in the hospital again, so I'm caring for them. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. But what about the sixth one? Oh, that, that's Mr. Brillantine. Brillantine? You know him? Hey, Lance Brillantine. He, he's an actor person. What does he do? Hair commercials? Oh, no, no, no. He's with the children's theater now. They, they do fairy stories. And he just flew up to Boston and he's looking to sublet. He has the whole top floor through. That's nice. A little nest in the treetops. Well, thanks, Mrs. Applebaum. You go on up to your apartment and stick around. We might want to question you again. Oh, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, but... Uh, what about poor Mr. Fender? He ain't going anywhere either. Yeah, but sh shouldn't he have a doctor? The only one he'll need is a medical examiner. Oh. How he died, that's up to the M.E. Now, you run along, huh? Oh, yes, sir. of course, Sergeant. Hey, hey, watch that thing. Oh, my hat's in. Oh, don't worry. I know how to handle this. Uh, come along, Morris. Just don't look at Mr. Fender like that. Yes, I know you didn't like him because he was so nasty to you. But you have the last laugh because you have nine lives and he only had one. Think she could have done it? Done what? The murder. What murder? All we know is we got a guy who's dead. Oh, no, but he said on the phone. Who said? You don't even know if it was Fender's voice you heard. Or if it was that he was telling the truth. Now, look. Let's wait till we have a case before we get all head up. Yes, Dicker, but if he wasn't murdered, then how could... Maybe he had a stroke or a heart attack. Maybe he was some kind of a nut. Hey, hey Detective Trout, don't touch that body till the doc checks him out. You want to do something? Here. What? Chalk. Draw a picture of the way he's laying. Then let's you and me take a look-see if anything else is disturbed besides the late Mr. Fenton. Okay, Detective Trout, start her up. Where are we going? Back to the precinct. Uh, what about the homicide? 
Well, a guy died, that's all. Of what? Doc says a brain hemorrhage. But what caused it? He doesn't know. At least till an autopsy. Probably natural causes. I don't believe it. The man said on the telephone... Look, do me a favor, will you? Leave it lay. We got nothing to go on. No evidence of forcible entry, no evidence of robbery. Look at all the dough he had in the desk drawer. We could have checked out the other people in the house. I did that. Nobody home. Or at least not answering their bell. All right, come on, come on. Now, let's move it. You could tell by his face. What? His face. Mr. Fender's face. His eyes wide open like they were accusing whoever it was. I wonder how he was killed. Maybe somebody said boo to him too loud and frightened him to death. It isn't funny. No. Now, what is funny is a rookie detective who can't forget she's a woman and has to get big romantic notions of first case is murder one instead of some poor old geezer scared to death of dying but having to do it anyway. Now, come on. Let's not go looking for trouble, detective. You're going to find out plenty of it gets handed to us for free. I'm sorry, Sergeant. Ah, oh, don't mind me, kid. Doesn't matter how many times you look at one, I still don't like to see no one dead. Did... Did the doctor say anything about the mark on his eyelid? What? What mark on what? His eyes were open. How could you see a mark on the lid? It was creepy. The way he was staring and I tried to close his eyes. I just started to pull down the right eyelid. Then you wouldn't let me touch him and there was a little mark there. What kind of mark? Well, just a little red mark like, uh, well, maybe somebody, something bit him. I don't know. He jabbed a pencil by mistake or, or I don't know, something sharp. Maybe like, uh, you know, when you get a penicillin shot from the doctor. All right, take the next left, Trout, and hit that gas pedal. Turn on the siren, too. Where are we going? The hospital. I want to have a talk with that doctor fast. Needle, huh? Well, you're, wait, you're, you're not thinking of Mrs. Applebaum's hat pin. What else? Oh, that nice little lady for what? A quarrel about heat or the plumbing or a, a cat? Let me tell you something, detective. Most murders are committed by nice people who just flip a screw suddenly and go berserk. Sometimes all it takes is a hot knife or a sneeze or the wrong words put together. No, I mean, Miss Detective, the right time, the right place, the right circumstances, anyone can commit homicide. So you do think this is a homicide after all? I don't know, Trout. Well, let the doctor tell us that. The unmarked car hurtles through the city streets, traffic clearing for its wailing siren. In the passenger seat, Sergeant Digger Bowles is no longer relaxed, but sits forward as though driving himself. Beside him, Detective Marion Trout is tense and more than a little scared at the reaction to what her observant eyes have seen. I shall return shortly with Act Two. of us, death, the inevitable last rite, is a feast or sorrowing already arranged. But for countless others, it is the accident which was never expected, and there is nothing tidy about closing the house of life. Saul Fender, who was he? What was he? Who is left to mourn him? And most of all, how did he come to die? While Sergeant Digger Bowles and Detective Marion Trout wait at the hospital for the M.E.'s report, some of this is resolved. Where have you been, Sergeant? The autopsy room, waiting for results. Nothing yet. What do you dig up? Less sketchy, just a sort of outline. Draw it for me. Okay, Saul Fender was 67. No relatives, retired on Social Security. He got the basement apartment in return for servicing the building. His wife died a few years ago, and after that, I gather he didn't care too much about anything. He kind of died with her. Did he gamble? No sign of it. 
other women? Oh, come on. He was a sad little man all alone. He kept to himself, minded his own business, and like the old story, never did anyone no harm. Maybe. All right, the deceased is on the autopsy table. I got nothing to say until... All right, I'll take it. I said I'd be at this extension. Hello. Yeah, this is Detective Sergeant Bowles. Who's this? Oh, Dr. Baker. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, I see. Okay. I'll take it from here. So? So, score one for youth and an eagle eye. You got the makings of a detective. Maybe I was lucky I had you along. Uh-huh. The mark on his eyelid? Yeah. Somebody shoved something really skinny and sharp right through his eye socket and into his brain. That's what caused the hemorrhage and his death. So it was murder. That's about the size of it. Mm. You got your case after all. No, I have. I'm not sure I want it. That nice little old lady. Mrs. Applebaum? Yes. We still got to build something that'll hold up in court. Where do we start? Uh, it's after midnight. I'll have the house staked out tonight, just in case. We start early in the morning. Okay, Trout, here we are. Scene of the crime. Everybody out. Okay. Where do we start, Sergeant? We're going to face Mrs. Applebaum first. No. Nope. We'll check out all the other suspects. The patrol car phoned in. They're all home. But first, we'll have a look at Fender's apartment. What for? That's what we're going to be looking to find out. You find anything here in the bedroom, Detective? No, Sergeant. You find out anything? Yeah, a couple of things. I counted that money. $295. A lot of cash to have hanging around. Well, it makes some people feel secure. I mean, like to have cash on hand. Yeah. Two bank books, over twelve hundred and one, ten thousand in the other. What's in the cigar box? Have a look. Smell. Mmm. Grass. Marijuana. Good stuff. Well, you think he was a dealer? Grass, money, they go together, don't they? Oh, not necessarily. The entries in the big bank book are all years old. The money's been there since the year one, just gathering interest. Uh Uh-huh, and the new bank book. Chicken feed. A buyer, maybe. Not a seller. But I got a notion where this grass came from. Where? Yeah, this is his rent book. A character named Dreiser. You remember Mrs. Applebaum called him a person? The first floor back. Yeah, check he was always behind in his rent, it seems. Sometimes the old boy carried him for two, three months. Why? He was a supplier? Or is that jumping to conclusions? That ain't jumping. That's just plain adding up two and two. Tell you what. Let's you and me go pay a visit to the first floor back. Mr. Dreiser? Mr. Dreiser? Open up. Police. Hey, man, what goes with all the loud jive? I mean, like you're breaking my head. Are you, Mr. Dreiser? Ooh, I am the one. Detective Sergeant Balls. This is my sidekick, Detective Trout. Real nice. Solid. The mama and the papa. What can old slats do for you? I'd like to ask you a few questions, Mr. Dreiser. Can we come in? Well, sure. Come on in. I'm clean. Uh, just a little stretched out. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got some coffee moving. You use some for what ails you? We haven't gotten anything that ails us. Oh, then you're lucky. You got it made, mamas and papas. Slats here, he's just cutting it. I mean, like just. Excuse me. Stoned. To the gills. And something a lot stronger than grass. You know it. I stay one side of him, be ready for anything. I uh, guess you know what happened here last night, Mr. Dreiser. Oh, man. <laughs> Is that hot? Last night? Uh-huh. To the superintendent. You know he's dead. He's what? Dead. How? Well, we're trying to find out. Oh, don't look at me, man. I wasn't even here last night. 
Where were you? Well, now, that's no question for a doll to ask. I mean, you got to protect your own doll, right? Uh, Mrs. Slats, are you trying to say you were with a woman? Ah, crazy. You named it. You want to give us her name? Why? Fender didn't just die. Someone killed him. Oh, wow. You, you're not looking at me. You were behind in your rent. Well, I was, but I paid up last night. What time? Well, just like before seven on my way out. Didn't show in his rent book. It was cash on the line, 295 bucks. Here, I got his receipt right here. Huh? That's uh, a receipt, all right. But for what? I don't dig it. What was passing between you two besides grass? Any hard stuff? Hard stuff? What are you talking about, man? Junk? Yeah. Were you buying from Fender? Well, uh, I'm no user. Well, what do you do? Push it? Sister, lay back. No call to come on so hard. I'm clean. Where were you last night around 9 o'clock? Well, like I said, with, with my old woman. What's her name? No, I wouldn't want to get her mixed up in nothing. Hey, what are you doing, Fuzz? Get out of that drawer. Hold it. No, you hold it. Don't you touch nothing of mine. There's one little item in here I wouldn't think of touching except to pick it up with my handkerchief. You mind if I borrow your ice pick? What do you want it for? I want to take it down to the morgue and see if it fits the hole above Saul Fender's eye where somebody drove something real sharp like this right into his brain. What? That's the way he died. Around nine o'clock last night. Now... You still want to clam up about where you were then? Man, I keep broadcasting. I couldn't have been here. How come? Because I was in Mount Pleasant then, 50 miles from here. Prove it. Come on, what kind of a roust is this? You ain't going to make me take no fall for some murder rap. No, let's look at it this way, punk. Now, no, don't tell me you haven't done time. I dig deep enough, I'll tie you into junk peddling. So the old man found out, was going to throw you out or turn you over to the cops, and you were on a trip and used this on him. No, no, I didn't. This ain't no ordinary ice pick. It's sharp as a needle. Now, what do you need it for with an electric refrigerator? This is a weapon, and you know it. Okay. Okay. I ain't standing still for being railroaded on no murder rap. I take a fall, it's going to be for one to five. Not the whole bundle. There's a pump jockey in Mount Pleasant will remember me and get me off the hook. Why is that? Because I hit his gas station last night. At 9 o'clock, he was backing off from that ice pick 50 miles from here. Okay. Put your wrist behind your back. That's it. How come you... You had a pick on me for... And then Fender his ticket. Well, you seem the only one who might have a motive. You kidding? What about all the others? Well, what about him? Well, like old Professor Porter up there. Him and Fender used to be such great buddies. But last night, just as I was cutting out, he he come on like a like a sore boil about something. When I left there, there was some kind of a brinigan going on. That was before seven. So how do you know where he was at nine? Well, check it out. An old lonely heart's dimby. There's a babe who's so hot for anything in pants, she even made a few passes at Fender. <laughs> and man, when he brushed her off, she was ready to total him. And how about Mother Applebaum, huh? I mean, like, she may look like Whistler's old lady, but there's one tough little cookie. Her and that hat pin of hers. What would she have against Mr. Fender? Babes, he hated cats. I mean, like, they turned them off all the way. And anybody don't like her means you old cat is marked right off her books. Let me tell you. Okay, okay, that's it. Move. We'll check them all out. Don't worry. Well, too bad it couldn't have been him. Hey there, babes. Cool it. Now you cool it. You're lucky you're just a two-bit crook. It just may save your life. the stone head back to the precinct while you check out Miss Dimby. You think he can handle it? Well, a dried up sex star Fordish would be sex kitten. I'll be a lot safer than you would. You can have her. 
I'll take the professor as soon as I get back. Then we'll compare notes. I hope it turns out to be one of them. Why? Well, I liked old Mrs. Applebaum. I don't want it to be her. Listen, detective. First thing you got to learn in this job is don't form any attachments. And the second is, don't kid yourself there's any romance. And forget all about the books, the movies, and the TV shows. The way it is in real life, 99 chances out of 100, the perpetrator is the obvious one. Which means Mrs. Applebaum. Which means Mrs. Applebaum. It will have to be a very large or unexpected miracle to get Mrs. Applebaum off the hook, as Detective Marion Trout is due to find out when both her other suspects turn up with airtight alibis. And yet, uh, but that will have to remain till I return shortly with the third act. at this moment, Marion Trout is almost regretting her transfer to the detective bureau. As a uniformed policewoman, she has faced death before, but then it was impersonal, not something she had to become involved in. A murder investigation, she is finding, is different. Now, she herself is committed to hunting down a murderer that might be a bright, attractive old lady to whom she has taken a liking. But in spite of Sergeant Bowles' conviction, she doesn't have to face that yet. For the moment, her quarry is Miss Dimby. Who is it? Uh, sorry to bother you, Miss Dimby. I I'm a police officer. Oh, dear. Oh, dear me, you, you don't look like a police officer. Well, I should have said detective. My shield and identification. Oh, I... I, I don't know what to say. You haven't heard about your superintendent? Oh, you, you mean about his heart attack? Mm. Oh, yes. So so sad. So sudden. It was a terrible shock. I, I felt so guilty about my, my feeling of relief for the moment before I... Oh, well, per perhaps you should come in. Thank you. Yes. Such a, a dreadful, dreadful shock. Mm. What did you mean feeling of relief. Oh, well, I, I never should have mentioned it. it. It's just that it's so difficult for a, a young single girl to to be in a house that's practically infested by men. Mm. One gets a little tired of, you know, being pestered. Mm. Particularly the older men. Although Mr. Fender was very sweet, but he was persistent. Oh, well, one must speak well of the dead. Mm. Won't you step into my parlor? Oh, thank you, Miss Denby. Oh, please, sit down. Oh, you, you don't mind if I go on with my knitting, do you? No. Not at all. Oh. Well, I, uh, I have so many bows, you know, m men in my life. Uh. So many favors to return, and I, I, I am not well to do, so I, I knit them scarves or... Oh, gloves. Hmm. Did you know that Mr. Fender was murdered? Oh, murdered? Oh, but, uh, but uh, how? Well, he was stabbed in the eye. Oh. Something very sharp was driven into his brain. Oh, how dreadful. What, what, what sort of thing? Well, something like a skewer or an ice pick or a knitting needle. Oh. Miss Dimby, where were you last night between 8.30 and 9.30? Oh, why, I, 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 I was at a moving picture show. Ah, well, what did you see? Oh, why, it, oh, it was lovely. Mm. So, so artistic and, and cultural. The, uh, that exquisite production by the great Spanish director, Mikhail Lugano, La Paloma. Had you seen it? Oh, well, no. What theater? Oh, the, the fine art. Oh, that beautiful little theater on the southwest uh, corner of Broadwalk and 24. <laughs> yes, that's the one. Yes, well, then you couldn't have been here anywhere near nine o'clock. Oh, heavens, no. Well, in that case, there's no need to ask you any more questions. No, 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 no. 
Don't bother. I'll let myself out. Oh, well, uh, you're sure that's quite uh, uh, satisfactory? I'm sure, Miss Dimby. You gave me just what I need. Sergeant. Damn, Professor slipped out on me. What is it? You don't have to look any further. I've got her. Who? The murderer. The Dimby Dame? She gave me an alibi. That she was at a movie at the Fine Arts Theater at Boardwalk and 24th last night. I trapped her with the address and get this. She's a knitting nut. I don't follow. Now listen, there's no Fine Arts Theater at that address. It's just a hole in the ground for a new building and knitting needles. A steel knitting needle. Wouldn't that be a perfect weapon for a sex-starved old maid to use against a guy who maybe turned her down? Oh, a police person? Miss Detective? Yes. Could I see you a moment, please? Go Uh, ahead. I'll go with you. Oh, I'd rather see the lady alone, please. I think I'd better come along. Oh, dear. Well, all right. Come, Come in, please. I... I, I'm afraid I have a confession to make. Well, you see, Sergeant. I, I lied to you earlier about being at the fine arts. You weren't at the movies? Oh, yes, I was at the movies, but not... Not at the one I said I was. Yes, well, then where were you? Well, I... Uh, surely a matter of one, might say, morally outraged uh, curiosity. I had gone to, to see a perfectly dreadful and vile thing called uh, the story of W. Oh, I can see why you might have wanted to keep that a secret. That their story of W, detective, is X-rated. It's what you call your hardcore pornography. You've got to be kidding. Well, what's the difference, Dimby, what you saw? Unless you could prove you were there. Oh, well, I, I can prove I was at the one. Oh. Well, the... Uh, the manager knows me. It's a little embarrassing going right up to the... Well, he, he... He lets me in quietly. And how long were you at this movie? From 7 to 11 o'clock. I, I'm afraid I, I... I sat through it twice. Glad you enjoyed it. Oh, you... You needn't look down your nose at me. And instead of harassing me with your... Your police brutality, you should be after the real culprit. Yes, and who's that? The almighty professor. Uh, Oh, butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Always the gentleman. (laughs) You should have heard him and Mr. Fender going at it, hammer and tongs as I did when I left for the... uh, When I went out. And something else. Ah, what was that, ma'am? Well, the door was open as I passed, and I... I saw him hit Mr. Fender over the head. With what, Miss Dimby? With his umbrella. If you look at this umbrella, you can see he must have hit him pretty hard. Some of the ribs are broken. Well, first of all, we don't know it's his umbrella. She said she saw him throw it out this morning. She says. Anyway, so what? There wasn't a mark on Fender's head. How can you hurt anyone with a light umbrella? And anyways, the time is all wrong. Yeah, well, maybe he came back. Well, here's the amusement center. That's what I intend to find out. Now. Hey, excuse me, uh, Professor Porter? Morning. You want to play one dollar a game unless you win, and then I pay you two. Take board number seven and choose white or black. Hey, excuse me, I, I don't want to play. I want to talk to you. My credentials. Police? We can go over here by the weight machine. It's the quietest place in the house. Very well, uh, Sergeant. You you have exactly one minute. I gather you were a friend of Saul Fender's. Saul, yes, yes. We played chess together, and why? When was the last time you saw him? About six thirty last night, when I went home for dinner before I returned here. What time did you return to work? It was some time before seven. And you got home at eleven thirty. That's right. How did Between you... those hours, you were sitting at your usual place in the window playing chess. Except for traveling to and from. Yes. What happened 
to Saul. He was murdered. What? what do you, you, you don't think I had anything to do with it? Not if you were here at 9 o'clock, no. You're out of it if you're telling the truth. And don't worry. I intend to make sure that's just what you're telling. Yeah? You sure? Yeah. Okay. Well, what did the lab say? No trace of blood on the hat pin. Well, that don't mean nothing. That could have been washed off. Uh, then you're going to arrest her? I don't know. We got motive, opportunity, means, but... Eh, ain't much of a case. No witnesses, no proof they quarreled. Yes, and yet we know Professor Porter did. What's the difference? That was two hours earlier, and he... What is it? I just thought of something. Who usually establishes the time of death? Well, the medical examiner or whatever doctor they send over. Only this time he didn't. We told him because of the phone call. But supposing by that time he was already dying and was only beginning to realize it. What are you talking about? I don't know. I'm going to get Doc Prouty at the hospital and maybe he can explain it to me. It's all right, Mr. Porter. Come on in. We've been waiting for you. You're that policeman who came to see me. Who is this woman? This is Detective Trout. What you're doing here? Well, we want to ask you some questions. Yes, Mrs. Aprobaum is quite correct. I did quarrel with my poor friend, Saul. We had a terrible one. And you did hit him? I'm ashamed to say I did. I hit him over the head. With your umbrella? Yes, but the provocation was very great. I ask you to imagine. My life is not much, but I have my pride. I could have been one of the greats, a Spassky, a Bobby Fisher. But I was never given the chance. Instead, I work in a window, playing with fools who have no hope of beating me goggled at by idiots from the street as if I were in a cage at the zoo. When, when Saul came to the house, he was lonely. He had no companions. I taught him to play chess. I played with him to amuse him. I even showed him the unbeatable reply to the Museo Gambit, a secret only I know. And you know how he repaid me? Yesterday, knowing I was sick and not myself. When I had ten games going, he came, he, the pupil to the master, and used my own trick to defeat me in the goldfish bowl. He shamed me in front of all the world. I was mad enough to kill him. I'm afraid that's just what you did. What? Is this the umbrella you hit him with? Well, yes, yes, that's my umbrella. I threw it away because some of the ribs got broken. But that, well, a, a, a little hit on the head from a light umbrella couldn't have killed him. Only it did. One of these broken ribs jabbed straight into the hollow of his eye and right into his brain. Oh, no. No. Well, I never meant... But wait a minute... You said he was alive at nine o'clock. We quarreled at least two hours before that. Sometimes it takes time for a man to die. The doctors tell us that the hemorrhage caused by the wound could easily have taken two hours to cause his final death. Good Lord. I... I suppose you're going to arrest me. The charge will be manslaughter. But we'll have to arrest you. But I don't care about the charge. I'm only sick to my soul that I, I could have caused another human being's death. I think I shall have a better judge and a punishment to fit the crime. Mr. Porter, are you all right? No, my dear. I'm very far from all right. It's my heart. There are some pills around. 
Oh, no. Which pocket, sir? It... It doesn't really matter. It's better this way. The end game is played out. This time it's... Checkmate. And I'm the loser. Some time ago, outside a New York bar, two men got into a fight. One of them lashed out at the other with an umbrella. After the fight was stopped, the man who had been hit by the umbrella continued on his night out. And it wasn't until he returned home some two hours later that he collapsed and died. Truth, as I said in the beginning, is stranger than fiction, except when it is borrowed to make a good story. I'll be back shortly. I suppose the motives for the crime of homicide are countless. Some of them are as unspeakable and as savage as the crime itself. But the most macabre and terrible thing about it is that by far the most of them are so small and unreasonable, except to the people involved. How few of them are as neatly solved and resolved in the words of Genesis, a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Our cast included Marion Haley, Robert Dryden, Court Benson, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs>